Are, are we live? Okay. Good morning uh, to everyone and good evening to uh, Alma too. Hi, how are you? Morning. Hello. Hi, Jiwan. Yeah, Very good hi. to see you. Nice to see you uh, in the late in the, in the in the evening there, no? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. We That's are in the right. morning time. Here. <laughs> it's not so late. It's not eight thirty. So it's good to see all of you. Okay, very, very, very nice. Uh, sec. Nupur? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's very sunny and warm in India, but uh, we hope it's not very late in the US. So over to our chief, Professor Jeevan Singh Titiyal, to introduce the morning session and uh, introduce our uh, international speaker, Professor Elmer Dew. So the lecture by Professor Elmer Tu is an ode to our first, uh, to our chief, uh, uh, Professor Madan Mohan, uh, who will be introduced by Professor Ditya. Good morning and uh, good evening, friends. Uh, indeed, uh, it's our uh, honor to have you connected to us in this uh, CME program in relation to our, our Foundation Day program celebrations. We call it uh, Ophthalmic Carnival because we have started with our inaugural programs. Subsequently, yesterday we had the uh, evening of international speakers. Today in the morning in India, we are going to start with uh, nothing better than a cornea, which is the, uh, the most significant part of ocular structure for giving a vision and subsequently life to people. And today we are going to uh, start with a lecture, which is uh, Professor Madhav Mohan lecture which uh, we all know uh, is a, one of the most significant event of RP Center in establishing the cornea unit, as well as the uh, eye banking system in India. And he, Madan Mohan, has been a great teacher to all of us. He was one person who brought not only the clinical skill to us, to Looking into a microsurgery wise, he was one person who incepted the microsurgery in RP Center, Ames, New Delhi. And we are indebted to his teaching that uh, we are standing here as a cornea faculty in RP Center. And he has mentored so many people across the world that they are leaders in their own areas. This year we lost him. So we all pray for his soul to rest in peace. I know that uh, he would be listening to us. He was always there with us in every event of RP Center. And he was inceptionless, the concept of a cornea society in India. He started with Madan Mohan Cornea Society. Now it is known as Indian Society of Cornea Corrective Refractive Surgeons. And fortunately, I am heading that society also and is doing great. So we'll honor him there also. So that is the base we started uh, honoring our teachers. So we started this uh, Madan Mohan lecture. And now uh, we thought of the best person suitable for this internationally. And Almer has been with us for many, many times through Sight Life. He's been in IPA Center. He's taught our resident doctors. He taught us. And he's been a great fr friend to us and RP Center. So he would be the first person to start uh, this lecture. I know that uh, he's a director of cornea and external disease department of ophthalmology and vision sciences, University of Illinois, College of Medicine, Chicago, Illinois. <clears throat> Graduated from the University of Miami School of Medicine, 1988. Completed ophthalmology residency at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1992. Fellowship in cornea and external disease at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute of 1993 one of the most reputed institution, former director of corneal and external disease section, Department of Ophthalmology, University of Texas Health Science Center, executive editor of the American Journal of Ophthalmology since 2011. He is an editorial board member of scientific journals such as American Journal of Ophthalmology, Cornea and Eye and Contact Lens. He is a proud recipient of several awards, including the American Academy of Ophthalmology Achievement Award in 2010, and Secretariat Award in 2009-2015. His area of interest in research includes infectious and inflammatory disease of the ocular surface and cornea surgery. Two 
his credit, he has more than 120 publications in international peer-reviewed journals and 22 book chapters. We welcome Almer too for this uh, first Madan Mohan lecture. Today in India is the morning and evening in the US. And we'll be very, very happy to listen to him. All to you, Almer. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen here. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to the celebration of Arvind Center from Chicago, Illinois. I want to first thank the organizers for inviting me, and specifically Dr. Paul and Dr. Sharma, especially for giving me the honor of giving the Madad Mohan lecture for 2022. My financial disclosures are listed below. In preparing this lecture, it gave me the opportunity to look into Dr. Mohan's contributions to ophthalmology. As you know, he did a schooling in Lahore and Wal Hindi, all of his medical education, and as well as ophthalmology and residency training at King George's Medical College in Lucknow, uh, and subsequently to the faculty. In the bottom right, you can see that I was able to visit uh, the institution in 2019 and found it to be a wonderful center for the vibrant ophthalmology department. Professor Mohan then came to Ames in 1960, subsequently received a Rockefeller Fellowship in 1963 to 64, where he traveled the world studying corneal transplantation and eye banking. He brought those skills back to RP Center, establishing the National Eye Bank and helping establish the cornea unit, subsequently serving as chief of RP Center from 1979 to 1989. Professor Mohan went on to found the MMI Tech Institute of Ophthalmology, serving South Delhi, tens of thousands of patients over the time. Uh, as you can see, he's received numerous awards and honors, both in his service here in Delhi, as well as India, and internationally on multiple uh, boards. It's truly an honor to give this lecture today, and thank you for that opportunity. What I'd like to do today is to go over the evolution of treatment of incantamine keratitis, and it applies to many things, many of the challenges we have in infectious keratitis. As you know, incantamine keratitis was first described in two separate case reports in 1975. It was a very poorly understood pathogen, rare systemic pathogen, and these cases had very poor outcomes. Even today, the comparative outcomes, even with modern treatment, uh, has been shown to have significantly elevated times of epithelialization as well as the amount of time requiring my antimicrobial treatment in comparison to fungal and bacterial infections. Acanthamoeba keratitis presents a severe challenge because it has two forms, a trophozoic form and a cyst form. The cyst form being extremely resistant to all types of antimicrobials as well as environmental conditions. In addition to that, the host immune system appears to be relatively ineffective at killing or clearing organisms. Parasitic infections are often caused by protists, also termed the very first, some 80 million years old. They're unicellular eukaryotes, similar to humans, and have similar metabolic processes. Unfortunately, this also makes many of the in vitro drugs that are effective against them also very toxic to humans. The usual process for drug discovery uh, in an unknown organism includes identification of candidate compounds. And this is usually based on the underlying biology of the pathogen, identifying potential targets and potential drugs, and then having in vitro testing of candidate compounds, determine those most promising, and then in vivo clinical testing. This involves a roundabout process where it's consistently refined until the testing reflects what happens in vivo. And this takes some time years. In antibacterial sensitivity testing, the 90-60 rule shows that 90% of infections respond if it's insensitive if it's sensitive in vitro, while 60% will respond if it's resistant in vitro. This is really the gold standard. Antifungal sensitivity testing really started in 1982, and it was 10 years before they realized clinical utility for a limited number of species, and about 20 years until it was broader utility. So there were constant adjustments for about 30 years for these patients or tests. Unfortunately for acanthamoeba, we do not have standardized testing, which has been shown to correlate with in vivo response. And this was pointed out by Dr. Dart in his article uh, in 2003, where there was poor correlation between in vitro and in vivo sensitivity. 
So in terms of uh, correlation, there is good correlation for bacteria improving for fungal pathogens, but again, quite lacking in acanthamoeba testing. In the early days, they identify candidate drugs through similar processes where they were drug, doing drug sensitivity testing for bacteria. And you can see here, they identified neosporin, paramycin, pamaricin, which we'll come back to in a moment, and a number of other candidate compounds. But even with this, you can see the first 10 cases that were reported, uh, they had very poor outcomes and very inconsistent responses to these drugs, showing that there was very poor correlation. Nearly 10 years later, uh, the first candidate drug, which appeared to have good in vivo activity, was propamidine, introduced in 1985 as a first reported medical cure of acanthamoeba teratitis. The patient ended up with a vision of 624 using a combination of topical propamidine um, drops, dichromo propamidine cream, and neosporin. This was actually commercially available as an over the counter drug in the UK. Uh, and certainly the number of medical cures were described more frequently after its introduction. This class of diamidines includes hexamidine and pantamidine. The mechanism of action uh, interferes with polyamine DNA synthesis and cell growth. In vitro, it retards insistment of acanthamoeba, but unfortunately has high levels of cellular toxicity, which are seen clinically with extended use. It's also minimally cysticidal and is primarily effective against trophozoites. Recent studies, however, suggest uh, that the effectiveness of propanidine may be overestimated uh, because of its formulation. The reason for this is that from this study that we did in 2013, we were able to show that benzoconium chloride is actually as effective as hydrogen peroxide against certain species of acanth amoeba. This finding was confirmed in 2019 out of more fields where they were able to show that benzoconium chloride was troposidal at, uh, in the one to 7.8 microgram per milliliter range, cysticidal at slightly higher concentrations. And that in fact, the entire efficacy of proline against acanthamoeba was due to BAK and not the underlying drug. And this will also inhibit recovery of the organism. Where this effect of BAK may be important is also in the recent interest in using natamycin for acanthamoeba keratitis. In the study from Korea, they were able to identify in vitro testing that natamycin was the most effective agent over povidone iodine and benzoconium chloride as well as PHMB. But it's important to note that the preparation that they use for this testing also includes benzoconium chloride, suggesting that the pomerosin may have less of an effect than was estimated by their in vitro testing. So is there even a theoretic uh, potential treatment effect for BAK? Uh, this came up uh, when a non-BAK containing anti-effective was introduced. Friedlander et al. looked at the BAK levels that were in tears and found it to be transient, that it would disappear in minutes after a single drop. This was used as evidence that BAK could not possibly have a therapeutic effect. But if you look at the original literature from Champeau and Adelhauser uh, from 1986, they used radioisotope labeled BAK, and they were able to demonstrate that after a single application, it would continue to be present in, tier, in ocular surface tissue for hours, and after moderate levels of application, it could be there for two weeks. And it was actually concentrated in corneal and conjunctival epithelium, and explaining why the BAK disappeared so quickly from the tears to rapidly absorb onto the ocular surface and resonant there for quite some time. We know the pitfalls of using in vitro data, but is there any clinical evidence for the effect of benzoconium chloride, especially in the camp labor keratitis? It's unlikely that we'll be able to prove this in the rare disease, but our, it piqued our interest in the original uh, article in 2008, where we found that in univariate analysis, those patients who had used the non-BAK antibiotic had a poorer outcome. Uh, but it wasn't significant multivariate analysis, but had us look into the in vitro data more. And there are some suggestion in antibiotic resistance patterns that uh, BAK may act as a second agent and reduce uh, the trends of resistance. And interestingly, if you look at the introduction of moxifloxacin in the US, it also occurred around the time the acanthamoeba outbreak cases began to increase. The next drug that was introduced was uh, PHMB. Its first publication was a series of six patients in 1992 from Moorfields. 
Interestingly, this was an environmental biocide. It was a swimming pool disinfectant that's marketed as Bacrocil here in the US. And there was in vitro evidence from its environmental use uh, against acanthinibus cysts and trophozoites. And you can see that they did have some significant success with its use. Subsequently, chlorhexidine was described by uh, Dr. Seal, also from England. Uh, both of these are cationic biguanides. Uh, the exact mechanism unknown, but it is effective against both cysts and trophozoites, a small molecule which can penetrate the cyst wall well. An article from this year shows that PHMB can be raised to a 0.08% concentration with slightly increased toxicity, uh, but still well tolerated. As far as comparative studies, uh, in 2008, uh, there was no significant difference between chlorhexidine and PHMB, 0.02%. And in 2019, they analyzed outcomes across 227 cases, and they were shown, able to show that biguanide therapy alone was equivalent in efficacy to a combination of biguanides and diamidine. There were some significant biases, but it suggested that biguanide therapy alone was sufficient for cure in most patients. Unfortunately, uh, in the US we've seen, and I believe in England also, that the, there's been increasingly resistant uh, acanthamoeba infections. Other diamidines have been used, pentamidine I mentioned earlier. It does have anti-acanthamoeba activity. It's been described as an IV administration, which is very toxic systemically, but that in the eyes of the authors reduced uh, the recurrences of acanthamoeba after penetrating capacity. Various azoles have been described in the past with variable uh, sensitivity and uh, in vitro in vivo e efficacy. Moroconazole has been described both as a topical and by us as a systemic treatment uh, for patients with recalcitrant acanthamoeba. And in some patients, this can be quite effective, uh, but in other patients may have very little effect. Renewed interest uh, out of um, uh, L.V. Prasad with Dr. Baga um, showed that topical vorconazole did have some effect, although the follow-up was somewhat variable in these patients and bears further investigation uh, as a single agent where it may have some um, antagonism with current agents like PHMB and chlorhexidine. The most recent uh, publications include alkalo uh, phosphocholines, uh, specifically meltefacin, which is the first one in this class, has a low toxicity in the drug in the developing world and has excellent in vitro activity against acanthamoeba. It has gained FDA approval and designation as an orphan drug uh, in December of 2015 for acanthamoeba keratitis specifically, and its dosing is 50 milligrams BID or TID. Main concern over uh, the drug is really uh, uh, as a teratogen. And it does last in the system for uh, several months after administration. And so patients need to be aware of this and taking the medication. It has a number of uh, properties, both anti-inflammatory, anti-neoplastic, um, is also effective against a wide range of pathogens. The mechanism of action is uh, not well understood, but in leishmaniasis, it triggers apoptosis, um, and it interferes with a number of essential cellular signaling uh, pathways. It has a very high bio bioavailability, so oral administration uh, does achieve good tissue levels, but it does have a very long half-life, almost 31 days. In fact, there are detectable levels even five months after stopping therapy. Animal studies do confirm, um, in addition to in vitro and in vivo, animal models it is effective against acanthamoeba, really best if it's combined with PHMB. A pilot study was performed by Dr. Baga and L.B. Prasad, uh, which suggested efficacy in hamster studies, uh, but in the five patients who were treated, they were all failed because of increasing inflammation and um, concern over perforation and need for penetrating keratoplasty. We conducted a multi-center experience here with miltepicin. We were able to show that patients were able to eradicate um, the acanthamoeba, but did have significant inflammation, uh, but was controllable with topical steroids and actually did reasonably well. They were all free of acanthamoeba at the end of the study. There were, however, three failures, uh, but 10 of the 15 patients also had significant improvement in pain within days to weeks of initiating the drug. It's a wide-ranging anti-effective um, with reasonable side effects, but these patients do need uh, careful monitoring 
uh, both for their ocular response, but also their systemic response. A really interesting collagen cross-linking as a therapy for acanthamoebic keratitis is largely unwarranted as this may be helpful as a collagen stabilizer, but was ineffective at eradicating deeper infections. Rose Bengal, however, has been introduced recently by Yomi Omeskiwa uh, at the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. And they've had some significant success in uh, acanthamoeba patients. However, these are superficial uh, infections. Uh, they do not recommend these usually for deeper infections. They did also have failures and perforations. As far as which patients are appropriate for this treatment, uh, I believe studies in the future will determine both, of the, both its efficacy and its indications uh, in a more systematic manner. In summary, I think we've learned a number of lessons in the evolution of the treatment of acanthamoeba keratitis. We lack uh, accurate in vitro models uh, for drug discovery. Uh, many of the early drugs are inconsistent clinically because of, the, because of this poor modeling. Much of the in vitro and in vivo activity of several drugs like propamide and nanomycin may actually be due to the benzoconium chloride, while biguanides remain the backbone of therapy. Recalcitrant disease um, may be treated by boriconazole, uh, miltepicin, and pentamidine as second line agents. And surgical intervention in the form of Rose Bengal PDT may be promising once the inclusion and exclusion uh, criteria are firmly established. Finally, uh, I want to invite everyone to the World Cornea Congress in Chicago, September 28th to 29th, immediately preceding the American Academy of Ophthalmology meeting in the fall. Uh, abstracts or um, submissions are open. You can scan this URL or go to www.corneasociety.org. The deadline is extended to April 15th. And we look forward to your submissions, as well as seeing all of you in person very soon. Thank you again for inviting me to provide this lecture. Thank you, sir. I now request Professor Jeevan S. Dityal, Chief RP Center, to felicitate Professor Elmer Tu with a moment, uh, plaque and a memento. So we'll be mailing you this Madan Mohan lecture plaque and memento after the program is over. I would love to come receive it personally, Jiva. <laughs> thank you. But thank you so much. Thank you so much. My good friends, Namrata, Samar, thank you, Ritu. Oh, thank you. It's an incredible honor. Thank you so much for this, this opportunity today. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Elmer, too, for uh, uh, gracing this uh, lecture. You are the first recipient of the Madan Mohan uh, Kanya lecture. Thanks a ton. And uh, your talk was just excellent, like always. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Namrata, I, I miss all of you. So I, I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you, Professor Tu, for that phenomenal lecture. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Vishal Jhanji, whom I know since his post-graduation at RP Center Ames. Thereafter, he joined his fellowship from the Royal uh, Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital, University of Melbourne, Australia. He serves as a professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine since the last five years and is holding numerous positions. He's the vice chair of Code Clinical Operations, director of quality control and clinical trials, a clinical coordinator of the Cornell Regeneration Laboratory and an associate medical director at the Charles T. Campbell Ophthalmic Microbiology Lab Laboratory. He has numerous re research uh, interests, and uh, he is uh, actually uh, been dealing with a lot of complex corneal conditions, ranging from ocular surface disorders to corneal ectasias to corneal transplantation. He has, to his credit, over 200 international in-text peer-reviewed journals and authored two books, and have uh, written more than 15 book chapters. Dr. Vishal, it is a pleasure to interact to you on this platform, and we would love to hear your insights on uh, graft versus host disease, a challenging corneal condition. 
Thank you very much for that introduction. Can you guys hear me and see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, well, good morning to everyone um, back home. I, I really want to thank uh, Dr. Titial, Dr. Namrata for this, uh, this invitation. And uh, this is my first presentation ever in our P Center. I think I didn't get to present when I was a resident there. So this it's really exciting. And congratulations uh -huh. again, Dr. Tu. Uh, you made it. <laughs> uh, it was a really nice lecture. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes on uh, uh, ocular graft versus host disease. I don't have any financial disclosures relevant to this topic. I'm going to give an overview of the disease and we'll discuss some treatment options and, and some new treatments that are available, um, that are going to be available very soon. Let me just reduce this. So uh, just the basics of GVHD, um, it's a complication of allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation uh, to treat hematological malignancies. It's, we do a conditioning regimen, uh, the bone marrow transplant surgeons, which usually uh, com is composed of uh, total body irradiation or chemotherapies followed by um, allogenic uh, HSCT, um, which basically triggers the alloreactive donor T cells that... Uh, that are going to attack different parts of the body and eyes are really uh, one important um, aspect of GVHD. Uh, acute GVHD is T-cell mediated, usually seen in the first 80 to 120 days uh, after bone marrow transplantation. Ocular involvement can be seen up to 7.2% of patients. Uh, the grim part is that it's actually a prognostic factor for higher mortality in these patients. Um, if you work next to a cancer center, you might come across some of these acute GVHD patients. They're, they're actually very sick. Um, they present mainly with uh, um, ocular symptoms such as eye pain and excessive tearing. Conjunctival involvement is it resembles a little bit like acute SJS. You see a lot of pseudomembranes, hyperemia, and there can be acute corneal melting as well. What we see more commonly is chronic phase of uh, ocular GVHD. The pathophysiology of chronic GVHD is less uh, understood compared to acute. Ocular involvement happens in up to 60% of patients. Common ocular symptoms are dryness, dry eyes, gritty sensation in the eyes, and sensitivity to light. Uh, there are three important processes that, that happen in a chronic GVHD. There's lacrimal gland dysfunction, uh, this MGD component and also corneoconjunctival involvement. Less commonly, you will see scleritis, uh, which is more common than episcleritis. You might come across uh, anterior uveitis, vitritis, hemorrhages on the retina, cotton wool spots, and also det detachment of the choroid. Um, uh, I've never seen detachment of choroid, but although we have seen um, a chronic disc edema in patients with chronic GVHD, that tells us that you got to dilate these patients every time you see them. Um, the corneal staining and dryness is, is slightly different from what you see in your Sjogren syndrome dry eye. Uh, it's very patchy um, and it's, it, it can involve any quadrant of the cornea. As I mentioned, this corneal conjunctival involvement, the conjunctival involvement actually is quite severe uh, and it actually matches what you see on the cornea, which is multiple punctate epithelial erosions. You might see uh, filamentary keratitis in these patients. And that's why one of the reasons why these patients are very photophobic. Um, in burnt out disease, uh, it is not uncommon to come across uh, mibobin gland dropout and tarsal scarring in these patients. Uh, this is a patient of ours who actually had uh, was a contact lens user, had keratoconus and had ocular GVHD, uh, but he had acute on chronic GVHD, which led to flare up of the ocular symptoms as well. He ended up uh, having a combined pseudomonal infection enterococcal infection and scedosporium, that's the, the fungal infection as well. So we ended up having a corneal transplantation. So these things can, can happen in, in these patients, uh, even um, after we think that they have been stable for quite some time. Another patient with chronic epithelial defect, um, we saw him for the first time. This is the first presentation. We started serum eye drops, uh, but the patient never made back to his follow-up. We lost the patient uh, because he had acute on chronic GVHD systemically as well. Um, treatment is important to reduce ocular surface inflammation in order to prevent psychiatrical changes and irreversible atrophy of the lacrimal glands. Uh, multidisciplinary approach is very important in these patients. 
We got to uh, adopt strategies to prevent air evaporation. Uh, warm compressors, lid hygiene, topical erythromycin ointment does help uh, in these patients. Uh, I don't intend to, uh, tend to use too much doxycycline or azithromycin in these patients, although I have colleagues who, who believe strongly that MGD in these patients does respond to doxycycline as it does in other patients. Uh, you'll be, uh, if you, again, if you treat many of these patients, you will see that some of these patients are, have been on uh, chronic doxycycline uh, low dose up to 50 milligrams per day. Um, moisture chamber goggles do help with chronic dryness. Uh, it is important to keep the eyes lubricated, uh, preservative free artificial tear drops during the day and ointment at bedtime definitely helps. Um, acetylcysteine can be used. Uh, it can be cost prohibitive, at least in the United States. It helps with filamentary keratitis. Um, some of these patients, we, we do work closely with the rheumatologists as well um, and, and gastroenterologists as well. They are on, on pilocarpine, which can be uh, limited by its side effects. Pilo we use pilocarpine uh, up to five milligrams three times a day. Autologous ceramide drops 20% or 50%. They are the mainstay of treatment in these patients. Most of these patients in our center, they get ceramide drops during their first visit. Some of the chronic GVHD patients, they do very well on scleral lenses. Uh, we do not use punctal occlusion uh, in these patients just because the MGD and inflammatory eye disease is, is quite prominent. So we really wanna drain all the inflammatory um, substances from the surface of the eye. Uh, topical steroids, we use uh, short-term steroids. Uh, we use more fluoromethylone as compared to prenicillone. Topical cyclosporin, mainly restasis here in the United States uh, in 0.05% formulation is can be very useful, especially to control the ocular surface inflammation. Some patients do benefit from topical tacrolimus. Uh, we do not have compounded eye drops in our setting, but we do have a 0.03% dermatological ointment that can be used in some of these patients. Surgical intervention, fortunately, we don't have to go there very often. I showed you one patient who needed a transplant. Uh, amniotic membrane can be used in the office for patients who have poor ocular surface. Some of these patients, they do need uh, a temporary tarsorophy, especially if they have poor healing uh, epithelial defects. Um, and again, as I mentioned, if the cornea is not doing well, you might end up doing a tectonic patch graft or even a penetrating keratoplasty in these patients. Some of the newer treatments on the horizon, um, diacrofasol, I know that's available in India now and ribapamide, which is uh, freely available in Japan. It increases the mucin and equosteer secretion, also has some anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, topical um, uh, immunoglobulin eye drops, uh, at least two good publications, and both of them are from, from UIC, where Dr. Tu is working, from Sandeep Jain's group. They have shown that they are, these eye drops are well tolerated in phase one and phase two clinical trials. Um, topical fibrinogen depleted human platelet lysate, um, uh, phase one and phase two clinical trials have been done. Uh, our uh, Pittsburgh was a part of this trial and, and we currently submitted this uh, for publication, but it has got some, uh, it has shown some promising, promising results in patients with chronic GVHD. Topical heparin drops uh, uh, have been used. Uh, they are supposed to clear the neutrophil extracellular traps, which are sort of pro-inflammatory um, uh, markers on the surface of the eye. Topical heparin eye drops also have antifibrotic and immunosuppressive effects, which helps uh, in controlling the inflammation in these patients. A newer drug on the horizon, um, entosplatinib, it's an oral selective inhibitor of spleen tyrosine kinase. So it's sort of STK enzyme. It prevents, uh, it has been shown to prevent ocular GVHD in mice, but human trials have, have not been started yet. There's at least one paper that shows uh, that if you start up topical cyclosporin uh, within a year after a, a allogenic HSCT, you might be able to delay the development of uh, extraocular GVHD in 45 to 50% of these patients. Another study has shown that comprehensive eye exam, uh, ideally before allogenic HSCT, but not later than six months after uh, the, the transplant, it does help to identify and perhaps prevent um, chronic GV, ocular GVHD in these patients.
So to summarize, ocular GVHD is common after allogenic HSCD and significant cause of morbidity and decreased quality of life. It can affect the entire ocular surface. Early detection and treatment of ocular GVHD is critical to control the inflammatory effects of ocular GVHD and to prevent the irreversible fibrotic changes in the eyes. So in these cases, we always uh, presume that more is better than less. Thank you for your kind attention. I found this old picture uh, of some of my teachers and mentors who have inspired me all my life. I'm sure uh, two of them are sitting here. And this uh, picture is from um, 2009, uh, San Francisco American Academy of Ophthalmology. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you for that excellent presentation and for that picture, which you know uh, brought back old memories. So, are there any uh, Vanati? Would you want to ask something since you worked on uh, GVH? Yeah, I think that was a uh, very excellent elucidation of an overview of uh, graft versus host disease. Uh, uh, just a few points is that uh, prophylactic cyclosporin low dose really does not help in ocular GVHD. And uh, platelet lysate drops seems very promising. We just finished a trial and uh, that it really helps in controlling. And what we have to understand is the role of uh, extracellular DNAs, the net traps on the ocular surface, which is responsible for the refractive dry eye disease in, these, uh, in this scenario. IVIG is promising as well, but uh, works best once the baseline inflammation is controlled only. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal, and hope to see you in person very soon. I hope so too. All Thank you. So, uh, a good evening, a warm good evening to Dr. Gaurav Prakash, who uh, uh, we would like to welcome to your alma mater. He's currently the assistant professor in Department of Ophthalmology, University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. His research uh, interest includes uh, ectatic diseases, and wavefront optics. One of the first few papers were, were from Dr. Gaurav Prakash. He's a certified biomedical investigator and currently he is doing a lot of projects on artificial intelligence based prediction of early coronal ectasia and treatment guidelines, including predictive modeling for ocular surface modulation. He has to his credit 88 index publications and 42 international meeting presentations. Dr. Gaurav, we welcome you, and uh, we would like to hear uh, for, uh, for, uh, on a talk on uh, imaging and artificial intelligence-based prediction of early corneal ectasia. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I would like to thank Dr. Tetyal and Dr. Sharma for the invitation, and it's great to come back here. I'm trying to put my presentation on. It's not letting me do in, so I'm trying to see if- Just, just one second, you have to put this off. Put the slide off, please. Yep. Yeah, okay. My slide is off now. Yeah. Access for the uh, screen, please. Good morning. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the 55th annual RPCA Foundation Day celebrations and Professor Tityal for this opportunity. It feels great to come back home. I'll be talking today about clinical applications of coronal wavefront analysis. Coronal wavefront is a bit different from the total ocular wavefront because it ignores the internal ocular abrasions and therefore the coronal wavefront data is derived from the summated elevation data only. That means the data from the cornea. Um, therefore, on the same premise, it gives us a better understanding of the total corneal power and the total corneal behavior. The central K, for example, just gives you the central part of the cornea right over here. The K max can give you a different indication. It can tell you how bad an ectasia is. However, uh, the Coronal wavefront error gives you the measurement of the entire cornea, and then therefore it's a much better metric as we'll see in the next step. So the way I understand this is, and the way I try to explain this is that 
obviously there is no good way to predict a preclinical change we are trying to look at the biomechanics of the eye but till we kind of stabilize over there the next best bet is to look at the wavefront changes of the cornea because they tend to precede the topography changes in patients with progressive cornea disorders the wavefront changes of the cornea that is the total and the hva wavefront error of the cornea present earlier and changes faster than the traditional keratometric parameters let's talk about some case examples this first case is a case with a non central keratoconus on serial follow up between 2015 to 2017 two years we saw that this patient had a change in the k max of hardly 0.3 which is next to none now in this period of time uh, the patient did have increasing difficulty of in driving at night so if you look at the ectasia area we definitely see there's a qualitative increase in the area of ectasia but the the k max and the central k failed to tell us the true picture however when we look at this patient's wafren profile at 6 mm corneal wafren profile we see that there is a percentage of increase of approximately 85% in the coma and approximately 31% in the spherical abrasion both suggestive of a progressive trend of worsening whereas the kmax are only 0.6% change which is next to none so take home message in a situation like this is that non central keratoconus is a tricky and therefore we require attention to symptoms moreover in situations like this hoa are more sensitive sign that is hard operations are more sensitive signs to look for changes in conectasia compared to keratometry we did a work few years back in which my team published the relationship between the change in kmax the mineral point thickness and corneal hoa and we found that the hoa has a positive quadratic relationship with kmax that means every unit change in 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 kmax is a much more faster change in the hoa parameters and therefore hoa gives a much more uh sensitive vantage point to evaluate ectasia progression let's look at another case now now this patient had clear topographic signs of lasik she is 30 uh, of of post lasik tasia she is 32 years old lady both eyes had lasik done 6 years back progressive blurring of vision sister scan shows suspect keratoconus she is definitely was not a good candidate there are clear signs of topography that she has ectasia so definitely we don't need wavefront to diagnose this patient as topography he has given us enough in information however we waited too long for this sign to pick up is there a way we can pick up earlier signs that's my question can we pick up the signs of ectasia much more earlier much more faster compared to looking at the signs of ectasia when you have kind of the ship has already sailed the sea let's look at this case for a comparison now this patient 26 years old had a prk 4 years back for thin cornea and mild myopia obviously the or the first subtle sign the first red herring as we say and uh, she had a progressive blurring of vision for 2 years so if you look at the topography you see some abnormality arising in the left eye but is it irregular cornea yes is it ectasia maybe is it poor ablation unlikely and especially in a in a scan like this sometimes it's better to to kind of be cautious now what's the objective documentation for being cautious over here So if you look at the right eye and compare that to the left eye this is the profile for the right eye and I'll show the profile for the left eye in the next column over there the left eye has almost 11 times more coma compared to the right eye and the non coma non spherical which is the technically more irregular asymmetrical abrasion profile is around 6 times higher so this proves the point that assuming that she had bilateral similar ablations when i was going into ectasia uh the changes in coma are much more faster more sensitive and more easy for us to pick up compared to uh changes which which should be seen when you're just looking at keratometry so especially asymmetric ablations like coma can be sensitive signs so always look out for seeing what's happening with the coma and the patient because keratoconus itself is asymmetric now our, our post lasik tasia itself is asymmetric now let's look at another case over here 
This is a 37 year old patient who had bilateral LASIK six years back, progressive difficulty in driving and vision in the night after second pregnancy, classic for post-LASIK tasia. She has post-LASIK tasia. We also found that she had large pupils, which was kind of contributing to the symptoms, but how to explain that to her? So if you look at her pupil in the wave, wavefront and photopic conditions, almost similar, bit of abnormality in the left eye, become much worse in mesopic light conditions and become struck worse in photopic in scotopic light condition this is how the profile change in the paucity of time i'll skip through this and let's talk about what we try to explain to this patient so as she grows um, as as the night as the illumination becomes lesser her symptoms will come worse which can be much more easily quantified by help of the hoa as we saw in the last example the next case is a case which is seen by almost everyone, pterygiums. Now, this patient has, if you just look at the central case, the K1, K2, K max is almost similar in the pterygium eye versus the non-pterygium eye because it's central cornea. However, the patient feels that the quality of vision is very, very poor. Why are these symptoms so bad? Because topography is missing the signs. You look at the topography, you're at least going one step ahead than somebody who's just doing the central keratometry. With the topography, you see that there is an area in the left eye, in the nasal region, where you see a bit of flattening, but that's it, nothing else, right? However, when you look at this patient's HA profile, you see there's a much different profile in the left eye. In fact, the higher abrasions at eight millimeters, which is the capture area for this abnormality, is seven times more in the left eye, 0.95 in the right eye versus 7.11 in the left eye. So that kind of explains the symptoms. Proof in point, when we did the surgery for this patient and we kind of made the, top, made the topography normal, as we say, you see the pre and the post-op, the change was, uh, the post-op becomes 0.92, which is uh, almost back to the pre-normal levels. So take-home message is the seemingly innocuous disorder such as terigium can affect the visual quality to significant levels and assessment of coronal wavefront profile can help us monitoring these symptoms. Talk about one more case. This is a post PTK analysis case. So, we did a standard PTK for a Salzman nodal degeneration one patient. Vision improved, the refraction became lesser. But if you look at the topography, I mean, it still looks the same almost, except for that red area, which has gone the steep in the top. But the central cornea looks almost the same. In fact, it looks a bit worse. So, how is the patient saying that the vision improved and how is the vision objectively improved? And look at the HA profile of the patient. The patient did have a significant decrease in the HOA went from 5.5 to 2.9. That's approximately a 40% reduction in 80% reduction in HOA, sorry, approximately. So take home message in case of colon and scars, colon and wavefront can be used to quantify the effect of treatment in a more comprehensive manner. I need to summarize. Coronal wavefront is a more sensitive method to diagnose coronal ectasia or node pathology progression compared to topography. Coronal wavefront can explain and quantify refractive phenomenon much better than coronal topography in many cases. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Gaurav. I think that was a very uh, intelligent presentation, like always. And nice to see that you're working on artificial intelligence, uh, which was again your first lab even at RP Center when you were here. Thanks a lot, ma'am. And I'd like to I like to uh, say that uh, whatever we are, uh, and I'm echoing the, what Vishal said, it's because of the, men the mentorship we got from you and Professor Tyal and, and everybody else. And I I'm so glad that we are uh, kind of taking up the mantle. Thanks a lot for everything you guys have done for us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gaurav, for that very informative talk. Uh, we would now like to invite uh, Dr. Vikas Mittal, who will be talking to us on Bowman layer transplant for progressive retroconus. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Tityal, and it's it's definitely a privilege being part of uh, this August gathering and uh, being a part of annual day of an organization which is a world leader in ophthalmology. So may I request to play my slides, please? Good morning. 
At the outset, I would like to congratulate RP Center on its 55th annual day. I would like to thank Professor Titial, Professor Sharma for giving me this opportunity. Let me start with this case. 20-year-old boy came for right eye consultation and he was diagnosed progressive keratoconus. He had a history of transplant in left eye but was not happy mainly because of the uh, high astigmatism. Tomographic image showed severe keratoconus, K values more than 65 diopter and PACI less than 300 microns. So what options do we have? Since he had good vision with the contact lenses, he wanted that somehow if we can stabilize this disease. CXL at 300 microns can be very challenging. So do we have anything else for them? Bowman layer transplant has been into vogue for six, seven, eight years. And the rational use was in keratoconus, Bowman layer is fragmented. Meles et al. have shown that the stabilization of ectasia as well as flattening of K values after Bowman layer transplant. But primarily because of the surgical difficulties, this hair technique has not been adopted world over. Stromal augmentation has been also reported in for such cases where the lenticule is harvested from a smile uh, lenticule during the refractive surgery. This also has shown uh, stabilization of ectasia. But here you are dependent on one specific type of femtosecond laser that is smile. And in this lenticule, you don't have a Bowman layer. So what we did was we used both Bowman layer as well as corneal stroma to stand in the keratoconic cornea. We harvested anterior stroma uh, from a donor eye using femtosecond laser, then made a pocket or in the recipient eye using again femtosecond laser and place this lenticule into this pocket. Since it has both Bowman layer as well as anterior stroma and was placed intrastromally, we called it Bowman stromal inlay. So let's look at this video. So for patient side, we used normal uh, LASIK uh, software. The only difference was the side cut energy was reduced to minimal and this canal was broadened. This is the donor eye, which was mounted on artificial anterior chamber and anterior 180 to 200 microns were harvested. First step was application of alcohol so that uh, all the epithelium can be removed. Then the limbus was marked using junction well violet and then docking and harvesting of this inlay. This was separated and placed in BSS. Now the patient was shifted into main OR. That pocket which has already been created was opened using any blunt instrument. We had planned to use IOL injector for, for uh, uh, placement of BS inlay. So this was inlay was placed with Bowman layer side up. The canal was used to engage the tip of the IOL injector and then it was injected into the intrastromal pocket. Once the inlay was into the pocket, it was unfolded using surface strokes. It, it was quite similar to what we do with the DSEC graft. Finally, it was placed central to the pupil. As you can see, no suture were required and the surgery is over. This is how the patient looks like. In the first week, there was some edema, but within three to four weeks, this edema used to subside. The interface was quite similar to what we see after LASIK. The same patient, have a look, this 300 micron cornea has become now 500. We had compiled first 10 eyes and published in JCRS. All these eyes had mild to uh, moderate to severe keratoconus and we followed up for average 15 months. So what we found was it was surgically very easy, no specific learning curves, and there were no specific intraoperative complications, no folds, tria, interface haze, DLK. There was no such uh, complications. And increase in the pa uh, coronal pachymetry was very predictable. There was the flow, posterior float remained stable throughout. BCVA increased or was more or less same in all patients. Tomographic parameters marginally improved, but statistically insignificant. What we found was all cases were stable. There was no progression in uh, over uh, 15 months follow-up in any of the patient. This 10 years old boy had underwent cross-linking in moderate keratoconus eye, the left eye, and BSI in the right eye, which had advanced keratoconus. And both eyes were stable over 
uh, two years uh, period, two years follow up. We have now five patients in which one eye has undergone cross linking, other eye has undergone BSI, and we have found that both eyes were uh, stable. So that which means that BSI efficacy is equal to CXL. So we found the stabilization, but keratometry was not uh, so we couldn't, but we couldn't achieve much of flattening. For that, we tried to customize this inlay. So what we did was in this inlay, we did a central PPK on the stromal side and then placed it. So just have a look at this video. So this was similar to what we I saw earlier. So this is the inlay. Once it was harvested, it was flipped so that the stromal side is up now. And in this stromal side, PTK on the central 4mm zone was done. So we have now Bowman layer as well. And down, after that, it was placed in the intersomal eyes. You, you can see the one patient. It's an, in the center, it was thin. In the periphery, it is slightly thicker. Uh, the pre-op K was 68 diopter, which improved to 57 diopter. Both BCV and UCVA increase. Such patients, we have now close to 12 such patients where there has shown that the flattening, we, we achieved the flattening, but it was not very predictable. So overall, BS leg will cause strengthening of cornea and we definitely can achieve a stabilization of keratoconus. We can do future topo-guided PRK for visual rehabilitation. And in case ectasia progresses, we can always do CXL. And now it will be a thicker corneas. And we are already trying how best we can achieve uh, an ideal inlay. So uh, at the moment, it is an, another management option for keratoconus. And results are definitely similar to uh, cross-linking. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vikas, for that very informative talk. Uh, I would not now like to invite Dr. Rishi Saroop for talking on the complications of deep lamellar keratoplasty. Dr. Rishi, please. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good morning to all of you. And at the outset, I'd like to congratulate RP Center alumni and uh, Dr. Titiyal and Dr. Namrata and the other organizers for this wonderful uh, show that has been put up. And uh, it's an honor to be part of this. Without further ado, I'll just get started. Is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, complications of deep lamellar keratoplasty. Uh, so some of the videos I borrowed from some of my friends, including some of them are here in this, uh, this gathering. So uh, when we talk about complications for any surgery, we talk about intraoperative complications and postoperative complications. Intraoperatively, I think the bugbear of deep lamellar keratoplasty is perforations, and I'll be uh, most of my talk will cover that. And of course, then there are other complications which you can have with respect to big bubble formation, graft sizing, trephination issues, dissection related issues intraoperatively, postoperatively retained big bubbles, interface issues, suture related problems, rejections, melts, infections, and finally failure. So when we talk about perforations, there are various types of perforations. You can have micro perforations, which are relatively easier to deal with, but you could have a large perforation, central versus peripheral, superior versus inferior. All of these have implications and the management will differ depending on what type of perforation you're dealing with. Availability of back, backup issue is not is certainly an issue in people who are in private practice and don't have a, a spare tissue. And at what stage did you have the perforation? All of these will decide whether you will continue with the dial or convey it, convert to a penetrating keratoplasty. As you become more and more experienced, very few perforations really need to be converted and you can salvage most of them. So this is a video I borrowed from Dr. Himanshu in which he's showing uh, a perforation which happened during the um, trephination. So this is something uh, which is, can be quite devastating because you'll end up with usually a large perforation. Uh, luckily, this patient was in the hands of an expert surgeon like Dr. Himanshu, who essentially converted a situation like this where almost you know uh, two thirds of the graft uh, post junction was uh, perforated. He sutured the graft hose junction as was sh shown in the video and started the manual dissection from the opposite side. So although you'll end up with a pre dyspheric DALC, but uh, you can actually get away with doing a DALC. Um, and it's funny, uh, many of these patients who have some stroma left behind over time with stromal remodeling, uh, 
you can actually uh, get fairly good results. And if there are some irregularities, etc., you can correct them later with the laser. Uh, for people who do bubbles, uh, we know that although big type one bubble is what we want, but sometimes you don't end up with that kind of a situation. You can end up with air going into the anterior chamber accidentally, as is shown in the video on the left. And then you can sometimes end up with incomplete bubbles like this, which you need to enlarge. Uh, you can end up with type two bubbles, or you can get a, a get a combination of a type one and a type two bubble. And we all know that type two bubbles uh, sometimes can end up uh, perforating, uh, especially if you end up removing the duas layer in your dissection. And puncturing uh, type two bubbles sometimes can be ch challenging. So this is just a small video showing uh, my initial one of my initial cases where I didn't know what a type two bubble was. I ended up dissecting. And I was so happy that I was getting a very nice clean interface. And sure enough, this is Desmes membrane, which is underneath is so fragile that it can simply uh, rupture on touch, even an instrument or even a suture, if it is just passing over it without a needle being attached to it, can uh, rupture it. So that's what happened. And that's essentially the end of your dial. Micro perforations are a little more challenging. So this is uh, again a case by Himanshu. Um, and you can see that as he was injecting the bubble, he ended up with a pop or a burst bubble. And we've all, whoever has done that could have had one at some point. So, you know, and suddenly you find the air going into the anterior chamber. Uh, so again, in this kind of a scenario, the best thing to do is do a manual pre dalc uh, layer by layer. And you can see that perforation right in the center, the linear big perforation. But because he was able to do a good pre-desmetic dissection, he put a suture, the graft in place and eventually this cornea did well. Micro, micro perforations, uh, like I said, can happen at any place. It can happen in the center. It can happen in the periphery. Wherever you're putting a sharp instrument, it can happen, basically. So uh, it is essentially very, very important that you have the right instrumentation when you're doing DALC. If you use sharp instruments, you will pay the price for it. Uh, but the good news about micro perforations, are they are usually easy to salvage, especially the peripheral ones usually don't have much of uh, a problem. Here is one of the patients with post eye drops where I tried to do a manual DALC and sure enough, we did have a central perforation, but in spite of a central perforation, we were able to salvage it. And you can see this patient did really good. Uh, and actually had a very good outcome eventually. So this is one of the cases of mine where I punctured the uh, big bubble and then without realizing, I also punctured the decimation and then so first the air leaked out and then they um, uh, acquiesced. So one of the good things to do here to prevent this is to just do a brave slash. Don't be very tentative. It's a good idea to put a viscoelastic on top so that the air comes out in a controlled fashion. So again, we had a central perforation here. It's not the end of the world. What I did in this particular case was I put fibrin glue to seal the perforation and then put an air in the anterior chamber. And uh, basically, I started doing a, a DALC uh, dissection from the periphery and left the center for the last. In the end, what happened was uh, we had this central air, which is constantly leaking. So I put a little island of stroma there with fibrin, fibrin glue to just keep the perforation sealed and then put the graft on top, put eight sutures. And later I gently teased off that stromal island, even though it was stuck with fibrin glue, I could do it quite well. Uh, of course, next day the guy didn't look great. Uh, there was a double anterior chamber, as you can see in the slit image, uh, and the perforation is visible on the OCT. I put in C3F8 gas uh, here because it was a central perf and uh, the desmin is attached very well. And the graft cleared up very nicely, as you can see. Uh, eventually, this patient had a rejection, which could be treated medically, then had a high cylinder, which underwent laser, and eventually she had a fabulous vision uh, of 2020 parts. So post-operative complications, one of the things which uh, is a little uh, <laughs> rare is that if you don't realize intraoperatively that you've not let out the air of your big bubble and you end up in photograph, so you can end up with this kind of situation. So this is from one of my friends. He saw postoperatively that the graph was very clear, but the anterior chamber was very deep. People was dilated and IOP was high. And then he realized that he had actually not released the air from the big bubble. So postoperatively, he went in through the graph, made a kind of a stab incision, let out the air. And then of course the patient did well. Sometimes you can have pseudo uh, anterior chambers like this or double anterior chamber. This could be due to a missed perforation 
or if, if you're doing a therapeutic kind of a deep lamellar keratoplasty, you can have transudation of fluid, which has happened to me in a couple of my therapeutic dialects. Or if you've left behind viscoelastic accidentally, uh, that trapped viscoelastic will have to be removed from the interface, otherwise it won't attach. Uh, OCTs are very useful tools to understand what's going on if you have edema after a dial. Most of the time, it's usually a, due to a, a double anterior chamber or a detached interface. But uh, luckily, very easy to treat. All you have to do is go inside and put in either air or a non-expansile gas. And this can be combined with the draining of the interface if you have a, a lot of fluid or viscoelastic in the interface. Infections can happen with any keratoplasty. So this is one of the patients who had a suture-related infection and uh, it can be treated. I'm extremely sorry to interrupt you, sir. Hi, <coughs> astigmatism luckily is much easier to manage in a dial because you can do surface ablations uh, very, very well. Uh, and uh, I, have, I have a large... So sorry to interrupt you, sir. May I please request you to continue surface ablations a after dial And they actually do beautifully well. Uh, only thing is you have to use mitomycin C at least for a minute in these cases. So you can remove the irregular astigmatism. You can take care of regular astigmatism. It's, a, it's really a wonderful tool, uh, especially in DAL uh, patients because the risk of rejection is so much lesser. Uh, so this was just one of the patients who you can see the- Can you conclude the- uh, After please? doing uh, a surface ablation. Rejections can happen in DAL. Uh, so this is my series. We've had uh, um, a series of about, I think 15 or 16 rejections uh, so far. But all of them, almost all of them do really well. Uh, do, we do have predominantly stromal rejections. But Apologies for the intervention, sir. Uh, since we are running well. short of time, so this is one of the patients who continue. had an epithelial with stromal rejection, um, another patient with stromal rejection with vascularization. Um, this is one patient who was doing very well at the time of rejection. You can see the image on top right. Uh, and then after treatment, the rejection went away but left behind. Um, interface opacity with lipid keratopathy. Uh, but most of the patients are like this. You'll have a rejection, but if you pick it up early and give them immunosuppression, uh, they clear up very well. Uh, um, if you have an interface opacity like this, uh, you um, can do things like pine needle diathermy or repeat a DALC. But uh, if the opacity is just too um, integrated with the Dua's layer or the SMAs, then you may have to do penetrating keratoplast. Can you put the? Can you unmute, please? I think uh, uh, Rishi is muted. Uh, Doctor Rishi, we we are not able to hear you. Can we get this? Huh? What? AV team, can, can we you hear have... me now? Please, yes. Yes, yes Doctor so Rishi, we can conclude. Yeah, Rishi. Can yeah. Hear. So uh, to conclude, intraoperative and postoperative complications can happen. Perforations mm -hmm. are the main bugbear of DALC. Most improbable complications can be managed without converting to PK. That's actually uh, a fact. And uh, people who are afraid of perforations should realize that you, will, you don't really need a backup uh, tissue most of the time. Although rejections can occur, most of the rejections resolve with treatment. So uh, nothing to really worry about uh, on that front as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Rishi, for that uh, wonderful talk on managing complications post Deep lamellar keratoplasty. May I now invite Dr. Sudesh Kumar Arya for his talk on sympathetic ophthalmitis post keratoplasty, a clinical challenge. Uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, I'm really thankful to Professor Titial, Professor Namrata, for inviting me for this talk on this very great occasion of RP Center Foundation Day celebrations. Being an alpha mentor of RP Center, I'm really happy to be part of this conference. Can you see my slides? Yes, yes sir. OK, so I'm going to present one very interesting uh, case in which uh, patient presented was. Can you make it slideshow, Sudesh? Yeah, slide I'm, show. I'm doing that. I'm doing that. It's just opening. Sorry. Top. Sir, on the top left hand side, 
Yeah. Can you see the slide show option? Besides, I think five, I can see my slide now. No, no. Is no, it no. slide show now or not? No, no, sir. No, no. You are zooming it, so I think it's not covering on the top. On my left. So on your on screen there are three options: yeah. home, yeah, yeah, design, animations, and then slideshow. You'll have to click on slideshow mode. Actually, I've done slideshow on my laptop. I can see slideshow also. I don't know how. Whether you are seeing okay. or not. Okay. So, sir, could you please oh, unshare is... and share again? Okay. And maybe reshare. No. Sir, could you please start sharing again? Yeah, I'm just doing that. So can you see my slides now? It's loading, sir. It's okay. I think Fine. Yes, sir. We can see your screen. Should I continue like that? I think. Uh, no, I it's know. okay like this. I think we can yeah. continue. Yeah, it's hanging somewhere. Yeah. Okay. I hope I should be able to see it. So it was a very interesting case. Uh, this patient came to us, very uh, young adult, 37-year-old male. He had a history of all this uh, trauma leading to some fungal keratitis and then presented to us with severe corneal ulcer for which therapeutic keratoplasty was done. So this problem was in 2019. And then uh, we did TPK after one month of that because patient was not responding to conservative management. So TPK was done in June 2019. So after three months, till three months, everything was okay. Then suddenly after three months, we saw the patient having decrease within the normal eye. So not only that, there was a lot of keratic precipitates, circumcorneal congestion, and there were pigments over the lens surface also with anterior chamber reaction, grade two in that patient. And the eye which was uh, undergone TPK, there was no problem in that. So right eye, which was absolutely normal, so patient having this problem, and then we did posterior segment evaluation. We could see a lot of uh, uh, choroidal lesions on the choroid, and the disc was also hyperemic, and there was subretinal fluid and macular edema as well. So we did the ultrasonography. There was a choroidal thickening as well. So retinochoroidal thickening was very clear cut uh, in the right eye. And uh, subsequently, when we investigated and did the angiography, we could see there were lots of uh, fluorescent uh, hyperfluorescent spots uh, corresponding to the area of uh, lesions where there were choroidal lesions. So they, are all, they were all leaking. So that uh, suggested there was uh, active inflammation. Then uh, OCT also suggested there was clear cut uh, a serious retinal redirectment. So suggesting that there was subretinal fluid present, other part of the retina that was absolutely normal. So we thought uh, could be a sympathetic ophthalmia because uh, patient had already history of trauma, but after that, he developed fungal keratitis. So we thought of various things like VKH, pangivitis, but nothing was uh, uh, positive in that patient. Systemic uh, evaluation was absolutely normal. So only thing was granulometers, uveitis, and uh, just one history of trauma because corneal ulcer and all these findings. So we thought could be a sympathetic of thermia. Then we gave patient uh, topical steroid and oral steroid as well, and patient responded very well to the treatment. And uh, we saw the retina all the fluid disappeared and retina settled immediately and keratic precipitates, inflammation that also subsided. Then surprisingly, after three months, when we were tapering the steroids, so topical steroids were being tapered and oral also they were being tapered. The moment we started tapering the steroids, again, there was flaring up of the reaction. So that was after three months of that, that in January 2020. Then again, patient had same findings. So then uh, we did investigation again, same findings suggestive of uh, uh, uveitis, uh, detachment, retinal detachment, and choroidal lesions. So that means there was a recurrence of this uh, sympathetic feature uh, again in that patient after three months. So then we again started steroid. This time we started in, uh, intravenous methyl pad also, then oral steroid. Then not only that, we even added uh, methotrexate also. So same, this uh, whatever reaction was there. So at the time of discharge, after two weeks, patient vision again improved. So all these keratic precipitates, anti-HM reaction, choroidal lesions, all they disappeared. So only thing was that we added methotrexate also this time. Then 
then after six months till follow-up patient was absolutely all right. So basically it appeared to be a case of sympathetic ophthalmia because it is very rare to have this type of presentation. So we studied the literature. So we found uh, that there are uh, case reports where these types of picture can be seen. So as we know, this sympathetic is a bilateral diffuse granulometrous uveitis, which can occur after trauma or can occur after intraocular surgery also. So we see all these lesions on the forehead. So from after intraocular surgery, the incidence is very, very rare. It is just 0.01% only. But this can happen uh, starting from five days to even 66 years as per the literature we saw. So there were two case reports uh, which we could see is of similar kind. So one was uh, by Bandari et al. So they reported same thing. There was fungal catalytis, TPK done, and after TPK patient developed sympathetic ophthalmia and responded very well to the steroid. So this was the picture in that patient. So similarly, there was another case report in 2012 where again, they had uh, this fungal keratitis for which they did the sclerocleidoplasty. After doing that, that patient also developed sympathetic ophthalmia. So again, responded very well to steroid. So it is a now well-known entity that uh, after therapeutic graft, one may develop uh, this sympathetic ophthalmia. So one should be very, very careful that any inflammation occurring in the normal eye. So one may think of this thing and one should go for steroid. So etiology could be just autoimmune reaction as happens to an ocular antigen after post-trauma or any surgical event. So in this case, it is due to surgical event. So that also can cause sympathetic ophthalmia. So this entity, one should keep in mind. And histopathology will tell exactly whatever we see in sympathetic ophthalmia, all the lymphocytes, then epithelioid cells, multinucleate giant cells. So these are seen very clearly in these patients. So this was the patient uh, we just published this month uh, in the IGO. So uh, very nice and very interesting case. So message is just one should be very careful that any patient developing anything in the normal eye after TPK or any graft OPK, one should be thinking of sympathetic ophthalmia. So that could be one of the possibility. Thank you very much. Yeah. For a very interesting case sharing and actually finishing well before time. Thank you so much. Uh, may I now invite Professor Ritu Arora for her talk on shrimp love imaging post DSEC. Um, please. <coughs> Mommy, you're muted. At the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Tatyar and Dr. Namrata for giving me this opportunity to speak at this particular forum. And uh, I'd like to speak on our recently conducted, we just finished a study on uh, Shimflick imaging and vision quality post DSEC. Uh, this was, of course, a thesis of one of our postgraduate students. And uh, it occurred to me that a lot of times when we do DSEC and we do have clear graphs, but not very many they land up with six by six vision, though clinically they are uh, and they are okay. And uh, so, as we know, DSEC has lately become the surgery of choice, and of course, DMET too for the all the endothelial dysfunction. The advantages over the penetrating keratoplasty being a rapid visual recovery, better refractive outcome, superior graft survival, and minimal structural integrity of the eye maintains the structural integrity of the eye better than PK. There are uh, quite a few retrospective reports of uh, visual outcome following DSEC. And uh, mainly they say that more than 50% of eyes with no other comorbidities may not achieve 20 by 20 vision. Uh, there have been different uh, parameters and different predictors for the quality of vision. And one of them has of course been correlated with graft thickness or some studies have also seen anterior corneal HOA, which can affect the quality of vision. The factors which may affect visual acuity post DSEC could be induced HOA, which Dr. Gaurav did talk about the implication in the quality of, of course, he talked with respect to keratoconus, uh, graft hose interface irregularity, unevenness of the posterior corneal surface, lenticule thickness, stromal fibrosis, light scatter, duration of edema, and uh, where are very few studies where objectively the BCVA has been correlated with corneal densitometry. With this in the background, we did the study to evaluate
evaluate the factors which affect the visual equity post DSET. And especially, we, of course, there were very many factors, but we wanted to relate them to shim flag imaging. And the important factors which we took on shim flag imaging were corneal aberrations and the densitometry. It was a prospective uh, interventional study. We took 27 eyes of 25 patients with non-resolving corneal edema. The power of the study was 80% with 95% confidence limit. And the inclusion criteria, of course, were the usual age more than 40 years, duration of edema more than three months. And of course, they either had the PCIO or they underwent the IOL surgery along with the DSEC. The outcome measured was the post-operative best corrected visual equity at six months. And the secondary outcomes were, of course, lenticular and host thickness using ASOCT and Pentacam, anterior surface aberrations, posterior surface aberrations, and the densitometry study on the Pentacam. The surgical technique was uh, standard, and I usually use my slide glide push-through technique uh, to put in my DSEC graft, where uh, I, I inject the tissue over the glide. And this is my standard and this has worked very well in my hands, so I don't want to change it. And uh, this actually is now giving me good results. So this is what I, and of course, in cases where there is a, where I use a combination with IOL, the proper management in the IOL power is done. The parameters evaluated in the follow-up were best corrected visual equity, refractive error, corneal clarity, lenticular acquisition, and uh, corneal thickness, aberrometry, and densitometry. And the, the etiology, mainly we had PBK 70% uh, of cases, Fuchs 18% cases, ICE was 3%, endothelitis in 7%. And age ranged around 58.22 plus minus 9.5. And duration of edema was eight months. Before I started doing the study, my gut feeling was the longer the edema, the lesser the quality of vision, but it was not proven with my star study results. We did DSEC in 66% cases, DSEC with FACO in 29% cases, and DSEC with IOL exchange was done in 3% cases. The, uh, mainly, we found that the donor lenticule, the size was around 7.63. The thickness was 195 microns uh, average. The endothelial count of the donor lenticule was 2,800 plus. In the variables at a six month post op central recipient corneal thickness ranged from 444 plus minus 47. And I'll just come to the main point on shim flag imaging. And the post op BCVA, when we saw uh, the, yeah. So, so they had six by six or better was seen in 37% cases. In 40% cases, the vision ranged between six by 12 to six by 24. And 6% cases had, 22% cases had vision, which was 624 to 618. The major causes of low BCVA was IOL opacification, posterior capsular opacification and central corneal haze. But this is the, if on wavefront aberrations at six months, we found from the front surface of the cornea, back surface of the cornea, and the total cornea, all the values, total HOA, LOAs, were far raised compared to the normative data which we had. The densitometry which we did in zero to two millimeter zone, two to six, and six to 10 in total, also was much higher than what we had in the normal population. And uh, this is how we, I was, uh, then we correlated these with One the minute. visual factors with the, and the major thing which we found was preoperative lenticular thickness, aberrations from the front surface, LOA from the front surface, and total RMS of the total cornea, which was statistically correlated with the visual equity. I'll just run you through the, some of our cases. This is one of the case, which was PBK. And this is the six months DSEC. Though clinically it looks good, but the vision still was not six by six. This is another case of eye syndrome. And this is the clay case at six months. The, on the, uh, this is the shim flag imaging, which uh, where we did the densitometry study. And that this is the data from where we get the densitometry overall from the surface, different layers and the vertical data. 
and uh, in the because of the positive time i won't go into detail of that this is how we did the study for that and which we just published recently in eye and contact lens the major conclusion was there was an inverse relationship between post dsec bcva and total corneal hois and full thickness densitometry at 6 months we just concluded that there was a six significant improvement in bcva at the end of 6 months the major cause of low post-op BCV in three cases was iole opacification, PCO, and central haze. Anterior corneal aberrations, mainly LOA and total aberrations, and total corneal aberrations, including LOA, HOA, and total, showed a direct correlation with BCVA. Anterior densitometry, central densitometry, and total densitometry, especially in all these shown, had direct correlation with BCVA. Duration of corneal edema did not show any correlation with the visual acuity. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Ritu, for that enlightening talk. May I now uh, invite Dr. Samar Basak for his uh, talk on 1,000 plus DMEC surgeries, his experience. Thank you. Uh... Professor Tweetiel and Nambata Sharma and whole RPC team for this wonderful opportunity to share my experience over the last six years. I'll be talking on a thousand plus DMEC experiences. And you know that after Millie's describe in 2006, the DK scenario has dramatically changed. And when I perform six to eight DMEC every week. And some of the cases, it is for the second eye of the Fuchs dystrophy after treating their first eye about three, four weeks back. And this kind of faster sequential bilateral surgery is only possible with the DMEC because of DMEC provides quick unaided visual recovery. So, this is a long flashback. I shared this video in AIS 2009. This is a sad experience, just happened. I got the best video award in American Academy. Failure rate was higher. Several attempts made more failures. I gave up DMEC and only DSEC for next seven years. Then, I saw several younger people are doing DMEC, and I listened to DMEC, watch their YouTube videos, practice in wet lab, then STAMPs, and at the same time, Beldman published their publication in ophthalmology journal about their STAMP, and this F stamp and F stamp actually changed the scenario. Life easy, stromal site, it is a savior, smooth, and always you have a successful surgery. There are two most difficult hurdles in DMEC. One is donor preparation, and one, another is unfolding of DMEC scroll. 80% of the US surgeon, they always say that they are spoiled. In fact, the EK surgery in US starts in their eye bank. They use pre stepped pre stamped, pre stained, pre loaded DMEC graft. And they are hugely expensive between 3,000 to 5,000 US dollar. In India, all DMEC surgeons prepare the graft just during the surgery. And donor damage, it happens between 1 to 4.3%. This is the way I am practicing. Little bit changes over the last two, three years. But this is very quick using only MacPherson. Now I am using some hook uh, and it is faster in my hand. It took only two to three minutes time in most of the cases. And this over this 1000 cases, my donut damage is only in eight eyes. But you can still use those eyes for DALC, even for DSEC also, if you have only peripheral tear because you are working at 9.5 diameter area. So it is just fast, as fast as possible. You are seeing, watching in the video. And Trifon Blue staining, I usually do it for 30 seconds to one minute. Then I use a Petri dish and the injector system, again, homemade injector system. 
Second hurdle is the unfolding or unscrolling. It depends on DMX scroll and its type, anterior chamber depth, configuration of iris, eye well position, whether it is in the bag or in the sulcus, anterior chamber fluid dynamics, a little bit of physics, a mark or any asymmetrical mark, now smoothly in most of the cases and also in challenging cases. So I have submitted, and this was also shown in AO in 2019. So you have several types of DMX scroll, maybe six or maybe 10 types. Each scroll behaves differently. So this is my typical way of unfolding. Again, unfolding in recent years, it took only 30 seconds to one or two minutes in typical cases, but in difficult cases, it may take up to three, four minutes. So I work with two, one is iris spatula and one is uh, uh, BSS filled syringe with cannula. I tap different way. I can use the two hand technique or one hand technique and unfolds most of the time as because we see the more corneal edema cases and more brown iris. So it is sometimes difficult to see the S mark, but you could guess the cur curvature and there are certain signs when you do more, then you see that your surgery is on the right direction. Then you put AR and keep them for one hour and see the patient after one hour. So this was my result published. We see a lot of Fuchs cases in the rate of 36% in our part of the country. And there are other, and on the other hand, we get the endothelium. I mean, donor endothelial cell count is more than 2,600. And it is in my series, it is 2,800 cell count. And that's why we are always feel happy when I use this uh, cornea. The BCBA more than 50% eyes is 2020 or better over a period of two, three years. This is the endothelial cell loss in my hand. In the first year, it is 33%. And uh, this is uh, my batchmate I operated about five years back. You see the donor endothelial was 2,900 and uh, now she is with uh, uh, 2,600 endothelial cell count. Other eye, you can see the Fuchs dystrophy. This is also another doctor, my neighbor, and he is doing fine. So now, I am, now recently, I am obsessed with the DMAC PD, and you know that peripherally refinated donor tissue gives more endothelial cell loss, uh, uh, cell count during, and we have published this in a, a cornea journal. And recently I am doing this, we have also compared overall and the endothelial density post-operative after one year or two years are more than the central ET finition, we call it uh, DMAX CD. So these are the typically left-hand side, you see that DMAX PD and right-hand side DMAX CD, you see the cell count is tremendously different and this is a bilateral, it is just last week I saw this patient and you see the five years down the line, beautiful endothelial cell density. So we published our recent, some of the data uh, with DMEC using elderly donor, more than 80 years of age of the donor. And I have used hundred years of uh, patient also. And also during pandemic, we have used little modification BCL interface technique for graft preparation. All published this. So 68 months, 1000 plus DMAX surgery, continuous learning process and lot of new things. You see that there are many things which may not be your match with your cataract surgery or DSEC surgery. You will be obsessed with so many things, but always counsel the patient about the rebubble and never try to be 100% perfect for centering in DMEC. You may spoil the whole surgery. So take home message for India, we need to perform more and more EK and the choice will be DMEC in suitable cases. We need more trained corneal surgeon at the time. We need more good donor corneas. That is only possible if we have robust eye banks support with us. The last word, 
Do start with DMEC. Don't give up. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for sharing your experience of high volume DMEC surgeries. May I now invite Professor Namrata Sharma for her talk on intraoperative OCT guided DMEC. Thank you, Nupur, and uh, I would like to thank Professor Tityal, sir, and congratulate him for this great event uh, today and uh, during this weekend. I would be talking to you about intraoperative OCT guided DMEC. There are no financial or proprietary interest, and it does help because it is a non-invasive diagnostic tool which is attached to your operating microscope and uh, so gives you both the planar and the cross-sectional views of the surgical field. Uh, which are available to the surgeon through the IPs. Of course, it is expensive and it may not be available at all places. So uh, as far as the donor dissection is concerned, uh, probably uh, it doesn't uh, help as much as it, as it does when we do the recipient surgery uh, because of the fact that we use tripan blue dye to uh, stain the donor uh, uh, cornea. And uh, the do this is the Desmet's membrane role which is being prepared and it just helps in those conditions where sometimes there may be adherence which may be present and you can see it on the intraoperative uh, OCT microscope. Then once uh, this DM role is prepared, it is laid back again, uh, which uh, a technique which has been taught by Dr. Samar Basak to all of us. Then uh, this is the uh, punch uh, which has been made, three millimeters punch. An S mark, which is being made, made here, looks almost like a desmeto seal if you see the drop OCT microscope, and this is then uh, pushed back. And then, of course, after trephination uh, of the required amount of the uh, uh, donor tissue, uh, this is uh, uh, stripped and is uh, put in the petri dish with the MK media or the Conisol media. Now, this is a case of uh, Fuchs dystrophy in which the cataract surgery has already been done and the Desmet's membrane scoring, which is being done. So if there are any Desmet's membrane remnants, which are there, they can be seen on the intraoperative OCT microscope. And I think the greatest uh, use is uh, when it helps in um, uh, unfolding of the graft. This is upside down graft as can be made on the intraop OCT microscope because the biceps curl has to be upwards. And so you have to flip it. And now you see that this is the correct orientation and subsequently, uh, uh, once it is in the correct orientation, then one can put the air bubble there and uh, then you know that the graft is uh, stuck to the back of the cornea and this is the post-op picture and this is the post-op picture after almost one month with the visual acuity of six by six. In hazy media, it does have a very important role to play because uh, you can't see uh, both while doing uh, desmetorexis, the desmet's membrane remnants, which may be hidden behind that uh, corneal haze following which the Desmet's membrane graft is again uh, uh, placed inside the anterior chamber. And again, notice that it is still not there and we have to get the correct configuration which is coming in this uh, uh, top picture. And once you know that the biceps curl is upwards like that, then uh, it, the correct orientation is there and we can't see the S-shaped mark that well. Now we can very faintly see it here. But we know by the, by the way uh, it looks at the IOCT that it is the correct side up. This is the post-op picture. Then uh, again, uh, this is again to emphasize the same thing that this is a very hazy cornea and uh, we are just trying to see the position of the graft. It should be like this, the correct configuration. And once you uh, place it into the correct configuration as can be seen here, uh, as the air bubble is instilled, uh, then uh, as soon as the air bubble goes in there, one can actually see the S uh, which is there, which becomes brighter and the contrast becomes better as the air bubble goes in. And if you still can't see it, put a blob of viscoelastic on the S and S will get magnified and become uh, clearer again. Then sometimes there can be folds in the Desmet's membrane. This is a relatively clear uh, cornea. And uh, here, uh, when the folds are present, this is a fold which is present and we are trying to undo this fold by putting the fluid just beneath the uh, uh, Desmet's membrane or beneath the uh, graft so that uh, it uh, it, it unfolds and then it come, sits in the right direction and the, we get rid of the uh, fold completely. Uh, again, in eye syndrome, it does help because the desmets doesn't come out um, in one go and uh, it comes out in bits and pieces. And so these pieces and bits can be identified while doing desmetorexis um, onto the uh, recipient cornea. And again, uh, one, again, this is quite hazy. So when you get into the correct ori orientation, again, uh, 
uh, you know that uh, the graph, the right side is up. Uh, this is a DMET for a failed DSEC post PKP. So again, the graft is being uh, removed uh, uh, after uh, detaching it from its side. And notice that there's an adherence which is present here. And very gently, this adherence is released. And then when you're loading it, I think it is important you load it in this configuration only or in this direction when your biceps curl is upwards and then just put it inside the anterior chamber in that direction. And in almost all of the cases, you would have the correct side up with the biceps curl upwards. So I think it helps in uh, these cases also. So to conclude, it is a useful tool in the armamentarium of keratoplasty surgeon, and it helps to see the third dimension of the corneal layers in vivo. Acts like a third eye and helps to see the unseen. Of course, modification and quantifications are required in the current system for accuracy. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, ma'am, for that insightful talk. May I now call upon uh, Dr. Vinay Pillai for his talk on keratoprosthesis and overview. Thank you. Uh, excited and honored to be a part of this uh, 55th year celebration of RP Center. Uh, thanks to Dr. Professor Titiyal and Professor Namrata Sharma for giving me this opportunity. The topic that has been given to me is keratoprosthesis and overview. Probably this can be considered as a final frontier in ophthalmology. The idea came first in 1789 from Pelier de Quincy and then was first accepted by Verhoff by implanting a quartz button in the corneal leucoma. Over the years, you know, tremendous improvement has uh, occurred in terms of design and material in keratoprosthesis. Now, who all can be considered for keratoprosthesis? People who have had multiple uh, you know, unsuccessful corneal transplant, stem cell deficiency, Steven Johnson's uh, mucous membrane pemphigoid, ocular trauma, congenital corneal opacities, herpetic keratitis probably may be considered uh, for keratoprosthesis. And, and uh, uh, absolute contraindication is absolutely glaucoma. Any you know, posterior segment pathology, which is unlikely to uh, give any useful vision post-surgery and probably deep dense amblyopia also. Uh, of the different types of uh, keratoprosthesis which are available uh, in the world today, the two keratoprosthesis that has stood the test of time is the Boston keratoprosthesis type 1 and modified osteoendokeratoprosthesis. We are lucky to have, uh, in, for the Boston Foundation to have, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, transfer the technology to oral of uh, development of the processes in India, and it, it has actually reduced the cost of this surgery for our uh, patients tremendously. Now, Boston Capro was developed by Mass and I Infirmary, <clears throat> FDA approved in 92. And over the years, various modification has, has happened, which uh, resulted in better outcome. So it's a, you know, uh, 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 PMMA uh, uh, keratoprosis, which consists of a front plate, an optic cylinder, a back plate, and the titanium lock ring, which is fixed onto a carrier graph. Two types available is for FAK can pseudo FAK type. Uh, this is a short uh, uh, video of the procedure. It's practically a very uh, surgically, very simple procedure for a corneal surgeon. Uh, and, uh, you know, gives excellent results. So uh, probably any cornea trained person can do a, a Boston type 1 or ROK pro process, pro procedure. Uh, coming to uh, modified osteoautotocator processes, uh, quite tedious procedure, spread over three stages and uh, done over a period of six to nine months. In 1A is basically a preparatory procedure where you know you remove the anterior segment uh, condens, prepare the eye, look at the posterior segment to see if it is uh, suitable for, a, for further procedures. <clears throat> uh -huh. In stage 1B, you take the uh, cheek mucosa uh, and then uh, uh, dissect the you know, anterior surface of the eye to create a raw surface from the muscle to muscle and uh, suture it onto the surface. In 1C, uh, it is a tooth which is harvested and the preferred tooth is a canine tooth uh, uh, taken, harvested and implanted in a subcutaneous pouch here, which is uh, left there for three weeks, sorry, three months to get the good fibrovascular cover. And then it is harvested and uh, um, you know, uh, after reflecting the mucosa is implanted under the mucosa uh, to 
kind of restore the vision. So in both these cases, the visual recovery is quite good, 60 to 70% uh, in Boston and more than 80% in, uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, more than 80% in uh, MOKP with better than six by 60 vision. Retention rate is also good, almost comparable in both these cases. So, uh, the, but uh, the need for these two different types of keratoplasts is that in Boston type one, you need a wet eye with a normal functioning lids while in uh, keratoprocesses, processes, the status of the adnexa or the dryness doesn't matter at all. So a uh, very different indication for uh, uh, both these keratoprocesses. processes. And again, like, uh, you know, unlike any, uh, most of the, you know, uh, ocular surgeries, the, these two procedures are fraught with complications. They have to be, you know, uh, anticipated, looked into, detected early and managed uh, um, efficiently to get a good outcome. Specific to OKP, uh, you can have, you know, uh, problems with the uh, tooth, mucosa, and so on. Now, certain important points in uh, character processes, uh, which has to be raised is, should we perform a character processes in a unilateral uh, blindness or in bilateral blindness? My goal is always attempt character process only in bilaterally blind patients. It is if a patient has at least one eye with which good amplitude vision is there, it probably is not worth attempting uh, KPRO because of the problems inherent with the procedure, which has still not been sorted out. Now, in a bilaterally blind, blind patient, should we attempt KPRO in one eye or should we go ahead with the KPRO in both eyes? Again, here also, I would say limit yourself to KPRO in one eye because the other eye always acts as a standby in the rare event that some you know, untoward incident happens in the eye which has had KPRO and, and the vision is lost in that eye. Primary KPRO in bilateral, especially in stem cell uh, uh, procedures, probably in Indian scenario, KPRO might be a better option because of the uh, you know, uh, immunosuppressions and all other uh, uh, things necessary for a minute transplant. Left. Pediatric KPRO, from me, is still a big no, uh, though there are reports of, uh, you know, useful or uh, good outcome in, uh, uh, in pediatric population with Boston. So limitations for KPRO in Indian scenario is our, you know, climatic condition which favor infection, low socioeconomic strata of the people, hygiene is a problem, and the financial burden is definitely uh, significant. <clears throat> to conclude, proper case selection, gives uh, high anatomic and visual success rates, anticipate problems, and these patients have to be on lifelong follow-up. Extremely grateful to these mentors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vinay. Uh, we now move on to the next talk by Dr. Umang Mathur. He'll be speaking to us on HSV keratitis. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to wish uh, Dr. Professor Titial, the faculty and alumni at uh, RP Center, uh, good wishes on the 55th uh, Foundation Day. Uh, I'll be talking on HSV keratitis. Uh, we know this landmark study, the herpetic eye disease study. It studied the stromal uh, keratitis and suggested that the use of topical steroids reduces the persistence and progression of stromal inflammation and in shortening the duration of HSV keratitis. It also uh, suggested that the role of oral acyclovir in treatment of HSV stromal keratitis uh, was not of any significant benefit. However, if we look at the cases selected in head study, uh, the head study showed uh, selected cases that had at least 2.5 millimeter square of stromal inflammation with diffuse or disciform stromal edema, uh, which they described as non-necrotizing stromal keratitis. The other side of necrotizing stromal keratitis, they could not recruit enough cases. So basically, the cases that they showed uh, were what we today call as endothelitis or disciform keratitis. Uh, they had no epithelial defect and had stromal edema. 
if we look at the classification of HSV, uh, head study was in the early 90s. The classification that we use today is infectious epithelial keratitis, urotrophic, and in the stromal keratitis, we have necrotizing and immune-mediated stromal keratitis. Endothelitis is a separate entity, which is immune-mediated, which could be disciform, linear, or diffuse. So we conducted a study where we uh, selected cases with stromal necrotizing keratitis. As we all know, this is what mimics bacterial keratitis. 13 patients, and we had a 10-week regime of oral acyclovir with an initial two weeks of topical acyclovir. And after the initial load of acyclovir, we added topical steroids. 70% of our cases in the series were uh, HSV1 PCR positive. And we found that topical and systemic acyclovir for the treatment of non-necrotizing stromal keratitis facilitates healing of ulceration. And after the initial load of uh, antiviral, topical steroids did help in decreasing the inflammation and improve visual recovery. As we see in this case uh, over here, the case of stromal necrotizing keratitis with an epithelial defect and stromal inflammation and vascularization, initial acyclovir, and then we added topical steroids to reduce the inflammation. And over a period of time, the patient starts healing. Sorry, one second. And this is the end result of the patient. So stromal necrotizing keratitis was actually not studied in heads. And very often we just use that stromal necrotizing, stromal keratitis, the term that they use in head study for all our cases. Actually the stromal keratitis term used in heads is actually endothelitis and not stromal keratitis. We know we have life replicating virus and dendritic keratitis, geographic keratitis, which head studies showed that only topical acyclovir is required for these cases. Our study shows that the necrotizing stromal keratitis also has viral uh, infection and uh, oral acyclovir, we see benefit of it. More recently, we are using PCR for identification of HSV. It has a good sensitivity, uh, however, it is 71% specific. The other problem with uh, HSV is, of course, of recurrence. And uh, heads, again, had the study was more clinical and did not uh, test it virologically. We know with use of systemic acyclovir, 41% uh, reduction in recurrences occurs. Uh, and this is a major finding of the head study. But what about keratoplasty? Uh, HSV recurrences in keratoplasty is six times more prevalent than the normal transplants. And one year recurrence rate in keratoplasty without prophylaxis is 21 to 39%. So most of us prefer not to operate these cases, especially uh, if the fellow eye is okay. Uh, but the use of prophylaxis, oral acyclovir, does significantly reduce the recurrences uh, to 7.4%. And, and so there is a role of doing these cases, especially the one-eyed patients, uh, but they do need lifelong oral acyclovir. Unfortunately, not much is happening on the vaccine front. Uh, we do hope that this COVID uh, interest in vaccines increases. And uh, so far, we haven't really got any vaccine to prevent recurrence of uh, HSV. And this is something I think we need to generate enough noise uh, so that there's interest in vaccine production. Similarly, there are there is drug resistance that comes up sometimes with acyclovir. We don't again have too many drugs coming up for this treatment. Uh, so HSV seems to be is a very important disease, and we see it a lot in India. And uh, I think 
our community needs to create a little noise for prevention and interest in making vaccines for it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arman, for the informative talk. Uh, I would li like to invite Dr. Sujata Mohan for her talk on sense and sensibility of using high concentration antibiotics like levofoxacin. Thank you, uh, uh, everybody. Uh, doubts that I'd like to thank uh, the organizers and also uh, pass on my congratulations to the RP Foundation for the 50 years, 55 year anniversary. So my talk is on adapting higher concentration uh, antibiotics in infection treatment. Can you see my slide? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So uh, what are the shortcomings of fortified antibiotics? Commonly, we use vancomycin, cefazolin, and tobramycin. The frequent dosing of fortified antibiotics can cause increased toxicity and damage to the ocular surface, induces reflex tearing, can cause the dilution secondary to osmosis. They can decrease tissue penetration, has a variable and shorter shelf life, and more importantly, you need a pharmacist, which adds to the cost and also increases the risk of contamination. So the advantage of a single high concentration antibiotic is it's commercially available, lowers the dispensing cost, there's elimination of potential uh, contamination, has a stable pH and a longer shelf life. So the topics I'm going to speak on are the clinical efficacy and safety of levofloxacin 1.5% in managing bacterial infection, penetration and the pharmacodynamics, kinetics data versus the other fluoroquinolones, and the broad spectrum of bacterial coverage. So this was a study which was published uh, in Cornea by Chang et al, which showed that the peak concentration of levofloxacin was generally, when compared to uh, other uh, fluoroquinolones, was much higher in all, in, um, in all the tissues which is applied, that was in the cornea and aqueous humor, and they compared this higher concentration of levofloxacin with GATI, MOXIE, and bisifloxacin. So the same study also showed, uh, showed that a single application versus repeat application also showed the concentration of levofloxacin was the highest when compared with other uh, fluoroquinolones, both in cornea as well as in aqueous humor. So this study compared uh, the lower concentration 0.5% uh, fluoroquinolone with 1.5% fluoroquinolone and uh, compared the maximum tissue uh, availability after application and showed that uh, on all the tissues, the, the concentration, higher concentration uh, fluoroquinolone had much pe better penetration. So they also uh, uh, tested the aqueous humor installation after inst installing both 1.5 and 0.5%. They found that it was 4.58 times uh, higher, not only in the beginning, but also towards uh, at the end of six hours, the higher concentration levofloxacin, the, uh, uh, the uh, Cmax was much better when compared to the lower uh, concentration uh, levofloxacin. And looking at the bacterial elimination and symptom di disappearance, by the end of third day, 95.5% of the uh, bacteria had disappeared. And by the end of 14th day, it was 100% recovery in bacterial keratitis. And the symptoms abated by, uh, by third day, 67.6% uh, had a reduction in symptoms. And by uh, seventh day, well, almost 100% of the patient had uh, symptoms that resolved. So looking at the clinical response of levofloxacin, they found that the gram positive, gram negative, as well as anaerobic uh, bacteria showed marked improvement, particularly even uh, up to 94.9%, particularly in gram positive uh, cases. And it was very much comparable to moxifloxacin. So uh, what were the side effects? Um, the side effects were very few. Some of them complained by irritation, pruritus, dysgeusia, and articaria. And uh, the adverse side effect was only about 2.1% when compared to uh, the other uh, moxifloxacin. And it was just five out of 238 patients in spite of the higher concentration. So looking at the higher concentration, the worry is whether they'll affect the corneal epithelial cells. And this study, which is uh, published by Sakurai in the Journal of the Eye, showed that the higher con this higher concentration levofloxacin, 1.5% uh, when compared with GATI, MOXIE, and tosafloxacin, showed the least toxicity both in the corneal epithelial cells as well as in the keratocytes. So uh, they also looked at the corneal endothelial cells and this uh, study was done and published in the Journal of the Eye and they found that the effect of fluoroquinolone and wound healing and corneal endothelial cells, when they compared the three fluoroquinolones, the least toxicity was found in the higher concentration, that is 1.5% uh, levofloxacin. 
This study compared the other commonly used uh, preparations such as vancomycin, cefazolin, and uh, tobramycin and, uh, uh, in, in vitro, and they showed that the bacterial load at the onset of uh, topical treatment, which is compared with vancomycin, levofloxacin, and so on, showed that levofloxacin works best with, uh, when compared to vancomycin and when compared to cefazolin and tobramycin, and they showed the best response uh, over a period of time. So this is a wide spectrum of antibacterial coverage seen with the levofloxacin. It shows excellent aerobic gram positive, aerobic gram negative, as well as anaerobic uh, cover. It was equal, if not better than moxifloxacin. So this study was uh, um, a randomized active comparator study done on 111 patients in which it was a double mass study in which they had uh, divided the patients into two groups. One uh, using uh, application of levofloxacin, the other uh, applying moxifloxacin four times a day, three days prior to surgery. And on the fourth day, the surgery was conducted and uh, aqueous humor uh, samples were collected immediately before uh, cataract surgery. And the patients were also randomized to subgroups and surgery was performed on the first, second, fourth and sixth hour. And at the end, uh, the end uh, it was studied and they found that the aqueous humor drug concentration over time, uh, the 1.5 percent uh, levofloxacin fared the best. And uh, not only that, the pooled uh, levofloxacin aqueous humor concentration was significantly greater than moxifloxacin. So this is again an, uh, a study showing the bacterial eradication rate, showing by the end of uh, left. 14 days, yeah, I'm just finishing. 14 days, uh, uh, the patients showed excellent response. These are some of our patients who had uh, levofloxacin uh, post uh, PBK. So uh, the key messages are, it's a preservative free fluoroquinolone, achieves and maintains higher concentrations. And uh, the high concentrations effective in poorly sensitive as well as in intermediate strains. It's effective in uh, reducing uh, MRSA as well as uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's highly effective against major bacterial infections. And the rate of adverse drug effect was very low when compared to other moxifloxacin. And there was no uh, major adverse events, events. So in conclusion, higher concentration levofloxacin can be an excellent substitute to fortified antibiotics in bacterial infection and as a surgical prophylaxis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sujata, for that very informative talk. May I now call upon Dr. Himanshu Matalia for his concluding talk of the session on surgical management of peripheral ectasia. Thank you. And at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Tityal and RP Center for having me here. And congratulations to you all. So I'm going to talk about surgical management of periphylactasia, and by periphylactasia, the common periphylactasia, we include pellucid marginal degeneration, post lasik ectasia, and terians marginal degeneration. The pellucid marginal degeneration, depending upon the severity, uh, can uh, be visually de uh, debilitating also. Uh, classical signs of pellucid is beer berry appearance on slit limb where the peripheral ectasia is there and uh, the thinning area is beyond that. And on the, uh, on the topography, typical crab claw sign or what type wing sign is clincher of a diagnosis. If the disease is early to moderate, uh, it can be treated uh, with uh, either uh, uh, intracorneal ring implants, uh, cross-linking, uh, 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 topoguide PRK or the combination of uh, uh, them. One such case is if you can uh, see here, uh, had a uh, early to moderate uh, uh, pellucid margin degeneration. And when we did uh, topoguided PRK, we could reduce the irregularity on the surface as well as part of the astigmatism and then followed it with an intex, which can, you know, which could actually give quite significant amount of clarity of vision to the patient. Uh, in case of pellucid with cataract, uh, the treatment becomes uh, quite easy where we could use a customized uh, uh, toric IOL. And one such case I'm showing here is 22.5 diopter cylinder and patient had excellent visual outcome. So such kind of early to moderate cases, uh, the visual outcome uh, can be quite excellent. Whereas moderate to advanced cases, uh, we may need patch graph like banana patch graph, and which can uh, be sometimes a little tricky uh, in terms of surgical technique. Uh, usually these uh, banana patch graft are done uh, in the inferior uh, periphery, where we uh, do a conjectile peritomy, saving the limbal palisades there. And then we dissect out a banana shape uh, uh, area from there, keeping in mind that we do not want to perforate the eye. 
the edge of the banana we can uh, round it off with uh, three millimeter dermal punch the dissection deeper dissection here in these area is not as difficult because of the disease process per se the donor area again is uh, taken in the similar shape but 0.5 millimeter smaller in the width which will help us in flattening the uh, cornea the suture you know, towards the visual axis are relatively smaller whereas the peripheral sutures can be a little you know, a little longer and uh, definitely they need to be tighter uh, all these uh, you know, sutures can be left uh, in place for pretty long time because you know, the graft hose junction may not heal as early as we you know, think and finally we you know, conclude the surgery by repositing uh, the uh, the conjunctiva the limbal uh, stem cells uh, there uh, in many such kind of cases, you can also do a decentered uh, DALC, and which can work equally uh, well. Uh, RPC has reported tuck in DALC in very advanced cases like this. You can see paper within cornea. Uh, again, we uh, do a conjectile peritomy, uh, uh, saving the limbal palisades there. After an adequate cauterization, we create a peripheral groove near the limbal region. And then finally, dissect out uh, the recipient tissue, make uh, 360 degree pockets all around near the limbus, and then take a donor uh, cornea, which is along with a frill of sclera. And when we suture it, after taking tight sutures there, we tuck in the peripheral sclera under the pocket which we have created. Uh, the tuck-in part is usually done at the end of the um, uh, surgery and which uh, um, becomes much easier. And once uh, you tuck in uh, uh, these uh, uh, 360 degree areas of uh, sclera, uh, all you have to do is then uh, reposit uh, the conjunctiva, and uh, which I prefer normally to use uh, fibrin glue. And uh, that's the end of the surgery. The ocular surface becomes much stable and the visual outcome are pretty exhilarating. Coming to the next ectasia, which is post-lasic ectasia, we know the post-lasic ectasia is related to thinning and ectasia of the posterior stroma uh, in any uh, post-refractive surgery cases. Usually these ectasia are peripheral and usually uh, the treatment involves either cross-linking intracolonial ring implants or topo-guided uh, PRK. Cross-linking uh, has been done in various ways from epi-off to epi-on to underflap, but we all now uh, refer to cross-linking as epi-off cross-linking for any such kind of cases. Uh, coming to the ring usage, a single ring usage can uh, regularize the surface significantly and similarly, topo-guided PRK in some of the selected cases can actually do pretty uh, well. If you compare them uh, chronologically, as I am showing here, cross-linking only, what it does is it works, but it flattens the flatter area further. So it creates more irregularity. When you combine with the uh, index uh, with cross-link or in, any intracorneal ring with cross-linking, it regularizes surface much better and the visual outcomes are much better. If you uh, do similarly topo-guided PRK, the irregularity can be reduced, but you cannot totally get rid of uh, irregular surface. And hence, uh, I would rather prefer combining ring with uh, uh, cross-linking. Finally, the terians margin of degeneration, though not very common, but typically has the superior thinning area and superior ectasia. Uh, the, the area which is superiorly can actually uh, undergo a wedge resection and compression suture and can reduce the irregularity and can give it quite... 48 seconds left. Uh, this is the final part of it. Uh, when uh, we do the uh, wedge resection, we take uh, double trephines, uh, two different asymmetric size trephines, and uh, we create a crescent there and go a partial thickness there. After creating the wedge there, the tight suturing uh, is performed. And typically we aim for reversal of the astigmatism, which ultimately reduces on its own uh, the compression effect. And finally, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, keep the, the cornea a little steeper in this area. So to conclude, what do we learn in PMD early to moderate cases, you can do cross-linking with or without topo-guided PRK and intracorneal rings. Moderate to advanced cases, wedge resection can be done with compression suture or banana patch graft. 
Advanced cases, tuck in dal can work or decenter dal can work. Post LASIK ectasia, cross linking or with or without intex and topo guided PRK can work. I prefer cross linking combining with intex. Enterians marginal degeneration, wedge resection with compression suture does have a role. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Himanshu. A wonderful presentation and uh, thanks for ac accepting our invitation. I think we had a wonderful uh, morning session on cardiac. I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, who have contributed so nicely uh, in this scientific activity. And uh, definitely wish all the best to everybody and like to thank uh, people who have joined from US, uh, our own uh, Dr. Vishal and Dr. Gaurav. And uh, we had a privilege of having the first uh, Madan Mohan lecture and it was delivered by uh, Dr. Almer too. Uh, thank you Almer for uh, being with us today. And uh, we hope that we'll be seeing you, all of you, next time in our same meeting, if not uh, earlier than that. Uh, thank you again. I wish you all the best. Good night and a uh, good day for all people in India. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Now we start the glaucoma session. I would like to request Professor Ramanji Chihota and Dr. Harsh Kumar, along with Dr. Vinay Gupta, Dr. Divang, to please join us on the dais. The session is going to be moderated by Dr. Shikha Gupta. So without any delay, we'll start the session. Thank you. Dr. Rajiv Garg is joining us online. And welcome Dr. Deepak Ghatte, Dr. Pandav, Dr. Rajiv Garg. So it's an honor today to be uh, inviting Dr. Deepta Ghatte in the 55th Foundation Day celebrations. She has completed her MBBS and MD ophthalmology training from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. She went on to complete her fellowship in coronal physiology and pharmacokinetics from Emory University School of Medicine and Kentucky College of Medicine, followed by Glaucoma Fellowship in University of Nebraska Medical Center. She is currently serving as Associate Professor at University of Nebraska Medical Center. She has recently collaborated with students from the University of Nebraska at Omaha College of Information Science and Technology to develop a new app that allows glaucoma patients to pictorialize their field of vision. Welcome Dr. Deep Deepta. She'll be talking today on visual perception in glaucoma. Thank you so much for the invitation, Dr. Tanerj, Dr. Ramanji, Dr. Vinay. Uh, it's wonderful to be back for our PC day. Uh, as mentioned, I do glaucoma at Emory University. Have I shared the correct screen? I have two screens. Yeah. So. Okay, excellent. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about visual perception and glaucoma. These are my disclosures. None of them are relevant to the talk today. So we know glaucoma is common. Most of the glaucoma, even in the West, is undiagnosed. It's already moderate to advanced at diagnosis. And one fourth of our patients say they have no compromise at all in vision. But today we'll talk about visual perception, which is the acquisition of knowledge about objects and events in the environment from light that's emitted or reflected by these objects. As ophthalmologists, we deal with the eye as a camera, you know, the lens, retina, image, and we follow parameters of vision, visual acuity and visual fields to follow our disease. What we don't talk about so much is how we extract information or understand what we see. So the same person can see the image and have very different outcomes. You might remember this dress from a little while ago, which is clearly blue and black, but my husband and my daughter would insist is white and gold. So when we go to the question, what do patients see? We first go to the artist. And Michael Mama in his book, uh, The Artist's Eye, described four French artists with glaucoma. Three of them went blind, one had considerable field loss, but none of this field loss was ever evident in any of the paintings that they made. This is very different from other eye diseases. Edward Munch, the Norwegian artist, painted his uh, scrotomas and his vitreous hemorrhage. He pictured himself lying in bed and his scrotoma is a big skull. Here you can see he's painted himself in a scream position looking at his retinal issues. So when I asked this question, I went to my glaucoma colleagues at the University of Nebraska to ask them, what do people see? And here is Dr. Havens. So I think they see like they're looking through shower glass or a shower curtain. Dr. Gulati, who many of you know. Oops. 
think they just see things which are dimmer. So next I went to the neuro ophthalmologist, Dr. Kedar. They literally see nothing. The environmental surround blends in into their neighboring blind spots. Dr. Leg. Okay. I don't see, I don't think they see anything. Dr. Lynch. I think some people see dimness and I think other people's brains fill in um, uh, pictures from the adjacent um, information so that they don't realize anything's missing. And Dr. Wapala. So for patients who have uh, visual field deficits, I think the area of vision that they're missing is uh, what they see is variable. I think some patients see glare or bright lights and other patients see positive visual. So none of them agree, not surprising. You put six ophthalmologists in a room, but one thing that none of them said is they see big black commas in their vision, such as the American Academy of Ophthalmology vision simulator here. So other people have asked this question with forced choice experiments and Amsler grids, and the commonest answers there have been blurred or missing or no change at all. And in this simulation of glaucomatous vision loss, the idea was early scrotomas objects disappear, and in later scrotomas lines stretch and colors spill over. So we decided to ask this question, what do patients with glaucoma see? And the lead author of this paper, Miguel Gagrani is also an RPC graduate. This was published in the BJO last year. And we built an app with our computer science college at Omaha. The central idea was that patients will be able to observe and draw the discrepancy between a large wall-mounted scene which subtends to 45 degrees of angle and a handheld copy of the scene at 30 centimeters, which projects to the central degrees, which is preserved in most glaucoma patients. So patients look monocularly and binocularly at this big scene, and they, then they look at the app, and then they can modify the app. They can change the uh, degree of blur, they can change the contrast, and then you look up and compare, is this what you see? We ask them, is this what you yes. see when you look up and compare? If they say yes, that's the answer. So we took 12 glaucoma subjects, the wide range of uh, visual field loss, the average age was 70. We combined the monocular fields mathematically to create a binocular VFI using calculations that we have described in the paper. And these were our results from one of our patients, right eye, left eye, and this is the binocular integrated T. This was quite startling to me as a glaucoma surgeon. We see these patients all day. It was startling to the patients and their families. Some of them became really emotional and wet when they saw their results. This is a patient with a nasal loss, which we often think is inconsequential, but turned out quite consequential here. And this is the superior loss and binocularly seems to modify itself. Then we analyze each of these responses on these posters with the corresponding retinal loci on the Humphrey visual fields. We know the exact angles subtended at all of these. And these were our answers. So all our patients answered either normal, blurry, or very blurry. Zero person, not even one, chose the dimming action that was seen in all these simulators. What was the iPad response given a particular decibel value? And when they had less than 10 decibels, most people chose the blur or the severe blur option. And more than 20 decibels at any of these points were chosen as normal. An ROC curve to answer the question at what decibel value do people show changes in their visual field? The answer was 23 decibels for each data set individually, the right eye, left eye, and binocular. So we found out that glaucoma patients are able to pictorialize the scrotomas as blur or missing. None of our subjects chose the dim option. The cutoff for normal versus abnormal perception in glaucoma subjects was 23 decibels in all these data sets. And knowing what the patient sees helps us understand the impact of disability on the glaucoma patients and opens the door for future rehabilitation. Truly takes a village to do this work. And these are my co-authors. And I want to end with this slide. I've trained at lots of places, but RP Center is the first place I train. It's a pleasure to be participating, albeit virtually in RPC day. I wish I was there in person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Deepa, for finishing well in time.
and you of course has give, have given us the new perceptions for ophthalmologists in your talk on visual perception in glaucoma next i would like to invite dr surender pandav sir for the for the talk on role of selective laser trabeculoplasty sir please thank you uh, thank you rpc for including me into your founders day program and thank you tanush for the invitation uh, i'll share my slides so is my presentation visible yes yes yes, yes. yes i'll be speaking on role of selective laser trabecular plasty and uh, i don't have any financial disclosures uh, on this so we know that treating angle with the low fluence laser or any laser for that matter uh, reduce uh, least reduction in intraocular pressure and that was uh, known in you know early 80s when alt became popular and subsequently alt was replaced with the uh, selective laser trabeculoplasty uh, because this is less de destructive and almost as efficacious so if you look at the early data it suggests that uh, a slt is uh, useful in reducing reducing intraocular pressure i think they cannot all were the first one to report and they they found that about 20% reduction and the response rate is over 70% but subsequently i think there a number of studies have been conducted and uh, uh some with uh, even better results and if you look at the last uh, you know large publication this is the the light trial uh, which was a large multi centric uh, uh, you know randomized control study on more than 1200 eyes uh, where we had two groups the drops versus lct and they were uh, at the baseline they were fairly well equally distributed and comparable and if you look at in terms of uh, iop control uh you can see that the target iop you know was met in most of the patient visit more than 90% and uh, even at uh, if you look at the iop at, you know 3 years time the iop reduction is still uh, good but comparable in, in most of these group to the tune of 93 and 95% and slt also seems to work in oht uh, early to moderate open angle glaucoma Uh, it's a little less effective in severe or advanced disease, but that is also true for uh, medical treatment, uh, as you can see from these figures. And in terms of um, you know progression of the disease, uh, again there's not much difference. But uh, the drops group tend to progress a little more than the SLT group, but particularly the OAG progression, the open angle glaucoma, which is a little definitely higher on. Uh, 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 on the group in the group uh, using drugs as compared to SLT, and also number of medications were uh, more or less comparable in the two. But if you look at the target IOP not being met, and that figure was a little higher in SLT, uh, not significantly higher, but a little higher in SLT uh, in medical group as compared to SLT. So SLT seems to be working in uh, you know these patients and. Uh, uh, it is also believed now that if you use slt as a primary therapy then uh, it might be more useful uh, you know as a method of treating uh, reducing intraocular pressure and uh, if you look at the iop reduction it could could give you an iop reduction of 30 you know 20 to 30% and uh, you know some studies even say that as one slt is equal to that in the process for 12 months um There's another meta analysis of uh, you know eight uh, randomized control trials of more than 1200 patients and again the conclusion is basically the same that slt as well as medicines they work similarly in terms of controlling intraocular uh, pressure uh, the important question was has been also been addressed like how does slt compare with the retina prosp and uh, it is also you know mentioned that perhaps a slt can uh, you know replace that of cost but maybe there there's a little it's not really that comparable because we look at some of the data uh, if you look at the iop reduction of more than 20% then latinoprost group will achieve that to the tune of 90% whereas slt will achieve that only you know 82% so that is false rate with the slt is a uh, lower uh, than uh, than that in a prost uh, but if you compare it with timolol perhaps it compares very well with timolol and it perhaps does a little better than uh, timolol but uh, with sl uh, with uh, with latin prost maybe you have to take it with a pinch of salt the important thing is that slt will lead to a sustained lowering iop and and the 
treatments was shown to be secondary lower IOP and also it reduces the IOP fluctuations, which is very important for OH, open angle coma as well as uh, uh, NTG. So uh, SLT has many advantages. It's convenient, no drug related side effects, particularly there are no systemic side effects. Compliance is not an issue and cost of treatment, you know, could be, uh, it depends on in what setting you're you are using SLT. So what is the current status? So SLT is increasingly becoming the first line of treatment for OSP, PUAG, and uh, uh, you know, even for SOAG. However, if you look at the, you know, the worldwide distribution of the, how much SLT is being used, then there are still many countries where SLT is not actually popular. And this data is from the Canadian survey that was conducted uh, you know, in 2020. Only 17% ophthalmologists actually had taken up this uh, this method of treatment, and picture is, picture is probably similar to India because in India also we don't see that much popular popularity in SRT. The reason could be that there's a decline in efficacy, and we know the efficacy of SRT goes down with time. And also there's some concern the IOP spikes and the retreatments are often uh, required, but these can be quite dealt with. So. Uh, the cost of treatment could be variable, but there is definitely a cost of equipment and uh, availability of the SLT machines and also technology could be an issue in some parts of the world. So does it work in Indian population? Yes, I think we did a you know, control trial in our center also, and we did find that the SLT, uh, we, we, you know, we used people, patients from different uh, types of commas, uh, phenotypes and uh, and we can see that it does work up to one year. It does, uh, you know, lower intraocular pressure significantly in our population as well. Uh, and this is another trial that we conducted. This was on angle closure glucom after, uh, after uh, iridotomy. And you can see that most patients also show a significant IUP reduction following SLT. However, the response rate was somewhere around 57 to uh, uh, around 60%. That probably is the reason that why most people in India are not taken to it because uh, it doesn't work for everybody, but still a good number of patients will be um, benefited by this technology. So SLT does lower intraocular pressure in OST, OAG, and even in angle closure after the other adult. And sustained IOP lowering could be achieved. Uh, and uh, there are no vision threatening complications or very few, I would say, and there are no systemic complications. And there are many other advantages and can be recommended as a first line therapy for open at least for ocular hypertension and primary open angle glaucoma. Once again, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your enlightening talk. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Vijayalingam, ma'am, for a talk on approach to normal pressure glaucoma. Ma'am, please. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation. Congratulations on 55th anniversary. The uh, topic given to me is uh, approach to normal tension glaucoma. Uh, I saw the timer being changed to seven minutes. So I will try my best to cover in seven minutes. So the, what is normal tension glaucoma? If you look at the definition, um, optic neuropathy with optic disc excavation, visual field loss, open angles, and statistically normal intraocular pressure. And uh, how does it differ from the primary open angle glaucoma? Basically, IOP divides them. Mostly disc and field changes are similar. And in general, um, NTG patients are older. NTG can be familial, but females are more affected. NTG can be associated with peripheral vasospasm. And there can be differences in the optic disc and visual field. What are the differences we see in optic disc and visual field with, in, in NTG versus PYG? The optic disc change, what typically we see in NTG will have a disc hemorrhage like what you see here, and uh, there will be much thinner neuroretinal rim, shallow cups, and proximal retinal arterial narrowing can be seen. In terms of the visual field, the defects are much steeper uh, with the slopes and they will be closer to fixation and the depth will be greater in comparison to the POAG. 
So I just want to start this talk and how do we manage a, with a collaborative NTG study, even though it is done almost two and a half decades back, that is the only uh, uh, long-term multicentric study we do have. So what did they notice uh, in NTG study? I'm uh, going to share some of the salient features. They found the rate of progression slow with 30% IO prediction from the baseline. And interestingly, they also found half of untreated group did not show progression. Some progressed rapidly. The risk factors they found were migraine, females, disc hemorrhage at disc, uh, uh, diagnosis. Possibly there was a racial and genetic predisposition as well. The major findings were natural course variable, prediction of untreated course in individual is not possible because it is so variable. IO prediction retards progression in only some. Some remain stable without treatment also. There are certain risk factors. So with this background, I just want to share uh, some of my thoughts, uh, which are important because it's a very complex disorder. So let's look at the pathophysiology. So there are very uh, various hypotheses have been uh, 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 created by many uh, researchers. The one of them uh, is, happens to be some, are, uh, some patients are more sensitive than others to intraocular pressure. The normal intraocular pressure leads to mechanical damage and stress on the axons in the lamina cryptorosa and making those typical uh, disc changes what we see. And these individuals are likely to have thinner mean central corneal thickness, so possibly suggesting there is a link between the thinner cornea and a weaker lamina cryptorosa. Compared to the Caucasian, NTG is more frequent in e Asia, especially the eastern part of the Asia, uh, Japan, Korea, and other countries. These demographic differences point towards genetic component and uh, are a variable susceptibility to IOP in different populations. The other hypothesis is it is caused by local or generalized vascular dysregulation. It's not very uncommon to see low blood pressure with a circadian fluctuation of mean ocular perfusion pressure. The vascular dysregulation is defined as the inability of a tissue to maintain a constant blood flow despite changes in the perfusion pressure. So when because of the vascular dysregulation, the perfusion pressure cannot be maintained and the disc gets uh, susceptible for the, the low blood pressures and other vascular phenomena. The higher prevalence of sleep apnea or hypopnea syndrome is seen in NTG patients. Probably they also contribute to the uh, susceptibility of the optitis to the vascular changes. And uh, the other theory happens to be higher than normal pressure gradient across the lamina cryptorosa, making the disc susceptible for the damage. Similarly, impaired CSF circulation in the subarachnoid space of the optic nerve has been attributed for the disc uh, changes we see with the NTG. So it looks like none of the current concepts can explain this intuing condition on its own. Most likely, NTG is a complex syndrome with variety of pathological pathways that may differ between population and individuals. So how do we deal with it? I will miss this slide because it's more or less the repetition. So if you want to, in one sentence, if you want to say, how do you diagnose normal tension glaucoma? It is a diagnosis by exclusion. We have to keep it in mind, all possible pathophysiology, which I have mentioned right now. We have to exclude other types of glaucoma, especially the angle closures, are burnt out in glaucomas in the past because of the steroid use, etc., has to be kept in mind. Similarly, PYOG that have undergone with refractive surgery because the corneas are very thin, there is a possibility we may be underestimating the intraocular pressure in those individuals. Keep in mind possible optic nerve disorders such as congenital conditions like coloma, optic disputes, and uh, tilted disc, etc. Are acquired conditions like ischemic optic neuropathy, optic neuritis, or compressive optic neuropathy, trauma. Keep in mind possible drug-related optic disc changes. So when you see a disc hemorrhage, look at possibility of other causes like posterior vitreous detachment, 
ऑप्टिक डिस्क ड्रूसिन डिस्क डायबिटिक रेटनोपैथी और वास्कुलर अक्लूसिव डिसीज सो वन हैज टू लुक एट पेशेंट इन शुड हैव ए होलिस्टिक अप्रोच rule out all other possible causes before we really label them as normal tension glaucoma so in that process one has to do multiple iop measurements preferable to do the dvt look at critically the central corneal thickness rule out all other possibilities what i have mentioned to you and possibly look at the response of nail fold capillaries to cold and evaluate how is the systemic condition especially possible nocturnal blood pressure dips nowadays uh, physicians are quite aggressive in controlling the intraocular pressure so these uh, people who are taking the medication in the night time at a higher risk to develop the blood pressure dips and one has to uh, discuss with their physician and look at the possibility of this in cases where we cannot explain if there is a suspicion of possible neuro, uh, neurological causes please subject the patient to the carotid dopplers or if needed mri so when do we do the neurological uh, investigations when there is a disparity between the cupping and the pallor if the disparity between the optic disc and the visual field if they are not correlating or visual field defect respecting vertical meridian and central defect so always view with suspicion possibility of the associated neurological conditions in these uh, uh, patients so once we label them how do we treat even though normal tension glaucoma study has shown that uh, majority of them at least one third of them did not progress in with even without the treatment but our tendency is most of the time to start the treatment in theoretically ideally the treatment is indicated for progressive disease if one is able to establish or prove the progression of the ntg maybe one can afford to wait till we prove that because of the logistic reasons and because the patient fear of patient may not come back to us most of the clinicians once they make the diagnosis they tend to treat what do we treat we only treat the intraocular pressure a 30% reduction from the baseline is the recommended if you want to achieve that and if, among the available drugs the only drug we can think of will be the prostaglandins so try to use the prostaglandins the response probably will be better if the intraocular pressures are on the higher teens if the intraocular pressures are already on the lower teens the getting the 30% reduction may not be possible crucially look at the circulatory deficiencies and try to correct it the people have recommended use of the calcium channel uh, blockers for the blood pressure uh, treatment maybe uh, talking to the physician changing it to calcium channel blockers for the bp treatment may help in the versus really blocker. sorry to interrupt you ma'am yeah uh, last line avoiding yeah avoiding nocturnal hypotension is important remember some progress in spite of the iv prediction some may not progress at all and uh, these are some of my thoughts thank you again for the kind invitation and sorry if i have exceeded the time thank you thank you ma'am for your insightful lecture next i would like to invite dr rengaraj venkatesh sir for his talk on glaucoma management in the covid era thank you rpc team and uh, my good friend uh, tanuj for this opportunity and i am specifically saying it's covid and beyond because like how we are doing this hybrid meeting you now we learned a lot during the covid and i'm going to share with you some of the learnings which is going to take us beyond so we know it was a for last couple of years complex situation we had to minimize the spread there were a lot of new normals and lot of guidelines which was coming up so we had to protect both the patient and our medical team so a lot of use of personal protective equipment you know how the mask with the patient mask with the uh, doctor made a lot of issues in our care including fogging of our lenses not able to see the fundus properly do other tests properly and uh, definitely to some extent the lower patient load help us to manage but we had to do a lot of things around it so when it comes to glaucoma management i'm sure we have to do a lot of things like measuring the pressure doing gonioscopy oct fundus imaging so our team didn't want to 
let this crisis go waste. Though, so they sat on a couple of uh, uh, hackathons where we sat with engineering students from VIT, Pondicherry Engineering College, and some of our problems, we found our own solutions. And this was an excellent uh, solution which came up, you know, where uh, in uncooperative patients where you have to hold the lid, we came up with an innovation called eye opener. This is a V-shaped uh, device with a couple of butts you see. So this nicely holds the lid comfortably so that you can do uh, suture removal, you can do applanation comfortably, you can even do blood massage for some patients. And uh, we, we all had a concern about non-contact tonometry because of the spread, but later it was even disproven uh, by the team from NN, but we had to change to some other safer. So eye care was available. So we had come up with some ways of sterilizing and reusing the pins comfortably for at least eight to 10 patients. We found that the results were similar to gut. Uh, so you don't have to throw the pin for every case. You may have to be kind of cautious in how you use. So we developed a system to safely use it like how you see the pins here, so that we can, it can be cost effective. Gonioscopy, of course, it's very important, but we had to restrict the use. But all these uh, dividers between the patient and the doctor, like the slit lamp shield, which you see here, really helped in doing some of these tests comfortably. And we had to find solutions for it to be kind of sterilized after every case. And you know, funders evaluation was really difficult. The, the fog from this area was really bothering the lens. So our team came up with this beautiful 90D or a 78D holder, which was 3D printed so that you can comfortably do a 90D evaluation. And wherever it wasn't possible, we were trying to image and upload in the EMR. Of course, visual field was an issue. Again, uh, uh, evidence came shortly that there was not much of an aerosol in the bowl, but still putting a mask, I mean, putting a tape to the face mask really helped to reduce it. And the other way we really kind of tackle this by using the virtual reality perimetry, which we developed with a young boy from VIT Sandal. And this was also validated so we could use this. And this can also be safely sterilized in a UV chamber like this. So this really helped us during the pandemic. And now we are using it on disabled patients who cannot get up, who are finding it difficult to do visual fields on HFA. Now we are routinely using this. Again, imaging fundus photo, if you see there is issues of cleaning these lenses frequently, those it's a small, uh, uh, wrapping around it helps you to really clean these lenses. I mean, all these practices are going to stay with us even after COVID because it's going to save some of the other infections which normally spread in hospitals. And a lot of high-risk patients. So we have a system of kind of categorizing these high-risk patients, especially people who need laser, surgery, and emergency. We had this system which really helped during the COVID times. So we were able to get these patients back. We were able to send uh, uh, letters to get e -pass. And uh, when you talk about surgery, I mean, we, there are a lot of things which we did for cataract and also glaucoma surgery, but glaucoma surgery significantly reduced during this uh, COVID period. And uh, we are looking at how to build mechanisms so that we can improve the surgery in the post COVID times. But everyone should understand how much of drop has happened. No, it's not the retinal or corneal surgery where it was emergency, people are getting it done, but glaucoma surgery was delayed. And we found significantly increased lens-induced glaucomas, which had to be dealt in this period. And if you see in Aravind, we see close to 16,000 patients, and this came down significantly during Unlock. But the one thing which helped us really was the vision centers. The primary eye care centers, which are run by a couple of nursing staff, where telemedicine happens, and fundus imaging and glaucoma screening, diabetic retinal screening was very effective. And uh, recently, we published this in WHO Bulletin, where we said these vision centers significantly increased volume after the unlock, like how you see here. Whereas the base hospitals took a lot of time to build that volume back. So vision centers are easy to access because they are in semi-urban rural areas. And that's the way to go for opportunistic screening. We also explored like the Zoom session here. We also explored- The on the kind of light on the car while I'm ready for the Okay. So we were able to explore some of these ideas with our patients, the post-operative patient, high-risk patients. Uh, our surgeons had Zoom sessions with them just to reassure because they couldn't come. And then we were able to see them after the unlock happened. So we all know problems of telemedicine. You can't do all these things. You can't measure, you can't visualize. So what we did is we did a pilot project called Uberization of Eye Care. Now where somebody from the hospital, a very trained, a vaccinated technician was going to the community to screen the patients. So especially this was again done for high-risk patients who had advanced glaucoma who couldn't come. So the technician went there and we use a peak chart to check the vision, uh, 
uh, and then uh, and then he would uh, measure the intraocular pressure with a eye care tonometer like this and then a visual field was also done uh, so this is so this is a special trap again just to kind of help for sanitization part of the cfa which you use and then it can be uv sterilized also the uv box also goes with that and then once the visual field is done a fundus is also imaged at the end uh, and then all these reports are sent to the base hospital through wi-fi and then a doctor sees the reports and then he can give teleconsult see the problem in telemedicine you don't have these investigations now you can do all these investigations at home with all these portable devices and we were able to test it and we did on a, a few uh, uh, dozens of patients to see that this uberization is feasible in our system also so see that these are some of the ex experiments which we did and some of them we are trying to explore and take it to the next levels also so i think covid has uh, taught us a lot of things and i'm sure many of these lessons will help us to improve our care for glaucoma in the future also thank you thank you sir for the excellent talk and of course covid has given us a lot of innovation that is going to help mankind for a long time to come next i would like to invite professor harsh kumar sir for his talk on how to perform a perfect trabeculectomy sir please thank you shrika and thank you professor uh, tityal and tanuj for uh, having me here at a place where i spent 26 years of my life <clears throat> so how to perform a perfect trap that's a myth there's nothing like a perfect trap but let us try and do the best that we can. So actually, nobody wants to do this kind of a surgery. Never force a patient on that. But what do you do when the pressures go high? And with all medications, and the patient is fed up of 10 bloody medications that they have to put so that they hardly any time to do their own work. But if you see that the disc is progressing, you see that the fields are progressing, and you really see that there are allergies to the patient or the patient just can't afford medication. They are not going to put it and they're going to go blind. So you have to go for surgery and still the gold standard is a standard trabeculectomy. So we do stop prostaglandins for some time, but have to operate on a soft eye. So have oral estrazolamide or glycerol or whatever you want to prefer. Use topical steroids if the eye is congested and you don't want to operate in that kind of an eye. All standard tests, but if most of like our patients are one-eyed, so have to do a conjunctival swab and you have to do NIR, be sure that there's no uh, bleeding time, clotting time disorder over there. Explain the prognosis. Be very careful. We know that the wipeout is very rare, but do get it written down. And even if the patient is very fussy, please save yourself, make a video explaining everything to him and in the language of the patient. Preoperatively, we like to give IV mannitol at least half an hour back. Peribulbar anesthesia is what we prefer. No super pinky. A good intermittent massage is the best. Uh, and then we go ahead and <clears throat> do the surgery. I think... Can you make the video play? I think there's something here. Can you help me? Okay. Thank you. So uh, what we are basically trying to do initially, we used to do the burdel suture, but now we are on to uh, doing the traction suture at the, uh, at the cornea with the 6-0 vicral and then a standard. Uh, now this is a phonix based flap. Uh, that we are now currently doing, though we were initially taught uh, the limbal based flap, uh, a gentle cautery is to be usually done and you can use a 10 paisa blade normally to uh, create a 4 into 4 millimeter triangular or a uh, quadrangular flap, whatever you are comfortable with. And then you can actually, uh, if you want to show a fancy surgery, you can use the 85 rupee crescent also which actually works better, but if you are used to a 10 pesa blade, it works equally well. And uh, 0.2 to 0.4 milligram per ml of mitomycin C in sponges to be distributed widely over there. Please count the sponges while you're putting it in and taking it out. That could be a mess if you leave one of them inside. And uh, timing could be 90 seconds to almost four minutes, depending upon how much antifibrosis you want over there. And uh, once you take it out, you have to really do a good thorough wash so that nothing and please throw the sponges securely in a, 
a specific place which is meant for them. <clears throat> Once the wash is carried out, we uh, pre-place the sutures and uh, normally we uh, I always like to place three pre-placed sutures because most of our patients are quite uh, debilitated and uh, they are one-eyed. The last thing we want is a hypotony over there. And obviously, if you don't have a laser, it is always a good idea to put a, a releasable suture over there. As you can see, uh, some modification of Osher and Cohen's technique uh, in which we first give a corneal bite and then we go ahead and uh, pass the suture. It can be on one edge, both the edges or even at the apex, depending on how we are used to it. Once that thing is done, we create a one into three millimeter or one into two millimeter internal pocket and uh, the scleral corneal pocket. Uh, so if you get a wide uh, bite over there, we do very slow decompression. And uh, then we make a side port always, always make a side port so that you can put in air from there or fluid or whatever you want, you can titrate. So it's a must to make a side port. So that there is no sudden hypotony when you are actually opening up the pocket. And uh, once you cut with the vanas, if the cut is not adequate and you are not sure that the uh, schlems will be exposed, then you can even do a uh, little bite uh, with this. Uh, and then go ahead, do a, with the punch, and then you can go ahead and do a PI. The idea of the PI is that the, the iris around uh, the area should be so that there is no iris blocking the internal block. So that area should be cleared out. And then a four throw loop over here in order to, uh, in the releasable suture. Uh, obviously, you have to check it out because you don't want it to release when you actually don't want it to get released. And once that part is over, you just check, you bury the sutures so they are not protruding and causing an infection or other irritations. Uh, just check that the uh, sites are good. Then we have to close up the conjunctiva with the 80 vicryl, take a strong bite from the sclera and then go on to make two wing sutures. Sometimes that is all that the people uh, put, but you can also, if you want to be 100% secure, you can put two uh, 10-0 sutures, uh, which are kind of a mattress suture so that the entire wound is really nicely closed. <clears throat> Once that part is taken care of, uh, you can give a subconjunct time and I'll move on. And uh, so once uh, this is the releasable suture end, which was left, so just pull it gently and cut it so that the uh, end retracts within the cornea itself. And once that is done, you, a loop is only seen, which you can release later whenever you One want. One minute left. Uh, and uh, this is just to show you that there is another uh, flap that you can do 10 millimeters behind you can go and you can do a limbal based flap and this actually very very secure but uh, to our mind it has become uh, literally obsolete now because hardly anybody is doing too much opening up and too much fibrosis later so these are some of the points that we just wanted to highlight uh, but the main thing uh, is that be careful about the conjunctiva be careful about the flap uh, the PI should cover the entire area uh, of the internal block. Side port is a must. And the post-op follow-up is very, very important. And uh, obviously, uh, avastin we have been using in some of the cases of myopia where you can't use mitomycin C. The most important to go do a perfect trab is prayers. Thank you very much for your kindness. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for the excellent surgical video. Now I would like to invite Professor Anil Mandal, sir, for his talk on congenital glaucoma management. Um, Dr. Anil Mandal, sir, is he there online? I'm uh, putting my slide. Yes, sir. I'm sharing my slide. Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me for this occasion. The title of my talk is A Journey Through the Metamorphosis of Management of Primary Congenital Glaucoma in India, Three Decades of Experience. <clears throat> Primary congenital glaucoma is a surgical disease and surgery should be performed at an early age as possible. 
the question comes, what is the best primary surgical option? With intense pride and humility, I bear witness to the revolutionary changes that have happened over the past three decades. We, in our stay in RP Center, realize that combined trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy is the best surgical treatment for Indian patient population. After that, several new surgical treatments have been added in the armamentarium. And according to the consensus survey, um, now we realize that this combined trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy or CTT is used by only 14% of the experts worldwide. However, in moderate to severe degree of the disease, this is the way to go which is very suitable for Indian patient population and patients of the Middle East countries. Here is a patient, a premature baby, a product of non-consanguineous marriage, but both the parents were having uh, congenital glaucoma and both are blind. Look at the situation, three weeks post-operative appearance of the patient. Compare and contrast the pre-operative and six weeks post-operative appearance of the eyes and you can see the blave appearance. From my experience of 30 years, I would like to give some clinical pearls. A very important complication had happened in this patient. This happened in the first decade of my work in LV Prasad Eye Institute. During trabeculotomy, on right side of the radial incision, there was severe intracameral bleeding. What we did is waited for some time, allowed the blood to clot over the iris surface, and then with irrigation aspiration cannula, we removed the entire clot as a uh, you know, small bead of blood clot. You can see the irrigation aspiration cannula is uh, pulling the clot and dragging it uh, gradually towards the ostium, and then it will be removed entirely as a single blood clot. Fortunately, there was no bleeding after that or re-bleeding was not there. And at the end of the management of complication, you can see as if no complication has happened. And here is the post-operative appearance, uh, six months post-operative, the child is doing very well. Pearl two, some patients of congenital or infantile glaucoma presents with acute corneal hydrops. In such a situation, combined trabeculotomy, trabeculectomy works very well. This is the largest series in the world literature. 31 patients over a period of 23 years were managed at LV Prasad Eye Institute. Sometimes after normalization of intraocular pressure, corneal clarity is not achieved. This requires penetrating keratoplasty or some form of keratoplasty. Here is a patient who underwent simultaneous, uh, sorry, sequential bilateral penetrating keratoplasty, first on the left eye and then on the right eye and the child completed 15 years of follow-up with clear graft. Sometimes in the long run management, patients do require uh, cataract surgery. Here is a, uh, here is a series of patients, uh, 1128 patients of 653 consecutive children were analyzed. This is the largest series in the world literature. Success rate of 75.5% at the end of fifth year decreased to 56% at the end of 10th year. Patients who presented with corneal scar or corneal edema did relatively poorer. Here is a patient who completed 27 years of follow-up, another child, yet another child who completed 30 years of follow-up. The aim of management is not just to control intraocular pressure and uh, restoring corneal clarity, but to improve the visual function so that we can maximize the quality of life of the afflicted children and their parents. We worked on the quality of life of the caregivers of children with congenital glaucoma, and we uh, reported significant change from the pre-operative to six weeks post-operative uh, change. Now, our uh, results showed that children treated for primary congenital glaucoma experienced significantly better visual functioning and vision-related quality of life than those with secondary childhood glaucoma despite comparable visual acuity and intraocular pressure. Our recent report suggested that quality of life and life satisfaction of treated patients with primary congenital glaucoma during their adult life are generally good and appears to be driven by factors other than clinical indices. Educational achievement appears to be linked to better quality of life and life satisfaction 
and clinicians should emphasize the importance and the need for education in the continued care of these patients. This slide shows the educational and the achieve, achievement uh, uh, of education and uh, professional profile. In our series, seven patients are doctors, of which five are postgraduate doctor, five PhD, 13 dentists, and other professions like teacher, engineer, bankers, lawyer, journalist, chartered accountant, and business administration. Now, over a period of 30 years, we developed an integrated management, integrated in child's medical, surgical, and genetic rehab and rehabilitation approach to give holistic care of the children with uh, glaucoma. Compare and contrast at presentation and two months post-operative appearance of the parents' uh, face. The parents are smiling. I had uh, had the opportunity to attend the marriage ceremony of this girl. And here is the child, yet another child, 30 years follow-up. I happened to attend the marriage ceremony. And after three years, they came with the child who is perfectly normal. Holding the child, I have the feeling sharing once again in the wonder of birth, life comes to a full circle. Here is the second uh, child uh, recently born. I am yet to see this child. The uh, whole family is relocated to Canada. Uh, the parents are likely to bring the child in the next month. I have had the pleasure and the opportunity to uh, have mentorship of Professor N.N. N. Sood uh, while I was in ANPI Center. Uh, Having a mentor like Professor Sood is like sharing life's experiences. And uh, wisdom is the reward of experience, and it must be shared. Thank you for your kind listening. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your vast experience on management of pediatric glaucomas with us here today. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Pradeep Vyas, sir, for his talk on managing complications of trabeculectomy. Sound one, Okay. Is it all right? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So, good morning, friends. Uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to be here in this uh, prestigious meeting. And uh, thanks to Dr. Titial and uh, Dr. Anuj. I will take it from where Dr. Harsh was telling that nothing is perfect in traffic electronics. I totally agree with Dr. Harsh that nothing is perfect in trabeculectomy, and that is what I'm going to tell you, the managing the complication of trabeculectomy. Why is it like that? In my experience, I can tell you that almost 50% of the, our patients following the trabeculectomy require some kind of intervention in the first four to six weeks following the surgery. And almost 25% of the patients, they require some kind of intervention on five years follow-up. And we have n number of problems related to trabeculectomy, uh, starting from the uh, high intraocular pressure to very low intraocular pressure, sequelae complications related to low intraocular pressure, infection, and so on and so forth. So in this small talk, I cannot cover each and every complication, but still I would like to cover a few important complications which we do face in our day-to-day -day practice. The first and foremost is the blood failure, which could be early, that is within four to six weeks following the surgery, and early blood failure. Overfilling and leaking death, which is very common over a period of time. And these overfiltering blebs, they do cause hypotony and related sequelae of hypotony. Dysesthesia is the most commonly uh, condition where the patient encountered lots of discomfort following surgery that is because of the related to the blebs and the infectious infections that is a biggest nightmare. So just after the trabeculectomy, uh, when we see the patient after 72 hours or so, many a time we see that the anterior chamber is very deep and the pressure is very high. And you can see over here that the blade is flat. And if you can put the gunioscope very gently with all the precaution, then you can see that the 
block is not adequately open. There is mild fibrous reaction or a mild blood clot over there, and that's why this thing happens. And this is a late blep failure. The blep was successful in this patient, but over a period of time, it is totally scarred, and the patient again had presented to us with a very high entropy. Then, how to manage? So the early blep failure can be comfortably managed uh, in most of the patient just by giving the blep massage. Just at the six o'clock position, you give a gentle massage either with this Johnson cuts or with your fingertip, and you can see that the blep is comfortably elevated. There are many a time when when you cannot elevate the blep and you have put releasable suture. So if you have put the releasable suture and just release the suture and again give the massage and the blade will be elevated. In my practice, I put the releasable suture in almost every rapid electron. If you have not put the releasable suture and uh, you are not able to elevate the blade by doing the massage, then what is the option? You can do the suture analysis with the argon laser. You can see that this suture uh, was cut and you can see that two edges are apart. And then you give a compression and the blade will be elevated. So all these three modalities can be successful only in the early post-operative period. It varies from uh, immediate post-op up to six weeks if you have used the antimetabolites. And if nothing has worked and the blade has started failing like you are, you can see over here that lots of large vessels, some are carcass to vessels. So if you see these kinds of a vessel, then you can anticipate that this is a failing blip, and usually it occurs following the six to eight weeks of surgery. And in this patient, you can give a subconjunctival 5-fluorouracil injection. You have to inject 0.1 ml that contains 5 milligram of 5-fluorouracil. Just give 180 degree away from the blips or about 4 to 6 millimeter away from the blips. And usually 3 to 10 injections are adequate. Uh, Two injections per week, and usually the blep, blep is formed and the pressure comes under control. What happens if you are not able to control the pressure in spite of all these procedures? So that means that there is a significant scarring over the blep, and then you can do this needling procedure. You should not do it in the OPD. Take the patient in the operation theater, go under all SFP precautions, and by needling, you can open the deprostium and you can again uh, establish the aggression of the aqueous from the entry chamber to the subcollectivated space. And in many of the patients, this procedure is successful. Sometimes you have to perform the needling uh, in these kinds of ancestral blep as well. If the needling is not successful, then is, this ancestral blep has to be excised. And if there is a late failure of blep, then what are the options available for you? You just don't have any other option except to repeat the surgery. You can see that here I did two pedicillectomy, both have failed. And then at that time, I put the express wall. And this patient, I have followed up for more than 10 years now. And this is working very well. The patient is under control. But nowadays, if one pedicillectomy fails, then we put the, uh, the wall implant. And these patients, they do very well. The patient remains under control. Now, let us come to the second important complication. And that is the overfilling blip. The overfilling blip we see over a period of time when, uh, particularly in the biop, and their antimetabolites are used. In this patient, the blip is very large cystic with the macrocystic changes around. And these blip are always at the risk of developing infection, the blebitis. The other second problem is that they have a hypotony and the hypotony related sequelae like a maculopathy and uh, the uh, Genesis, decomposition of cornea, so on and so forth. So how to manage this patient? The important uh, and very simple method is that you apply the compression suture and many of these patients would do good uh, by just putting this compression sutures. Otherwise, sometimes, you know, I used to inject the autologous blood uh, intra blep, and uh, in my practice, uh, it has not worked well. Only a couple of patients might have done well but this is one of the methods described the overfiltration blame. But when uh, you have a hypotony related problem, then you don't have any other option except to offer a surgery. And when you dissect the blame, then what you can see that there is a significant necrosis sclera, and you don't have any other option.
except to put either the rotational scleral graft or a scleral page graft. So the surgery is usually successful, but there is a risk of again uh, uh, patients going into the high intraocular pressure. Then now another problem is a deep bleed. A deep bleed you can have in the early post-operative period as well as in the late post-operative period. In the early post-operative period, it's usually because of the inadequate closure of either the deeper talk or the cavity. You can see that here one patient uh, was referred to me uh, almost uh, seven days following the surgery, and he came to me with a flat uh, entry chamber and with a very low intraocular pressure. I took the patient for a repeat surgery, and the deeper uh, the scleral flap was not closed at properly or adequately. And I just uh, redid it and the patient and wonderfully. And you can see over here, there's another patient who has a microcystic changes over here and this was leaking. And you can see that the signal is positive. These kind of patients require a repeat surgery where you have to open and put either the rotational scleral graft or a scleral graft. Sometimes they may do put by putting up the sinoacrylate glue and the large package contact lens. But unfortunately, because it's a leaking tape, so the glue does not stay and you are always in trouble and you have to do the surgery. Dysesthesia is nothing but the symptoms and this is because of the decreased tear film backup time. And these patients uh, who complain of lots of foreign sensation, watering, burning, you just treat them with the lubricating eye drop and that is because of the large uh, cystic tear. The last but not the least is the plebitis, the plebitis infection. You can see over here and uh, it's a rare but yes, a very dreadful complication and we divide into three grades. In the grade one, only the baby is involved and if only the baby is involved, then with a frequent topical antibiotic, you can treat it. But in grade two, when even the entry chamber is involved, then you have to give the intracameral antibiotics. And in grade three, when even the vitreous uh, is involved, then you have to take the help of the uh, vitreous colleagues and the patient has to undergo a vitrectomy. So all these patients usually end up with a bad failure. And then again, uh, you have to do another procedure to control the intraocular pressure in these patients. So these all are the important uh, uh, post-op complications which we face following the trabeculectomy, but there are n number which obviously cannot be covered in eight minutes talk. So early failure is very, very common and you can treat this by giving the ocular massage or suture analysis or re removing the releasable suture. And if it does not work, then inject the five fluoride cell. And if that also does not work, then do the needling of the pair. And then if that also does not work, then you don't have any other option except to do the repeat surgery. Overfiltration blip had to be very judiciously used in mitomycin C. If you use it judiciously mitomycin C, then this overfiltration blip you can avoid comfortably. And if you do a good suturing, while what Dr. Harsh was explaining during the surgery, then the blip leak uh, can be comfortably avoided and it prevents the early hypotony of the patients. Rebitis is a dreadful complication. If you have a, a macrocystic changes or a very thin cystic blame, then this do, do occur. And uh, otherwise, if the patient has a cystitis, then also it's very common. So we have to be very, very careful uh, to take care of all these things. And it, that includes the, uh, the uh, good hygiene of the lid. Uh, you should make sure that the patient should not have any medioblin gland dysfunction, so on and so forth. Thank you very much for your patient sharing and thanks our presenter for having given me this opportunity. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful presentation. Now I would like to invite Professor Vinay Gupta, sir, for his talk on current concepts in juvenile open angle glaucoma. Thank you, Shika. Um, so basically, uh, I'm going to touch upon this topic primarily because um, it is not very much discussed in spite of the fact that it's a very important problem in our part of the world. So why are we talking about it? As I said, juvenile open angle glaucoma is not so uncommon in our part of the world. We get to see at least about three to four patients for every hundred patients that we see in our clinics. Unfortunately, because it is not so common in our part of the world, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we have not much literature on this particular disease. The long-term management of, of, of juvenile open angle glaucoma uh, is important in terms of the fact that these are young uh, people 
who have a lot of um, social um, um, implications to the to their um, disease, primarily because this person could be the father of someone, could be the brother, could be the husband or wife of someone, or could be the son uh, or daughter of someone. So they have a lot of uh, social obligations in the society. Uh, they are young, and so uh, treatment or management of these becomes cost intensive, and the economic burden of blindness is huge. Finally, the genetics of, of, of all glaucomas um, primarily arose from this subgroup of um, uh, glaucomas because it was considered to be a strict phenotype. So uh, we do see at least about three to four um, um, cases, as I said, for every 100 glaucoma patients. But given our population where almost 50% uh, uh, of our population is less than 40 years, this is a, a huge number. And what is known from literature is that it is autosomal dominant, it has high intraocular pressure with deep, steep cupping, which leads to a generalized visual field loss. Beyond that, not much is known. We, what we see on gonioscopy in these patients is either uh, prominence of iris processes or gonioscopic abnormalities in the form of high iris insertion. Sometimes there's just a featureless angle, which is um, 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 so, um, which gives the appearance of, of compact trabecular meshwork. And uh, so thick is, is it sometimes that it almost looks like a membrane, which Barkins had described for congenital glaucomas. And then, of course, there could be a combination of findings of, of abnormal iris processes with, with a featureless angle. But majority of these patients uh, still do have normal angles. So I'm going to talk about um, uh, something interesting that we found because we were analyzing almost like 400 such patients over a period of 15 years. And uh, what is given in literature uh, regarding this disease is that uh, it happens only in patients less than 40 years. So it has not been properly phenotyped. And unfortunately, all of the patients are not the same. You can see this, the, the iris uh, morphology in this particular patient, and you compare this, this iris morphology from another patient of juvenile open angle glaucoma, and you see the differences in the iris morphology in the two groups. And then you see another um, kind of, 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 of iris. So what we did was we did um, uh, cluster analysis, which is a form of artificial intelligence, where we put up put in all of these um, gonioscopic and, and um, uh, iris photographs of, of more than 350 patients. And we classified these patients depending upon their phenotype. And what was very interesting is that we found there were different uh, permutations and combinations of these um, uh, features of the iris and the angle. We found four subgroups which were quite distinct. The, there was one group where the iris features were normal, the iris, um, the, the angle was normal, and this was uh, a group where uh, the intraocular pressures were not so high and generally they presented much later compared to uh, the other uh, group of juvenile open angle glaucoma patients. <clears throat> there was another group where the iris pattern was normal, yet the angle was featureless and they had one of the earliest presentations. So this was a very immature angle and hence they presented with intraocular pressures which are much higher. There was one group where the iris pa pattern was normal, but there was a uh, very high iris insertion. Again, they had very high in, um, intraocular pressures. And this group, which had, uh, which had an iris morphology, which, was, which had prominent crypts of the iris, and it was invariably associated with a high iris insertion, they presented the, one of the, uh, in the earliest periods and with the highest intraocular pressures, Probably this resembles subtle forms of Agrenfeld rigors. Of course, we have not genotyped all of these patients, but we are in the process of doing so. <clears throat> so when you see this, uh, this, this phenotype of juvenile open angle glaucoma, you need to distinguish it from, from glaucomas that happen in this age group, which is primarily pigment dispersion syndromes, steroid induced glaucomas, congenital glaucomas, which are presenting late, there could be patients who come with trauma, but th this is generally unilateral. You can have a post schlossman syndrome, which would be missed as a juvenile open angle glaucoma. You could have angle closure glaucomas also, but then you must know that angle closure has a convex configuration of the iris, unlike a regular configuration that is seen in um, the open angles of in the juvenile age group. There could be subtle forms of axenfeld rigors, and there could be um, large cupping, which could have been secondary to a premature birth in some of these, which could be missed. And of course, there is a subgroup of normal tension open angle glaucomas also where the pressure remains normal all throughout, yet they have glaucomatous uh, cupping. As far as management of this disease is concerned, uh, medical therapy remains uh, the first line and can be successful in almost two thirds of these patients. 
Um, laser trabeculoplasty was controversial. I'm, I'm going to talk about it a little later. As far as surgical options are concerned, um, trabeculectomy still is the best option. There are a lot of other options which are non-penetrating, including the MIGS, which has been tried in juvenile open angle glaucomas, but they do not bring down the intraocular pressures to such low levels as does trabeculectomy, which is needed in these patients. The question uh, regarding the trabeculoplasty, uh, trabeculoplasty has been done in, our, in some of our patients and it did work in, in, in a small uh, group of patients, uh, especially those who had uh, uh, a normal open angle um, on, on gonioscopy. We also looked at the ASOCT features to see if they could be predictive of the um, response to, uh, to, to SLT and what we found was that Patients who have some, some form of risk genesis of the angle on ASOCT do, do not generally respond as well as uh, those with open angles and with a prominent Schlem's canal, which means that the anomalies of the angles are very subtle in these patients. As far as trabeculectomy is concerned, the question remains whether to use mitomycin or not, because this is something which remains controversial, primarily because these patients have a long life to live, and you are concerned about the complications of the use of mitomycin. So if you're doing a trabeculectomy in a young patient, and it's a primary surgery, then you have to consider um, whether to use mitomycin or not. And this study of ours showed that mitomycin does bring down the intraocular pressures much lower than, than what, is, uh, what, is, uh, uh, what we do without mitomycin. However, there is, a, there is a high incidence of hypertonic maculopathy associated with these eyes. Long-term structural and functional uh, uh, um, outcomes were also studied, um, and we found that almost 10% uh, do show some amount of progression despite treatment and sometimes require multiple surgeries. As far as rates of progression are concerned in these patients, we found that juvenile open-angle glaucoma actually behaves better than the adult forms of uh, POAG and PACG, primarily because there is some amount of reversal of the cupping and sometimes even improvement of the visual fields. So this is a long-term study where um, the three subgroups of primary glaucomas were studied for progression rates. So to summarize, I would like to say that there are certain common and uncommon features, even among the so um, considered a uh, strict phenotype of juvenile open angle glaucoma that we need to study. Uh, we need a genotype phenotype based classification in this, which means that it have to be more genetic studies to find out um, genes which are yet unknown uh, in this subgroup of, of, of patients. And finally, uh, we still need to know what are the best long-term therapies, especially with the newer, um, uh, newer uh, uh, available mixed devices, um, whether they would be better than uh, the traditional trabeculectomy. Thank you. There are a lot of people who have helped me during this work of 15, 20 years. Thanks. Thank you so much, sir. Now I would like to invite Dr. Rajiv Kurt, sir, for uh, sharing his tips for the young generation today or any experience, sir, that you want to share with us. Yeah. Uh, good uh, morning to all and thanks RPC and the whole team for inviting me. Uh, for this session. And as you know, we are going to the glaucoma week and, uh, and all of us have realized it's how much neglected our glaucoma patients if we take in total. So I think our young colleagues uh, need to, uh, you know, stress on detecting glaucoma at an early stage, which we know that it is a silent thief of eyesight. And I think one of the, most of the sessions in the today's uh, session we have been giving the very simple tips which should uh, go a long way in correcting the concepts of glaucoma. In uh, the present scenario, we have the stalwarts uh, who gave their experience of the last 35 years. And uh, so the glaucoma, uh, whether it's open angle, congenital, juvenile, or uh, the secondary glaucomas and the angle closure, we had a very good experience uh, you know, sharing on this platform. And uh, I would wish that uh, our national program, which is uh, doing very well in cataract, but not so well in glaucoma. Uh, we have seen in the DGHS also that uh, now more and more diagnostic and, uh, and, you know, facilities are available, telemedicine is available, and particularly the experience from, uh, you know, Madurai, it has been uh, really an eye-opening session. So thank you so much. And thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Ma'am, 
a small tip from you also. We have been mentored by you, just for the sake of the audience. Thank you, Dr. Shikha. And I'd like to thank Dr. Tithyal and uh, all the glaucoma team for including me in this session. I, I think the first is a request to Dr. Garg to say, please rejuvenate the National Task Force in glaucoma. Let us sort of do a little bit more for glaucoma on the national front. Um, beyond that, I think the talks were so interesting. And I have a question for Dr. Deepta. Um, it's so nice to see you, Deepta. And uh, it's really nice to see you. Yeah. Uh, basically, you said that patients see the or the areas that they don't see, they describe it as a blur. But actually, a lot of patients will tell you they see nothing. Yeah. So there seems so, to be a mismatch as far as that is concerned. So when they so when they think they see nothing. So for example, if you have the big poster there and we told them to fixate at a point and they'd move and they say, oh, I cannot see the ball and now I can see it depending on how they move. So because they have no comparison, if they have a comparison of what they're missing, they realize what they're missing. So that's why they started crying when they got the results because they had no idea what they're missing. And that's exactly what happens. People don't realize they've lost vision, which is why, you know, they present so late to us. Possibly also, you know, it, it is a question of, you know, the relative defect versus the absolute defect. Absolutely. So I think maybe more sort of dense defect or more severe glaucomas would show us something different. Absolutely. And in our study, 20 decibels, which would show up as faint gray in certain central areas, showed up as completely normal. So anything less than 10 decibels, the dark black, those did show up as, so it is a degree of defect and size of defect. If the object's completely within the scotoma, it disappears. If it's partly in and out, the brain seems to, you know, just complete it. So it's seen as normal. So. Okay, and the other thing I'd like to say is that it was really wonderful to see the long-term follow-up. I think Dr. Vinay yeah. presented the long-term follow-up. The um, Dr. Mandel presented the long-term follow-up. And I think what we don't realize, we, we are so cataract centric, that we are happy to say that in three months, you know, it's done wonderfully well. We forget that glaucoma actually is a lifelong disease. So long follow-ups in, in all our sort of uh, glaucomas, all the treatments we do, I think we can only request all the youngsters to please pursue this and tell us at the end, you know, which one is a good thing to do and which one actually benefits the patients because ultimately it's the patients that actually matter. Absolutely, ma'am. Now I would request Dr. Devang to please deliver the vote of thanks and conclude the session. I would like to thank all our speakers for the enlightening talk, all our esteemed panelists, especially Professor Rajiv Garg, sir, Professor Aminjit uh, Simota, madam, and Dr. Hash Kumar for their presence, and all our wonderful and energetic attendees, I would also like to tell all our attendees to hold on with us for the next session of orations. Thank you. Wonderful session by our esteemed speakers and very well moderated by our moderator. I would like to thank our chairpersons for sparing their time for this session. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be starting off with the oration in a couple of minutes from now. Next, next session, over oh, exchange away. Huh. Thank you. 
I would request all our online audience to please be with us. We'll be starting off with the oration at Hall A in a couple of minutes from now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start the RP Center oration session. May I request Chief RP Center, Professor Jeevan S. Tityal, Dr. Radhika Tandon, Dr. Sudarshan Khokhar, Dr. Mandi Pajaj, Dr. Rajpal, to please join us on the dais. Sir, we are the Our first uh, oration is the RP Center International Oration. And this year it's awarded to a very prominent international glaucoma faculty, Professor Tin Ong from Singapore. It's a proud privilege to introduce Professor Tin Ong, who is a graduate from the National University of Singapore. He was also awarded the fellowships of the Royal College of Surgeons, Josh. Edinburgh, Edinburgh, and the Royal College of Ophthalmologists in 1997. He completed his glaucoma fellowship in the Sing Singapore National Eye Center, and then went on to become the medical director of the Singapore National Eye Center. He also works at the Duke AUS Medical School and has research interest in angle closure and glaucoma genetics. And in fact, he has set up multinational international consortia that have identified novel genes associated with primary angle closure and open angle glaucoma, as well as exfoliation syndrome. He has over 650 publications to his credit and is a recipient of numerous awards, including the Singapore Transitional Research Award, the Singapore National Medical Research Council Initial Scientist Award, the President Science Award, the Nakajima and DeCampo Awards by the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology, the Alcon Research Institute Award, and the Robert Rich Award for Excellence and Innovation in Glaucoma and Glaucoma Foundation. So it's a proud privilege to have Professor Ong Tin with us and he'll be delivering the RP Center International Oration. Can you please have the video? Thank 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would first like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me to give this talk. My title of my talk is Precision Medicine in Glaucoma, Lessons from Pseudo-Exfoliation. My name is Tin Ang and I'm from Singapore. I have no relevant disclosures. As I said, I come from Singapore and currently I'm the medical director of the Singapore National Eye Center. And I'm also the chairman of the board of the Singapore Eye Research Institute and I hosted an appointment of professor at the National University of Singapore. I'm a clinician scientist with interest in glaucoma, particularly anchorological glaucoma and molecular genetics of glaucoma. Here are some pictures of the SNEC. We're the main eye hospital in Singapore. We see more than 350,000 patients a year, about 60% of the patient load for ophthalmology nationally. And SERI is in a, cross, in a building across the road. There's more than 225 staff with more than 50 PhD scientists and 25 MD PhDs. The topic of my talk is on precision medicine. What is the meaning of this phrase? Well, it's basically using information about a person's genes or proteins to prevent, diagnose, or treat disease. And in overall, to provide a more individually tailored management that works best for that particular patient. A very famous example of precision medicine is the BRCA1 mutation for breast cancer and, and other uh, ovarian cancers. And this was very famous because of Angelina Jolie. She is a carrier of BRCA1 mutation. And if you carry that mutation, you have almost 90% risk for getting breast cancer and 50% risk for ovarian cancer. And Angelina Jolie, as you know, a very famous Hollywood star, underwent prophylactic uh, bilateral mastectomy just to prevent the risk of getting breast cancer because of the strong family history of breast cancer in her mother and her sisters. So this is a very famous example of precision medicine. What about precision medicine in glaucoma? Before we mention uh, the delve into this topic, we need to talk a little bit about glaucoma genetics. So in glaucoma genetics, there are actually different forms of glaucoma, which are either inherited in a familiar fashion, as an example you can see in this uh, pedigree, where it's a Mendelian inheritance and it's a single gene disorder. And this is the famous example is that of myosilin, which is responsible for about 5% of primary open angle glaucoma cases worldwide. And this contrasts to most adult onset disease uh, glaucoma, in which the genetic risk is not as strong as a Mendelian disorder. So Mendelian disorders have very strong genetic risk and they usually typically occur early onset. And for adult uh, onset glaucoma, most of them are susceptibility genes. So that means they are not directly causation, but they are contribute to susceptibility of developing the disease. Myosilin, as I mentioned, was the first gene ever discovered for glaucoma. And this was found in the family, shown in the picture, by Ed Stone's group in Iowa. And this gene was found to be uh, inherited in an awesome dominant fashion in this family. Since then, many studies have found uh, different uh, genotype-phenotype correlations. For example, these mutations listed here, if you carry these myosilin mutations, you get a very severe form of glaucoma with early age of onset, high IOP, and resistance to medical treatment. This is an example of a rapidly progressive glaucoma. And if you get this other mutation in the myosilin gene, you get a very less virulent form of disease with very slow progression. So certainly for pretty familiar glaucoma with myosilin mutations, you can develop so-called precision medicine approaches to certain patients with these mutations. As I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of glaucoma cases are actually complex and not inherited in a Mendelian fashion. And to find genes for such complex glaucoma, we used to do something called genome-wide association studies or GWAS. And in this approach, you are running markers called polymorphisms across the entire genome in a case control approach to find genetic risk factors. And these are typically with odds ratios typically below 2.0. And this is a case control approach. 
So we move into angle closure glaucoma, our group in, in collaboration with multiple other groups in the world, including those in Malaysia. We did two angle closure GWAS and found there are about different, eight different genetic loci for angle closure glaucoma. So these are risk genetic uh, loci, which means if you carry these changes, you have between 20 to 30% higher risk of developing the disease, or an odds ratio of 1.2 to 1.3. Now, these angle closure glaucoma genes, are, we don't know exactly how it's involved in the disease. We don't know whether they are involved in developing the angle narrowing, or are they involved in developing risk for glaucoma? So we did a study a couple of years ago when we looked at these angle closure glaucoma genes to see if they were associated with narrow angles or PACS. And we found very interesting results. Two of the eight angle closure genes were also associated with PACS, which means that they are probably related to the narrow angle configuration. But there were other angle closure genes which were not associated with PACS, but they're associated with angle closure glaucoma. So it raises the question of whether these genes are involved in progression or perhaps in development of the glaucoma aspect in angle closure glaucoma. And one of the eight genetic loci, EPDR1, was also found to be associated with more severe disease. This was a study we published in 2020, in which we think it's a biomarker of angle closure severity. We move on now to uh, exfoliation or pseudo exfoliation. And this is a very fairly common disorder first described by Lindbergh, in which he found grayish flakes on the lens and pupillary margin. We know exfoliation syndrome is a major cause of visual loss and a major cause of blindness as well. And we, as cataract surgeons, we fear finding patients with exfoliation on the table because there's a greater risk of cataract complications, particularly zonal instability and poor pupil dilation and it's blinding disease because of the development of glaucoma. People with exfoliation syndrome have higher risk of developing glaucoma. At least 30 to 50% of them do develop glaucoma. And if you look at the genetics of exfoliation syndrome, we've been involved in several uh, different studies, but not in the first one, 2007, where they found the first gene for exfoliation syndrome called LOXL1. And this was found by a group in Iceland and basically, LOXL1 is an enzyme involved in cross thinking of elastin and collagen, and it's involved in the formation of TM uh, fibers and stabilization. So it makes sense, and because it's involved in, as a connective tissue disorder. And LOXL1 is a very strong risk factor for exfoliation syndrome, one of the strongest genetic effects for any complex disease, but there's no clear link with phenotype. And since then, we've been involved in several studies looking for exfoliation syndrome risk, genetic risk factors. In 2015, we published one. We found a gene called CACNA1, which is the calcium transporter gene. And in 2017, we, we led a global consortium of 36 different countries and found five different genetic loci for exfoliation syndrome. But none of them are really related to phenotype as yet. And the latest findings, which we found only in the last year or so, was using an approach called whole exome sequencing, in which you do, you sequence the entire coding region of the genome or the exons, and looking for rare mutations of high penetrance and high risk that are missed by GWAS. And the coding sequence of the genome actually is only about 1% of the entire genome. And using a whole exome sequencing approach, you're able to just sequence those coding areas to look for protein changing mutations. And this is what we did in 2021. We did a very large whole exome sequencing study of more than 10,000 cases of exfoliation syndrome from Japan, Singapore, and other countries with multiple replications. And we found mutations in a gene called CYP39A1 to be very strongly associated with exfoliation syndrome. And CYP39A1 is a gene involved in cholesterol metabolism. It, it's the environment. Uh, um, mediating the change from hydroxy cholesterol to dihydroxy cholesterol. And this is a very interesting finding because we never thought that cholesterol metabolism is involved in exfoliation syndrome. And this gene was also found to be in the liver, in the choroid, the body, the lens, iris, and the optic nerve. And particularly, it was very strongly uh, found in the epithelial layer of the cellular body, the pigmented epithelium, as well as the vascular endothelium in the iris and the retinal pigment epithelium. So, 
these are all areas which is involved in exfoliation syndrome. And in fact, when we looked harder, we actually found that patients with exfoliation syndrome have significant stains for estrified cholesterol at the basement membrane of the pigment ciliary epithelium, something that not found before. And that's because nobody looked at it, nobody looked for cholesterol in the eye. And here you can see the direct role. It's found that the people with CYP39A1 expression is found to be lower in tissues with of patients with exfoliative exfoliation syndrome compared to those without uh, exfoliation syndrome. And what about the phenotype of such patients? Well, we recently looked at the phenotype of the most common septillion mutation, which is the G204 mutation found in almost 1% of Japanese patients with exfoliation syndrome. And this is a retrospective case control study. We studied 35 Japanese patients carrying this G204E mutation in septillion A1 compared to 150 patients with exposed syndrome of Jap Japanese patients without any mutation. And these patients were followed up, had a follow-up uh, time, uh, which was comparable. In fact, it was longer in those patients with septillion mutation compared to those who are normal. And what we found was very interesting. Well, let's look first at the demographics. You can see here that there were similar number of patients, uh, males and females, and similar age of diagnosis as well as history of hypertension and hypercholesterolemia. But if we looked at the phenotype of these patients of exposure syndrome with this mutation, we found, for example, that patients with the mutation had five times greater risk of developing exposure glaucoma, seven times greater risk of developing blindness, and also a much higher rate of glaucoma-related blindness, higher need for glaucoma surgery, higher peak IOP, as well as greater disc cupping in those patients with the mutation compared to those without the mutation. We also looked at just comparing exfoliation glaucoma patients, those with the mutation versus those without the mutation. And even more surprising, within exfoliation glaucoma, those with the, with the D04 mutation had higher risk of blindness, as well as higher need for surgery and higher peak IOP. So even within the glaucoma group, we found greater severity in patients with this mutation. So this is the first study showing a link between rare genetic coding sequence variants and severity of glaucoma. And it's very interesting because we found that these patients, this mutation had a much greater risk for glaucoma, blindness, a more aggressive disease needing lower target IOP and more frequent monitoring. So this is an example of precision medicine because if you have such a patient, you need to treat them more aggressively, monitor them more closely. And this mutation is fairly common in a way, in the sense it was found in about 1% of all Japanese people with exfoliation syndrome. So we wonder whether in Japan now, they should, everybody with exfoliation syndrome who's detected should be screened for this mutation. And if they have this mutation, they need to be treated more aggressively and certainly monitored more aggressively. But probably there's no benefit of nationwide screening of these patients uh, just for population-wide screening because it's not that common in the whole overall population. But certainly it will be beneficial in Japanese patients with exfoliation syndrome. So of course, this was a study, it was a retrospective study, and we looked at patients uh, retrospectively. So there could be some heterogeneity in terms of patient data collection as well as management protocols. We didn't have OCT or compliance data. And this is only one of the several CYP39A1 mutations that we found. So we only looked at this one mutation because it was the most common. And these were of course only Japanese patients. And this very interesting paper is actually coming out in ophthalmology, actually I think this month or next month issue. So in summary, I've described to you a very interesting finding on exfoliation syndrome genetics. So we found firstly an association of CYP39A1 and cholesterol gene, this is the latest finding, involved exfoliation syndrome. And those who carry this particular g 2 e mutation had much higher risk for exfoliation glaucoma, higher risk for glaucoma-related blindness, and a greater risk for surgical intervention. And certainly they have a very severe phenotype, 
which needs more careful monitoring and probably poor aggressive treatment. And this example, as I said earlier, of precision medicine in glaucoma. I'd like to acknowledge here some of the sources of funding that we've, we've had over the years for this, all these studies. Particular acknowledgement to Dr. C.C. Kaur, who is our geneticist leading this group, and Dr. Minio Ozaki, who is our Japanese colleague who set up the Japanese Exfoliation Syndrome Consortium, and Dr. Wang Sinchun, who helped identify all these rare variants, and Dr. Katharina Bell, who did the study looking at the phenotype of these patients. And these are the Exfoliation Syndrome Consortium from Japan. We have all these uh, centers and collaborators listed here. And we had lots of fun over the years. Of course, with COVID, we haven't met up for many years, but you can see here all our social activities, having fun in discovering all these new findings in exfoliation syndrome. I'd also like to acknowledge all the other exfoliation syndrome international collaborating network. You can see here all the countries involved. It's been really a great pleasure working with everyone and developing all these friendships and collaboration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dane. That was really a wonderful lecture of how we can convert basic sciences into clinical application. I would now request Professor Jivanes Titialchi of RP Center to present the RP Center International Oration Award to Professor Tenong. Then we'll be sending you a courier. We'll courier this award to you. It's a very nice plaque and a citation for you. But right Thank now, you. we'll hand it over virtually. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pity that I couldn't come to Delhi to see all of you and to receive it in person. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I now invite Professor Namata Sharma to introduce the next oration awardee. Thank you, Tin. Thank you so much. The next oration is the Professor L.P. Agarwal oration. Can I have the slides? Professor Lalit Prakash Agarwal was the founder chief of Dr. Rajendra Prasad Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He served as Dean 1977-79 and Director 1979-84 of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He was appointed the first honorary ophthalmic advisor to Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Government of India in 1975. His advocacy, guidance and vision made India the first country in the world to start a national program for prevention of visual impairment and control of blindness in 1976. A prolific scientific writer and world-renowned clini clinical scientist with over 350 research papers and several books to his name. We are going to have this Professor L.P. Agarwal oration and the recipient of this award is none other than Professor Rajwardhan Azad, former chief of RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi and Chairman of the University Service Commission, Government of Bihar, India. He passed out his MBBS from PW Medical College, Patna, and subsequently did his post-graduation from RP Center. He joined RP Center as Assistant Professor in 1980. He was appointed as a Chief of RP Center in 2011. He has been instrumental in establishing retinopathy of prematurity unit in RP Center and trained several ophthalmologists in ROP management not only in our country, but all over the world. He has, to his credit, more than 40 prestigious awards, fellowships and orations, including the D.O. Campo Oration by the Asia-Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology and Dr. B.C. Roy National Award for Best Medical Teacher in India. Currently, he's the chairman of the Task Force on ROP of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, and chairman of Ophthalmic Education Committee of Asia-Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. He has also been the past president of Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology and All India Ophthalmological Society. He's been a principal investigator and co-investigator in more than 25 clinical trials in the field of age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and retinopathy of prematurity. To his credit, he has 12 books 
over 200 research papers in peer reviewed journals and more than 60 chapters in books to his credit and i think above all he's teacher of teachers and mentor of mentors it's truly an honor to uh, welcome uh, professor rajwardhan azad and to invite him to give this oration Yeah. It's truly an honor to be here, and uh, I have a mixed feeling. And by mixed feeling, I mean that uh, I was in RP Center for forty years, so many of the nostalgic moments and uh, so many other uh, events. are there and the second thing is that i am delivering professor lp agarwal oration and professor lalit prakash agarwal ji was a, uh, i'll just show a video before that uh, i want to say that i had the honor of being his house surgeon and then as a resident and then as a colleague or a faculty member so and more than that he was a uh, very close to our family he was a good friend of my father and he was the person who pushed me into ophthalmology i was going to join the medicine because i like the medicine but all the time he'll come to my house and say you join ophthalmology there is nothing in medicine ophthalmology has got medicine ophthalmology has got surgery and everything so the fate brought me here and the rest is a history bharat ka chikitsa vigyan aaj jo tarakki ke buland sapne dekh raha hai usko punj dene walon mein ek pramukh naam hai professor lalit prakash agrawal जिनके नाम में ही प्रकाश है संयोग देखिए प्रकाश के धनी प्रोफेसर अग्रवाल की जन्म तिथि वही है जो महान स्वतंत्रता सेनानी नेताजी सुभाष चंद्र बोस की है तेजस्वी ललित अपने बड़े भाई प्रेम प्रकाश अग्रवाल आईसीएस की तरह गणित पढ़ना चाहते थे मैथ्स में भी वो अच्छे थे मगर क्योंकि उन्होंने हम हम बड़े थे तो उन्होंने देखा कि हमारा मैथ्स में बहुत अच्छा है तो कहने हम मैथ्स में ही करेंगे तो हमने कहा ना बेटा इसमें हम तो भैया इसमें हमको तो कोई ज्यादा आगे ओपनिंग्स नहीं दिखाई देती हमने तो कर लिया है तुम मत करो तो हमने उनको प्रसोड किया कि तुम मेडिकल लाइन में चले जाओ कुशाग्र बुद्धि और परिश्रमी स्वभाव से किंग जॉर्ज मेडिकल कॉलेज में उन्हें प्रवेश मिल गया एम पूरी करने के बाद डॉक्टर अग्रवाल उच्च शिक्षा के लिए लंदन चले गए ब्रिटेन में शिक्षा लेते वक्त उनके गुरुजन भी उनसे प्रभावित हुए बिना नहीं रह सके सैतीस वर्ष की आयु में ही एम्स के प्रोफेसर के रूप में चुने गए इस सपने के पीछे एक दर्द छुपा था जो उन्हें लंदन में पढ़ाई के वक्त मिला था उन्हें पूजनीय मानने वाले डॉक्टर अग्रवाल के उसी दर्द को बताते हैं प्रोफेसर गुरु ब्रह्मा गुरु विष्णु गुरु देवो महेश्वरा गुरु साक्षात पर ब्रह्म तस्मय श्री गुरुवे नमः मैं डॉक्टर पी के खोसला डॉक्टर एल पी अग्रवाल जो हमारे गुरु थे उनके लिए प्रणाम करता हूँ वहाँ कुछ ऐसी बात हुई कि लोगों ने कहा कि आप लोग यहाँ आते हो और वहाँ आपके यहाँ इंडिया में कोई फैसिलिटीज नहीं है तो डॉक्टर साहब हमें बताते थे कि हमने उनको कहा 
कि मैं इंडिया में ऐसा इंस्टीट्यूशन क्रिएट करूंगा जहां के तुम लोग आओगे और काम करोगे उस वक्त तक प्रोफेसर अग्रवाल के साथ कई उपलब्धियां जुड़ चुकी जैसे प्रोफेसर अग्रवाल के एम्स परिसर में ही देश को आत्मनिर्भर बनने वाले डॉक्टर राजेंद्र प्रसाद नेत्र विज्ञान संस्थान की स्थापना प्रोफेसर अग्रवाल के आर्मी सेंटर बनाने के पीछे एक सोच थी सब स्पेशलिटीज जो है आई की उनको डेवलप करें ताकि पोस्ट ग्रेजुएशन में हमें बाहर विदेशों में कैंडिडेट्स को डॉक्टर्स को ना भेजना पड़े प्रोफेसर एल पी अग्रवाल इज अमॉन्ग ऑफ ग्लोबल ऑप्थलमोलॉजी एंड इन इंडियन ऑप्थलमोलॉजी इज रिकॉर्ड इज आंसर फैस्ट प्रोफेसर अग्रवाल is a superb was a superb clinician an outstanding teacher jo hui unhone wo center to banaya uski dekha dekhi hum logo ne center banaya wahan pe to jaise neuroscience aur cardiothoracic center bane wo jab humne dekha ki baksha mein aisa banaya hai aur ye possible hai is desh mein aisa karna तो ये जो बाद में सेंटर बने वो एक तरह से मॉडल्ड ऑन द सेंटर दैट ही क्रिएटेड वे भारत सरकार के पहले ऑनरेरी ऑफिक एडवाइजर बने डॉक्टर अग्रवाल को कई प्रतिष्ठित राष्ट्रीय और अंतर्राष्ट्रीय सम्मान मिले विश्व के सबसे प्रतिष्ठित केवल 60 सर्वोच्च नेत्र वैज्ञानिकों की संस्था ऑफेलमिक इंटरनेशनल के भारत के पहले और एक मात्र सदस्य थे विश्व स्वास्थ्य संगठन के सहयोग से प्रोफेसर अग्रवाल ने एशिया और अफ्रीका में अंधेपन को रोकने के लिए कार्य योजना बनाई देश विदेश के वरिष्ठ डॉक्टर उन्हें भारत में ऑप्थेमोलॉजी को नई ऊंचाई तक ले जाने का श्रेय देते हैं प्रोफेसर अग्रवाल सच्चे कर्मयोगी थे ऐसे प्रेरणाविद को शत शत नमन प्रोफेसर एल पी अग्रवाल वॉज अ फेनोमेना इन इंडियन ऑफ्थलमोलॉजी इंडियन ऑफ्थलमोलॉजी कैन बी डिवाइडेड इन टू प्री अग्रवाल एरा एंड पोस्ट अग्रवाल एरा इफ वी कॉल हिम फादर ऑफ ट्रांसफॉर्मेशनल ऑफ्थलमोलॉजी इट वन बी एन एग्जेशन ई सॉ द फ्यूचर which very few person could see at that time when no one envisioned rp center is true example of his vision and uh, all that we have today is attributed to his dream that he saw five decades ago concept of sub specialty in ophthalmology national program for control of blindness highly academic teaching program that still continuing in rp center basic science department under one roof our testimony of his commitment to science and ophthalmology in particular i am very small in front of him but do deserve a place since i was his resident and then i also work as his colleague to place my record of ode to this great man of indian ophthalmology my salute to you sir and wish wherever you are you will be at the feet of the god thank you will you all stand and uh, just pay our respect to the founder of rp center thank you very much now coming on to my lecture uh, these are just important landmarks my landmarks uh, and the landmark of uh, a person who has been in rp center for 40 years joined rp center in 1974 the first day i came to rp center i still remember 
my younger brother who was in Hindu college, he dropped me at the gate of RP center exactly at eight o'clock. And I went to Professor L.P. Agarwal's room, which, which is now the medical superintendent's room. And there I went, Mr. Vasudeva was his PA. And I said, I am so and so. Then he said that uh, the Professor Agarwal is very busy and you have, do you, did you have an appointment? I said, no, I didn't have an appointment, but he, he, he has uh, asked me to come. And then when he mentioned him that uh, such and such person is waiting outside, he called me inside and said, Aap aage hain? Humne ka, yes, sir. So he said, Aap 20 number cover me jaye, or jakar ke waha kam suru kar dijiye. Or ek baat dhyan me rakhiye, ki RP center jo hai, wo teen saal ka regress imprisonment hai. These are three years RI. So you, you have to understand this, or jaye or kam kijiye. That was the day, and in 2014, when I left, took voluntary retirement, so it was a, uh, Bhavna was asking me, sir, what is the, you know, the, the secret of your, uh, you know, uh, physical, this thing, you know, your uh, 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 evergreen uh, personality. I said, the secret is, karmane vadika raste ma phale Not a single day I have said. Even now, at the age of 70 plus, I am working, you know, from 8 o'clock until 7 o'clock in the evening. So if you keep yourself busy, you will be healthy. So this is just a summary of my journey in RP Center. And later I'll talk about the, my test with retinopathy of prematurity. Of course, the time is very short. I, was, I have been pleading to Professor Titial that gave me some more time. Hope, hope I get it. So 90 to 94, we, you know, it was a, a day, it was the time when we, I was baptized into retinal surgery in 1977. And that time, uh, Ramanjit was my senior resident for one year, and then she left to London for uh, doing FRCS. And from 90 to 94, we had transitioned from Victor Retina to, I had transitioned from Victor Retina to Retinopathy of Prematurity, published several book, one book on retinopathy. I think Harsh is not here. Harsh was with me. And 1994 to 98, I worked, I worked in Kuwait as a VR surgeon. They invited me to set up the department there. And they didn't tell me that you have to do some work for retinopathy or prematurity, but because I was free, and as I told you, the timings were in, you know, Middle East is from seven o'clock in the morning until two o'clock. After two o'clock, I was free. I thought, what should I do? So after two o'clock, I used to go to maternity, do the screening and all that. And I was the person who set up ROP unit in Kuwait. And that, that is still going on. From 98 to 2004, we did a lot of these awareness programs with WHO, Sightsaver, Orbit, Orbis, and Ministry of Health and Family Welfare introduced the RedCam and Anti-VEGF at RP Center. I gave RedCam to Bhavna, which she did not take it that time, but later she asked for some book, ye de dijiye, red cam de dijiye. and then we gave her the RedCam. And then the Indian Retinopathy of Prematurity Society, which I have started, which is, you know, uh, established. I'll talk about that later. And then, you know, I took voluntary retirement. So 92 was a time when I trans transitioned from pediatric, uh, from VR to pediatric retina, and especially retinopathy of prematurity. And it was a significant event in my personal life. When, and this happened because this study is from blind school. This happened sometime, this came much earlier, maybe sometime in 93, 94. And that time, uh, you know, this uh, uh, paper had come and where I saw that in the blind schools, so many, you know, the children, they were having uh, blindness because of posterior segment. These are all because of the posterior segment. And that moved me uh, to, uh, you know, the vitreoretina, pediatric vitreoretina. I will not go into the further details of, you know, the, 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 what is the incidence and what is the prevalence of retinopathy of prematurity in the India and, 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 and in the uh, global arena. But this is a study which is worth mentioning here. This is an Asia ROP study. I did this study when I was president of Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology and uh, the regional director of Orbis, uh, this um, gentleman, uh, Dr. Abu Rahan, so we, he asked me, sir, can we do it? I said, yes, we will do it. 
And this was simple, short, structured questionnaire. And this was mailed to nine countries in February 2014. And the data we collected basically on premature birth, NICU services, ROP screening treatment related to eye care situations of the country for the year 2014. We did the data analysis at a very broad level, a macro level. And let's see what, what came out of this. These are the country participated, Bangladesh, China, India, Indonesia, Mongolia, Philippines, Taiwan, Thailand, and Vietnam. And um, if we see the human resource, what is the human resource in these countries? You find that China, Thailand, India, and Philippines, these are the countries where we have the doctors. We also have the doctors who can screen, we can treat, and uh, most problematic is, what is the most problematic in case of retinopathy or prematurity is the neonatal anesthesia. No anesthesiast will come and will be ready to, I think, Sudarshan Khokhar might be having the same experience. But nevertheless, when I was there, we, we tried to get more people inducted into neonatal anesthesia. So the next was, the, what are the ROP service centers available in these Asian countries? And if we can find here in Thailand, also in the Philippines and India, we find the centers where we can do the screening also, the laser, the treatment laser also, and there are hardly a handful of centers where surgical facility for retinopathy of prematurity was available. If we go into the cost of screening, if we go into the cost of screening, you can find, uh, you know, in terms of the dollars, <coughs> I'm talking, if you see the India and you see some countries, you know, like, uh, like uh, you know, Thailand, China, all these countries, you know, even sub maximum costly it is in Taiwan, but other countries, it is, you know, not much as far as the treatment for uh, screening and also for the laser treatment of retinopathy of treatment prematurity is concerned. Basically, we did this, you know, to establish the guidelines for screening in Asia Pacific country based on the existing healthcare, ophthalmology care and subspecialty availability, geographical location and accessibility to care, awareness among services, service providers and seekers, and the level of neonatal care, last but not the least, the clinical picture of the severe ROP. What are the challenges? What are the challenges we are having? The challenges are there is a barrier to the effective screening and early detection and treatment because the key, key issue in retinopathy of prematurity is the early detection and the treatment. If you detect early and you treat and you do the laser, the, the most of the problems are solved. The other challenges are the awareness among parents and the neonatologist and also the ophthalmologist. That is very surprising. The lack of trained manpower to tackle the disease, super specialty training is needed. So these were the challenges before us. The most important challenge was of the awareness. And you can see we did the study actually. And uh, most in most of my study, Parijat is sitting here. Parijat worked with me and we worked together. And 86% of the babies referred were referred by the ophthalmologist, and only 8.7% babies were referred from pediatrician. Because I always say the retinopathy of prematurity is a gift from the ped pediatricians to the ophthalmologist and to the pediatrician from the gynecologist. So in the link, we have gynecologist and the pediatrician, and then it comes to us. So the awareness on the pediatrician was only 8.7%. And see, what is very important here is the correct diagnosis by ophthalmologist was only 4.3%. This is very, very surprising and very, very depressing. Now, if you see metropolitan cities like Delhi, it had 30% of the people who were unaware. So these are very startling figure, you know. And in 91.3% babies were irre irreversibly blind. This is a study we did. And this is something, you know, which is an eye opener. We did a lot of these awareness program. I started from 1999 to 2004. And these programs were supported by the Ministry of Health and uh, WHO. And for the first time, because I told you earlier that uh, this is a gift from the pediatrician, we did a paired workshop where we invited the pediatricians, neonatologists, and also the ophthalmologists. And this was a two day workshop and all over India and many other places we did and we did Train 116 neonatologists and ophthalmologists, but this continued for a long time, and maybe many more people have been uh, trained. 
And in 1999-2004, this impact of this workshop and awareness program was 118 unitologists and ophthalmologists trained in two days in the paired workshop during 1999-2001. Pre and post workshop questionnaires we found try to see what is the feedback, how people have taken it, how much uh, you know knowledge they have gained from these workshop. And the outcome of this workshop resulted in you know opening of many viable ROP centers all over the country. And these are the places where we did the workshop, Pune, Mumbai, you name a place we did the workshop. And this was site saver workshop. They came to us and they asked us, sir, please do it for us. And then we start, we, you know, started this in 2013, when I was advisor to government of India uh, for a national program for control of blindness. I, I put this retropathy of prematurity into their government priority guidelines and then we took the government of india initiative for the first time the task force was formed and i was the chairman of this task force and we prepared the these guidelines quality improvement initiative for newborn care we prepared the guidelines for program implementation we did competency based training curriculum and we also were doing the monitoring and evaluation advocacy and communication and program monitoring then we, I from India, I went abroad and I did a lot of these, you know, the pre-conference Hong Kong International Symposium. Uh, I mean, from all the places, you know, starting from Hong Kong to Guangzhou to Manila to Vietnam, Taiwan, you name a place, we went there, Shenzhen and uh, Dongguan, Guangdong. And all these places, I did a lot of these lectures, a lot of these workshops in all these awareness workshops in all these places. And uh, we, that, that, that's how we try to augment the ROP education and global platform. And a lot of these, you know, in Ruthenia, the first world Congress, the second world, third world, world Congress on ROP, fourth and the fifth. And the, the last one is going to be organized. As you can see here, world first ROP Congress was done in Ruthenia, which is very close to now. Uh, you know, uh, Ukraine, and where this all this problem is going on, Russia is trying to pressurize all these small, small countries. Of course, Lithuania is safe for this at this particular point of time. The second world congress we had in Delhi, the third world congress was in Shanghai, and all these congresses, I organized this congress even in Shanghai, I did it. And then in the last one was in 2017 in Cancun in Mexico, and the fifth, fourth, fifth one is, you know, due, was due in 2020. Unfortunately, we could not do it because of the COVID 2020 and 21. Now we are doing it in September 2022. Having done all this, I thought that, you know, if we form a society, because ROP is very specialized, not many people would like to come. And this is something where you need a lot of commitment, a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of passion for uh, go ahead, doing this. Not many people will go because seeing a small baby and uh, you know doing indirect ophthalmoscopy is not an easy job. But some people who are committed, there are people, you know, the young people now come and they say, sir, I want to get trained. I want to get do the laser and all these things. So this is, you know, a very committed group of people, which I formed in 22 July 2016 in Bangalore. And, uh, and uh, it's okay. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
So I think the video speaks everything. I don't have to speak anything more. My advice to a budding surgeon is the most virtuous are those who content themselves being virtuous without seeking to appear so. I hope you understand what these lines mean. And the journey continues. Uh, I started in RP Center from 1977 as a junior resident. Many of you were not born at that time. Uh, and from then onwards, 2014, uh, I was in RP Center itself and uh, started from student and became the chief. And I never cared for the chair. I had at one point of time, three, four chair, I was holding national chair and the international chair, but I never gave importance to the chair. Rather, I did something for the chair. So that is my personal philosophy of life. And then from 2014, uh, Biswas was there as the director. So he told me, sir, could you come to RP, this regional institute and do something, you know, some research kind of thing there. I said, I'm always there to do the research. Even now, I have got two, two research, one from ICMR, the other one from DBT. The one from ICMR is a very ambitious, uh, you know, project that is on optic nerve regeneration, which will interest uh, Ramanjit also, because glaucoma is one of the disease where there is an optic atrophy. And of course, many other diseases are there. So we have got a grant from you know, the ICMR for uh, almost 2.5 crore grant for doing this research on optic nerve regeneration. So life goes on and the journey continues. Currently, I'm chairman of Bihar University Service Commission. And if everything goes well, maybe for another three years also, I'll be there as chairman of Bihar University Service Commission, maybe many more things will come in the future. So the God is kind to me, my parents, my father and mother, my teacher, Professor L.P. Agarwal, who, who, who in fact I call him as my academic father because he used to come to my house all the time and every each time he will say, Ki tumko kitna number mila? So I was very scared of him. If he has come to house, I will not face him because he will again ask me the same thing. Nevertheless, now what I am now today is all because of him. Professor P.K. Khosla, he made me learn how to write a, write a paper, you know, how to correct a lot of, how to do a lot of draft, many drafts and how to do the correction and all that, of course, retina. And Professor N. Pandey was my undergraduate teacher in ophthalmology. Maybe some, some seed he has sown into my body, which pushed me into retinopathy, of, uh, sorry, in the ophthalmology. Professor Madan Mohan, who was a very, you know, stylish and a very methodical, systemic, systematic person. He was my guide for a PG thesis, uh, leukocyte migration test in UVITIS. I think you will have to read what is leukocyte migration test. It was uh, for cellular immunity. And Professor H.K. Tiwari was my friend, philosopher, and guide. He was like a friend to us. We were all moving together in conference also. We'll stay in the same room. And that was, uh, you know, very fantastic. But unfortunately, Professor Tiwari is not here. I really miss him so much. And of course, my wife, without whom I wouldn't have been what I am today. It's not an exaggeration, everybody says. But in my, uh, you know, sense, in, in, in true sense, she is... Uh, one of the person who, you know, uh, put me here where I am today. And last but not the least, don't praise me in life. This is my epitaph. Don't praise me in life. Don't raise me in death. For I am born out of dust and I will go down the dust. <clears throat> or ek share. Share ye ki har apni har fateh par itna gurur mat kar. Mitti se pooch, aaj kal sikandar kaha hai. So each one of us has own stories to tell. Some are good to buy and others are good to sell. What is success? Happiness, less and less. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thanks a lot, sir, for that outstanding oration, which was very inspiring and absolutely mind-blowing. And it was a trice with not only retinopathy of prematurity, but of your entire journey in ophthalmology. Uh, thank you for always in inspiring us, guiding us, supporting us. And I'm sure your best is yet to come. And very few people know that there is a poet in you also. And very soon the book is going to be released. So thank you very much. I would request Professor J.S. Titial, Chief of the RP Center and President of Thalmic Research Association, along with dignitaries of the dais, to please uh, felicitate, sir, with the L.P. Agarwal Oration uh, Award. The most modest, the most humble, the most intellectual, the one of the best surgeon of the world, Professor J. S. T. T. L. Look, I am not saying because he is here and because he is chief and because you all are his student, but this is a true fact. I speak from my heart. If there is something good, I have to speak. I can't stop myself. And this guy, this guy, I have seen him, you know, from the very beginning. He's such a sincere, such a committed, such a humble. See, with your knowledge and with your quality and with your qualification, you try to be high, you know, an aggressive person. But he is not. That is the best part in him. And I am really, you know, uh, uh, what I should say, I will not say thankful, but I will say that he has the knack of looking towards quality and towards the best in everybody. And perhaps that was the reason why he chose me to deliver this oration. Thank you. Jeevan Singh Kityal, or thank you, Jeevan. You have given a new Jeevan to this RP Center. Thank you very much. I would now request Professor Tanush Dada to announce the next oration. Our next name lecture is after Professor N.N. Sood. Sir is virtually the father of glaucoma in India. He was the first head of glaucoma services at RP Center and the founder president of the Glaucoma Society of India. He developed the Glaucoma Division and RP Center into a world-class facility that provided advanced training, clinical services, and research. He is recipient of numerous awards, including the prestigious P. Shiva Reddy Award and the Glaucoma Society India Award for pioneering glaucoma care in India. And for this work, the RP Center and the Ophthalmic Research Association has instituted the Professor N.N. Sooth Lecture so that we can all remember his great contributions to ophthalmology in the country and worldwide. 
the first professor n n sood lecture is to be delivered by none other than our dear madam and teacher professor ramanjit sihota she is a graduate from the christian medical college velour and then completed her post graduate training at rp center aims in 1982 she obtained a dnb in 1983 and then went on to do a fellowship at the royal college of surgeon edinburgh and also a fellowship of the royal college of ophthalmologists in 1985 she joined rp center as a faculty in 1987 and then continued on as professor of ophthalmology and head of the glaucoma services at rp center she has authored numerous chapters and has over 200 publications in peer reviewed international journals recently in a stanford university survey conducted to identify the top scientists of the world madam was identified among the top 2% most influential clinical scientists worldwide from 1960 to 2020 it is a great privilege and honor it is a great privilege and honor that madam will be delivering the first professor n n sood lecture titled the management of primary angle closure disease the floor is all yours madam thank you thank you i'd like to thank uh, professor tithyal all the faculty at rp center and of course the dear residents um, i'm honored to be here and i'm especially honored because professor sood was not only my teacher he was um, A, a very sort of uh, honored sort of colleague, and I would like to say a, a guru. So as you can see, um, most people who talk about him talk about him being the most caring doctor that we've ever seen. I think in our P Center, but more than that, he was a gentleman. He was a team man. I think everybody who interacted with him, either as as colleagues or as uh, residents, found that there was so much that was beyond just being a teacher. For every new resident, he actually used to ask them what their interests were, and over those three years, he would remember. And I can uh, personally remember one junior resident who was not particularly good in ophthalmology, but was a wonderful table tennis player. and every round dr sood would somehow bring the topic around to table tennis and then say you do that so well so you know all you have to do in ophthalmology is to do something like that again i think his family as a whole were welcoming to all the residents and i think even today i see a lot of alumni here who i know would come back to rp center just to discuss with the dr sood what their lives were doing i think the cv has already been gone through but i think it is tremendous that in that day and age he won the morfields medal for post graduation he actually sort of set up the glaucoma services not only in rp center but they were then a model for all the uh, other centers that came around around the world in those days to have more than 200 publications when people didn't look at india at all as any kind of scientific sort of area is tremendous he was the founder president and the motivation behind the glaucoma society of india as long as he lived there were many things that he actually taught us and i think the most important was was don't believe anything always look for yourself question and then decide is that actually so because when we were junior residents when i joined as a junior resident he would personally do every single gonioscopy in the glaucoma clinic and we then realized that despite our western textbooks telling us that angle closure was only one in in four glaucoma patients we found that it was almost equal and then we had the task of of convincing others so he then did a lot of biometric studies for congenital glaucoma he realized it was trabecular dysgenesis but needed to be treated so he instituted trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy which all of us have learned including dr mandel from him pseudo exfoliation i think is something that people don't realize but in in pondicherry he found that he could actually correlate the intraocular pressure and pseudo exfoliation with the amount of pigmentation that he could see in in the 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 trabecular meshwork he also helped us in in changing to peribulbar surge, uh, injections to make the camp surgeries much easier so i would say he's a teacher that all of us remembered and 
you know, besides retina and glaucoma, it was life he taught us about. And I remember him very fondly. And I think uh, as do anybody else who came in contact with him. It is especially uh, fitting that I'm talking about primary angle closure disease. And I'm going to say that I'm going to talk largely about understanding primary angle closure. So uh, Dr. Sood, as I said, was the first to actually tell us that, you know, unlike the West, we see a lot of angle closure here. And from this diagram and the three red uh, arrows that you see, we actually inherited uh, a lot of uh, angle closure studies that had been done from Dr. L.P. Agarwal, whose work was actually published by Duke Elder, to Professor Sood, who actually told us how uh, to, to look for it and to diagnose and treat it. And Professor um, uh, Agarwal, who actually did a lot of pathological studies on autonomy of the ciliary body and the iris. And the rest of my talk would not have been possible without all the people that I've named on this slide and many others amongst our senior residents who have helped over the years. Thank you so much. So coming to primary angle closure disease itself, I would say it's a spectrum. And unfortunately, despite everything we have done, blindness in angle closure is still huge. And if we actually look at the Indian surveys, we see that open angle and primary angle closure plus primary angle closure glaucoma are almost equal. In the clinics, we see them as um, with visual field loss being almost equal, but PACG is more blinding than primary open angle glaucoma as was recently published by uh, Ronnie George et al. So I'll just divide my talk very uh, succinctly into anatomy and physiology. Dr. Sooth had shown us that there were smaller eyes that actually led to angle closure. And he gave us numbers. So if you look at the angle, the anterior chamber depth, if you had an anterior chamber depth of less than 1.8, you were likely to develop angle closure. If you had an axial length of 22.5 or a lens which was more than 4.6, again, you were actually more likely to develop uh, uh, angle closure. So in these days where we are doing biometry for cataract surgery, maybe we should look at these biometries and probably take some uh, um, uh, time off and treat the fellow eye if any of these indications are there. We found that the, uh, if, if one patient had primary angle closure glaucoma, 50% of the relatives were likely to have some kind of primary angle closure subtype as well. But the anatomy itself was not enough to cause the, glau the, the glaucoma. There were some other physiological factors like dim light, stress, accommodation, which actually led to it. And the angle closure occurred when the two came together. And if you look at what actually causes the angle closure, to a greater or lesser extent, pupillary block is seen in almost all these eyes. Plateau iris and the exaggerated lens vault only in a small percentage and a prominent last role and even less. So if we look at these, we have to understand that as some degree of relative pupillary block is there in all angle closure eyes, it is important that the first thing you do is to do an iridotomy. As Mapstone showed us, he said that, you know, the, um, the two horizontal vectors, that is the dilator and the uh, constrictor sort of cancel each other, while the posterior vectors are summed. And therefore, if you do an iridotomy, the uh, lens, the aqueous can pass through without causing angle closure. So for an iridotomy, I would say counsel patients ahead about possible ghost images. Otherwise, it's very straightforward. And I'm sure you're all very, very good at, at doing these lasers. But what does the iridotomy do? It does not lower IOP. All it does is it prevents further pupillary block and the associated fluctuations in IOP, which are known to cause progression of glaucoma. What about the iridotomy in angle closure glaucoma? You already have a closed angle. I hope you can see in this, uh, is, this is the Cassia angle clo um, uh, anterior segment OCT. And you can see the height of the iridotrabecular contact here. And then after the iridotomy in the same patient, you can see how low it becomes. So it actually exposes area of the trabecular meshwork. And in about a third of patients, you may be able to do medical control in such patients rather than surgery. Genetics, I think, has already spoken quite a lot about it. But I think that uh, besides the consortium that he spoke about, I think it's interesting to know that from Ames, there was a GVAS done and it has recently been published, which actually says which eyes or which gene is more likely to 
uh, indicate that these patients are going to get a high intraocular pressure. The rest of them are more sort of contributed to the development of the anatomy itself. What about trabecular meshwork damage? We see in the subtypes that in the patients with just a suspicion, the trabecular meshwork is absolutely open. You see these spaces and this nice, clean trabecular meshwork. While in, in those where some amount of angle closure has occurred, this is what's seen in the acute stage, and this is what happens once the healing has occurred. So if we keep that trabecular meshwork damage in mind, one controversial aspect of treatment of angle closure these days is cataract surgery alone. So if we look at all the meta-analysis that have been done over the years, a recent one that was done in, in 2020, Cochrane analysis that have been done twice earlier, you can see that none of them actually show that there's a significant control of intraocular pressure with just a cataract surgery alone. So when we look at the Eagle study, which everybody talks about, please remember that only one millimeter of mercury was, was seen to be lower after clear lens extraction than after an iridotomy. But the last line is most significant that cataract surgery in such eyes with shallow anterior chambers is more prone to complications. You have more endothelial cell loss. And in fact, in this particular study, a lot of patients lost significant vision. The suggested effects of FACO are the ultrasound is going to change the uh, trabecular meshwork. It's going to wash out debris. And there's a mechanical widening of the angle. But when you look at these scanning electron microscopy uh, pictures that we have, can you think that the ultrasound or the washout of anything is going to change these membranes and fibrosis that has already occurred? So the IOP does fall. It falls in, in more acute angle closure glaucoma than chronic angle closure glaucoma. But remember, medications will still be required. So in the Eagle study itself, the authors have said that there is a one millimeter difference in the clear lens extraction group. This difference is small and by itself is unlikely to be clinically relevant. So please remember to continue to look at other options for these patients. What about visual field progression rate after cataract surgery? There are contradictory sort of studies, but some say there's been a significant progression and others say that they have flattened post-operatively, but probably with the use of additional state of medications. The classification itself is, is, uh, is in, in uh, flux. I think that there should be a, a, an additional point in the classification. You have a person who has anatomical biomarkers, so we call him a suspect. You have a person who shows us some degree of trabecular damage. You can see in this diagram that just one or two areas which are showing uh, um, uh, trabecular contact or pass. So you have what we call primary angle closure. Once the damage is, is wide enough to cause a raised IOP, we think in terms of primary angle closure with ocular hypertension. And finally, when the neuropathy occurs, it's primary angle closure glaucoma. So if we go down this continuum, you can see that at many points, we can actually stop the process from getting any worse, and therefore we can actually prevent blindness. So in primary angle closure glaucoma, we can actually prevent it if we diagnose it early. And what do we need for the early diagnosis? You just need your eyes. You need to be able to look at the anterior chamber and say, okay, this anterior chamber looks a little shallow. This pupil is not very round. You can see it's irregular. You can see that there's a sphincter atrophy over here. And you can see that these patients don't generally have crypts or the other things that we see with the iris pattern. You can do a Van Herrick test, or you can just put the, uh, a very sharp beam on the inferior limbus, and it actually gives you almost a uh, uh, ASOCT picture of whether there's a contact between the iris and the cornea or not. So you don't need much. But once you have that, you must immediately do a gonioscopy and be prepared then to, to see that you know, there is a, uh, the iris coming very close to the corneal wedge that can be seen, that you can't see the structures of the uh, trabecular meshwork posteriorly, that here you can see all these uh, the, the layers of the trabecular meshwork. And here you're possibly just going to see the Schwalbe's line and the anterior trabecular meshwork. You also should be able to, to say how narrow is the angle. And the narrower the angle gets, the more likely it is that you're going to end up with angle closure glaucoma. So once you have diagnosed these occludable angles, we now have to decide how are we going to treat them because your gonioscopy is going to tell you how much of the trabecular meshwork is affected. 
Your IOP is going to tell you how much of the trabecular meshwork is no longer functioning. And your optic nerve is going to tell you how much of, of damage has occurred and what should your target IOP be. So in suspects, we're only going to treat high risk patients with an iridotomy. I think we are aware of fellow eyes of PACD patients requiring uh, an iridotomy, patients with retinal diseases or those requiring dilation for other causes, patients living in remote areas who are unlikely to follow up. And why is this so? Because we know 20 to 30% are going to progress. And these people who progress are those who have narrower angles who are older. So if we actually do an iridotomy, how are we helping them? There's a ZAP study which has been done, which took away all those that were going to actually uh, probably go to angle closure, but were still able to show that there was a significant prophylactic effect of the iridotomy. And they found that it was very safe. So in eyes where you can get what they have labeled as a, a, a triple hump. So you can see one hump here, the second hump here, and the third hump here, telling you that there's a relative pupillary block the iridotomy is likely to both reduce the IOP and prevent further closure. We get to a point where the narrow angle has now begun to show us these blotchy pigments or peripheral anterior synechia. Again, an iridotomy is the must. Do a diurnal phasing two weeks later just to see that there's no raised IOP. Do a baseline perimetry and imaging and follow the patients up over time. At this stage, doing a clear lens extraction is equivalent to an iridotomy. And I think everybody would agree that an iridotomy is something much safer than a clear lens extraction. This primary angle closure is likely again to progress in about 20 to 30% of, of patients to a point where the intraocular pressure is going to rise. And when uh, we know that this is going to rise, we also want, want a biomarker to tell us which eyes are likely to rise. So what has been seen is that those who have a pass of more than two quadrants at baseline after you've done an iridotomy need closer follow-up so that you can prevent the ocular hypertension from occurring or treat the ocular hypertension as soon as it occurs. So once you have the ocular hypertension, there's a lot of, uh, of controversy about how you treat or whether you treat or you don't treat. But what we have seen is that they do progress and they progress in a significant number. One in five are going to progress. So lowering the IOP with medications after the iridotomy is done is a good option because it makes you uh, control what may happen as far as the optic nerve is concerned. And the patients, again, who are more likely to progress are those in whom it is difficult to get the pressure to uh, less than 18, that two medicines or more are required, or they have a very small optic nerve head, or they inadvertently are using steroids, maybe they're asthmatic or have other problems. So in such cases, you use your imaging and you can follow the patients up initially, but the moment you start seeing changes on your imaging, please increase the medicines or add medications. Primary angle closure glaucoma itself is of two kinds, acute and chronic. I think acute, everybody is well aware of how the management goes. What you may not be aware is that even after an early control of the uh, attack, 20 to 30% will still have some raised IOP when seen one year later. And there will be some ischemic damage to the optic nerve head in almost all patients. 12% may still have a visual impairment of some degree because of the ischemic damage that there is. So in India, unfortunately, they don't come to us very early. They, we, are, they, we see them late. So we need to actually do trabeculectomies in about a third of patients. And one should be willing to do that. If you want to do a phaco trap, that is equally good. What about chronic ACGs? We've had now a closed angle, more than two uh, quadrants involved in the past, chronically raised IOPs, and now we can begin to see the glaucomatous optic neuropathy and some visual field loss. What we actually need to understand again is the IOP is higher, progression occurs earlier, worsens faster than a POAG, and therefore we should be more keen to keep these uh, target IOPs in mind early, 15 to 17 millimeters, moderate 12 to 15, and severe 10 to 12. A rule of thumb is that if the baseline IOP is, is 30 or less, medications will work very well. If it's more than 30, you're likely to require some surgery. These target IOPs should be re reassessed after one or two years. If we do all that to, to target, we find there's a progression in only one to 2% of eyes. Trabeculectomy is safe. There are many studies that have shown it is safe. You can do a phaco trap if you like. 
So what are we left with as far as prognosis is concerned? As I said, I started off saying that blindness in, in primary angle closure glaucoma, we see in almost 20% of uh, patients. And at least unilateral blindness, we tend, tend to see in even more. So if we do all that, that I have suggested, which is largely just an iridotomy and a follow-up, this lady at 50 for the next 30 years, what is likely to happen to her? She's one of a cohort of say 100 patients who on gonioscopy have shown some angle closure, you do an iridotomy. The first thing we said that 20 to 30% may show a rise in IOP. So these yellow faces that you can see are showing us a rise in IOP. But the moment you control that, only 20% of these, that is about six, is likely to actually begin to show us some damage to the optic nerve head. And if you can immediately drop the target pressure, you will find that out of these only 11% or on the whole only 1%, may show us an increase in visual field uh, progression. So I hope I have said that, you know, iridotomy and control of IOP is the way to go to actually prevent blindness, which we see so commonly in angle closure glaucoma. So I would just like to conclude by saying, screen families of primary angle closure patients, use the biometry that you're doing every day for cataract surgery to pick up these patients, do an NDIAG iridotomy, it's, it's a safe procedure as it's must for every stage of primary angle closure disease. In PAC, after the iridotomy, review annually for an increased IOP. If you have a PAC and there is a chronically raised IOP, reduce the IOP to at least 18 millimeters. In primary angle closure glaucoma, set a target IOP as per parametric damage. Finally, please, cataract surgery alone cannot reverse the trabecular damage that I have shown you. It cannot reduce the IOP alone, so it does need medications. I would like to wish RP Center all the very best for the continuing excellence we've seen through all these years, and the very best to all the, the faculty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for your excellent presentation. I would like to request Chief RP Center, Professor G.O.N.S. Titial and all the unit heads to kindly present the lecture award to Professor Ramanjit Sihota. It's um, my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Ronald Yu, and I'm very happy that he accepted our inv invitation to be part of this uh, RPC Foundation Day celebrations and th in this CME. He's been traveling and uh, he's still uh, traveling, I think. Yeah. And to introduce him, he completed his surgical vitro-retinal fellowship in Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. Faculty of Singapore National Eye Center and Medical Director, founding partner and senior consultant ophthalmic surgeon at Eye and Retina Surgeons, Camden Medical. He has received multiple awards, including Distinguished Contribution to Ophthalmology Award, International Council of Ophthalmology, Singapore National Eye Center Service Award, Best Teacher Award at SNEC, ACE Award from APACRS Certified Educator, and Golden Apple Award for the best teacher in the Asia Pacific by the International Council of Ophthalmology. He has served for three years as the president of APACRS, that is Asia Pacific Association of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons. Apart from that, he is a great teacher and great fr friend to all of us. And I know that uh, he has a passion of a photography. I, I every day see his beautiful photographs in his Facebook uh, pages. And today he's going to talk about something, how to image the cataract surgery and his, his passion and his liking to go through the entire gamut of IOCT assisted surgeries. And today he's going to talk about 
the picking the posterior capsular defect or rent with IOCT during posterior polar surgeries. Dr. Ron, all yours. Thank you very much for inviting me, uh, G1. It's a great pleasure to join you and congratulations on the 55th anniversary. Uh, please start my video, which I've sent to you. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak at this meeting. Today, I'd like to speak on the topic of IOCT imaging of the posterior lens capsule and discuss a new physical sign visible on the imaging. Now, we are all used to the microscope down or plan view of the eye during our cataract surgery. But the eye, as we all know, is a three-dimensional structure and a side or elevation view may actually yield more information. So two microscope systems, the Leica and Zeiss, actually have inbuilt live OCT, but these were actually originally dis, uh, really designed for corneal and macular imaging. So I wanted to really explore the uses of intraoperative OCT in cataract surgery. But before we can really use any imaging system for surgical purposes, we need to appreciate the anatomy, the surgical anatomy of the eye. So let's look at the lens. The anterior lens capsule we can see very clearly on the IOCT, as is the posterior capsule here. Cortical lens opacities are equally well defined. And here, a nucleus sclerotic cataract can be seen on the IOCT to be a central core that is dense. Moderate posterior subcapsular lens opacities are also clearly defined. And of course, it's going to be very useful in posterior polar cataracts uh, to help us see if there's already a rent in the posterior capsule. We can even image Mittendorf spots, which are embryological remnants on the posterior capsule. But here, let me share with you uh, hydrodissection images uh, of the lens. You can see the posterior capsule there. And as I start hydrodissection, you can see that a gap appears between the capsule and the lens there. At the bottom picture, you can see the fluid wave coming in. And then when we complete the hydrodissection, the gap here widens considerably, showing completion of the hydrodissection. So the ability of the technology to image the deeper layers of the lens and the posterior capsule is very good. Here we see that when the phaco tip is in the eye, the posterior capsule has a layer of soft lens matter on it. When it's removed, the posterior capsule bulges forward with a layer of soft lens matter on it. And when the IA tip is introduced on the left, we can see that the normal concave shape of the posterior capsule is restored with a deepened anterior chamber and the layer of soft lens matter. So what are the applications of intraoperative OCT? Well, as a teaching aid, research, and is it any use as a surgical aid? Now, we are all familiar with the microscopic view of PCR, which would be a line in the posterior capsule, vitreous in the anterior chamber, deepening of the anterior chamber. But what does the OCT view of a PCR look like? Now, I didn't have a PCR for many years after I got this technology, but eventually I had a patient who needed a primary posterior capsulotomy, which you see me doing here behind the implanted lens. Once that has been done, I turn on the live OCT to see what the OCT image of a PC rupture looks like. And you can see here in the top uh, scan image that the posterior capsule rupture is very clearly defined and the edge of the tear actually is a little bit rolled. And then shortly after that, I had a patient in whom I injected a lens. And when the lens is injected, I always go behind the lens to uh, remove OVD. And in this particular case, I still don't understand what happened. But after I remove the OVD and move the IA tip in front of the lens, you can see that there's a, a diagonal line going right across the posterior uh, capsule. And really the realization that there is a uh, posterior capsule rupture is present. Anyway, the lens was captured, okay, leaving the haptics in the bag with the optic uh, prolapsed through the capsulorexis. And here the OCT shows that the optic 
is in front of the anterior capsular rim. And we can see that quite clearly here. And it's a useful tool to help you gauge the position of your optics uh, relative to the capsulorexis. But here, we're gonna try and see the posterior capsule rent. And in the lower picture, we see the edge of the tear is rolled up like a scroll. And in the upper picture, depending on which angle we're taking it at, you can see that the uh, edge of the tear is not a straight one, but actually rolls into a scroll. And this is something that I think is worth describing as the scroll sign. So this is the scroll sign of a PCR in another patient who also had a posterior capsule rupture. The scroll in this case is much smaller. So here I would like to share with you the story of a patient, a 53-year-old man who was stung all over his body and eyes. In fact, his friend with him at that time died. His organs failed. He was blinded in one eye. And this eye had corneal melt endophthalmitis and had cataract vitrectomy for that. And then he developed cataract. So after phacoing him, and his nucleus was a very odd, sticky consistency, when I removed the uh, cortex, I realized that there was a line uh, deep in the posterior capsule, but the view was bad because the cornea was hazy. So again, my colleague who was with me at the time felt it wasn't PCR. I felt it was a PCR. And let's turn on the OCT. And if you look carefully at the lower picture, you see that scroll of the posterior capsule. So I implanted the three-piece lens uh, into the eye with the haptics uh, in the sulcus and the optic uh, being pushed through the capsulorexis into the back. And here we see the optic is now under the anterior capsular rim uh, in, 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 in the bag. So here is the scroll sign of PCR again, very helpful when the cornea is hazy as in this case. But are lines behind IOLs always ruptured posterior capsules or could they be folds in the posterior capsule? Well, here's a way that you can tell the difference. So in this patient, after the lens is inserted, we can see that there is a creased line or a line behind the lens and we're not sure what it is. And you can see here, there is a fold there, but it's continuous across the back of the lens. And one way to confirm that this is just a fold and not a tear in the posterior capsule is to put a cannula in and push down on the lens. And you can see here that the posterior capsular folds have completely disappeared. So, and that's a useful thing to do to distinguish a tear from a fold. And this confirms the lens was stable. So just to sum up again, I've described a sign which I have called the OCT scroll sign of posterior capsule rupture. So IOCT is, I believe, a very useful surgical aid uh, in confirming the presence or absence of a posterior capsule rupture, and it also confirms whether you've done an IOL capture successfully. Thank you very much, and I'd like to welcome all of you to join us in Singapore for the virtual APACRS and joint meeting with the SNEC International Meeting on the 30th to 31st July 2021. Thank you. Okay. I'm just going to uh, excuse myself from that last slide. The, the meeting, obviously, this uh, lecture was recorded just before last year's virtual meeting, but I have very good news uh, for you, uh, Jeevan, and with your permission, I'm just going to bring up a, another slide uh, here. Um, if I can find it, oh, it seems to have disappeared. Hang on. Um, there. Can you see that? I'm not yet. You, you have to share that. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no worries. I, I think I, I won't share that. Just to tell you that this year's meeting, I've just received news from uh, Korea that all travel restrictions and quarantine has been lifted as of 1st of April, 2022. So the uh, this year's APA CRS is going ahead 11th to 12th June in Korea. Um, and I welcome all of you to come and join us uh, there. But thank you so much, uh, Jeevan, for inviting me to, to, to give this lecture. And I would also take a note of appreciation of your work in really uh, elucidating uh, posterior polar cataracts and the IOCT uh, images. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ron. Uh, it was a wonderful lecture. And uh, we all appreciate the, your sign, poster capsular scroll sign uh, in a uh, poster capsular tear.
and uh, we hope that we'll be meeting very soon physically and uh, we know that uh, we'll all come to APSAS meeting. This is one of the most important meeting for all of us and you have done such a wonderful work to really bring the APSARS in a such a format. And we look forward to you know, having APSARS in, uh, India. in India in uh, coming years, if not in New Delhi, in our place. And yeah. thank you I again. We'll have to schedule for India in about two or three years' time after China next year. And I think India yeah, is I know that. I know that. Please remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Please remember Delhi. Th thanks a lot, Ron. And uh, good evening. And uh, keep safe and be blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you to all our speakers for the wonderful session. And thank you to all our chairpersons. I would request everyone to please proceed towards the lunch area. A very delicious lunch has been prepared by our chefs for all of you. We'll see you back. Same here again at 1.30 p.m. sharp. For our online audience, I would request you can also proceed for lunch. And we can see you back at 1.30 p.m. IST time sharp. Thank you.
सबको बिठाओ ना Thank you. 
उसको दिखा दो मैं स्टार्ट वी आर ऑन टाइम थोड़ी देर के लिए A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, to the post-lunch session. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you. So we'll be starting off with the next session, which is subjected on refractive surgery recent perspectives. And I'd like to take the honor to invite our chairpersons, Dr. Jeevan Estetial, Dr. Radhika Tandon, Dr. Sudarshan Kokar, and Dr. Namrata Sharma. As the moderator, I would like to invite Dr. Rajesh Sinha. And as the panelists, I would take the honor to invite Dr. Tushar Ragarwal, Dr. Manpreet Kaur, and Dr. Sri Devi Nair. To begin with the very first session, I would take the honor to invite our speaker, Dr. Rohit Shetty. No, no, just hold on, hold on. I think he's not there. Hold on. So uh, we begin the session with uh, Dr. Rupal Shah, and uh, we invite Dr. Rupal Shah for a talk on PTK Art and Science. Dr. Rupal will be joining online. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Am I visible, audible? Yes, yes. You are visible and looking beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I'm really sorry that I could not attend it physically. I would have loved to do that. Uh, we would have loved for that. this honor. I'm very happy to even know that I'm the opening batsman. <laughs> so, I would be. To I'm sharing my screen right now. Yeah. Is it visible? It's loading, ma'am. We cannot still see your screen. Baroda is slower than Delhi. Still not seen, right? Still loading, ma'am. Could you please unshare and share again? Sure, I'll do that. Trying to do the stop share. Easier to come to Delhi, I think. Ah, oh, that would have been better. <laughs> more, more fun also. Perfect. We can see your screen, ma'am. You can. Oh, now it's gone again, right? Yeah, so it's gone again. I'll just share it again. Sure. Um, I think Professor Sikunto has also joined, and uh, good afternoon. Very nice to see you, sir. So please tell me when you can see my slides. Yeah, we can, we can see. see just make it slideshow. Yeah, um, I've already clicked on it. I think it's just too slow. So today I'm going to be talking to you about a very unique uh, application of excimer laser. And I'm sure that everybody who owns an excimer laser uh, would be able to add this particular technique to their armamentarium. Most times when you're talking about excimer lasers, people know that they are supposed to go to a refractive surgeon when they have glasses. So you don't need references from ophthalmologists. What happens for phototherapeutic keratectomy is that sometimes uh, patients themselves don't know that they can actually get a treatment with an excimer laser, which can be very useful to them. And so they need ophthalmologist reference. And sometimes the ophthalmologists themselves don't know the potential of this very superb uh, way of uh, treating some very important corneal related issues with an excimer laser. The objective of PTK is to remove or treatment disease corneal tissue. So it can be to improve best corrected visual acuity. It can be used for elevation of visual symptoms such as monocular diplopia, starburst, or glare. Sometimes PTK is used for elevation of non-visual symptoms such as pain, foreign body sensation. And sometimes it's done simply to improve the cosmetic appearance of the eye. And the rationale for using PTK is that from the very beginning of the use of ophthalmic excimer laser, it's a clinical potential. Its clinical potential for removal of disease corneal tissue was recognized. 
and the lamellar structure of the cornea lends itself very well to the excision of diseased superficial tissue, leaving a very healthy cornea behind. The special properties of excima laser yields it really as a nice tool to get rid of these superficial corneal pathologies. Manual keratectomy is often unsatisfactory for all except the most superficial lesions because it can cause scarring and opacities. An alternative is then to do a lamellar or uh, penetrating or any other forms of keratoplasty, which would mean that you are utilizing this very important corneal tissue for pr procedures which can then be also having, uh, can be offered with alternatives. And the special properties of excima laser which allow you to do this is that it can remove precise amount of tissues leaving behind an absolutely smooth bed with no collateral damage to the surrounding tissue. And therefore, you can apply it for various applications. The one in which we have the most experience is for recurrent corneal epithelial erosions, band shaped keratopathy, corneal dystrophies, and superficial scarring, and to prevent recurrent terigen and to give a better visual outcome after recurrent terigen. The advantage is that it's a simpler technique, it's cheaper because it does not require any donor tissue, and the vision can be very fast, uh, the visual recovery can be very fast with much less use of steroids. Remaining stuck to the advantages. Um, can you try unsharing and share again? Looks like the slide is stuck. Not allowing me to just go anywhere. I'm so sorry for this. Oh, uh, are you able to unshare? I'm not able to. So it's just turning around. Nothing's happening. Yeah, so your slide is gone now. Uh, maybe you can start sharing again. Okay, I'll do that. It's not moving at all. It's not sharing. It's not stop sharing. Nothing. I'm really sorry for this. Can I just talk? Sure, ma'am. Please go ahead. So uh, basically what you need to do is a therapeutic approach where you are making the cornea smoother. In recurrent corneal erosion, the idea is to remove the diseased corneal tissue, the basement membrane in this case. So you remove the epithelium, make the uh, ablation on the, ba the basement membrane, and this would mean that you are ablating off the bones. Now, we have seen after a PRT procedure that the pseudo membrane that gets formed has a very good adherence to the epithelium. And this is the principle that is getting used here. So you are creating a pseudo membrane which will help the epithelium now to adhere better so you can prevent recurrence. And we have experience of 20 years now and not a single person has had the recurrence again. Also, at the same time, you have to take the laser on a spot mode and puncture the laser. Uh, can you see my slide again? Okay. Uh, no, ma'am, not Am yet. Am I audible? Am I yes, audible? We can hear you, but we can't see your slides. Okay, then that's okay. I'm just talking. Please go Because I don't want to waste time. I think we should carry on. Sure. Um, so that's how, I, and you take the laser on then spot mode and also do something which is known as epithelial puncture into the healthy margins. This will also help you into having a, an effect which is lasting. So this is how the recurrent Uh, sorry, Dr. Rupal, we are not able to hear you. I think there's some uh, issue with your connectivity. So meanwhile, yeah. uh, without losing on time, we'll move on to the next speaker. And I'd like to invite Dr. Sri Ganesh to present their talk.
So we invite Dr. Sri Ganesh for his talk on uh, the new era of smile surgery, Vizumax 800 initial experience. So Dr. Sri Ganesh okay. has loads of experience in smile. Uh, can you see my slides now? No, we can't see your slides. Can you see my slides? Hello? No, no, no. Oh. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but we can't see your slides. Uh, Dr. Rupal, could you please uh, unshare Hello? your screen? Yeah, I would do that. I Hello, can you hear I'm... me? Hello? Hello? We, we right can hear you, Dr. Shri, but uh, we can't see your slides. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, fine. I'll share my screen. Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah, can you see? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Jeevan Tityal and uh, RP Center for inviting me for this Foundation Day. Uh, talk. I think there is. I think this. Sorry, I share again. There's some problem. I think it's going into auto mode. Yes, we can see your screen, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Tithyal and uh, RP Center for inviting me. I will be speaking on the Visimax 800 initial experience. I am a consultant for Kalzai's. Uh, Meditech and uh, Biotech Vision. Uh, if you look at uh, SMILE, now it's an established uh, procedure with over 5 million eyes treated uh, with SMILE worldwide and uh, over 1,600 uh, Visamax installed and 2,500 uh, practicing surgeons. And uh, SMILE, as you can see, uh, is contributing to the overall growth of the laser vision uh, correction market. Almost uh, the 10% growth is mainly driv driven by SMILE in the past few years, where, uh, and you can see that the femtolasic and PRK is fairly stable, but the number of um, smiles are increasing. Uh, so smile is the uh, procedure which is driving the refractive market uh, today. Uh, Zeiss has now introduced the Visimax 800 in uh, 2020. The Visimax 800 is a totally different uh, uh, machine, and you can see that uh, it has got two robotic arms, and it is a mobile unit, the uh, laser arm and the um, microscope arm swing in and out. And the laser also has uh, certain uh, uh, aids like the centration and the cyclotorsion aid. And uh, it has a very high speed laser, two megahertz, uh, which makes the laser uh, treatment very fast. So now let us. Uh, Look at, uh, okay. this is all, they've also introduced the Zeiss Refractive Workplace, which is, uh, it, and it's very easy to manage, evaluate, store, and transfer data remotely, and it connects to all the diagnostics and the laser machine. If you look at the workflow itself, uh, this is one case which I'm demonstrating after the speculum is put in, the laser arm descends, you can select the treatment, then you put in the PI, and then the movement uh, occurs at the laser and not the patient bed here. The patient bed is uh, stationary. It's also got top and side view cameras uh, to help uh, dock the PI to the eye. And that's the docking procedure. You use the infrared. And here you have a centration guide. And you can see the centration guide so that you can center to the visual axis. So this is a, a new uh, feature in the 800. And so you can be centered exactly on the visual axis or if you want in between the visual axis and the um, pupil center. And then it's also got a cyclotorsion adjustment, which uh, if you have pre-marked the 0, 180, you can use this to adjust the axis. As you rotate the joystick, the treatment also rotates or you, you can do it automatically if you have the IL Master 700, where it takes the data of the iris from the IL Master 700. The laser itself is very fast and it just takes eight seconds uh, for a six millimeter zone compared to 25 seconds with the old uh, Visomax 500. The laser arm moves up after the treatment and the microscope arm moves down. 
And uh, you can see that the bubble pattern is excellent and uh, you can get a very smooth and easy dissection. And uh, lenticule extraction is very easy. So that was uh, just a case of uh, on the Visimax 800. Now uh, let us look at uh, initial results. Uh, the two week uh, clinical outcomes following uh, spinal with the Visimax 800. Uh, we had uh, about 180 eyes treated and uh, 136 eyes uh, follow up at two weeks. Uh, the average age was 27, average uh, sphere was around minus four, uh, cylinder was around one diopter, spherical equivalent around 4.4. Uh, uh, and uh, you can see that the optical uh, zone use was uh, 6.14. We used a nomogram, which had a overcorrection of sphere for 10% cylinder, 15% for with the rule astigmatism, and 10% uh, for oblique uh, astigmatism. Against the rule astigmatism, we did not uh, uh, use any nomogram correction. And you can see that we maintained a residual stromal bed of over 300 microns. So this is the, uh, these are the results. Uh, day one, the mean uh, uncorrected distance visual equity was minus 0 0.05. At 15 days, it was minus 0 0.08. Uh, sphere, uh, post-op day one was uh, uh, zero and uh, 15 days was 0 0.001 uh, log bar. And um, if you look at the cylinder, uh, the residual cylinder was minus 0 0.009. At 15 days, it was 0 0.02. This is the efficacy index. The efficacy index was one, which is excellent, which is the pre-op corrected distance visual equity versus post-op uncorrected uh, distance visual equity. And most patients had six by 7.5 or better. This is the safety. Safety index was 1.01. .01, and uh, you can see that that's the change in corrected uh, distance visual equity. 66% were unchanged. 22% gained one line and 11% lost one line. There were no eyes which lost more than two lines of best corrected visual equity. This was the refractive outcome. 95% of eyes were uh, within uh, 0.125 and 100% uh, within half a diopter. So the correction is excellent. This is the uh, scatter diagram of the predictability. And you can see that the average deviation is just uh, 0 0.01 diopter. And uh, this is the refractive astigmatism uh, percentage. And you can see 96% of uh, eyes were within quarter diopter and 100% were within half a diopter. This is the stability. Of course, we need to follow up for a longer time, but it we all know that uh, with SMILE, the results are very stable. This is just a two-week graph. This is the comparison of OSI. We checked the objective scatter index. Uh, Pre-op, it was 0.57. Uh, Post-op day one was 1.23. And uh, post-op day 15 was 0.77. And anything better than uh, less than 1.5 is excellent. And this is uh, the scatter. And this is one of the examples. Uh, and this indicates the quality of vision. This is a pre-op OSI of 0.5. Post-op day one, it was 0 0.6 and uh, 15 day, it was 0 0.2. So the point spread function is excellent. The quality of vision is excellent. The scatter is very less. This is another case, pre-op OSI 0.4. Day one was 1.4, day 15, 1.1, 1 .1, and uh, three months is 0 0.3. So hardly any change. To summarize, uh, the two-week post-op results with the Visimax 800 demonstrate excellent correction, good visual equity in terms of efficacy. No eyes had one or more line loss of corrected distance visual equity, demonstrating a good safety profile. Quality of vision and interface clarity shows minimal increase of scatter, which is expected to improve the Visimax 800 with surgeon supporting functions for cyclotorsion adjustment and uh, centration improved workflow gives uh, very good results and our initial results have been excellent. Thank you very much for your attention. If there are any questions, uh, I, would, I could take them. Thank you, Dr. Sri, for a wonderful presentation. Um, okay, so uh, would you like to speak? Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, next, uh, we're going to invite our uh, international uh, guest speaker for our Foundation Day uh, this CME.
and I'm really thankful uh, for Professor Walter Secundo, who agreed to our invitation to deliver this uh, plenary talk on refractive surgery. And we know that he's been a pioneer in the field of refractive surgery, and more so in a smile, because he was the first person to uh, clinically demonstrate the uh, smile surgery. And now we have uh, newer machines coming up, new generation system has come up, and today he's going to talk about something beyond what we have been doing, the results of hyperopic smile, and something on a, a new 800 uh, system. Dr. Secundo, all yours. Now, as you all know, we've done you know, lots of work till we got to the stage where we believe that we can perform a multi-center study. And we had several drawbacks, and indeed, it was 2016 when I published the first nine eyes, where we realized that we can you know, create a reasonable and decent uh, um, uh, result um, using femtosecond laser. Obviously, we started with flex technique, as I did for myopia. Um, it worked quite well. And the trick was actually to create a large transition zone, some you know from XML laser, and uh, obviously also to come up with an idea, how can we integrate these very large lenticles um, under the cap? Uh, so we worked and I did another prospective study where I treated 40 eyes using hyperopic flex. There were no nomograms at all. And it was a nine month study, which I published in 2018. And just you know, for comparison for my later talk, see now we had 70% within half of a day after intended correction, and roughly 90 within one day after. Now, from there on, uh, at the same time, using the same, uh, or almost the same uh, lenticle parameters, um, Kisho Proton from Nepal um, um, started a SMART, a pure SMART study, you not know, a flex study. And uh, he was the first actually who did a hyperopic smile in the world. And he is two incisions, two millimeters each. Um, he is 6.3 to 6.7 millimeter optical zone. Um, and he treated a very high numbers. I mean, his mean spherical equivalent was plus 4.73 diopters, a very young, well accommodating population. It was published uh, in the GRS in 2019 by Dan Weinstein, who also participated in the study. From my point of view, I think the most important thing, uh, or well, 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 there were actually two things that were important. First, they could show that they could uh, get a very good centration. And this is absolutely crucial for the treatment of hyperopia. At the same time, looking at the topographies, the investigators show that the 6.3 millimeter zone was small corresponds to a seven millimeter zone um, with the femtolasic using MEL-80 or MEL-90. So we had those very important clues um, when we decided to go ahead and do a um, prospective multi-center approval study. It's been finished meanwhile, all the results analyzed and submitted to the authorities. And you see the list of the investigators here and I would like to highlight Dr. Pavel Studulka. He did the most uh, eyes, and us being uh, three eyes less than Pavel um, in total. I will show you what we did um, was that we use an M size treatment pack. Obviously, you know, the hyperopic eyes are quite often rather small, so we had to limit the white to white at least 11.5 millimeters. Otherwise, you apply the suction to the conjunctiva instead of, uh, instead of a cornea. Um, so we more or less fixed the optical zone at 6.3 millimeters. At least the vast majority of the eyes was treated with 6.3 and the transition there went fixed at two millimeters. We decided to have a slightly uh, thinner central thickness as compared to Nepal study. And it was 25 microns. Now our cap was 8.8 .8 to 8.89 millimeters and had a thickness of 120 microns. We um, used either 
two incisions, a two millimeters uh, 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 length. But for instance, I used a one incision with a four millimeter length and uh, a place it temporarily because there's just more space here to, to get to the lenticle. Um, from a surgical point of view, it's not that easy. It's not as easy as a myopic smile because uh, you have a very small corridor, which I, what I call, you know, when, when, when the lent where the lenticle stops and, uh, and uh, um, the cap ends. So this little edge is, is in hyperopia much more difficult to identify just because they're not in that space. We also figure out using previous studies that we don't have to have high energies as a Nepal study and our oh, energies were 226 and 27 units on the Visamax 500. And obviously calculating uh, the post-operative outcome, the limit was at uh, 51 diopters, but uh, fortunately we did not have to go that far. Um, we accepted eyes with 0.8 of 2025 best corrected. So yes, we accepted eyes with very mild degree of amblyopia. In total, we treated 374 eyes of 199 patients who came to us at nine visits. And the follow-up went up to one year. And I think it's, it's a great strength of the study just because you will see what's happening during the healing phase in hyperopia. The mean spherical equivalent for all eyes treated was plus 3.2 diopters. And there were obviously uh, you know, a couple of eyes going for very, very high numbers, but in general, it was a very reasonable range. Now, when you look at the safety index, you would realize that after 12 months, we were back to index one. And as you know, you know remember the safety index is, is uh, um, best corrected visual acuity uh, compared preoperatively, postoperative to preoperatively. So I think it is quite remarkable because these are high proper treatments where we quite often lose a line or so. Um, look at the contrast sensitivity again. I want to look at the blue line, which is a preoperative contrast sensitivity, and a black line, which is a 12 uh, months contrast sensitivity. And you realize that there's a little gap starting at about 12 uh, cycles per degree and going into 18 cycles per degree, but uh, for, you know, for our daily uh, work, it's, it's absolutely okay and there's no loss of contrast sensitivity. Now here I'm going to show you my own data. I personally treat 91 eyes, uh, a more typical hyperop in Western society being a presbyopic age, so 42.8 years, 43 plus minus 10 years, and for this reason, I had 66 eyes of those 91 eyes um, where I uh, performed an overcorrection, basically a monovision, uh, pushing one eye uh, into myopia for better um, near uh, uncorrected visual acuity. Fortunately, we don't have these, too many of these very high, high props. So it was uh, mean spherical equivalent two and a half diopters but I also had you know, a few eyes in the higher range. And the same for the cylinder, majority reasonable cylinder. But again, I had a couple of eyes with cylinders going almost up to five diopters a cell. Now let's look at the results. Um, so these are the results of 25 eyes that I uh, targeted for plano. And um, you can see here that uh, the post-operative uncorrected visual acuity, which is a, 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 a blue line here, was 76 and 76% 76 was 2020 and 88% was 2025, uh, which is, I think, uh, is quite good indeed. And uh, fortunately, I didn't have a single eye, uh, which would have lost two uh, uh, lines of visual acuity and had 9% with loss of one line and 30% of the gain one line. So I think this is a pretty good balance, particularly again, talking about hyperopia. Now, when we look at the stability, we're very, very happy at month three, six, nine. It was quite interesting that between months nine and 12, it was a little push into regression again. And I can tell you, you know, at this stage, it wasn't just, just my own data, 
Also, other investigators had a similar uh, uh, reaction. We don't know why is it. It's a little bit unusual, and something we need to look into in the future. Perhaps it's late epithelial healing. Um, epithelial mapping was not a part uh, of, of, of the study, uh, but something needs to be looked into. And when you look at the refractive outcomes, something we also know from LASIK surgery, as long as we were still within three, three and a half diopters, everything looks fine. But you see beyond three diopters, we start to have regression. And uh, again, this was a nomogram a smile derived from hyperopic flex study on 46 uh, eyes. So, uh, um, you know, the, the real nomogram for the future will be better because obviously we can adjust this here um, using the, the data we achieved. Um, so the better refractive outcomes are probably due to better nomograms. Remember, we had a 70% after hyperopic flex in my previous study, now my own work is 81%, 81% within half of a day after intended corrections, and 93% within one day after intended corrections. Indeed, it is even marginally better than the refracted outcomes from a hyperopic femtolasic study with NL90, published by Dan Reinstein in 2018. And the astigmatism perform also very well. Obviously, I mark the eyes with astigmatism higher than 1.5 diopters, as we all learned from Sri Ganesh. Um, so uh, um, as you can see, the vast majority of post-operative astigmatism, again, this is a bluish line, was less than 0.5 or equal 0.5 diopters, still very nice physiological result. So I don't have any doubts that we will get an approval uh, for the hyperopic style as the study, but uh, we also learned something from it. Well, first thing, the critical issue, in my opinion, is the M size treatment pack. Obviously, it's mandatory because you've got to create large lenticles, but you deal with small eyes, small white to white. So time is an issue, and I'll tell you, uh, Sometimes you were just sort of sitting and, and, and hoping, you know, please, you know, stay still, stay still, uh, just hoping you're not going to have a, a suction loss. And my suction loss rate in this study it, for those 91 eyes treated was 0.7%, which is uh, uh, more than double of my suction loss for my optic smile. And when you look at the overall study, the suction loss rate was 1.34%. So it's just too high. Uh, how can we improve it and how can we uh, you know, um, deal with this problem? Well, the solution is simply, you know, yes, we did the study with a MELF, uh, we're sorry, with, with a Visamax 500 because it's the laser we'll have, but now there's a new laser, the Visamax 800. It is three times faster and also has centration cycle torsion. And uh, this will be the solution. Now here, I'll show you a, a, a video of a hyperopic smile on porcine eyes, but uh, look at the time. I mean, we're talking about 12 seconds. This is it, boom. Okay, so this is the way to go. And on top of it, you get a better uh, centration and a better cyclotorsion control. So coming to the conclusion, I think you believe that integration of hyperopic smile into the new Visimax 800 really makes sense and uh, it will provide a new excellent option for hyperopia and hyperopic astigmatism um, correction in the future. And it's going to be a very near future. Thank you, Dr. Sikendo. It was uh, uh, really uh, very uh, an eye opener and a wonderful talk. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, no, next, next, we have Dr. Rohit Shetty, who is the Vice Chairman of Narayan Netralay Bengaluru, and he'll be talking on how newer dimensions imaging will change refractive surgery. Dr. Rohit Shetty.
Thank you, sir. And uh, thanks, Titya, sir, madam, and the AIMS uh, faculty for uh, giving me this opportunity. My talk today is uh, how newer dimensions uh, lasers imaging will uh, change the refractive surgery. These are my financial interests. The evolution of uh, modern day refractive surgery has moved on from a simple topographer uh, to something more advanced today with mix of multiple things. One of the challenges is when you speak about new things, the first thing which comes to your mind is as you keep growing, your numbers will drop. That's the fear of new techniques and technologies, especially as far as imaging is concerned. In fact, uh, at the end of my talk, I'll try to convince you that new technologies does not create drops, but it'll also help you to increase your practice in some way or the other. So with the time allotted to me, I'll talk about three important things, which is my area of work. One is looking at the fund foundation collagen, uh, AI, and uh, the kits, which looks at the cell biology aspects of it. So what I'm going to speak is about a new dimension OCT, which helps to look beyond our topographies. When you look at these kind of topographies here, you are, you are worried about the biomechanics, you're worried about these areas, and you really don't know whether you want to do or operate on them or just ignore them. Both are a challenge. You know, if you operate on them, there's a fear that you may end up in ectasia or something else. If you don't operate on them, that's also not right because somebody who's eligible, not giving them the right to see without glasses is also not right. But all the investigation modalities speak different languages. So what do we do on this? So even your topography and biomechanics, again, sometimes, or most of the time, speak different uh, languages. So we are in the process of commercializing this. This took a few years now. It's using a very high definition OCT and using the polarization light to look at the collagen itself because ultimately everything is, everything is on the collagen. A healthy collagen looks like this. These are your peripheral fibers. A lot of papers on these subjects would be used in our practice. So let's go back to the same case and see how the collagen is. This is a Bauman's thickness. And this is again very important because when you use a very high definition OCTs, you can actually measure the Bauman's. The Bauman thickness, actually the thinner the Bauman's is an early sign of a potential problem or ectasia. So what we started looking at is the same patient, when we actually image the collagen, the collagen looks quite doubtful here. You can see that the darker the colors means the collagen uh, orientation is very strong. The lighter the colors here, it's sometimes on screen, you don't really pick this up. But if you on the laptop, it's saying that, you know, this is not as good as this, which is a healthy one as a reference. So this person is actually not a good candidate for LASIK. You can probably look at a PRK or just don't do anything about it because the collagen is weaker. Now, this patient has come to you for a refractive surgery. Again, a doubtful biomechanics looks stronger here. But a stronger color means the Bauman's is very strong. This means that the Bauman's thickness is stronger than what is normal. So you're actually looking at the Bauman's level now because that is where the earliest sign of a disease happens. And what was actually happening is that the, the, the re reason why there was an inferior stiffening is an epithelial change. And you can see that the collagen is very strong. So you can easily go and do a refractive surgery on this patient, in, even though your bad D is a little suspicious and you have an inferior steepening. So I'm just giving an example how the, the whole process of refractive surgery would change with these kind of techniques. This is again a case of post lasic ectasia. Every post lasic ectasia, we don't need to jump and do a procedure. Very anything above 12 or 13 microns is pretty good for a for a Bauman's. You can see that even though this is a post lasic ectasia, the collagen is not as weak as the keratoconic eyes. So you can actually observe this. And this is a case where a stable keratoconus for more than three years, you can see that even the patient is keratoconic, his collagen is very strong. So this shows, just shows that if you're healthy collagen, even though the topography is showing as ectasia, and this patient I be observed because we knew that this would probably would not progress. Even that can be looked into this. And there are different uh, classification. I don't want to go into this at this point of time. It helps to look at how your collagen cross-linking is working. 
you can see that post cross linking what happens it can help even eye rubbing sorry even eye rubbing and uh, sorry eye rubbing and how you can reduce eye rubbing and use uh, cyclosporin and trehalose drops no financial interest in how the collagen changes when your eye rubbing have eye rubbing changes you can see the amount of collagen build up here exactly what you would see in a normal patient this is a keratoconic eye so every single thing is directly seen on your collagen which is the most important thing for a refractive surgeon and that is what is going to be the future the second one is all about ai because when you look at a lot of new imaging a lot of things get confused and we don't know which one would be the safest one to do so build a team which looked at building a very strong simulation modeling which looks at multiple parameters and try to give it in a in 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 a software form and this software what it does is it tells you with each procedure how much is the percentage of weakness caused before you when you do the procedure before you do the surgery and that's all based on the machine learning and it will tell you in newtons per meter what procedure would cause the least amount of corneal weakening and based on that you can actually choose the type of procedure for that particular patient and also gives you predictive risk of ectasia if you do a smile or lasik or any of these procedures and this is what would be the future in most of our refractive surgery the final thing is about by bi bringing biology to your clinic is about understanding the different healing patterns of refractive surgery and this is a small one minute left this is a small uh, sorry i just play this video and uh, this small video about how from the tears you are able to collect this and earlier it used to be in the lab now it's in my clinic and my fellows do it and it just takes around 30 30 35 minutes to give the report of all these parameters which actually cause changes in the wound healing dryness and including from for retina flux it you have the wedge falls out here based on that you can actually pick up post refractive or any dryness which type of drops would be the best way to do in, for example if tomorrow liftigras comes we would know whether liftigras does work with this patient or not and even mmp nines you can look at the change in because these are all very common post refractive surgery challenges in summary what i feel is i've just shown the just the gist of it the future is on high definition octs the future is on ai and future is on integrating cell biology to your clinic thank you thank you dr rohit for a wonderful presentation uh, we move on to the next speaker we have uh, dr sonu goel who will be talking about when going gets tough smile A well, very good afternoon, and at the outset, I'd like to thank Professor Dr. Thial and the entire RPC faculty for giving me this opportunity. So, I would just like to extend what Walter said: the suction loss is almost like one point five percent. So, when the going gets tough, we need to smile. and to all my colleagues who practice refractive but not being doing smile so i think there are four crucial steps when you do smile the first is the lenticular cut the lenticular side cut you have the cap cut and you have the cap side cut so the four critical steps when you are doing this refractive surgery and this is what you know my makes my heart pound when i the moment i apply suction i keep my fingers crossed and pray everything goes well so suction loss is the biggest bug when you do smile and this critically stands holds true for me when the lenticule is cut more than 10% but there is no lenticule side cut and that is what you know prevents you to doing smile or a lenticule and transits to making a flap so this is the area where you really need to work smart and this can be how you can play follows the videos here so uh, this is one patient suction applied now watch my vocal commands appear but the eyes keep on dancing the patient is a hyper anxiety type a personality and look i am still able to do away my verbal commands keep on and at times i feel i'm gone i'm gone but pray pray but still yes successfully you're able to transit and you're able to you know 
take away with the situation. So you need to be yourself cool, smile and make your patient less anxious at the moment when you're performing the surgery. So watch carefully. So this is the lenticule and now watch, watch. So I know something brewing in, but I'm safe. My lenticule side cut is over and I'm now doing the flap. So I have the foot pedal and the suction under my control. The moment I see this, I withdraw. So here I have purposefully stopped the suction and then rebuild. I just go back, put in the centration and go back and apply the suction and the rest of the procedure can easily be attempted. So that means suction itself, you know, you can hold, remove, and then you can, you know, take away with this. So another situation, watch carefully. So now look, something brewing in, now I'm praying, let the lenticule side cut be over because this is the critical step. If I go here, it'll convert to a flap. So here it is. Now it is at this moment that I withdraw. I have withdrawn the foot pedal because I knew that this is going to break. See now, I know this is coming up. So I withdraw and I'm in the safe zone. So where I can start the cap cut now from this position. So again, you can center, reapply and safely you can take away this situation. So your nerves as a surgeon, the patient, this has to be cool. And as the international studies all denote that the suction loss is a major nuance and coming off with the hyperopia where you have the treatment time close to 35 seconds, I think suction is going to play an important role. So we do almost two millimeter uh, incision and uh, come again. So uh, this is an architect who was working with us in our place and uh, this girl, poor girl, had an injury with a pencil trauma. One of our, uh, sorry, one of our colleagues hit her hard and she had a self-sealed coronal injury with small amount of, no, no, I'm sorry. So if you watch carefully, she has this lesion here and it's a small self-sealed conal and the, the pupil is ovalized, the optic zone is large. So we were talking about doing a trans epithelial PRK, which she you know, refused, her sister had got, she was very, very apprehensive of the pain. So we planned, I talked to a lot of people doing smiles. So she, they said that you can plan. So what we do here is we uh, do a large optical zone, maybe 6.4 here after uh, calculating out the right pupil uh, size and uh, very carefully we go, you can see here, uh, but I do not have any uh, losses, still maintaining the suction and I'm able to create a good lenticule here and very carefully the dissection. And if you see under the slit lamp, you see a bump here. So it's a small conjunctival raised area, but we were lucky that there was no breach in that area. And the rest of the dissection could be smooth. It's a two millimeter that we always target, identifying both the lenticule underneath the cap I am, a smooth dissection, 360 degree. I always leave a small hump here, go underneath, dissect, and I'm being very careful and very carefully dissected. And this is the final outcome. This is the final post-op picture. Yet another case. So this was again, a very apprehensive patient. So this is the first eye. Watch carefully. The conjunctiva is coming up here. So it could be a loose conjunctiva as well as an over apprehensive patient. This is the first eye of the patient, which makes me uh, very cautious when I would be attempting the second eye. So quickly 
this I done. Hydro, this is, and then we take over the second eye. Now watch carefully. Watch, now this is an area where the lenticule cut hasn't initiated. I'm starting to having suction loss, so I cannot withdraw. If I withdraw, I'll have to convert to a flap. So what I do is I continue until I'm able to do a lenticule cut, but I'm very clear here. So lenticle cut has happened, but I need to look into this area because this would be the area which is uncut. So once this is done, I now withdraw my foot pedal. I go back, mark the center. Carefully mark, redock, and then I'm able to complete the cap and the side. So now while dissecting, I have to be very careful because this is the area where the lenticule has not been cut. So I separate very carefully, go underneath the cap. This could be easy. Still the two areas not being very well demarcated. So I go back, separate, go underneath the cap, separate this out. And now the moment I go in underneath the lenticule, it's smooth till here. But the moment I go on the right side, this is the area which is uncut. So now this is what Shri has taught us. You can do a good rexis out here and very slowly, if you see carefully, I'm able to strip it off by that rexis technique. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sonu. It was a very nice uh, presentation. We now move on to our next speaker, who is Dr. Krishna Prasad Kudlu, and he will be speaking on residual error for smile, when and how to treat. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. I thank uh, Professor Tithyal sir, Namrata Madam, Kokar sir, and Manpreet for this opportunity. So I think after very interesting talk, now we'll be coming to the what and all the complication you can see with uh, SMILE. This is my financial disclosure. So as most of the previous speaker said that safety and efficacy is a very well established SMILE. I think if you can see post smile enhancement was needed only in 2.7 up to 4% of the cases. In most of around 77% of the eyes achieving a correction within plus or minus point after the intended target. <clears throat> the main issue with the smile is repeatability. The problem arises difficulty to identify the original lenticule plane and creating a second lenticule and also creation of second lenticule sometimes may interfere with the incision of the initial smile procedure. Even it, sometimes with the loose stromal fragments and subsequent difficulty in lenticle dissection while you are taking the uh, other lenticule. So these are the retreatment options. You can do surface ablation, you can do LASIK also. Most popular one is circle pattern. Even there are a couple of procedures still yet to come. One is subcap lenticle extraction and secondary smile. These are the indication for retreatment post smile. One is primary under correction, primary over correction, post surgery regression, and sometimes with a irregular astigmatism as a result of decentered ablation. What are the risk factors for retreatment, especially patient more than 35 years? Uh, Magnitude of the refractive, especially when you're treating more than six diopters of uh, myopia. And so, mm, one of the most common complications, as Dr. Sonu said, that there is after suction loss. Even the beginning, beginning, I think most of us come up with this complication with the excess of uh, surgical manipulation. So coming to the preoperative consideration, so you need to find out how much is the magnitude of the refractive correction. 
how much is the rst remaining and what is happened during the intraoperative and postoperative complication because all this surgery will be recorded in the machine you can take out the videos then you can see all my cases i do cycloplegic and manifest refraction but i keep at least minimum 3 months to be allowed before considering for any of the retreatment so coming to the decision making in case of a very thick cap if you have already done it with a 130 140 micron then you can think about a thin flap lasik in case of you are already done a very thin cap that is around 100 to 110 micron then you can think about pr case a better option suppose if you are already patient if you when you see under the set lamp if you are already having a interface haze then prk has to be avoided because it can even worse on the overall outcomes so in case of a borderline uh, rsbt always uh, uh, further ablation beneath the interface should be avoided in the cap ablation like a prk or thin flap plastic can be considered of course when we explain to the patient before procedure smile is a a uh, flapless procedure sometimes we may have to explain to the patient that especially patients with a contact sport uh, you may have to do only prk so i will not be talking about much about the prk but optical zone normally we have to keep around 6.5 mm mitomycin c is, is mandatory so in case of a very thin uh, smile cap as i already said that thin flap lasik can be done so when you are doing a thin flap lasik always uh, you have to uh, be very careful so prefer we do the femto lasik then you just take out take out the flap then whatever the residual error then you can continue with the excimer ablation so flap even thin flap lasik flap sitting can be customized always you should keep a flap diameter larger than the whatever the initial smile cap that is very important so oh, whenever you do a deep plastic flap which is extending beyond the initial cap is also an option but sometimes it may even interfere with the previous incision so the most popular one is the circle pattern it has got a three Uh, parts that is lamellar ring side cut and the junction cut i will not be talking about the what exactly is this but the most popular one everybody is practicing called a pattern d what happens here it creates a lamellar ring adjacent to the smile pocket cut at the same depth of the pocket so the advantage is it eliminates the any risk of multiple dissection plane in the optical zone this is a video of circle pattern so it put the incision now it cut the cap into a flap only thing is whenever there is a oh, post smile residual refractory error i think you need to have a excimer machine also there in your armamentarium uh, otherwise you have to refer to the other center wherever the so oh, examer laser availability is there so these are the pipeline coming in this thing subcap lenticular extraction in nothing but a modified repeat smile as dr sri ganesh was telling that they have incorporated in the newer machine about uh, how to do a repeat smile in that machine but i don't have personal experience with that even they are even trying with a secondary smile where already there is a previous smile cap is there underneath that they are doing the one more pocket to take out the lenticule and uh, come up the results yet to come i think we need to talk to the experienced surgeons who those who are dealing with the visumax 800 thank you one and all for the wonderful opportunity in the end i just want to tell you that oh, oh, last word the advantage of flapless procedure always we tell the patient that we are doing smile flapless sometimes we may have to explain to the patient that we may have to take out the flap and uh, put the examiner application this is very very important thank you anand all for the opportunity thank you dr kudlu uh, our next speaker is dr chitra ramamurthy who will be uh, talking on enhancements for myopic regression Dr. Chitra, please. 
a uh, very good afternoon can you hear me all of you yeah uh, a very good afternoon to one and all of you and uh, my very special thanks to dr tithyal for this wonderful opportunity and all the faculty of rpc and of course every single person of rpc for this great opportunity it's my ill luck that i um, not able to avail of the physical opportunity of meeting all of you so without ado i shall go on to my talk on enhancement approaches in the myopic regression we what we do understand is all of us especially based on the talks which you've heard what comes to the forefront is when it comes to refractive surgery it is how optimal you get in your primary procedure and if you are caught in a quandary where there is a residual refractive error how would you address it as optimally as you were planning to in the primary situation so regression which is what is uh, the talk about and how to correct this is seen when you are treating very high refractive errors when the stromal bed is thin when you are erroneously using a smaller optic zone and whenever there is a higher astigmatism which needs to be corrected older age group dry eye and of course we can always need to always keep in mind that one of those rare patients could have had a progression of axial length because of which there has been a myopic shift or a latent hyperopia which could gets unraveled and of course the lenticular shifts so just as there are multifactorial causes there are multifactorial responses essentially regression is all about epithelial hyperplasia and remodeling which occurs and this gets triggered more if there is an inflammatory cascade or if there is an altered reinnervation patterns like if there is a mild inflammation in these eyes or there is a dry eye status these could trigger an regression again if there is a greater change in curvature or a steeper gradient is created because of the high myopic correction or a hyperopic correction or a greater curvature change induced by correcting a high quantum of astigmatism there could be again an increased epithelial response and remodeling so then again whenever there is a th thinning of the uh, cornea this reduced tensile strength could actually create a stromal biomechanical response where the intraocular pressure of the eye pushes this thinned out uh, uh, corneal thickness uh, pushes the posterior lamella forward and that could also cause a myopic shift and that's why there is this talk on and off about the temporary role of iop lowering agents in some of these eyes wherein it looks like an apparent regression regression has also been seen more in microkeratoma flaps versus femtoflaps again because of the architectural change and it is also seen in eyes where they have done a prk for higher corrections which is why we it mandates that we use mitomycin for a longer duration of time in these eyes and we know as was told by the earlier speaker that in lasik the chances of regression is far more than in smile so then we need to investigate we need to plan the course of management so most primarily on the slit lamp you would see whether you are able to define the slit, uh, flap edge whether it looks more fibrous at the edge does the flap look centered do the hinge look safe enough the characteristics of the hinge it's not a low hinge or it's not a very thinned out hinge you need to look at the topography to know what is the corneal thickness do you feel there is a pachymetric progression is the surface regular is it an asymmetric bow tie or a skewing or an inferior steepening which you are missing out is there any suspicious elevated elevation points in the anterior and posterior float the investigation does not stop with that it mandates that you do an abrometry to check the pupil size and what is the optic zone you use primarily could you play around it and enlarge the optic zone which could also be co uh, contributing to the poor quality of vision for the patient is there an increase in higher order abrasion or the psf does it feel that you should keep away from the corneal surface altogether and not do an enhancement in these eyes you need to look at the epithelial maps to plan accurately how you are going to do the epithelial removal and an accurate surface ablation of course you need to do a biometry to rule out an axial length elongation or a progression of myopia and an asoct is such a major help because it helps to identify the flap thickness the uniformity of the flap and any 
primary challenges which occurred in the first surgery, like a very thin flap or a buttonhole flap or some kind of a opacity or haze which is therein. And of course, dry air status is absolutely mandated because if you have a dry air status, we need to aggressively treat it. And till we have treated it, we need to defer doing taking these eyes up for enhancement. So then what do we do? Do we lift the flap? Yes, there are specific indications to lift the flap. Of course, like with, if it is within the first three years, it makes more sense because the chances of epithelial ingrowth based on different studies tell us that the chances are left if you have lifted the flap within three years. Would you recut the flap? The chances of recutting has become far, far less now with a greater understanding. But there are situations where you would consider recutting a flap. If you've had a primary decentered flap, when you would like to go ahead and take a deeper cut and the corneal thickness allows, and then you create a larger flap and then go ahead and treat. But largely, surface ablation seems to be the right answer for all these post classic post smile and post RK regressions. And if you could combine it with cross-linking in indicated situation, it just gives you that extra safeguard. And of course, if the fla initial flap was thick enough, you could even do a mini flap, or you could convert a cap of the smile to a flap if the primary cap was uh, planned to be a thicker uh, cap or in flap plastic, a smile over smile, or if the res residual refractive error is more, you could do a fake IOL. So as I had said, if you're going to do a flap lift, it's best before three, less than three years, but you should also define the flap edge and ensure that you do a smooth lift without uh, uh, disrupting the epithelium around. And you should aim for a centered ablation and again, avoid lifting very thin flaps, buttonhole, irregular flaps with low hinges. And if the flap is has to be lifted beyond three years due to different indications, it makes sense to debride the epithelium a little beyond the flap margin all around. Again, as I had earlier alluded to, if the original flap is decentered, it's small. And if the corneal thickness allows, you could create a deeper cut, a larger diameter if it allows. And of course, but we need to keep in mind that when you cut a flap, you could really fragment the flap and there could be an irregular stigmatism and a loss of BCFA and it's not an ideal procedure. Now, this was a case where the initial flap was decentered and small and a deeper flap cut is created because, and then we have gone ahead and lifted the uh, flap and done the treatment. Surface ablations, of course, is a safe option mostly, but you could decide to do a topo-guided approach if it is an irregular corneal surface, which has got primarily created and mitomycin usage is absolutely mandated, or you could combine it with low fluency CXN. Again, what you need to keep in mind, if the original flap is thin and you're doing a surface ablation, you should expect some micro striae to appear. And you have to also ensure that you might have to prolong the usage of BCL. The topical steroids may need to be used longer and lubricants are far more stringent when you're doing an enhancement. When it comes to smile, I'm not going to discuss much on it because it's already been discussed. The, um, the desire to remain flapless is what is most important. So you would do a PRK if you want to do that. But the depth of the cap and what is the residual stromal bed. Sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Uh, Chitra. Uh, yeah. I would request you to please sum up in the next 30 yeah. seconds. Thank yeah. you. So then these are the different options which could be looked at. And of course, uh, what you need to understand is when you do a thin flap plastic, you should be very conscious that the cap thickness is at least 130 micron because there could be a gas breakthrough which could occur in these eyes. And secondary smile, anterior and posterior, of course, I have a limited experience, but these are ways to go. The last option is a circle software, which has been very beautifully discussed. And the D approach makes the biggest sense where you are able to create the lamellar ring, the junction cut and the side cut in the same plane as the pocket. And then you need to lift the flap and treat it. So, of course, fake kyoles are the very large last options when there's a large res residual error. We need to keep in mind that ectasia has to be forewarned, DLK is possible, rare occurrence <clears throat> infections are there and epithelial ingrowths are possible. But I would like to conclude stating that well investigated regressions can definitely be very well managed. Thank you all for this wonderful opportunity and thanks. Sorry for crossing the time a little. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chitra, for a very nice and comprehensive presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Sheetal Brar, who will be uh, whose topic is safety and efficacy of Bowman's membrane relaxation for enhancement following tissue addition for high hyperopia.
Thank you so much, sir. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Namrata Ma'am and Tial sir for this uh, amazing opportunity. Uh, my talk today is uh, uh, on the long-term outcomes of Bowman's membrane relaxation, uh, which is a new <clears throat> sorry a new technique for enhancement following tissue addition techniques for management of high hypropia. So I hope my slides are visible and voice is clear. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, in 2000, <clears throat> sorry, in 2014, our, uh, we published this paper, which discussed the feasibility of use of cryopreserved smile lenticules for potential use in human subjects for treatment of high hypropic, uh, high hypropia. Now, this particular technique we named as FILI or femtosecond laser intrastomal lenticule implantation. And this was based on a very simple Barragas law, which states that if tissue subtraction from center of the cornea corrects myopia, which we all know, then an equal amount of tissue addition to the center of the cornea should also correct hypropia. So the, uh, we, uh, this was the methodology that was used. We used to match lenticules, smile lenticules from, from donor uh, patients who were undergoing smile for myopia correction. And after the informed consent and serology, uh, we used to cryopreserve these lenticules. And whenever we found a patient of hypropia uh, whose, len whose uh, refraction was matched with the lenticules, the smile lenticules, we used to post the case. So uh, essentially in this, uh, we used to, uh, we create a lent uh, an intracorneal pocket at 160 microns using femtosecond laser. This pocket was then dissected. And then the donor lenticule uh, was marked in the center and finally it was implanted in the pocket and centered on the corneal uh, vertex. So very simple technique and we achieved uh, quite good results, especially for uh, low to moderate hypropia. And uh, this is the case where the patient's hypropic error was plus 4.25 and the donor tissue used was minus 4.5. And we got a good correction. And you can see here that the uh, steepening is quite uniform and well-centered. However, we learned few lessons um, down the line and uh, one of the most important learnings that we had from uh, this whole experience was that uh, we observed a significant undercorrection in those eyes whose hypropia was very high. So uh, eyes more than plus six diopters, we used to observe undercorrection uh, and there was a bit of residual refractive error which uh, due to which the patient was not very happy for distance and it affected the near vision also. So here we had a patient. So four eyes of three patients had high residual refractive error and uh, one of them had manifest refraction of plus nine. Uh, lenticule power used was minus 9.5 and patient ended up having a post-op residue of plus 2.5 diopters. So he's not happy for distance nor for near. So uh, we thought we can do, probably we can do something um, to enhance, uh, we had different options such as PRK and LASIK, but then we came up with a novel idea of Bowman's membrane relaxation, which I'm going to describe. So first, let us try to understand why we get undercorrection in high hypropic uh, cases, high hypropic cases where we are using a tissue for correction. So as we all know uh, that the anterior corneal stroma is the toughest part of the cornea and it is it consists of a network of highly interwoven collagen lamellae that insert into Bowman's membrane. So this part has a very high tensile strength, which is about 50% more stiffer than the mid or the posterior stroma. And the anterior part is also resistant to any kind of swelling or expansion. And this is why this uh, actually is the main structure that uh, plays a role in the preservation of uh, corneal curvature. Now, what happens when we implant a tissue or lenticule in the cornea? especially if the lenticule is thick, of course, we are going to see both anterior and posterior uh, uh, changes, but you can expect more posterior curvature changes <clears throat> because what happens is that <clears throat> the tissue becomes compartmentalized between the anterior layers and the posterior layers. Now, posterior layers being more uh, pliable and softer and uh, having a more porous structure, so uh, they get more uh, uh, basically this expansion. And uh, what happens is that the, the Bowman's, the decimal layer, it expands backwards towards the anterior chamber. And this negates the anterior steepening effect that was achieved uh, by the tissue addition. So uh, 
uh, how we do the bo uh, Bowman's memory relaxation is a very simple technique. <clears throat> so we use the Hesburgh uh, Baron Trifine and we place it on the cornea, uh, keeping the crosshairs in the center aligned to the corneal vertex. So first we give a mark on the cornea. So here we are using a seven millimeter uh, diameter refine and then, <clears throat> excuse me, two turns of the refine are taken. So as we all know, one turn is approximately 60 microns. So two turns becomes 120 to 130 microns. So finally, we open up the incision. So what it does, it is incising the Bowman's layer, uh, Bowman's membrane, as well as the anterior uh, 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 layers of the cornea also. So uh, after the BMR is done, it essentially relaxes the anterior layers and creates additional space in the anterior cornea, allowing forward expansion of the lenticule and further steepening. So the lenticule, which was pressurized and, and it was compartmentalized now has, can actually expand One slightly left. forward. And uh, this also leads to reversal of the posterior curvature changes. So just showing you the results. So our mean preoperative uh, residual refractive error was plus 2.25, which reduced to only plus 0.31 at the end of 36 months. These are the changes in the corneal parameters. All parameters changed, but the most characteristic change can be seen in the back keratometry. The value has come back exactly what it was before the tissue was implanted, minus 6.3. And after the tissue was implanted, it became minus 5.9, which, which is a more positive, showing that the denticle is pushed towards the anterior chamber. And after uh, BMR, it has become again 6.3. Uh, so, so the changes have been reversed. Changes in Q value and abrasions. So Q value has further increased showing further steepening from uh, minus 0.93 to minus 0.12. And uh, these are the changes in the biomechanics. Essentially all parameters, especially the stress strain index has reduced from 1.92 to 1.05 showing the weakening of the corneal biomechanics. So case one had a steepening of plus two diopters. You can see these are the difference maps, pre-enhancement and post-enhancement. Case two also had a steepening of 1.9 diopters, post-enhancement. Case three had plus four diopter steepening and case five, uh, three had uh, the left eye of the same patient had plus five diopters. You can see there is a significant increase in the curvature of the cornea after the Bowman membrane was relaxed. And uh, this is the, uh, these are the clinical pictures of uh, the third patient, right and left eye. You can see that this is the, uh, the scar of the BMR, uh, which is plugged by the epithelium and it is well outside the mesopic pupil zone. And this is the ASOCT showing the primary filial lenticule in situ and the, uh, the, the incision of the Bowman's membrane uh, relaxation. So the potential limitation, the sample size of four eyes is actually too small to derive any pneumograms. However, considering uh, that the setting itself is very unique, you have a high hypropic uh, error, which is managed by tissue addition and further enhanced with BMR is rare. So I think this four eyes also can actually, uh, uh, we can learn a lot from these cases. So to our knowledge, this is the first report on BMR and its long-term outcomes in this unique setting. BMR could potentially be a practical, technically easier and relatively cost effective alternative to PRK or LASIK, which are the common uh, enhancement procedures after uh, um, any kind of refractive surgery. And especially after tissue addition, this technique seems to work well. And our initial research uh, paves the way for future research in, on this subject. Thank you so much for your kind attention and the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Sheetal. It was a very nice presentation, something very novel. Uh, now we have Dr. Sudarshan Khokar, who will be talking on pre-operative assessment and sizing in fakic IOLs. You're muted. It's not in my control here. <laughs> you have muted me. <laughs> not at all. Okay. Not at all. So when the going goes tough, you can change the situation or you can change the scenario altogether. So if your smile is not working, your elastic is not working, you're still trying to cut the cornea, right? Why can't we go to the non-corneal surgeries? So I think this is the last talk. I'm a pinch hitter for, hitter for this one. And uh, as, as a showstopper, some people use that word. I don't mind that. So 
when do you do these procedures? I think you should always have an option open in case you have a doubtful cornea. Corneas which are, how does it go up and down? Okay, here. Okay, so this, these are the options which we have and these are the FDA approved indication, but uh, I'd be surprised. I mean, there are people who cross this limit and go everywhere. It's their own risk, but this is what the FDA, if there's a, a court case, FDA thing will work. So abnormal corneas, very thin corneas, Try not to play around with those ones. If there's a form of first day, you keep a finger across. You don't know why it happened in the first place. And the moment you cut the cornea, you stimulate the cornea, it might just go out of control. So avoid those ones. Asymmetrical thin corneas and very high amount of refractive corrections if you want. You want a high myopic or haperopic and a high cylinder. Okay. So when you're doing a patient for the, uh, for the fakie lenses, I don't think you need too much of a machine to actually start working on. You need to have a good ultrasonic uh, machine so you can pick up anterior chamber depth. You can do a gonioscopy and do the angle structure you can see. You can do a speckler. You can see the, always try to see if there's a patient having a cataract and any other problem which you can actually increase by doing your procedure. And if it's a very high refractive power, always counsel them for bioptics. Okay. So what do you test? You check the pupil size. At the RP center, we normally have two days follow-up uh, checkup for these patients. The first time when the patient comes, Undilated, we do the surface curvature of the patient, then we dilate the patient the same day, do a wet refraction and indirect ophthalmoscopy because you're not treating myopia. So retina has to be evaluated and every six months, one year, they have to come back because retina, in case it has to go off, it will definitely go off. Then what you try to see is you try to put the patient on a slit lamp after dilatation and try to see if there's any change in the lens. If they're there, please mark them and tell the patient beforehand that you have a cataract here or there. Take a picture and show the patient. Otherwise, every, all this thing will be pointed towards you after the surgery. And I can see the ASG guys all smiling there. Good. Guys, follow that. Okay, so you indirect to the endothelial count, IOP, and you don't need very big machinery for all this stuff. Okay? And in case you find a break in the laser, retina or laser somewhere, please do the laser and wait at least four to six weeks. Patient not going to run away. Even if you run away, you're going to be out of trouble. You should be happy this patient not coming back till the retina is fully secure. Okay. So what are you going to do? You're going to see the size of the lens and the power of the lens. And power of the lens is in your hand. If you don't do the refractions yourself, I think the best way to do is to do duochrome tests in all these patients yourself. The surgeon should do it. Don't depend on anybody. If you have a refractionist who's really good and who's been doing you for, for you for a long, long time, you can follow that. Otherwise, you might get in trouble. Coming to the size, size is never accurate because you've got only four sizes to fit all the patients. But if you see the statistics, 12.6 and 13.2, these are the lenses which are, I think 95% patients fit into this one. I think everybody will agree to that. So how do they fix fit there? Okay, so what, if you measure them, it's still not very accurate. You can do UBM. If you have a problem in patients in which your excel length and the white to white, is not going in sync. You realize that there's some asymmetry, then those are the best patients to be taken up on a UBM. A 35 megahertz yeah, UBM yeah, can yeah, give you through and through, as you can see in the first yeah, picture yeah, here. Yeah. Otherwise, a caliper is the safest and give you the best results. So you can use this data and go ahead. So what happens is your size is not good. And this was a paper, by the way, in which Pope et al. found out a relationship between the sulcus to sulcus, angle to angle, and uh, white to white. But surprisingly, this patient was given very high importance. But what they did was they used a 50 megahertz uh, uh, US UBM and they took three pictures and made a collage and joined them. So there was error which was induced by measuring itself. So best is to use a 35 megahertz for this purpose. Okay, what happens if you use a size big? So this is what's going to happen. It's okay. This is a zero compression and this is a compression of one millimeter. So you're off by one millimeter size. Even if, if you notice this and you take the uh, uh, arithmetical logarithm, uh, regression formulas, it does not cause much issues. So even if your size goes one up and if you have V4C in the eye, it's not going to make a, a hell fall down. Your vaulting will be high. If your pressures are good, so what do you do if you think your vaulting is going to be high? So what you need to do is in those patients, I'll just come to that. So this is how you calculate the sizing. So that's my final take now. How do you measure the size? There are four sizes. Which one do you pick up for which eye? If you see the area which I've uh, uh, colored yellow, anterior chamber depth from 2.8 to 4.5. So if it's more than 4.5, you have to still put 4.5 because the machine is not going to take it. And if it's less than 2.8, please do not do the surgeries in these ones. Four point, more than 4.5, you can get in patients of keratoconus or if it's already healed up and you want to do it as a secondary procedure. But be careful that you can still burn your fingers. So always counsel these patients well. White to white is between 10 and 13.5 and there's no 
question to that. Less than 10, 10 you can't put a lens and more than 13.5, you don't have lenses for these eyes. Okay, so let's start with one. Less than 10.5 and more than 13, ACD, whatever it is, please do not put an implant in this one. Clear. Next. So you have 11, 11.5 11 and, and 12. So if you have an 11 CD, uh, white to white is 11 and you have a ACD less than three and more than three. So these are the parameter we've been following in RP Center for the last, I think, 15, 20 years. And we haven't burned our fingers yet. Okay, so if you pay, put a 12.1, you'll have a high watt. And if you put a 12, uh, you can have a moderate valve if it's more than three. Same size lens can have different wall depending on the interior chamber depth. Coming to the second group now, which is uh, 11.5. If you take a 12.5 here for less than three millimeter of ACD, you will have a high wall. But if you take a 12.1, it will be a low wall. So all these red ones, I avoid. I per se, I've been doing it for 20 years. I prefer high wall, the highest wall possible, which does not compromise the structure of the eye and the pressures are staying good is the way you should go. I have time. Oh, I thought somebody scratched. Okay, itchy fingers, right? Some, some people are trigger happy. <laughs> okay, so similarly, you go to the 12 millimeter. So you again have an option of 13.2 and a 12.6. Now, if your white to white is low, say it's touching 2.8 and your borderline, please stick one minute. <laughs> okay, okay. So this is very clear on this one. So coming to the last one now. So if it's 12.5, then 13.2 is uh, going to give you a moderate wall. And if you take 13.7, it will give you high wall for the same parameters. Okay. <laughs> If you're planning a high vault, always plan a little high vault. And uh, uh, for a myopic, if you're having a patient, you have to change the refractive power. Uh, you can uh, add uh, 0.25 more. And for the hyperopic, you can reduce 0.25 if you're going for the higher vault size. OK, uh, I think that's OK. I, I can stop it. I think so. I've already told you the sizing. Rest, I think everybody's a great surgeon here. So I don't have to tell that. But your sizing is the most important thing here, which I think kicks people back badly if you don't take care of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sudarshan, uh, for uh, summarizing the you know, and being a show stopper. <laughs> and I think we had a terrific uh, session on refractive surgery. And I'd like to thank all the you know, uh, speakers, panelists, and the chairpersons, and especially uh, looking into a beginning of a session, uh, Rupal had some problems. We are sorry that she could not finish our, our talk in time. We'll have enough opportunity to uh, have a, some more discussion and your sessions will be there. And I'd like to thank uh, Walter for being with us in a, or such a premier uh, academic uh, session of a refractive surgery. Thank you again for being with us. All the speakers, Dr. Rohit, uh, Sonu, and Kudlu coming for a, physically for this meeting uh, for refractive surgery. Thank you again. And uh, we would definitely like to welcome you people again and again in RP Center and wish you all the best and uh, be safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic session by all our speakers and very well moderated by Dr. Rajesh Sinha. Let's have a huge round of applause for all our speakers and our chairpersons. <laughs> Wonderful. With Thank this, you. we move on to the next session, which is looking beyond ophthalmology. How did they do it? Starting, establishing, and still going on. I would now quickly hand over to Dr. Namrata Sharma. Over to you, madam. Thank you. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Professor Titial, sir, for uh, letting us do this uh, great session. This is truly a session on inspiring diaries. And the title, as has already been uh, announced, is How Did They Do It? Start, how Did They Do It? Starting, Establishing, and Moving Ahead and Rocking. So for this, uh, the first speaker is going to be uh, Professor Maipal Sachdev, my teacher, Padmashri Awadi, Ames Luminous and RPC Luminous as well, left RP Center in 1996 for greener pastures and from a single clinic now to 53 centers. So he's going to be telling us about the story of Center for Sight Group of Hospitals, uh, which is a super specialty quality eye care service. Thank you, Namrata. Before this, uh, we'd like to invite the other chairpersons, Professor Radhika Tandon, Professor Sudarshan Kokar, Dr. Tanush Dada, Mandi Bajaj, Rajpal Bohra. They all can come in the dais.
जहां सीट मिलता बैठ जाओ एक कब्जा कर लो गुड आफ्टरनून डॉक्टर जीवन टटियाल मनदीप एंड अमृता ऑलवेज अ प्लेजर बींग बैक हेयर इन दिस ऑडिटोरियम हैव स्पेंट ट्वेंटी इयर्स ऑफ आवर फॉर्मेटिव इयर्स हेयर एंड ब्रिंग्स बैक मेमोरीज and uh, thanks very much for calling me to share the story of center of sight what is said is that you have to build your enterprise on firm foundations of fundamentals and fundamentals start from when you are born your family and then as you go on your teaching and i think uh, uh schooling modern schools spent 13 years not that i failed twice but there were two kindergartens and we spent 13 years in modern school 1976 uh 1st of august that's where the mbbs batch starts uh joined ai aims uh as an alumni had the fortune of uh, being selected out of 35 open seats and this is where it all started ophthalmology was my first choice uh that i took as my speciality ophthalmology ent is what we put we didn't have a need at that time and joined rp center which i call my shrine in 1982 and from 1982 to 1996 with one year break going on to georgetown university medical center i think that was what i would say my turning point in my life and uh, professor dwight kavana i think uh, what you people use that time we worked on uh, confocal microscopy and uh, mybography that's the time in uh, 1989 90 that the infrared mybography and tear osmolarity we did a lot of work on dry eye and contact lenses the extended wear but what looked at with dwight was that he was aiming for the nobel and that kind of set me thinking के उड़ान कितनी ऊंची उठते हैं लोग एंड आई थिंक दैट इन माई माइंड वट एवर वॉज हैपनिंग दैट बिकेम अ टिपिंग पॉइंट एंड आई फेल्ट दैट वेल मे बी आई वुड बी ऑब्वियसली बींग द यंगेस्ट ऑफ द फाइव फैकल्टी हुर सिलेक्टेड एंड ऑफकोर्स समथिंग वेंट रॉन्ग आई वुड बी चीफ आर पी सेंटर वन डे मे बी डायरेक्टर एम्स बट इज दैट वॉट माई रेकनिंग इज सो दैट इज वेन आई डिसाइडेड टू स्टेप आउट ऑफ माई कम्फर्ट जोन आफ्टर हैविंग रिटर्न वर्क इन एम्स फॉर एन अदर फाइव सिक्स ईयर्स and that is when you want to realize as to what you want to do further and that is the story of center of sight there was definitely a need for a super speciality niche hospital uh, there was no player in the corporate sector in north india south india had and still has lot of charity organizations and that's something that i uh, thought that you can always keep on doing charity but your concept should be very clear you shouldn't mix uh, make charity a business and uh, uh, look at that so i thought that we should have a corporate sector in north india at that time uh, we looked at building an institution for the future and to move beyond cataract because at that time the only thing that people were doing was refraction and cataract so we looked at uh, having world class super specialized care and clinical excellence and know how also to get in of the business of ophthalmology the ideology was clear and that was to create an institution that should be above self excellence should be the key word above quick profits profits always follow and that is not the goal or the ultimate thing the ultimate thing is to create an institution and be excellent about that and something that always enamored me was technology so wanting to do first in technology was something that i wanted to and the craving was to create a platform for excellence an opportunity to lead with cutting edge technology with a super specialty team and we worked very hard to get this super specialty team the reputation and strength of an institution takes years and years to create and that is what was a long arduous path that we set on on and this platform needed to create a difference it wasn't about what role i will have in this platform but about the ultimate goal and as they say that without a purpose that is bigger than yourself you are likely to serve only yourself so you need to actively promote the institution and you need to actively promote others to do that 
one important thing that anybody youngsters would need to do is that you need to do what is called as a SWOT analysis. And we did go onto a drawing board. I did write as to what I am looking at, where I will be, where center for site would be after five years, 10 years. And that is what you have to look. What were our strengths? What were the opportunities? And what were the weaknesses and the threats? And these are the things that we worked on. Obviously, the weakness and the threats was that I did not have any lineage whatsoever of private practice of having set up or nor did I have the money. It was my GPF and my gratuity that, sorry, I didn't even get the gratuity. So it was my GPF and my uh, uh, the other things that I had, which was uh, left. And that is how we started. The important thing at that time, which I thought was the strength was and the opportunity was that one could stand out to be outstanding. And uh, Jeevan will bear, bear me out that it is in 91, 1991, I think 91 February that we got the first Alcon machine, uh, Alcon 1, uh, where you couldn't do a vacuum of more than 100 or 200, I don't remember. Uh, and we started doing FACO emulsification. And there were very few people who were doing FACO emulsification at that particular time. And I thought that that was the strength that one needed to look at because that was a gut feel, even though there were a lot of people criticizing FACO emulsification, but I thought that that was a gut feel that this is the technology of the future. And I rode what I call the FACO wave or rather helped create the FACO wave. And then the second thing was to take the big leap of going into refractive surgery. Almost similar, simultaneously, we started refractive surgery. Apollo was coming out, asked them to put up a refractive surgery unit because I couldn't afford it. And these were the two things that we rode. And then the story, uh, story started. But one thing that I believe is that we need to have the first mover advantage. Devashi says here, he differs with me, but I say you have the first mover advantage and create the, create the people's awareness and the craving to get that. Because technological leadership is important. No, none of you would remember who this guy is. But this guy is the second guy who landed on moon. Both Aldrin and none of you would know the name, nor did you know it. But it is important that you need to have technological leadership. The second thing is, what they said, Mark Twain said that during the gold rush, it's a good time to be in the pick and shovel business. What does that mean? That means that you don't need to go hunting for gold. Even if you make the picks and the shovels, you can sell them and you can, uh, you can make a good business out of it. So what is it that one could do? And that is the thing that I looked at that how could one get into an atmosphere where there was so much of competition in Delhi? The second thing after setting out was to create team CFS. And I would say <clears throat> the best blessings that has been bestowed on CFS is that we have built people and the people are building the business. That is something very, very important. Best clinical doctor, uh, Walter joined us. And then we had people from RP Center, Dr. Harsh Kumar, Lalit Verma, Dinesh Talwar, Professor Tiwadi, Professor Prem Prakash, Professor Dada, Professor Pradeep Sharma. Uh, I can just keep counting now. We have Obli, we have people who have, uh, there's this girl who's joined, I'm forgetting her name, Pranita? No, Pranita Nepali. Sir. No, somebody has joined here also. Pranita, sir. Bhubaneshwar. Pranita also. So you have people who are coming in, but they are people who can decide their destiny at RP Center and best young talent is selected and mentored. But the super speciality approach is something very, very important that is there. Bring out the commentary and bring out the strength in the people that you are having with you. Super specialization is the key word. You need to be the last word in ophthalmology in that speciality. Uh, we are proud to say that more than 30 to 40 percent of our patients in Delhi are or in Saptarang enclave are not from Delhi. They are from outside Delhi. So that is the kind of respect that you need to have. Santosh is sitting here. Babu is sitting here. They are all part of RP. They were part of RP Center. Santosh gets, Babu gets patients from all over the country. Neeraj Kungar is there, Mukesh is there. I just can keep on saying General Parihar, Patial, everybody is there. So the team that we have is the key for the success of uh, CFS. It is the power of the fist, as they say, versus the first five fingers. So that is something important that we had. And we made a professional management team also work with us. That is important. The skill honing is that something that you need to do. And that is the best project is to keep on honing your own skills and to get everybody there. Now, one thing that I believe is the name of the institution. The name of the institution, according to me, should not be based on your own name. 
it should not be hi i am robert center i center or mary or james or whatever it needs to be a neutral name because if you have a neutral name what is very very important is that it does not become a roadblock for other people to join they they, they don't tell to the outer world that i am working for xyz it is for an institution and that is something very very important now after the team after the name after having set up the super specialization comes the brand and what is important in a brand is to have a mission and a vision a vision statement to create an image and to have values and to stick by it you need to stick by your values and that is something very very important that we have not taken shortcuts uh, we are proud to say that we have worked the right way and we are not uh, gone outside of what is said to be normal or what is right second thing is that you need to actually if you show your hand in the darkness it doesn't help anybody so you have to tell people as to what you are doing you need to reach out and you need to give technology because uh, you need to give information about technology and about the people and that is something very very important now if you create a successful brand the patients come on their own today i am proud to say that if dwarka is my second large second uh, most uh, uh, revenue earner center it has is the only 2% contribution from maipal sachdev and it does not have contribution from any other big guy or a big uh, i would say a top guy of ophthalmology so that is what the brand has created and it is need to give an assurance of quality it needs to give a a, a patient a super specialty cover uh, it obviously helps the doctors at the time that you are and in making center for sight successful we have to think of the uh, future embrace technology so for embracing technology you need to have the right people also to embrace so education is the way forward uh, happy to say that we have dnbs we have fellows long term short terms observers etc uh, wet labs so that is something which is very very important r and d uh, in house institutional ethics committee we have more than 25 projects that are running Uh, Rohit was just here. I think they are the epitome of uh, the uh, research which goes on, and that is something that we are proud that Center for Sight has. And finally, coming to being successful, success I would say is an antithesis to taking risks. If you don't take risk, there are no gains, no pain, no gain, no risk, no gain. I think there was a movie of Harshad Mehta, the scam, which said. ishq hai to risk risk hai to ishq hai so the the point is that until of course you take a risk and people are very 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 i think uh, again uh, private equity has played an important role in my uh, uh, my journey uh, they have been uh, good they have given you ideas they have increased the canvas and i think they have given you the opportunity to go forward and this dream of uh, having an institution fructified in 22 years i think because we had the money power of private equity today as we have gone forward i think uh, we have moved on to 12 states and we have 53 centers uh, things are uh, having the best of uh, uh, talent that is there and two three last important things i believe in the japanese word kaizen that means small incremental steps for improvement change is imperative and change for the good take only small incremental steps and that is what center for size epitomizes and the other thing is there are no free lunches in life work will work when nothing else works you have to work very very hard and even at this particular age i am happy to say that i am the first person to enter center for sight and maybe the last person to leave so you have to work and you have to work very very hard to get what you want to finally goals leading to accomplishment only happen with self discipline you have to be disciplined you have to show the way to people and that is something very very important that is something that leads to the strength and finally i will end up with uh shri abdul jay kalam as to what he said because it sums up everything beautifully you should stand for a culture of excellence the excellence not by accident it is a process where an individual continuously strives to better oneself the performance standards are set by themselves they work on their dreams with focus and are prepared to take calculated risk and do not get deterred by failures as they move towards their dreams then they step up their dreams 
as they tend to reach the original targets. They strive to work to their potential. In the process, they increase their performance, thereby multiplying further their potential. This is an unending life cycle phenomena, culture of excellence. They are not in competition with anyone else but themselves. That is a culture of excellence. I'm sure each one of you will aspire to become a unique with culture of excellence. Let the unique you is a big battle. The battle means you don't need to take a gun. The battle means you have to have four unique things, four unique tools you must have in that battle. Uh, one is you have to set the goal. The second one is acquire the knowledge continuously. And third one is a hard work with the devotion. And fourth is perseverance. Question is whether you want to be you or everybody else. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that outstanding presentation. I think it was truly inspiring to one and all who are sitting here. And the next uh, speaker is going to be Dr. Devashish Bhattacharya, who is the chairman and founder of Disha Eye Hospital, which now has more than 15 branches. And uh, many of the RPC alumni, including Dr. Samar Basak, who is with us. And he would tell us a story of how, from humble beginnings, the Shai Hospital has moved into a glorious story. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, our Premier, RP Center. Thank you, Professor TTL, for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, greetings from the Shai Hospitals um, for the 55th uh, Foundation Day. Well, when Columbus uh, sailed, he was to he was destined to discover India, but uh, he landed up discovering America, which became the strongest nation in the world today. So uh, much in life actually occurs more by default than by design. So talking about my initial days to the youngsters down there, um, didn't get my conventional government job after MS from RIO Kolkata, because I argued with the hierarchy that ophthalmology was a peripheral discipline. Uh, so actually, we need to decide. We cannot work for something we don't agree to. And uh, then came the city clinic experience where I designed, recruited manpower, bought, bought equipment for six months, all for free. And then when it was about inauguration time, all the big wigs of the city came. And there I was found too young to be a consultant and offered a RMO's job. So again, declined that. So that was the kick in the back. So just see, you know, six months before I was applying for a government job, six months later in front of that meeting in that I promised myself and quite broadly and openly that I will have a bigger hospital than this. Didn't know how. So went back home, which is in the periphery of the city of Kolkata and uh, spectacle shops were the places where you start your practice where the optometrist's name would be written in a big fronds and yards, small MS. So never mind, he was there for 25 years. And so in between, when I mostly didn't have patients, I used to look at that uh, brisk Panipuri Walla, you know, who's doing great business. And uh, I was seeing, you know, how he would connect. It was street education. And uh, he was distributing happiness. It was not about Pani Puris anymore. So I comforted myself that at least I could do this one, if not ophthalmology in the long run. But anyway, dreams take you. And uh, 
So I saw this before most of my peers. And uh, so uh, Appa Swami, I'm sorry to say that we have lost this great soul in ophthalmology a few days back. My condolences and my entire respect to that great person who gave me 30 free IOLs and a microscope to be paid as I earn. So, and by 1995, I was doing 2000 IOLs a day. So, you know, those were a different time. Everybody who wanted something, it was such an innovation, they achieved it. So what is there for the young guys today? Well, I think the thing remains the same. Uh, it, it's more in the attitude, but, uh, you know, learn through my defaults because here is another default that I was in Barakpur and the long tail of the West Bengal map had to cross over us before they entered the city. And as you know, you know, uh, the peripheral district people, they are more comfortable with suburbs rather than the city. They're scared of the city somehow. So location was a big advantage. So as my practice overflowed, I had Dr. Basak, who's here, and an RP Center alumni, a friend from the same college, and uh, the two Tushars. And uh, of course, the security of the government job held them back, but they would come and maximize my practice in their free time. So, uh, but how could I get them uh, into the dream of having uh, hospitals? I was um, uh, almost crazy about it. So, you know, to bring that commitment uh, and uh, I just left my practice and I said, we all work for 10,000 rupees a month and uh, their wives agreed, which was more important. So there we started and uh, I tell you what, I had the best colleagues of my life and we are still there and enjoying our senior citizenship. So uh, the journey as we go, uh, you know, this collegiality of doctors did an immediate uh, faith of the community and the surrounding and the building a two storied structure of 12,000 was very imposing. We uh, borrowed about uh, one crore rupees, uh, but that we could uh, uh, pay back in one year's time. So a uh, lot of patients were going to South for valid reasons. And uh, so we needed to think how we could give an alternative in the proximity, which was affordable. And though you know we couldn't match the experience quality of the South, we started developing super specialities amongst us, and we got a bunch of uh, youngsters. You could probably, the, the mid-generation would recognize two young fellows there, Dr. Arnab Das and Subendu Boral, also from RPC. We are proud to say that about 15% of our 100-strong uh, doctor bench is RPC. So, uh, But uh, we, over time, realized one thing, that cost is the first step to quality. Because if it is not affordable, it's not there for many people. And then quality itself further improves cost. So uh, going back to tell that, uh, you know, we would say that, you know, often low cost is uh, equated to low quality. But, uh, you know, as entrepreneurs, we always ask, what does the patient want? As doctors also, you, we also ask. But uh, they want everything. But then the, if we rephrase the question and ask, what is he willing to pay for? So then you get realistic answers. And that is why, you know, till uh, about 2004 on an institutional basis, we didn't promote FACO because the cataracts were harder, the technology was costly, the patients couldn't afford it, the outcomes were not as good. The ads, uh, torsionals and the machines, the lenses became cheaper, cataracts became softer, affordability increased, we launched ourselves. So when I, like in the cataract packages, we tell from bottom up. So at least when they stop somewhere, they have a feeling that we didn't miss much and we bought the best from, for our parents because we considered that an aspiring um, patient group would always you know, give a gift to their parents. That is perhaps the product line. 
And uh, when the Torix came on the Indian platform, so now we do 5% Torix and about 1% uh, trifocals when the bifocals resolve their problems. We had an OCT, the, one of the first, and uh, today we have about 20, 25. I lost count how many we have. And we do it for 3, 300 and 500, it's not 3,000. And we do it because we believe that to see the macula, it's better that we see it through optical coherence. So simplification at times is the ultimate sophistication. The retina surgeons would refuse almost, were very unwilling to go through a routine IO. And uh, so the myopics, the flashes floaters, the uh, examinations before surgery, after surgery, they're becoming difficult. So, you know, our equation is fairly simple. We, this machine is sturdy, does wonderful IOs, and uh, we have six of them. Similarly, to facilitate uh, lasers and make it one seating, two seating uh, PRPs, Pascals were wonderful, and all our centers are Pascals. We uh, have these imposing theaters to impose the doctors that do your best. And uh, so we kept on, uh, you know, in, in putting our surpluses uh, into and attending patients in their proximities. Wherever we had 50 patients from a locality of around 10 kilometers in the city, or maybe um, 50 to 100 kilometers in the district, we started having branches and uh, this worked wonders for us. And uh, we are still growing and counting. And uh, this accommodated the next generation's uh, area of uh, growth and the staff and the doctors all. So, uh, assimilating scales, uh, we had systems in place from 2003 and now we are all linked through the uh, AWS platform, every center is connected, all investigations are uploaded immediately. And the staff grows learning multiple functions and the first place, then they take up active roles in training or uh, taking charge of a particular uh, function or a center. So that is the curve uh, for the staff, the doc, uh, they are incentivized on numbers outcomes and the doctor through their salary, which is not the main payment structure, the payment compensation is for fee for service and built on compliance on their advices, the time at, of how uh, on time services they give, how are their brands, the academics, we even incentivize academics, teaching and training. And uh, for any disputes, there are AV recordings in inquiry to surgery fixation to sort out things. So uh, all this has to be strategized because, you know, attending to scales is something we've learned over a period of time. And uh, of course, our most dearest thing are the connect between, we have hardly very few, you know, people leaving us after two, three years. If some do leave at the first year, but uh, most of them stay with us. And uh, these are lovely photographs and memories to keep back. Four or five of these young kids sitting in the front are now studying medicine, hopefully will be back in ophthalmology. So that really solves my problem. So and uh, summer's problem. So these are uh, the comparative things that we did uh, in the COVID times, so you can see that there was a drop uh, of, of cataract surgeries to 57,000. And, uh, but this year, I think we're doing very well, 81,000. And uh, these are all paid surgeries. And uh, cataracts, uh, vitroretina, I think these are full Just VR surgeries we're talking about. And uh, so, I mean, we had a pretty good uh, time. And uh, I'll just take one minute. These are the investigations, uh, the top of the list, you can see, we do about a lack of OCTs and another lack of for the cataracts, all cataracts who can undergo OCTs do undergo OCTs. And this you can see, as we have added branches, how the growth has happened. And uh, so this is our IPD statistics for cataract, which we have already shown. And these are the revenues which are at the end of the day important for 
the most important resource for growth. So this year we'll be doing this with a good bottom line. So we use only organic and not inorganic ways to grow like Mahipal does. Well, the future beholds uh, uh, challenges through government policies because I think the people of this country, the democracy probably wants a stronger government and they want more welfare. So this vicious cycle can be quite challenging, but we have to get prepared and work and take the best system forward towards IKEA. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for that wonderful presentation. I'm proud to announce the next speaker, who again is an RPC alumnus, and I must say he's the youngest tycoon in ophthalmology. He seeks, he creates, and he conquers. He seeks RPC alumni, he creates center for them, and then he conquers ophthalmology in true sense. From a single center in Jodhpur to now 143 centers across the country, and after recent acquisition of Vasan Eye Care, which is now the largest chain in the country, it is the ASG group of hospitals, and I invite Dr. Arun Singhvi to give his talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everybody, for coming here. So we are relatively a young organization. And uh, probably whatever we have learned, the doctors, the colleagues who are at ASG, almost 50% are from RP Center. We learned our ophthalmology here. We learned ethics, patient care. Also, we saw the problems in the healthcare scenario being at this premier institute. When we were studying here, I mean, there were three, four kinds of patients coming here. Few were who knew the doctors, few who came through connects, few were aware about the quality, but the majority was drawn because it had a brand as AIMS RP Center. Majority of patients in North India at that time I won't say South Indians when many patients we saw here, but majority of North Indian patients we saw draining from all over from East to West to Central to North. All complex cases, all patients who had lost probably, most of the patients who had probably lost the hope. That actually instituted the idea of, could we go to the peripheral India? Could we go to non-metro India and try and deliver the quality which we were taught? With that mission in mind that any patient who walks in, who's not aware about what he's going through, can we deliver a similar quality irrespective of their awareness, irrespective of their financial status, irrespective of their connects, irrespective of their knowledge about their disease. So when you work for a cause, you ought to have a team with you. And that's why we chose people from RP Center because we knew the quality we had been taught here. It was the cause which drew the exceptional super specialized talent to probably ASG. And these guys 
gives such a i would say such a dedication i mean i can name himanshu is sitting here ganesh joined later all of them the kind of dedication they have shown towards the cause somebody who is sitting in patna doing surgery somebody who does patna and then moves to hazipur and then also to dhanbad jamshedpur i mean you ought to have that kind of a tenacity to deliver it in the non metro areas that's where the team started grouping up it's all about the team what we do it's never what i thought it's never what i did it's always what we all together have thought about it and there were many tough times when you have a private equity as dr maypal said they help you but they also try to confuse you because they will be after their returns their money etc that's where the team has to draw a line and say we are here to pursue our dreams and in the process whatever returns are given to you are the by product not the dreams we live for you so when the team started forming a lot of confusion happens that's where i feel we could differentiate slightly from others because it's a youngsters team everybody has his own dream they are working for a cause but then if we start focusing on strengths it's like just like a cricket team i would say you cannot expect a jaspreet bumrah to come and open the innings you have to just focus on the strength what each one has and respect and actually develop leadership in their strength and cover their weaknesses that's what we have been doing at our places and once they start grouping up the i would say the exponential growth which comes with it not in terms of revenue i would say in terms of the patient care in terms of the volumes which we have started drawing now and in terms of the expansion these guys take care is something me and dr shashank would have never imagined when we started so as rightly said it asg was started as as arun singhvi and sg shashank gang our names were there but these were the guys who changed the name in the mid time and now it is called as all stalwart groups so everybody for us is a star there is not a single star in the company but that everybody is treated as a star that's the team it's i would keep on talking for next 5 minutes but it will be only and only about the team nothing else matters for us so once the team was formed we started thinking of ambitious things and we were very very clear in our thoughts that what has brought us here will never take us where we want to go by that i don't ever mean that you forget your culture or you forget your ethics or you forget your patient centered protocols by that i mean there is always a change which has to happen there is always an assimilation which has to happen for the new blood you ought to retain your culture and your values and allow the new ideas to come in and then assimilate them with us it's a platform for youngsters it's a journey which we live together i might not be there for the next talk maybe somebody else would be leading it and they will continue this journey and everybody has financial support creates a social name for himself loves the responsibility and the power of running a center then a region then a zone and then finally the organization and then might embark on a journey for a social or a personal front 
and leave the legacy to the team which is coming in. And that's, I think, the whole journey and is continuing to be the journey of ASG. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. I think uh, as we train in RP Center, we are creating teams for ASG, for Center for Site, for Desha, for so many other institutions. And I'm sure Professor Tetyal sir is going to feel very proud about it, that RP Center has become the feeding, uh, uh, feeding institute for all the other big centers in the country. So nothing can be you know, greater than this. It is, my, uh, it is my pleasure to invite the next speaker, who is a friend of mine and my uh, batchmate as well, six months, my junior, Dr. Raj Shekhar, who is going to be talking about a very important topic, and that is uh, ingredients of successful practice. Uh, Dr. Raj Shekhar is a very keen administrator, a surgeon par excellence, and a very astute uh, clinician. Raj Shekhar. Thank you, Dr. Namrita, for the kind words. First of all, uh, thanks to Professor Titial. He was my senior resident and now the chief. Dr. Mandeep, Dr. Namrita, all the faculty members and my dear friends, and those who are attending this uh, meeting. It's a great privilege and honor to be st standing on this uh, podium. We all know how uh, prestigious this podium is. Thanks for the kind invite. Need some help with this. Excuse me, can somebody help me? So you, you had very good uh, talks. Uh, this program is very well uh, designed. You had first talk uh, by Professor Mahipal, then Dr. Devishis, then uh, Dr. Arun. It's very well structured. One is a chain which is already there. The other one is a hospital which grew into a big chain. And the ESG, which started with a mission and growing very rapidly. Now I am representing here that set of people who have big dreams, want to do it, and do they really have to follow the first three paths, or they can chart out their own path? Okay. Which slide is playing? I'm not able to see. Sorry about that. Just... So here I started on my own. Can Dr. Pradeep Sharma present? I'll come next. Please take a, take a seat, Dr. Sikha. The next, next speaker is our uh, uh, very respected, our very dear, and we really miss you, sir, in RP Center. Uh, again, has uh, uh, is now in center of a site, Professor Pradeep Sharma, sir. But I think you will always remain in our hearts and you will always remain in RP Center. Same with you. <laughs> Professor Nambita, it's really very kind of you to give those kind words. And it's always a pleasure for me to be coming back on this stage. Uh, so, and then to talk on a subject which is dear to all of us, all who are listening on this side or the other side of the presentation. Of course, RPC, 
we are the best why we are the best and why and how we can remain the best is the other question i have no financial disclosures as you can see i have already left rpc and very <laughs> ceremonially i was given the retirement last year so uh, but my heart as dr namrata was saying for rpc's heart is with me and my heart is always with rpc so that disclosure i would like to make professor lp agarwal dream that rp center is there he founded rajendra prasad center for ophthalmic sciences he was a great visionary and i think it's very very appropriate that we are talking of him on this birth centenary year of professor lp agarwal so i would like to dedicate this talk to this great visionary our mentor it was a my great luck that i joined in 1980 and i worked with him as a junior resident for some months concept of super specialty was his genesis and he also started the national program but today we are going to talk on the medical education that he did world over i mean generally in india particularly the education system is like this we have rote learning we have people coming in very nice intelligent people but when they come out they are what you don't want to talk of course lp changed it the ophthalmic course lp changed it so there is a pun there he famously said this is a 3 years rigorous imprisonment without parole but you come here as a donkey and you will go out as a gentleman so he just flipped and this is what we are now churning out every year 105 junior residents some of you are sitting here some are not here but enjoying at their own rooms the select lot he named it md in ophthalmology that's interesting elsewhere it is ms in ophthalmology but because he wanted it to be distinctive he said no ours will be called md in ophthalmology then the senior residents and faculty we have had successive chiefs and now it's professor titial who is gracing this chair and we are hopeful that he will take this name of rp center further higher and he is already doing it it's a pleasure thank you professor titial the patient care is tremendous and the super specialty clinics are there which was started in rpc annually as you would have been told by professor titial in the annual report also there is a huge number of patients which are seen but it's not just the numbers it's the quality care that we can give that is important and this is dependent upon the salient features of clinical teaching that i'll talk about he started rotation of every 3 months in six units twice in the residency so that you have a equal exposure even to this day there are parallel institutions in delhi itself who do not rotate their residents they are for two years in one particular uh, unit only and then one year they are given a ceremonial rotation that doesn't give them a full all round learning so professor lp agarwal's one salient feature was this opd based learning with senior faculty posting in the first 3 months and then afterwards they were posted with the srs in independent cabins working up of in patients evening round with senior residents but the very important part which i think dr samar would recall as he was among those times when we used to have group discussions three times a week uh, just the evening before the seminar the journal club and the case presentations that was in each unit there were groups of just six people uh, one from each semester and they were supposed to be conducting what is going to happen tomorrow and professor lp agarwal would question the group leader if there was anything ms with any any of the team members that we need to i think re look into it weekly pathology slides was another thing which we have lost there used to be one slide to be seen by all residents and report by saturday and then it would be discussed or discussed on wednesday so that was again giving a very interesting thing the inpatient file workup this is something which we are still retaining in the uh, in theoretical form the you see the last penultimate page and the last page if you fill it properly the resident please note if you do it regularly you will learn from each and every case which nothing else no books can teach you so this is something which you need to do it very religiously diligently clinical teaching in the evenings 2 to 4 pm the clinics this time has been changing over under several chiefs in uh, several times that bedside teaching by the consultants on the rounds was something which was unique and for this professor lp agarwal did one unique thing the round day was a day prior to surgery many patients felt why we are put one day extra 
we can be operated and then one day post off we can be kept but no he wanted the residents to learn from the case so there was one full day prior to surgery when the cases could be seen by the residents individually so the md thesis is another unique thing and i can tell you even 40 or 50 years back dr s k angra's thesis was on preventing cataractogenesis by using some agents experimentally even relevant today after 50 years so this was his vision that was there and this is something which we have now added surgical training as times have improved we have uh, more technologies and techniques which are coming to our help and we have these uh, imparting of surgical skills which many of you may have seen uh, under the leadership of dr titial this is now flourishing much more weekly teaching in uh, lt is done and now we are also using whatsapp so everything is on whatsapp even the teaching has come to whatsapp level and many residents are learning through whatsapps clinical didactics is there specialty workshops are going on and foundation day lectures like today are there more people attend it would be better of course live surgeries foreign faculty lectures and comprehensive ophthalmology this was a unique institution where he started ocular pathology ocular microbiology pharmacology biochemistry and radiology all separate and uh, ocular anesthesia also was there separately a dedicated eye emergency this is something which is again unique for an eye specialty to start with even in those 40 years back and finally the exam it was not just one day exam it was a three days exam it was for this reason that he the candidate was examined in each and every aspect the examiners would get fed up of the same examinee again and again but this is somehow that the resident would be exposed to each and every part and it was difficult to fail an examinee because he was seen in different specialties so from a junior resident in january 1980 i was lucky to be and then i became a faculty and later on i have retired in 21 when i got the fellowship and when i went to us i realized the importance of this learning it was so great that when i went to jules stein i could interact with the my mentor so called mentors at the same level and they also appreciated this so this is something which will give you that th thrust it's like someone can give you a flute but you have to learn to play it part of the job can be done by our teachers by the institution but you have to learn to play it you may get a very nice iktara you might have seen the person is playing so nicely and when you start playing it doesn't work because you have to learn to play it this is something which i would like you to say that wherever you go you may be having no problems yes rp center gives you lot, lot of stress this is true but then stress is also a form of vaccination the same amount of stress if given in an attenuated form is what we are now realizing is working as vaccination so this is a stress vaccination that rp center gives you provided you have realistic optimism you have training of facing the fears social and family support has to be there because sometimes some children i have seen undergo a lot of stress they can't cope up and they uh, have to be then taken to uh, with some physical uh, psychiatric help physical and mental fitness has to be there cognitive and emotional flexibility and sense of purpose and meaning and of course i would like to add that spirituality is something which gives you just like daily we take nutrition to have our physical uh, completion rest is required emotional energy is required in the form of love and relationships similarly a spiritual energy is required and that can come from meditation if you can do just like charging your phone is so important you don't miss charging your phone when you get up in the morning you don't want to go with a depleted battery but you go depleted soul with yourself that is something which needs to be charged at the same time remember the greatest feats in ophthalmology are two one is the iul implantation and the other is phaco emulsification we all rejoice in those but those mentors who provided that initially were castigated they had to undergo lot of problem by their seniors and by their system harold ridley was posted in africa but great men wherever they are posted will do something good so he discovered onchocerca volvulus which is one of the five leading world blindness causes so you see a good man posted even in a bad place will do a good thing that is one lesson to be similarly charles kelman it's not easy that phaco emulsification was ac accepted by the ophthalmic fraternity american academy of ophthalmology kept on denouncing him till late and this recognition come came very very late to both harold ridley and charles kelman charles kelman was a very good musician too which probably kept him through all this stress 
so what i would like to say is failure is a challenge don't deny it explore your weakness and rectify it don't just give up continue to treat because success is just a step ahead opposing winds can't check your desire they just blow to take you higher learn and practice empathy and compassion treat patients as individuals in rp center sometimes when we see crowds we treat patients as a group as a crowd don't do that each is an individual and this is much more so we we'll, you realize when you go out into practice improving your stress coping is something which i would like to add stress training can improve resilience community activities help in that be more adept in observing your own self and the self in others then you will able to empathize you will know how you feel when you would have been in that patient's position and then you will be able to do better being more flexible and not rigid gratitude for whatever is happening accepting the inevitable and having always a positive attitude because attitude and aptitude are two things but aptitude depends upon attitude all work and no play of course no way and rp center does give you all such opportunities too mm -hmm. and we had a wonderful cultural program on just a night before that and similarly we can continue that too and rp center ki har dam machi rahe dhoom i would like to thank you all for this patient listening but i will just like to say the world is in front of you you can make the best of it but these three years are something which you have to make the best of it if you can really learn to play this flute this will give you very melodious music all through your life and you will enjoy it thank you all thank you so much sir that was really a recap into the entire activities of rp center thank you so can i start yes yeah. thank you sorry about that uh, slide related issue so if you are given the flute you should learn to play the flute great words and uh, great inspiration sir so my uh, uh, my topic is looking in the subject looking beyond ophthalmology ingredients of a successful practice so it's titled looking beyond ophthalmology if you honestly ask me so we are actually looking at making ophthalmology work at a greater level beyond what we know as a subject reaching it to the end user so and hence it's very much within ophthalmology but we have to look beyond the traditional part to set the context for my talk i am talking from uh, the perspective of a solo practice if any one of you want to start your own practice and grow it bigger then you can multiply it but the initial steps and what the ingredients that are required they nearly remain the same except for other strategic thinking branding and uh, marketing and uh, aligning with the investors the rest of it will remain the same and in continuing with that uh, i would like to place some disclaimers i am just a student in the university of success success is a continuous journey it's both objective and uh, subjective you can measure it at the same time uh, some people may they are successful but for others they may not be so successful so it's both objective and subjective and professional satisfaction is just a part of the success and it's not in entirety a success because success is achieving your full potential in the wholesome sense and what doesn't change is the change change is a constant thing and whatever we talk today may change after 5 years or 10 years and the parameters may entirely be different and inner happiness that supersedes all the success that we are going to talk as an ophthalmologist i started my journey from uh, 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 as an mbbs from bangalore medical college then i, I was a student at uh, rp center graduated in uh, post graduation in 93 and then uh, senior residency in 96 and then i chose to stay back in india when some of my friends went abroad and there were some tem temptations that time then i joined a private organization in bangalore as a full time consultant so that time 15000 rupees was a big sum of money that's the monthly salary that we were getting that time and later on i started after 3 years of working in a private organization i learned a lot of new things after working in rp center for 6 uh, long years going to private practice suddenly you find that whole thing is different you may be knowing the subject but you when you interact with the patient when uh, the entire accountability comes and stops at your desk here you have a lot of hierarchy where you know a lot of people are there to support suddenly you find that whole thing you have to handle yourself it was a good learning 
Then I started my own clinic in 99. It was a small place, 12,000 square feet area with OT, OPD and uh, five staff members, four staff members, including myself, five. And then we expanded the facility in 2003 to a slightly bigger place, the 15,000 square feet area. And we uh, slightly increased the number of doctors to 10 and uh, we have around 75 staff. We also have uh, all those quality journey. When you start a hospital and you, it's bigger, then all these things come up. The ISO certification, NABA certification, and uh, accreditation, and then going in for uh, DNB institution. So we also train postgraduate students. Then in the meantime, I also had uh, a small tie up with one of the chain hospitals. It was for a short period of three years. And I had my own uh, good learnings uh, during that time. So now we are uh, solo again, back to our own hospital and uh, growing and serving. So it's a, a single setup hospital. If you compare with any of the chain hospitals, uh, their best centers compete and uh, maybe I may be doing slightly better or at par. So here, now coming to the ingredients itself, then ingredients we'll have to say depends on what you call as uh, success. So each one's definition of success may be different, but this is important to see as doctors, all of us are kind of scientists. Uh, we believe in uh, proof, we believe in uh, truth, we believe in uh, what is said is uh, what is, we read and learn. Here is the story of uh, the father of uh, bypass surgery, who after a great career, because his focus was so much on the subject itself, at the end, he had to meet a sad ending. We can take a leaf out of this to say that we need to have certain skill sets and we need to widen our uh, arena of thinking to a broader things. And thereby, success is not just knowing ophthalmology and getting a gold medal. It's little more. It's, it's inclusive. It should be sustainable. And it should have an ethical growth that creates a positive impact on oneself and the society also. You should enjoy. Then, you know, uh, like Professor Pradeep Sharma was saying, if you can, body can fight it, even that stress becomes a joy. Like, you know, you, you, the moment you start enjoying your work, there is no stress there. So in this, inclusivity is important, sustainability is important, and being ethical is extremely important. There are a lot of stakeholders in this. And what works today may not work six months down the line because there's a changing environment. There are a lot of good and bad things. The same thing which comes as good may later turn out to be bad because with the changing scenario, whole thing changes and the expectations keep changing. To put in a nutshell, the essential of success in the stakeholders, you have a lot of things, patient, staff, society, financial aspects, the vendors, industry, the doctors whom we work with and the medical community at large. And on the expectation side, this quality of care is non-negotiable thing. The value for money, like, you know, patient asks, I'm ready to pay, but what am I going to get at it? So these kind of things, one has to think when you are starting your own thing, as less expensive as possible is the main thing that's important. For, for doing this, you have to have a lot of financial sense. The return on investment is important because money is going to be real. And meeting financial commitments, professional satisfaction, and income commensurate with time and efforts. So many of the times, uh, Arun will agree, Mahipal will agree, and Dr. Devushis also will agree that uh, the clinicians who come to us as uh, to join us in practice, they say that I have these many credentials, these are my uh, experiences, I need this much of pay package. But in the real life, all those things are fine. They are the qualifiers, but they don't make you qualify for paying so much of a paycheck unless you are able to deliver so much of services to the patients. I'm not saying you have to do so many things, but are you able to deliver to the services? Because in the real life, only for the services that you deliver, you will get paid. So that, that kind of uh, balancing will be there. And we have to uphold the medical standards. And as part of success, we have to be involved in teaching and uh, research also. In my own journey, the stakeholders, you know, patient is the patient is at the core of everything that we do. So quality, empathy and transparent processes here, the transparent processes, uh, we may be doing everything as we have promised, 
but making sure that they also understand that we are doing it is extremely important the process is extremely important because lot of things in ophthalmology are re repetitive things as a doctor you may you may not like to repeat the same kind of counseling again and again so and hence you have to put in a process and transparency and you have to engage the patients patient is at the core he is the first stakeholder next is the staff this is this is you can read it as team it's extremely important because 80 to 90% of the time patients spend time with the staff than with the doctor it's extremely important that entire team spends uh, talks the same language and there is uh, a trust that is seen in at each step so for this you have to empower your uh, staff and uh, the working environment has to be good in our place you know uh, we have empowered nearly every staff even if i am not there for 15 days they are empowered to take decisions within their reach and they know how to handle things very few things get escalated uh, uh, to me that's how the empowerment is required in a service industry and then the society is extremely important wherever you are practicing you can you you may be the best like dr mohipal was saying you have to raise your hand in the light so you have to get connected with the community and you should make the society understand that you mean quality service you you care for them and you are there so these are certain tangible things and intangible things some tangible things you have to do some programs i don't mean do free things and all that that's not the society because over a period of time as professionals we have to encourage society to pay for health services and make them understand that paying for health services is an investment and not an expense so keeping that in mind we have to go i'm not talking about free services here but getting engaged with society is extremely important here is something which many people uh, many doctors you know they think they are good at it but they are not good at it here financial aspects are real it's a specialty in itself there is it's an art and science both the art part of this financial thing is what we miss emotions have no role here a doctor who tries to be an entrepreneur in the first day he wants to have best of the uh, interiors all the equipments lined up whether it's required or not because emotionally he feels good and he feels that as if his clinic is complete emotions have no role when it comes to financial things it has to be real all business practice decisions to put a machine or not to put a machine both decisions are going to have an impact on the finance so both the decisions are good to if you want to decide on doing something it may bring in revenue not doing something may still bring in revenue and hence it should be a wise decision so and after having said this financial hygiene and financial health is very important when i say hygiene there is nothing like black and white and all that it has to be a transparent process that will give you a long run uh, good stable uh, practice environment vendors and industry are equally important we may be the best but we don't have technology to back us up we if we don't have all the newer medicines to back us up we can't do much so we have to respect vendors and industry uh, and at the same time it should be an interdependent uh, approach we, we shouldn't fall to their uh, uh, marketing strategies because their skills are much higher in negotiations than our skills across the table what we speak we think that is the that's the truth but for negotiation they have a much higher skills so in case you are starting a practice you should uh, improve your skill or take the help of somebody who is good at negotiation doctors and consultants must since patient is the core of what we do expertise is extremely important that's what asg is uh, uh, leveraging on and like you know that's where uh, we are thankful to professor titiyal and the entire rpc family for providing excellent doctors in our, in my center also nearly 60% of my doctors at one point of time were from uh, aims it's peace they deliver quality and they deliver uh, uh, that kind of a commitment so expertise empathy and ethics are very important this important for the overall growth at the same time as owners to grow as a team we also have to take care of them so pro for a professional work culture and support systems are paramount and owners of the hospitals should take care of that with this it doesn't end we are also part of medical community so tomorrow's ophthalmology is very important and uh, we have to look at the marketplace and build that bridge bridge and our expertise and whatever we have learned we have to come give it to the societies in the coming years uh, sitting in uh, like you know bigger institutions we may not uh, appreciate that much in private practice we see a lot of uh, aggregators coming in 
insurance sector coming in, patients' expectations are increasing, law enforcing agencies in the form of uh, consumer uh, acts and consumer uh, consumerism is increasing. This is where as a society, we have to build a, a, an environment where a professional can practice with ease and uh, with good peace of mind. So finally, uh, this is the inclusivity I was talking about. And most importantly, one has to have the ability to handle failures. It's easy to handle success, but if you can handle failure with ease, that's another essence of success. And we have to balance all the stakeholders, changing environment, good and bad, and the expectations. Thank you very much for your uh, patient hearing. And in the success, going down the line, so presently a lot of societal causes, developing various uh, other projects, all these things are coming up because those things also come up as part of what we have to do that's beyond ophthalmology. Thank you very much. I once again thank uh, Professor Titial, Dr. Namrata and Dr. Mandeep and the entire RPC team for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raj Shekhar. That was a lovely presentation. And um, now we come to the next talk. The next talk is going to be given by Dr. N. Venkatesh Prajna, Chief Cornea and Refractive Surgery Services, Director Residency Training Program, Arvind Eye Care uh, uh, Group of Hospitals from uh, Madurai. And uh, he's going to be talking uh, about a very important topic, which is also close to my heart, impact of my work on fungal keratitis. He's truly changed by various randomized control study He's truly changed the way we manage fungal keratitis. So thank you, Dr. Prajna, for doing this and over to you. Thank you, Dr. Namrata. And uh, thank you, Professor Titial, for uh, this invitation and opportunity. Uh, I wish I was there in person. I have been there earlier on a similar occasion, uh, but this time I couldn't make it. But thank you once again for having me. So what uh, I thought was I'll just share uh, my experience uh, in working in research uh, in a specific field uh, in ophthalmology. There are many R's associated with research, and some of them are, it should be right. The first R is research should be right. The second and most important R is the research should be relevant. So the field which I chose was very relevant, uh, especially to the Indian agrarian population, and fungal keratitis, a big public health problem there. And if somebody had to do something on it, uh, the Indian ophthalmologist had a lot of responsibility. The third R associated with research is it should be rigorous. And the fourth and the fifth R are very important. The fourth R is it should be recordable. And the fifth and the most important R is it should be reproducible. So this is the qualities of a good research. And if you perform good research <clears throat> of this kind, the impact of that research on the world is tremendous. I have been involved in the field of fungal keratitis right from 1997, and I have published in all spheres in this disease, right from epidemiology, antifungal susceptibility, artificial intelligence, confocal studies, drug trials, clinical features, cross-linking, the economic impact, as a clinician, we need to understand that as well. The quality of life, the risk factors, and the gender difference. So my, my publications range from 2022, but it started off in 1997. So the importance of this is, I, luckily for me, I took a relevant topic, and I just stuck on with that topic for almost 20 years to make some impact. And I'll be talking about the impact which our work in research uh, made in this disease. These are my publications in the field of basic sciences, again in the field of fungal keratitis, in the field of microbiology, proteomics, metagenomics, genetics, immunology, cytology, and pharmacology. Now this is important because as a clinician, we are the persons who are going to treat these patients. And if we have the support of basic science, it makes our therapeutic regimen all the more stronger. So what happened was this was a publication which came in Cornea, so an independent publication by Chinese uh, ophthalmologists who did a bibliometric and visualized analysis of global research on fungal keratitis from 1959 to 2019 and uh, donated our, I mean, uh, noted our ocular uh, 
microbiologist as one of the most prolific uh, papers, uh, paper uh, writers uh, in the amount of time cited. Now that is a big prestige for, for an organization which is actually uh, uh, always linked with a large volume eye care and not necessarily with research. But that is the impact which you can do if you concentrate on a relevant disease and then do uh, multiple work on this. What has also happened is we have a lot of collaborations. These are, these are just my collaboration with fungal keratitis. We work with universities. Uh, we work with ophthalmologists. We work with chemists. We work with respiratory medicine specialists because pulmonary aspergillosis is a very big thing. So we now are working actually with WHO. In fact, I was taking the help of uh, Dr. Namrata Sharma to represent to WHO to make uh, fungal keratitis as a neglected tropical disease so that it, it, it gets the importance that oncocerciasis gets. So that is, that is our uh, a, a play, that is take it to a global level or on a disease which is, which is very, very locally relevant to us. So I'll just, the next two slides are the important trial in which I was part of uh, was the MUD study. And what we did was we compared two drugs and we said one drug is better than the other. And why is this important? Because we said the older drugger, drug, which was discovered in 1960s, is better than the newer drug, which was discovered in 2004. Now, this went against all the beliefs which uh, many of the uh, ophthalmologists had in play at that point of time. But see the power of uh, such a conducting a big, uh, well-conducted research. After we published this, Moorfield Sci Hospital started first, and then the NHS took a, uh, took a pattern and said, in view of this results from the MUD study, our current recommendation is that the initial treatment will be 5% natamycin. Now, this is a big, big change in the UK because UK made voriconazole, UK did not make natamycin, and because our study was so powerful, they imported for one whole year till they made natamycin, they imported it from Canada, so that this became the preferred practice pattern for the entire NHS. A study which was done in a small town in Madurai could influence uh, the practice pattern in the UK. It also uh, got a very big uh, press release, press, uh, release uh, uh, in the southern part of uh, India, where we could say, uh, proudly say, that a uh, research done in Madurai could influence the UK treatment protocol. Not only the UK, but USA in Wilsai Hospital, which sees a lot of uh, infectious keratitis, also cited MUD study and then said, this is where our treatment options would be hereafter. That was a very, very uh, accelerating moment for me where, uh, you know, we have that sort of a complex, you know, even though we, we do all this uh, uh, in a very good thing, but when you're, you're being acknowledged by your peers, and they change the treatment paradigm based on your study, you really feel uh, very good about it. So what did we do? We did, a, we did a survey on the Cornea Society in 2007. We gave them a choice. We said, if given a choice, would you prefer voriconazole or natamycin if you treat a case of fungal keratitis? That was the question which we asked in 2007. 80% said they could prefer voriconazole. This is global audience. And 2017, we did a repeat uh, survey where 70% said they would prefer natamycin. Again, our influence on doing quality research, how that much of influence uh, a quality research has across the globe. Uh, this was sent by my friend Tanush Dada from RP Center. I was not aware of it. Uh, he sent me a congratulatory message. He said on expertscape.com, uh, if you put worldwide, and if you type uh, fungal keratitis, your name comes in the top. That's what he said. That was, uh, again, a, re a revelation for me. I, I was uh, not aware of this. Uh, thank you, Tanuj, for, uh, for sending me this. But again, it, it, it just makes you feel nice that you are able to influence and be recognized as the world's topmost expert uh, in a field which affects a lot of uh, Indian patients. So I also, uh, you know, all the time I'm, uh, I've been something always uh, 
uh, is in the is in my mind that you know you spend a lot of time in research what are we actually doing for the patients who are actually coming with fungal keratitis and this small video of 2 or 3 minutes uh, is is uh, is something which i am passionate about and i feel uh, that all budding ophthalmologists should have this element in them uh, research is important but more important is our patient care element and i'm proud to say that my entire uh, royalty uh, on my book payment goes to this uh, project which i'm going to talk about i also take this opportunity to thank so many people who had contributed to my payment book as well as uh, 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 professor uh, pradeep sharma sir uh, who has also uh, contributed to his publications in uh, in diginow where we are going to uh, send all this royalty to this project and i just want to share this 2 minute clip ati inda marundalla potittu rendu naal kalichu engala vandu paarunga seriya a healthcare provider's responsibility does not stop with diagnosing the condition and offering a prescription Arvind along with partners like GBS goes an extra mile and gives free medicine and money for transport of patients and attenders till the ulcer heals Over a period of time I came to realize that a prescription never cures a disease you can have all the resources in the world you can have all the intellectual knowledge you can have all the results from a clinical trial effective implementation is the key and i came to realize that without implementation of the knowledge it just doesn't mean anything instead of that expensive prescription which they all feared free drugs were directly handed to the patient along with the money to meet their travel expenses this encouraged them to come for regular follow up and put life back on track for thenmuli even the junior most staff at the clinic is given the freedom to educate such beneficiaries about the treatment schemes the quality of giving is ingrained into every member of the team and thank you so much for the entire arvind rai hospital team and the gang mathe weapon van van paadu vandha naarmula nalla theriyudu Ultimately, it is faith that cures. What it effectively means is we have flattered the families with optimism, with courage, and we have also stood by them during this time of crisis, especially in the whole era of pessimism which surrounds their everyday life. And it often reminds me of Dr. V's words. He used to often say, "It is ourselves we are helping." it is ourselves we are healing and it's a very very nice feeling to have for me once again i want to thank you for your patient hearing and i would like to leave you with last two r's one is residents and the second is responsibility it is your responsibility as well uh, as you embark uh, from residency to a consultant mode uh, into the future thank you once again Uh, for this opportunity dr namrata and dr ditya thank you very much thank you prajna i think uh, that was an excellent presentation more so the last bit of the movie which says it all that you may or you may not you know work for the patients but ultimately things have to be implemented and i think we do have some social responsibility in that also
Thank you so much again for your time and for your uh, presentation. Thank you, Namrata. Uh, indeed, uh, this session was something which was, you know, not only uh, the clinical ophthalmology, something beyond that to learn how to survive, how to practice, how to implement yourself into a public, how to serve the public, and how ethically you can work in these areas. Listening to uh, people who are really made the change in a scenario, right from Dr. Mahipal Sajdev, created a center for sight, then Dr. Davis's who have created their own uh, kingdom in West Bengal, this uh, hospital chains. Dr. Arun Singhvi, who is uh, working with the younger generations to build the ophthalmic uh, care facilities in every corner of the country. Dr. Uh, Raj Sekhar, who is doing an individual practice in a Bangalore city. So all these things have given a lot of teaching how these young people sitting in this audience and people who have joined us today, they would uh, definitely learn all these aspects, which are so true in terms of building a practice of own. Then we have our institutions. We listened to Dr. Pradeep Sharma, who's worked in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, RP Center for so long, more than 40 years in this institute. And his way of expressing how we younger generations should look into was great to listen to him. And subsequently, uh, listening to Pajanna, the institution of the country, maybe of the world, changed the entire scenario of uh, practice. And we appreciate these institutions who have really served the country. And if we are doing something better for the country, it's because of these institutions. Thank you again for being with, with us and being a part of RPC celebration today. Thank you again. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I was very impressed by the chains and the people who are giving a very, uh, you know, affordable health care. The social angle is also very important in our country, like especially Dishai Hospital, what Dr. Debeshi has shown that uh, he is giving very affordable health care. I really congratulate them for that and carry on the good work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, all the chairpersons. Uh, uh, can we... Uh, Diksha, can you invite the next group of people? Excellent presentations by all our speakers and very well moderated by Dr. Namrita Sharma. And let's hear it for all our speakers, our chairpersons and our moderator for this session. Moving on to the next session, which is subjected on nuances in FACO techniques and IOI implantation. I would take the honor to invite our moderator, esteemed Dr. Rajesh Sinhaji, over to you, sir. Can we have the slide of the So uh, I welcome you all in this uh, wonderful session. And uh, our first speaker who is going to give a plenary talk is Dr. Boris Milugin. Dr. Milugin is a professor of ophthalmology known worldwide for his innovations. Uh, and he is working at the Fyodorov Eye Microsurgery Institution, Moscow, Russia. He is the Deputy Director General at uh, Fyodorov Eye Microsurgery uh, at Russia and currently President of Russian Ophthalmological Society. A world-renowned authority and expert in the field of anterior segment surgery. He is well known for his development of the Milugin ring, which uh, um, many of us and most of us actually are using. Uh, member of the ESCRS uh, Program Committee, Academia of Thalmologica, Internationalist, International Intraocular Implant Club, as well as ICO and AO Advisory Committees. He is a recipient of numerous awards, which includes the Bunkost Award uh, uh, in the year 2017 by ACRS, the Krizinger Award again in 2017 by uh, ISCRS, and many others. Uh, he has to his credit several named and keynote lectures and live surgery sessions at the major national and international conventions. And we really feel privileged to have Dr. Boris Milugin with us in this uh, RPC Foundation Day uh, uh, ceremony and uh, of course the CME. So we welcome Dr. Boris Milugin and uh, invite him to give a talk on uh, cataract surgery in corneal opacities. 
dear Dr. Rajesh, uh, dear Jivan, uh, dear Namrata, and esteemed colleagues, uh, uh, first of all, it's my great pleasure and honor to be here with you today uh, to celebrate with you uh, 55th anniversary uh, of the prestigious institution. Uh, and uh, I am deeply honored to share with you uh, some of my uh, thoughts and ideas uh, related to cataract surgery in corneal opacity. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, cataract surgery uh, in these circumstances uh, is, um, 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 is um, all about visualization. We know that thread reflex is the prerequisite of modern cataract surgery, allowing us to visualize all the details of the anterior segment structures. However, corneal opacities uh, obviously uh, is one of the reasons why we cannot obtain red reflex uh, during cataract surgery. The other reasons being uh, the cloudiness of the vitreous body, uh, posterior segment pathology, uh, small pupil, and uh, inability to achieve orthogonal position of the eyeball. Uh, obviously, we do have different options here. Uh, when the uh, opacity is very thick, it's a good idea to perform uh, uh, optical reconstruction uh, by keratoplasty, uh, followed by uh, cataract extraction, uh, or sometimes uh, together with cataract uh, uh, extraction and IOL implantation. There is another option uh, also described in the literature uh, to use uh, uh, microendoscopy probe introduced into the anterior segment. And then you can see here, we can see from within the eye, uh, the structures of the anterior segment. And to some extent that help us to uh, visualize uh, the, uh, these structures through the uh, cornea, which is not perfectly transparent. Another option would be to use external uh, transcorneal illumination when the um, light pipe is attached to the cornea uh, and help us to uh, visualize uh, the anterior lens capsule patches in that case or uh, lens nucleus during uh, fake emulsification. Alternatively, uh, there is a possibility to introduce the light pipe inside the anterior chamber, uh, even further enhancing uh, visualization uh, of the structures. Uh, during the FACO procedure. So my personal approach is to use chandelier illumination and there are different devices uh, and different manufacturers that can be mentioned with that respect. Uh, this is the one that I have in my clinic. So this is a chandelier illumination. And as you can see here, uh, when the uh, chandelier is introduced uh, through the parish planar, it gives you uh, uh, the illumination from behind uh, of the lens. Uh, and uh, obviously it is not perfectly uh, matches with the uh, reflex that we uh, uh, get used to be. It's a, it's a little bit greenish in color. However, uh, this retro illumination is very much helpful in, um, in uh, obtaining the visualization of the uh, anterior segment structures. The other uh, important thing is that the pupil size is quite critical. You see here uh, when the pupil is small and this one when it's extended and obviously the uh, amount of the light outcoming from the eye uh, uh, is uh, uh, very much uh, dependent on, on the pupil size. So here is the clinical case of the patient um, uh, having uh, corneal opacity since childhood. Uh, however, uh, uh, she experienced gradual vision decrease during the last couple of years. And uh, uh, that's why we see no reason uh, to uh, perform corneal transplantation. And uh, we thought that the, probably the main reason was the uh, uh, um, opacity of the lens although some uh, narrowing of the field uh, was a little bit suspicious with regard to the 
possible optic nerve uh, issues. Um, and as you can see here, the eye was uh, uh, not very long, uh, 21.19. However, due to the cornea that was uh, hard to assess, we, we decided to, uh, to um, place in the high power lens. And this is the uh, OCT image of that uh, cornea. And we will see it a little bit uh, later during the surgical procedure. And we can see uh, that this is the opacity. Um, uh, fibrotic tissue is located on top of the cornea. And we can see that the underlying cornea is also uh, affected. So uh, the, the idea here was to start with the uh, removal of the uh, corneal opacity, uh, which was uh, lying superficially, uh, trying to uh, uh, dissect this uh, uh, fibrotic tissue uh, with the idea uh, uh, first to regularize the cornea and second, uh, improve visualization uh, during the later steps of that procedure. So to some extent it was achieved, although we obtained not very regular uh, surface of that um, uh, of that cornea. Following that uh, implantation of the chandelier device uh, uh, was being performed as shown here. Uh, uh, this is inserted um, through the parse planer. And as soon as uh, it is introduced, uh, you see how we can uh, visualize the reflex that going from behind the eye. Sometimes it's a good idea to, uh, to play with the microscope light. Uh, so combination of microscope light and chandelier light uh, uh, is uh, quite useful. In that case, uh, we um, uh, put some viscoelastic on top of the uh, cornea because uh, it was irregular and uh, uh, improving visualization uh, uh, was achieved by applying this scholastic. And also, as I mentioned to you, expanding the pupil was uh, in that case uh, critical uh, to achieve uh, uh, much better uh, reflex from the, uh, from the uh, behind, uh, from the uh, posterior segment of the, of the eye. And uh, now the pupil device is introduced and uh, it's a good idea to use bimanual uh, technique of insertion of the scrolls of that device in cases when the pupil is very small in order to uh, avoid additional trauma uh, that may be caused uh, to the pupil uh, by excessive movement of the, of the device. So as shown here, uh, the, uh, this is a kind of a greenish uh, reflex that we get. And the other important step, uh, which should be emphasized, it's uh, obviously the uh, staining of the anterior capsule, uh, because uh, uh, this is a very, uh, very important to additionally uh, outline the edge of the anterior capsule axis uh, without that it, it might be a bit tricky to visualize the, uh, the anterior capsule during the procedure. Uh, following that, the next steps of the surgery were uh, more or less uh, stay same that we, we are get used to uh, during our regular FACA procedures. Um, although, um, as I mentioned to you, the colors were not, um, very familiar to us uh, uh, because of the weaker uh, uh, weaker red uh, uh, portion of the uh, of the color palette, uh, as you can see here. However, uh, double illumination from behind and from above uh, allows you to uh, uh, see the details of the structures that were not mm, been possible to to do without that kind of uh, illumination. So I will speed up a little bit the process uh, uh, to, uh, to show the further steps of the procedure. And these are the late, late last uh, 
uh, seconds of uh, fragmentation of the uh, of the nucleus uh, evacuation of the cortical material is now being done uh, with bimanual uh, technique following that uh, um, IOL will be implanted uh, into the capsule bag uh, um, uh, pretty much uh, the same way that we get used to and again you see this irregular uh, contour of the cornea uh, which was due to the uh, uh, removal of the fibrotic tissue and we can sometimes do, intro, do intraoperative paucity uh, to be sure that the posterior capsule uh, is intact and uh, there are no breaks. IOL goes inside the capsular bag uh, and uh, uh, the uh, pupil expansion device uh, removed from, uh, from the iris. You see that the iris is quite atrophic. Um, However, uh, no issues were uh, um, observed uh, during that step of the procedure. Um, like to utilize the injection system uh, to remove the uh, pupil expander ring from, from the eye. You have to be quite careful, of course, when the iris is especially thin. Uh, Fiscolastic is removed from uh, behind the lens, and uh, that uh, concludes the uh, the whole procedure. Uh, following the removal of the uh, chandelier and checking uh, the position of the lens uh, inside the capsule bag, and one suture was placed uh, uh, on the cornea to be sure that the incision was self sealing. Uh, after the surgery, uh, because of the probably irrigation uh, trauma, there was some thickening of the cornea. Uh, we observed folds on the posterior uh, surface of the cornea. However, in one month, the thickness uh, of the cornea resolved. Uh, and the, here you can see the eye of, of the patient uh, one month postoperatively. So uh, we, we have uh, now several cases uh, where we use this technique. And we do think that the use of chandelier and the illumination uh, allowed us for reasonably good visualization of the anterior segment structures in patients with corneal opacities. Uh, it is critical uh, to have the right angle of chandelier positioning uh, for optimal illumination. Uh, because variable uh, uh, angles of, of the illumination gives you a different um, uh, uh, different illumination um, um, uh, rates. Uh, capsular dye is mandatory to achieve anterior capsule visibility. Uh, obviously, appropriate size of the pupil uh, is needed, and uh, several devices can be in, uh, recommended uh, with that respect. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Boris, for showing a, a wonderful case and very nice tips on how to handle such a case by use of chandelier illumination. Very nice presentation. Thanks a lot. Okay. So our next speaker is, uh, again, uh, uh, a plenary talk by Dr. Ruth Lepid. She is a faculty of medicine, AMC, University of Amsterdam, Netherlands. She has done fellowship in cornea and external diseases with uh, Professor Rootman and Professor Slomovic at the University of Toronto in Canada. She has obtained a PhD degree in visual quality improvements in refractive surgery at the University of Amsterdam. She is a member of the board of the Netherlands Intraocular Implant Club since 2013, an expert in multifocal IOL implantation, complicated cataract and corneal surgery, anterior segment reconstruction and refractive surgery. She is involved in experimental corneal surgery, uh, including the first in human study with the endo-art artificial corneal endothelium and principal investigator for the coming study of the corneate capro and artificial cornea. She has 76 publications with 1183 citations under her credit, a very renowned name. Uh, let's uh, 
listen to her talk on uh, clinical results with VVT uh, at my practice and my approach for patient selection. Dr. Ruth Lepid. Thank you very much, uh, dear organizers and uh, colleagues. Uh, congratulations on your foundation day, the 55th anniversary. It's very special to be with you, even though it's only virtual this time. Um, if I can have my first slide, uh, please. It was uh, sent to your technician. Yeah, we are just going to, going to put here as come. Here it is. Thank you very much. So I would like to share with you the clinical results with the Vivity lens at my practice and how I approach the patient selection. Now, uh, next slide, please. I'm of course acutely aware that uh, India is a, a subcontinent with a wide range of uh, patients' needs and uh, capabilities. And even so, I think that Vivity is very relevant because of its capability of giving freedom from glasses. Glasses cost money. Uh, there is a good reason to correct vision for all distances uh, in our patients. So the Vivity lens is a wavefront shaping IOL. It uh, can do some press biopia correction. And most importantly, it's not diffractive, which means it has less side effects. Next slide, please. So a little bit about myself. I work at a clinic which is called Retina Total Eye Care, and it's funny, but we do only refractive surgery. It was named well before uh, corneal and lens uh, refractive surgery was in fashion. So we're the first refractive clinic in the Netherlands, and we did the first premium IOLs in the ne Netherlands. And boasting, yes, we have the most experience, turning out a lot of PhD uh, research from there. The next one is on its way, and I hope we'll do this this year. Next slide, please. So our patients, and we sometimes we call them clients, right? So they are very savvy. They know exactly what they want. They did a market research and they want to live without spectacles. So this is what they come to for me, from to my clinic. Next slide. Next, yeah, thank you. So what we do is we listen carefully to our patient's um, wishes, and then I return to being an eye doctor. So I ask about their general health and about their ocular history. And because people come to us for refractive lens surgery, our default lens is basically a trifocal lens. So if there's no ocular problems, then we would give patients a choice. But if they do, have some ocular problems which will preclude, preclude the use of trifocal lenses, then I never had another option. I used to go monofocal. But now, since the Vivity has come onto the market, I have uh, um, followed closely what my results are with doing this presbyopia correcting lens in difficult eyes or difficult patients. You also have patients who have, uh, well, uh, a difficult sense of, of, of uh, what they want in life, right? Next slide, please. So what I'm going to share with you is the immediately sequential bilateral implantation of the vivid IOLs in eyes with ocular comorbidity. Next slide, please. In this cohort, what we did is we did a retrospective uh, uh, audit of all our data from September to December 2021. And in these patients, we did an immediate sequential bilateral refractive lens surgery. And we put in either the Vivity or the Vivity Toric. I have a, a typing mistake here. It's 21 females, 18 males. The mean age is nearly 67 years old. And all of them had ocular problems. Next slide, please. So in these 78 eyes, we had eyes that were post-laser, and we had eyes that had epiretinal membranes or terrible floaters or glaucoma or eyes with very high myopia, uh, amblyopia, esotropia, macular scars, irregular topographies, 
post-trauma, you name it, this group had it. Next slide, please. And these are our results at uh, three months in those patients. So what you can see is that the distance vision, both corrected and uncorrected, this is binocular, is around 2020. And the intermediate is slightly better than 2020. And interestingly is that the near vision is around 2025. And this is with a presbyopia correction that, which has a stretched focus, which is not supposed to give uh, upfront very nearby reading. So our strategy, next slide, please. We have a real strategy in implementation. So it starts with our shared consent. We tell about the focus stretch and we tell them that we can give them a little bit more of, of freedom if we stretch it a little more by doing a mini mono vision. And of course, we tell them that they are screen agers. Our patients are uh, basically mostly older than I am still. And they all have tablets and smartphones, and they uh, can handle those situations in which they otherwise would need reading glasses for close up. And with these lenses, you can see what you cook, you can see what you eat, you can see what you wear, you can do facial recognition, you can do computer screens, which is more or less 90% of the things that we do in our daily lives. And we tell them upfront, you may need readers for small print. And then we go for the dominant eye, we go for plano correction, and the non-dominant eye, we want to be in between minus one quarter and minus one half of a diopter. Next slide, please. So here you can see our dominant eye outcomes. On the left side, you can see the predicted uh, refraction in terms of spherical equivalent, sphere, cylinder, and the mean absolute error. And on the right side, you can see what we actually achieved. And this is non-toric and toric lenses all in one go. This is all the post-laser eyes and the not lasered eyes, everything on one big mountain. And what you can see is that the results are, in my opinion, really, really good. And this is very encouraging. Next slide, please. And this is in the non-dominant eye. We wanted to have a minimum of vision of about half a diopter, which we achieved. We tried to achieve low cylinders, which we also achieved except for in one or two patients. And basically our patients had a very nice range of monovision and this is what enhanced the results. Next slide, please. Now, what about the toric lenses? You know, we, we still, some of us in the West think, you know, this is only for the high cylinders. And basically what we have done is we calculate the lenses and we see whether a toric lens, even a low toric correction, could improve the post-operative outcome. So we do not have a cutoff of 1 or 1.25 diopters for starting out with toric lenses. Our baseline is that we, we make a calculation for a toric lens. And if the calculation tells us, yes, you will have a better outcome, we put toric lenses in. Next slide, please. And so these are the toric calculations for these eyes. And you can see that the centroid is really lower and we get a very nice uh, uh, small centroid showing that most of our patients have less than one half a diopter of uh, uh, toricity or cylinder in the refraction post-surgery. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of satisfaction, most of these patients are very happy. And I have one unhappy patient here, you know, not every patient is listening very well. This man has a macular scar. So the, the expectations that with the lens, I will uh, um, um, do some gimmick and, and make his macular scar go, go away doesn't work, right? So he's not very happy. But basically from those 30, Eight patients, 39 patients that we did, 38 patients are very happy. These were very difficult eyes to do in terms of refraction. And um, um, 
the good patient management, the, the shared consent to transfer some of the responsibility for the outcomes to the patient really works. Next slide, please. So we did a cat quest uh, satisfaction questionnaire. And here you can see that, that most people have, have no difficulties with their vision. Uh, many of them can read newspapers. They're somewhere between some difficulty and no difficulty. Facial recognition, reading price markings, uh, uh, look where you walk, uh, do manual activity, uh, sewing or working wood. I don't know whoever does this still, but they had no problems with this. And also reading the subtitles on TV were no problem. I'm not sure you want to watch any TV in these times at all, but in any case, they can see the subtitles or participate in their activities and hobbies. Next slide, please. In terms of using reading glasses, so one in every three patients didn't even have reading glasses. One in every uh, nine patients sometimes or seldomly put them on, often was just one in seven patients and seven patients and always was also rare. So these were basically the, the outcomes that were the outliers that, that needed reading glasses. Next slide, please. And then we also had a look at, at auto refraction versus subjective refraction because the Vivity has a, 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 a lens that has an optic that's quite sensitive and, and quite complex. You want to make sure where do you start with refracting those patients that you will not have a systematic mistake postoperatively. So here we can see that both in terms of sphere and cylinder magnitude, we get a statistically significant difference uh, between the autorefraction and the subjective refraction. However, in terms of the sphere, it's, it's not a very big uh, mistake. It's, it's a, a little bit over minusing. So when you're refracting, you should be careful of not over minusing these patients. And in terms of the cylinder magnitude, we're over correcting on the auto refraction and we see that in, in, in subjective refraction, it's really lower. I have to tell you, I did no vectorial analysis yet. Um, I also have to tell you, you have to be careful because you know it's dependent on the auto refractions machine that you're using. And um, this is also still a small sample size, which uh, I'm hoping to grow very soon. Next slide, please. So in our practice, we do refractive lens surgery. That's uh, what we make a living of. And we used to do 95% of our lenses trifocal, trifocal torix. And then when we had no options, we would offer monofocal lenses. Now, I was very skeptical of this lens in the beginning. I mean, the stretched optic, who's ever heard of that? And then we discovered that we are basically not doing any monofocal lenses anymore uh, because we have a very good uh, addition to our uh, lenses, which is the Vivity. I have something to offer to patients who cannot have trifocal lenses. And I think this is exciting news. Now, in terms of uh, biometry and IOL strategy, we use multi-formulae. Uh, we do check dominance. We go in the nomen dominant and nent eye to minus one half. And in the post laser eyes, of course, we do an adjusted IOL calculation, but basically we're so familiar with that that that's no problem. I see I'm being hurried, so I'll read this out fast. Summarizing, uh, we have a very dependable outcome. Patients are very happy. They have a much higher freedom from spectacles than we ever expected. We stretch it with mini monovision and we use toric lenses the moment you need it, not the moment after. So this is very important. And remember, this is special technology, no diffractive rings. So we don't hear anything about halos or, or visual side effects, basically. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Lepid, for sharing with us your uh, results of Vivity intraocular lens. And, uh...
So we move on to the next talk. We have uh, Dr. Partha Biswas, who will be talking on white cataract tackling troubles. Dr. Partha is the chairman of the scientific committee of AIOS and uh, the director of Trinitrale Kolkata. Thank you very much, Professor Titiyal, sir, and the entire faculty of RP Center for having me here. It's a great honor to be here on this podium, and I'm really, really grateful, sir. White cataracts tackling troubles. Is it something new? Well, the newness is COVID has brought in something new because, again, there is a spate of white cataracts in our clinics. And we need to take cognizance of the fact that white cataracts are white cataracts and they have to be dealt with caution. A long surgical list, and if it is a long surgical list, a long surgical day, let us not put all our white cataracts together because they pose a number of challenges during the surgery. And these challenges would be the capsular excess difficulty, which is very well known. Also the nucleus management in these dense uh, uh, cataracts can have complications which, which could be much more. So the pre-operative evaluation is important. Examination of the retina and the optic nerve is not possible for this except for the ultrasound assessment. And the defect, the RAPD has to be done. The ultrasound definitely gives a better picture of the posterior segment and an anterior segment examination to rule out uveitis, narrow angles, vascular diseases, all come into the preoperative evaluation. Biometry, of course, most of the time, we are not able to use the optical biometer, and therefore the ultrasound biometer comes into play. Catometric measurements, et cetera, have to be fixed. And here, the surgery of the white cataracts is challenging, and we'll go through a few surgical procedures to elaborate how we do it. This was a wonderful paper, Tityal sir, from you. And uh, it really gave an insight to the interoperative dynamics of the white cataract. And I think it's there for every one of us to read through this paper, to understand, and to understand the management strategy, which has been so well uh, delineated. Let's look at this uh, video. And uh, here, of course, as you can see, that it is a white cataract, and it might cause trouble. But the use of high molecular weight viscoelastic, you can see the intralenticular cleft, and these are, there is a possibility of a rexis run out. But the use of the substances, the high molecular weight viscoelastic, and the use of small incisions whereby there is very little of leakage definitely improves the possibility of uh, rexis decreases the possibility of a rexis run out. And if it is a neat and round rexis, nothing like it. The rest of the parts are quite, quite easy. But now let us look at this uh, video and uh, a smallish pupil. Do I have to use a ring or a device? Uh, well, we go ahead and uh, again, stain the capsule, which is mandatory in these cases. And then with the high molecular weight viscoelastic and the inevitable happens. So our excess run out and in these excess run outs, we need to debulk the amount of fluid that there is. So there is a definite amount of intralenticular clefts over there with fluid pockets, which have given rise to it. So after debulking the intralenticular uh, cortical matter that there is, then the two snips, and then with the microrexis forceps, the capsular axis can be so tuned that it gives a possibility that this might not run out anymore. The fear, of course, is in the possibility of uh, extension to the posterior capsule and, of course, the pupil going down. So these are the fears which happen. And here again, if you have to put a device, this with the capsular, capsular excess run out might become difficult. Here I'm lucky that it, there is no extension to the posterior capsule. And every time I remove the instruments, the viscoelastic should support the chamber as much as possible. So in such cases, where do we go on to and how do we go ahead? placing in the intraocular lens. Here, of course, we choose 
the three piece lens, which supposedly should go into the capsule well and stay in the capsule once it is there. So the possibility of again a run out of the Rexis is there, but most of the time the support is good enough and uh, the three piece lens stays in. Let's go on to the next surgical case and here it has One already run left. out. Yes. Carry on, carry on. One minute? Yes. Okay. Carry on. So I'll go ahead with the third case. This is a more interesting case. And uh, this is a case in which we did a fake IOL, an ICL, the ICL very nicely in place. But then after six months, the patient developed retina detachment. With the retina detachment, the patient uh, lost vision. A uh, good retina detachment settling surgery was done. The retina got settled and uh, everything was fine. But in about four weeks' time, there was a total cataract that appeared. And obvious, the obvious thing was it possibly was a lens touch during the retinal, retina detachment surgery. So in such a case, removal of the ICL is the first thing. Not so difficult a task. And if the ICL can be removed, then, of course, oh, sorry. If the ICL can be removed, then uh, uh, not able to move the cursor. Uh, if the ICL cannot be removed, then the, the, the trouble is not removal of the ICL, but the cataract that is beyond it. So as you can see that there is synechia over there. And with the synechia, is uh, the possibility of difficulty in the uh, in the uh, man maneuvering the capsular axis. So if the capsular axis has to be done well, and in this again, it is an intumescent cataract, you can see that there is a bulge of the anterior capsule. And with the bulge of the anterior capsule, which means that the interventricular pressure is quite high. So viscoelastic above the capsule, and above the ICL placed, and then removal of the uh, ICL, which is not so difficult. The ICL has to be removed by these forceps, which is offered by the manufacturer. And uh, it's a hand over hand technique. Once the ICL comes out, then the things are not so difficult. But of course, the smearing of the anterior capsule is important because, again, we need to see the rexus fashioning out in such cases. So very gently and uh, through the 3.2 millimeter incision itself, the ICL can be removed intact. And uh, once the ICL is removed here, of course, we go ahead to do the capsular axis. The capsular axis is going to be uh, a little tough because remembering the fact that the synechia is there and uh, the synechia would, could mean that there could be a possibility of or excess run out, which actually is something that we apprehended. So the rexis run out in such a case is also coupled with uh, the possibility of uh, uh, difficulty here. The viscoelastic is again washed out. The rexis has uh, uh, is to be fashioned now. I'm sorry, sir, I cannot move the cursor. Uh, so that would have been important. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> removing the amount of fluid and milking out the fluid is the important part and milking out from both the sides have to be done. And uh, But here, as we try and fashion this uh, rexis, uh, the rexis uh, tends to run out and uh, grasping and re-grasping, we have got to the half the part, but then it now runs out. So once it runs out, what we also see that there is a run out, not in one place, but it has run out in two places. So here we, are, we have the risk of the whole bag getting unsettled. And of course, as we understand that there's been a posterior capsular touch and thereby there could be a dehiscence anyway in this capsule. So removal of the cortex is not so difficult. The iris is crowding in. And, uh, but we are able to get, off, get rid of the uh, cortical matter quite easily. Uh, and here we see that, yes, there is a central 
part of opacity in the capsule, which uh, actually is has to be negotiated, has to be improved if this patient has to get back vision. And uh, this uh, we need to do, and uh, therefore the strategy that we employ is, of course, we had thought of both the single piece as well as the multi-piece lenses, but here we are going to place in the multi-piece lens now. Uh, since we do not know where this lens is going to be situated, so best to put in a multi-piece so that a single piece and a single piece lens will left, not be the right choice. So placing in the multi-piece lens, being very, very careful because uh, in these two places, if the excess runs out, we will have a lost bag and then uh, more difficulties in this case. So we are able to place in the three-piece lens quite well. But now to negotiate and to uh, improve upon the visual uh, vision, so we take a MVR blade and go right through the center part and uh, make an opening in that central plaque that you see. After making an opening, uh, this central plaque has to be uh, removed by a vitrector. And so we take the vitrector, go underneath the lens and to remove uh, the central opacity. So this central opacity again is protective to the capsular bag. So we do not need to go beyond the central opacity and thereby the vitrector has to carve out just about that much of area, which should be good enough for the central vision to be preserved. So uh, this is what we did and uh, the patient fared well and uh, got back approximately 624 N12 vision. Uh, thank you very much for your patient hearing and thank you and sorry for taking a little more time than was allotted to me. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Partha. Thank you, Dr. Partha. Uh, very nice case, very nice tips on how to handle such cases. Uh, we now move on to the next speaker and that is Dr. Rajinder Prasad, who will be talking about terminal chop and easy way to manage the difficult heart cataract. Dr. Rajinder Prasad is uh, an alumnus of RP Center and currently the Vice President of Delhi Ophthalmological Society, practicing at Delhi. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Tate for the invite and uh, it's really a great honor and more than that it's great pleasure to be here uh, at your own alma mater and uh, it's really thank thank you very much uh, professor Titiyal, for the invite uh, friends i'm going to talk about uh, a very important topic that is uh, about the heart cataract and the technique which is called as the terminal chop an easy way to manage these heart cataract uh, if you look at this uh, publication, it has shown that most of the complication, intraoperative complications, took place while segmenting the nucleus or during the emulsification of the conjoined segments, if it is not free and uh, uh, complete segmentation of the nucleus. So why it is so? Because if you look at these heart cataracts, they present to us series of specific and difficult challenges. And these challenges, starting from the capsular access to hydro procedure, to manipulation of the nucleus, rotation of the nucleus, each and every step of the heart cataract is a challenge. But the most critical challenge in these heart cataract is they don't break easily. It's always difficult to achieve full thickness, uh, complete segmentation of these uh, heart nuclei. And what happens, like if you do not get the complete segmentation, then what happens, we tend to use very high energy levels. We tend to start doing a longer ultrasound time, uh, prolonged manipulation. And then we start using a lot of compressive forces in the form of, we change our procedure to drilling, trenching, making a crater into the nucleus. So all these would increase the CDE value. And this not only increases the risk of endothelial cell damage, but also increases the risk of thermal injury to the supporting structures as well as the mechanical injury. So I'm talking about the terminal chop. It's a one of the very simple, very safe and the easiest technique 
to break these hard nuclei into complete full thickness free segments. So you can see these videos uh, to segment these hard nuclei, we use a unique novel device, which is called as a terminator. It's a wedge device and uh, a unique technique to crack these hard nuclei. So you can see very easily here. So how easily these hard nuclei can be cracked and split into multiple fragments that is full thickness without here plate in these hard cataract. So what you need to do is you have to just hold the nucleus with the FACO probe just within the equator. And this device has to be hooked all around. It's a full thickness hooking of the nucleus and then draw this device through the equator of the nucleus and you get a crack. So once you get a crack, then you don't need to put too much of the splitting force or the lateral separation force. And uh, with a very minimal separation force, you can split the nucleus into two free segments and then into the four or six segments, depending on the type of the, and the hardness of the nucleus. And the important point, what you can see here is like when I holding the nucleus, your FACO probe has to give the counter force. That is a counter pressure against the, the device which is hooked around the nucleus. So that is how like these, both the devices are parallel and the same point, unlike in a horizontal chop, you uh, go the, uh, with the FACO probe, go deep into the center of the nucleus, not towards the equator. So here this device is going around the nucleus and the FACO probe is also at the, within, just within the equator. And now the, both the devices are at, at the equator and then only you will get this mechanical force of uh, fracture of the nucleus and you get a complete fracture. So you can see here, this is a grade six nucleus and even a grade six nucleus, the, look at the direction of the FACO probe. It has gone towards the equator. The device is hooked around and then you get a crack and you split it into two free segments. So it, the, as you have seen these videos, the in terminal chop, what we do is we first crack the nucleus and then split to break. Unlike in horizontal and uh, vertical chop, what we do is we put a little separation force first to crack the nucleus and then you break the nucleus. So lateral separation force is required at too high of lateral separation force, which you do not require here because you have cracked the nucleus already. And the mechanics of this uh, technique was drawn from the brittle crack propagation with tensile fracture force. This was described by the Griffith somewhere in 1920. And this actually mechanics was basically described for the rock excavation system, where they used to use uh, this wedge device to crack these hard rocks or split the one object into two. So this device when driven through the hard object, it gives a tensile fracture force. And this is how you crack these hard rock without crushing or without cutting the hard uh, material. So what we did was like we incorporated this wedge device within the inner edge of the chopper and we converted this chopper into a cracker. Now this is not a chopper, it's not going to cut or crush it's going to give you a tensile fracture force that is the cracking force into a hard nucleus. And uh, the important point with this cracker, what you can see, it has a three, three edge, three wedge edge. You can use this uh, device right or left or anteriorly. So you do not need right and left uh, choppers like uh, many of the choppers you have to use right and left choppers. These are different, but this can be used on the right and left and anteriorly on all the sides to crack the nucleus. And the important point, another important point is how to use this within the capsular bag. So that was the main issue. And what we did was like we, you can see here the position of the FACO probe. If you hold the nucleus at the equator, just within the equator, and when you draw it, what will happen? Like nucleus will have a little rotational movement. Once the nucleus rotates, you can very clearly see the edge of the nucleus. And with visualization, because you are seeing the edge of the nucleus, then you are hooking this device around the equator of the nucleus. Unlike in horizontal chop, you are blindly putting the chopper at the equator. You do not see the edge, but here you are seeing the edge and then you are hooking it. And once you hook it, then you slightly draw it 
you create a crack at the equator. So this is called as a crack formation. Now what happens if you create a crack at the equator, it automatically traverses through the center and to the equator on the other side. So you do not need to draw the chopper or the cracker from the periphery towards the center. It's just at the equator you create a crack and the crack will traverse. Now since you have already cracked the nucleus, you do not need the lateral separation force. Very minimal lateral separation force will split the nucleus into two. So it means you are not putting any stress on the posterior capsule as well as on the zonules. Your zonules and the posterior capsule is absolutely safe. So just see this, uh, how the device is used in this video. So what you do is you just hold the nucleus just within the equator, draw it a bit, hook it and crack it. So this is the first crack we got. Rotate the nucleus and crack the first human hemonuclei further See the position and the direction of the FECO probe, crack it, you get another crack, and then to interrupt you. the further cracking. Okay, just the time. half a minute. Sure, sir. And uh, this can be used, even this kind of cataract also. This is uh, one of the very hardest and hard cataract, uh, grade six or more, absolutely black, rock hard cataract. And you can see here, you hold the nucleus just within the equator. Hook it and you crack the nucleus and then you split. In a hard cataract, you may need a little more lateral separation force, but still you get a complete full thickness cracking of the nucleus. So to conclude, uh, this is a very simple technique, very safe and very effective technique to be used in the hard cataract. Uh, the reason for that is because you need a very, a very minimal manipulation, very minimal FECO energy, and, uh, and the cracking, what you get is full thickness. You are never left with the posterior plate, and you get a complete fragmentation of the nucleus. And if you have a complete fragmentation, then drawing these free segments on the FECO probe becomes very easy, and emulsification procedure becomes very safe and swift. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prasad, for a very nice presentation of a difficult scenario, how to handle such rock hard cataracts. Thank you very much. We move on to the next talk, and that is by Dr. Chintan Malhotra, who will be talking to us about femto femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery for white cataracts. Dr. Chintan Malhotra is uh, a senior consultant at uh, uh, PGI Chandigarh. And over Hi. to you. Thank you, sir. And at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Patel, sir, and uh, the rest of the faculty of RPC for this uh, invitation. It's indeed a privilege and an honor to be part of your Foundation Day celebrations. So I'll be speaking briefly about the femtosecond laser-assisted cataract surgery for white cataracts. We all know that FLAX gives us precise, well-centered capsulotomies, which is inherently a benefit in any kind of cataract, but more so when we have to do the premium IOLs. And there are multiple complex situations where flax is useful, but I think for in my practice, the most useful condition where I find it is the white cataracts. And why is that? Because the specter of the Argentinian flag sign with an equator to equator rip looms large over the surgeon's head, whatever be the experience and the skill level. The rates of incomplete capsulorexes in white cataracts are higher vis-a-vis -vis normal cataracts and attempts to achieve an intact CCC often end up in being it being undersized which again is not great for premium IOLs. Once we talk about white cataracts, we need to realize that not all white cataracts are the same and comparing different types of white cataracts, clubbing them together would be like comparing apples and oranges. Uh, the way I like to look at it is importantly, white cataracts with fluid and without fluid, at least in uh, femto cataract, that's what makes a lot of difference. For example, this is a 30 year old lady with Fuchs utrochioma cuveitis and she had a huge lens. It was completely ballooned out. But on the ASOCT, we see that this is mainly swollen cortical fibers with lamellar separation. There are some fluid pockets, but they are less. And now this is the kind of cataract which to my mind would immediately rip out and we'd have an Argentinian flag sign if we went in for a manual capsular excess in this. And in such a case, if the patient was sitting on the fence undecided about undergoing a femto cataract surgery, I would kind of take extra efforts to convince that patient. On the other hand, if we have intumescent cataracts with fluid pockets, plenty of fluid pockets, if femto technology is not available or the patient is unwilling, 
Needle aspiration prior to initiating the capsular excess will decrease the run, uh, risk of a runaway capsule and uh, have a lesser risk. And if it's a dry white cataract with no fluid and compact nucleus with an intact posterior capsule, there's minimal risk of extension even with a manual CCC. So as we go on to, uh, before we go on to videos of the white cataract, if we see in a normal non-intumescent, non-white cataract, the femtosecond laser enabled anterior capsular opening is very predictable. It's like sailing on very placid waters. On the other hand, if we see uh, the, uh, in white cataracts, the capsules can behave unpredictably and that can depend upon the intralenticular fluid and fluid within the lens. For example, this was another intumescent cataract where the anterior capsule and the fluid comes out more in the form of a sudden spurt. It's more like a volcano and that, rip, uh, that could block the delivery of the laser pulses. And this is just a slow motion of that same capsulotomy again. And where we see that sudden forceful gush of that intralenticular fluid at a point. And in this kind of a case, it's been shown uh, by Dr. Soon Pek Chi in an uh, article uh, in 2019, that the anterior posterior change in the position of the anterior capsule predisposes to incomplete capsulotomies. That is why, because the capsule has moved posteriorly and where your laser pulses were intended, they are not hitting that. And this is the video of the same patient moving forward. It was anticipated that the patient would, could have a bridge or a tag somewhere. And uh, so staining, of course, is vital for these cataracts. I've now moved on to painting the anterior capsule. This is an earlier video. So a tag was present, which was tending to come out of the main incision. The patient had a very short neck, high intralenticular pressure, and everything was tending to bulge forwards. So multiple attempts were made. And finally, with, on, from the side port with a uh, cystitome, I was able to remove this tag, and then the uh, cataract surgery could proceed normally. This is just the uh, photograph of the, uh, on the first post-operative day, we can, we can see the site of the uncut capsular bridge where this, a small, uh, there's a small, uh, I would say deficit in the opening. It's not completely round, but otherwise the CCC remains intact. And this was again, uh, there's been so much work done from RPC on white cataracts. And this was a uh, paper by Professor Tityal, which was published in 2016. And we, it's the Lens6 platform, which was used. I have experience with the same platform as well. And it was seen that uh, there was one to two clock hours of incomplete capsulotomy seen, but as we can make out, the incidence was much more in the cases with the fluid group, and this was zero in the cases with no fluid group. Adhesions, micro adhesions were seen in the no fluid group, but again, they were almost less than half as compared to the cases with the fluid group. A recent publication, again, the one I was referring to earlier by uh, Dr. Chi, where it's been shown that it was similar, almost similar rates, incomplete capsulotomies were seen in 17.2% eyes. In their paper, they also suggested that attempted lens fragmentation, which was affected in 38 eyes. And it was effective in nearly around 70% uh, of the eyes in some fully effective and in some partially effective, but it was completely ineffective in seven eyes. I personally have tried uh, lens fragmentation in a few cases, but uh, I really haven't been able to get a good fragmentation. So I generally keep it reserved for the capsulotomy. The authors, however, recommended avoiding lens fragmentation in Morganian cataracts due to the possible overlap of the lens fragment with the anterior capsule. I would, however, like to point out that despite having incomplete capsulotomies, peripheral extension as a direct consequence of firing of the laser pulses is not common. The laser cuts are delivered in an arc-shaped manner rather than a radial cut that occurs with the manual capsular excess. If any extension has left. to occur, uh, that occurs usually in the later steps. However, in some cases, an inherently weak case uh, capsule may predispose to peripheral extension in real cases right at the time of the capsulotomy. Okay. This is one okay. case where I noticed this. And in this case, I don't have the video, sorry, in the electric cataract in a young male, the iris moved out in a jerky pattern at one point. And it was noticed that the capsulotomy had extended uh, due to the equator during the femto procedure itself. And that's because electric cataracts has, have been shown to have changes in the collagen, and which is why the capsule becomes uh, fragile and less prone to expansile forces, uh, less susceptible, sorry. And this was, we labeled it as the iris ricochet sign, and that could be an indicator of peripheral extension of the anterior capsular excess. So just to sum up, what can be done to prevent incomplete capsulotomies? One could increase the, uh, to take care of the anterior posterior movement, one could increase the delta up and down of the anterior capsule as compared for the anterior capsule as compared to normal cataracts. 
to uh, prevent the physical blockage of the energy delivery one could increase the energy levels used for the capsulotomy uh, decreasing the amount of fluid is being recently suggested by giving preoperative vanitol uh, i really haven't gotten down to it but uh, now i think one should be starting and the last is the avoiding of the extension of the tags and bridges that is very important just to show in the video i'll just take 30 seconds more so in this video this was a case again i was showing of the fhq lady sorry so proper docking is important and if one gets the peripheral tags so this had multiple tags here these tags should be removed either by uh, if they are micro adhesions they can be used with this removed with a spatula and broad adhesions should be removed with the help of a capsular excess maneuver just the last thing this is a mistake which should not be done i pulled out the last fragment without taking the capsule to the center and there was a peripheral tag there which however was managed successfully using a rexus forceps at the end so uh, last but not the least a thorough review of previous history is important and in, in conclusion why femtosecond lasers for white cataracts you get a speedy sure creation of a well centered adequately sized anterior capsulotomy which sometimes may be incomplete but there's really a minimal risk of radial extension early anticipation and close observation are however important thank you so much thank you dr chintan very well presented and very well concluded thank you so much uh, our next speaker is dr purinder basin who will be talking about stepwise approach to foldable iol in the absence of adequate posterior uh, capsular support with modified yamanes technique dr purinder basin is the founder director of uh, ratan jyoti netralay uh, gwalior dr purinder can you share your screen please uh, yeah. just one second thank you at the outside and uh, i really uh, congratulate for the 51st 55th uh, foundation day celebration i really thank all of you especially dr titial sir for giving me this opportunity to share my experience of step wise approach to foldable iol in the absence of adequate posterior capsular support with modified imane technique i have no financial interest uh, there are basically three critical steps first is passing the needle second is engaging the haptics and third is iol centration various methods are available for secondary iol implantation i am focusing on this modified imanes technique which is quite popular these days the prerequisites are a 29 gauge or 30 gauge wide bore tsk needle from delasco uh, we are not able to find these needles of 30 gauge over here so i use 27 gauge needle i use sensar ar40 three piece iol from johnson and johnson or otherwise one can use ct lucia 602 iol from zeiss company as they have a pbdf haptics which can better withstand surgical manipulations a 23 gauge anterior chamber maintainer or 23 gauge parse planar infusion system and a 25 gauge forceps to perform intraocular haptic placement into the needle and uh, the important thing which we use is uh, battery operated heat cautery which is uh, very helpful in cauterizing the and making the flange of the haptic before we go further uh, i check the bore of the needle and the haptic which which should go inside the needle because in this particular case as you can say the haptic doesn't go inside the needle so now to be on a safer side i always check it in each and every case the second important thing is that instead of making the main incision which is 2.8 mm size uh, corneal incision at 0 degree we make it at 30 degree or 25 degree or so uh, for a right handed surgeon the this this kind of um, triangle uh, this uh, tri radiate thing should be made uh, through with the help of a uh, varion system and uh, it should pass through the center of the pupil and uh, it should traverse, uh, traverse at uh, 180 degree apart 
and instead of 180 degree it is 160 degree and and this is at 30 degree and 180 degree apart on this side so this will help us in manipulations of the trailing haptic otherwise it becomes very very difficult other important thing is that our needle direction should first be parallel to the sclera 1 to 1 and a half millimeter in the uh, substance of the sclera then it should pass down towards the center of the globe and then parallel to the iris so this should be the direction of the needle in this in the eye so this is a case wherein so we are marking pre operatively and ac maintainer is placed with the help of iris spatula we are supporting the lens which should not fall back and a needle is passed as you can see and with the help of a micro forceps i am pa passing the haptic into the needle and the direction in which the needle has been passed inside it should be brought in the same way and similar thing is done on the opposite side the haptic is placed on the surface of the iris and tucked into the bore of the needle and it is pulled out and this is a special heat cautery to make the flange and this over thickening of the bulge or the flange is not recommended and uh, and uh, hydro uh, uh, the uh, wounds are hydrated and this is the end of the surgery another case you can see it's a grossly subluxated lens in a young individual and with the help of uh, vitreous cutter we'll be doing lensectomy ac maintainer is placed a lensectomy is done and after marking at the specific places and uh, we use varion also in all these cases so this is in this clara horizontal part of the haptic and needle will pass through the substance of the sclera and then it goes towards the center of the globe and then parallel to the iris now we are not placing the iul on the surface of the iris i we engage the haptic directly into the needle and uh, believe me this is uh, very stable and it doesn't fall back and flange is created at the tip of the uh haptic this is done on the other side and a counter traction could be done with the help of uh, this forceps or with the help of a bud when the needle is passed inside so this is how and it is stuck subconjunctively and the wounds are hydrated this is another interesting case which was done two days back day before yesterday and it's a case of spherophakia as you can see the ubm picture of it and uh, the lens is uh, bulged and uh, the lady is of 41 years old with a great 2 uh, to 3 cataract and it's a 360 degree wobbling lens zonules are there but they are lax so we did a, with a posterior levitage we did a fake home emulsification and uh, without chop and fortunate enough that uh, because these zonules are intact in these cases so chances of the uh, the lens to fall back is very less but definitely the chances of uh, the the nucleus species go slide. behind this is how we are engaging the haptic in in the bore of the needle i am showing multiple cases to show and we have done more than 100 cases by now with this technique and uh, we feel that it is simpler easier and less time consuming and uh, th though some issues are there which i will be sharing uh, my experience the opposite uh, with the forceps the trailing haptic this is the uh, most uh, sensitive step 
which I feel, and uh, the haptic is passed two millimeter away from the limbus, and one point one to one point five millimeter into the substance of sclera. So this gives when it is one to one point five millimeter into this in the substance of sclera, it gives good stability to the lens. And this is the day one of this uh, last case wherein the flange is visible on the uh, superior and inferior haptic. So conjunctival marking aids visualization, use of fixation ring or cotton tip for counter traction, as I said. Note the needle is easily visible through the scleral tunnel tract. This is very important and smudging by excessive ink or subconjunctival fluid or blood, this limits the visibility. So uh, uh, any excessive manipulation should be stopped and the best attempt is the first attempt. So a multiple time entry into the sclera and subconjunctival, it will lead to bleeding and you will not be able to mark, uh, enter into uh, the sclera at the right place. Pearls are proper pre-operating marking that is 180 degree I'm apart. I'm extremely sorry to interrupt you, sir. Since we have overshot the time, we please request you yeah. to conclude. Yeah, this is the last slide. The take home message is that it is an effective technique for secondary oil fixation. Takes less surgical time. There is a le uh, learning curve is also less, but definitely it requires dexterity, dexterity to uh, mainly during the trailing haptic fixation. We should avoid in cases of conjunctival and or scleral scarring or when there is a thinning, like cases who have undergone multiple surgeries and do not make a large uh, or thick uh, flange in, uh, in a hurry. So that, that is the my take home message. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. And uh, I invite you to the trauma conference, which is going to be on 14th and 15th of May at Gwalior. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Haseen. That was a very elegant presentation with beautiful videos of a very complex surgical procedure. We now go to another very challenging scenario that is iris repair in cataract. And I invite Professor Tushar Agarwal, who is also an expert in handling these very complex uh, cataract cases. And uh, we look forward to this talk. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so the topic of my talk is iris repair in cataract surgery. Uh, I shall be covering uh, the various types of iris defects that you might encounter uh, along with cataract. Uh, when to consider uh, the iris repair and reconstruction uh, along with the cataract and uh, basically uh, what can be achieved with iris repair. So the iris defects can be either congenital or of the acquired variety, the congenital being a partial absence of the iris in a sectoral uh, area of just called iris coloboma or a total or a near total absence of the iris uh, 360 degrees, which is called aniridia. And the acquired defects are the disinsertion of the iris uh, from the root, which is called iridodialysis, a partial absence of the iris, mostly iatrogenic in nature, and uh, mitriasis, which can happen either due to trauma or sometimes due to some types of systemic medication. Uh, congenital aniridia usually requires uh, uh, management with aniridia IOLs. Uh, however, uh, availability and cost are an issue. And uh, similarly, colobomas also require some form of implants. Although I have stopped using these implants now because uh, the color matching available for the Indian eyes uh, is not very good. So in this talk, I'll be covering uh, the management of iris defects using uh, sutures. Uh, so coming to the first type of defect, so you can see there is a temporal iris defect, uh, most likely due to uh, a vitrectomy probe and the three piece IOL is prolapsing into the anterior chamber. Uh, this patient, uh, the indication for surgery was uh, monocular diplopia and uh, uh, halos caused by the uh, edge of the uh, optic. So uh, in all these cases, you have to learn how to make a sepsis knot, which is essentially a sliding knot uh, uh, using a proline suture uh, put on a straight needle. And uh, the, in the sliding knot, the, the suture ends are basically pulled out from both sides of the uh, cornea. And once uh, you pull and the knot is created outside the eye, and when you pull on the ends, the knot moves in the eye and uh, closes the gap wherever the iris has been uh, pinched. I also use a guide, 26 gauge guide needle uh, to guide the proline uh, needle, the, the needle on which the proline suture is uh, 
uh, there uh, to uh, pass it through the iris in this case the iol was repositioned and the uh, we could get a round pupil this is another case uh, of traumatic metriasis so in these cases uh, we are fortunate that uh, in indian eyes the the cosmetic defect is not that much as compared to people with the lighter irises uh, the the major indication for uh, intervening in these cases if you can identify a functional problem which is attributable to the iris defect so in this case the indication was severe uh, glare and halos caused by the exposed optic edge so we can use a, a, a single suture uh, and single pass technique in which the the primary aim is to pinch the iris together uh, in one of the axes uh, using again a sepsis knot and uh, in and these these um, black overlays just highlight the passage of the sutures and uh, again this is uh, taken out from the other end of the uh, limbus and again the sliding knot is created outside the eye uh, this just shows the position of the suture which is to be achieved and once you uh, uh, knot the, uh, the, the suture outside the eye, uh, you slide it and uh, it goes into the eye where the iris was pinched. So you do get a, a oval, ovalish pupil in such cases but the goal is to cover the optic with the uh, iris tissue. These are a few other examples of repair of traumatic uh, metriasis. So as you can see, mostly I, I stick to cases where the iris defect is in either inferior or temporal uh, in nature. Uh, lastly, this is a case of uh, post angle closure glaucoma in which the lens was removed because of uh, the high IOP and uh, the, the pupil size was reduced because the patient's primary complaint was intense glare. Coming to the last type of iris defects, which I would be covering is the iridodialysis. Uh, these are a little more uh, trickier than the previous two types of defects uh, to, to manage. The, uh, the surgery begins with creation of a conjunctival flap and a scleral pocket around 2.5 millimeters from the limbus where the sutures would be passed to impinge the iris onto the sclera. Uh, the surgery itself uh, is as any other case of traumatic attracts. Uh, quite a lot of times you will need additional uh, implants like a CTR or a Sioni ring. Uh, having done the cataract surgery, the helon stays in the eye and then uh, you can use a guide needle from outside uh, to in the eye rather than the previous technique which used to use uh, uh, the straight needle from inside the eye and coming out from the sclera. Uh, in, in, in that case, you never knew from which point you would exit the eye. And uh, following this, the sclera is closed uh, with the help of uh, fibrin glue and uh, the case is done. So this is the post-operative, I think the uh, first day appearance of the patient's eye. Uh, again, uh, depending on the size of the uh, iridodialysis, you might need to uh, make uh, two of such passages. And again, I like to point out the, the location of these defects which I have uh, repaired. Uh, these are mostly temporal or inferior in nature because these are the ones which are most likely to cause uh, problems to the patient. Uh, this is one example where I did repair a superior iris defect along with the large subluxation. This was managed with the Sioni ring as well uh, because simply because it was too large to ignore. Uh, in conclusion, um, iris defects uh, to be uh, the repair is to be considered uh, in cases with two clock hours or more of uh, defects. The inferior in the temporal locations are more likely to need repair. Uh, they can be combined with cataract surgery if the defect is too large and uh, you do anticipate a, a, a definite functional problem with the iris defect. However, in most cases, especially in uh, traumatic metriasis, I uh, uh, do it as a secondary procedure after establishing a functional need for the iris repair. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sushar. That was a wonderful illustration of a judicious repair in uh, appropriate cases, and the videos mm -hmm. were marvelous. Uh, I would like to now invite uh, Dr. Rohit Om Prakash, who is the director of the uh, Om Prakash Center in Amsterdam, and he's a surgeon par excellence. Um, and this is going to be uh, handling a very difficult situation of the enigma of intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. Over to you, sir. So we have your slides, but we can't hear you yet, Dr. Om Prakash. Dr. Rohit, could you please unmute your line? 
Is it visible now? Yes, visible and audible now. Yes. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Dr. Tetyal for the opportunity to speak in uh, at the annual day of uh, RP Center, which is the prestigious center uh, as far as India and across the world is concerned. I would be taking up conquering the enigma of intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. So floppy iris, so this uh, concept of mine won the a video competition in the educational category in 2020 ESCRS. So alpha-1 antagonist drugs have an action on, uh, they have they block the alpha and uh, alpha iris dilator muscle receptors. Subsequent to which what happens is we find that these patients have a reduced maximum pupillary size. That is the first thing which we come across the second thing is because of these alpha antagonist drugs, primarily tamsulosine, what we find is that the dilator, there's a change in iris architecture. The dilator muscle is thinned out and atrophic. Subsequent to which what happens is there is whenever there's an excess to posterior aspect of iris, there is a billowing of the iris. Now, what does this billowing of the iris do? This sets in, uh, you know, before going into the, that, let's understand the dynamics to iris trauma. This is a patient who does not have any effect of tamsulosin, is a, is a routine patient. He has a strong dilator muscle tone. So now what happens is with a small iris touch, there is no effect on the dilatation of the muscle. It is only with the repeated touches because the dilated tone muscle is strong that the, with, the, with the repeated touch that the iris constricts. So this is quite contrary to the patients who are on tamsulosin because there is an exaggerated response to iris touch. What happens is that the dilator muscle tone is less, a small touch causes pupillary constriction in these patients. So this is what we have to realize. And what happens is that we have the iris billowing and fluttering of the iris. There's a tendency to iris prolapse and there's a progressive constriction of pupil. So this is what makes up makes the IFIS. So let's see in the animation, the billowing causes touch and a small touch uh, sets in progressive constriction and prolapsing of iris through the incisions. So uh, in a, there's a, when we see papers across the world, the incidence of intraoperative floppy iris syndrome in, on when patients who are using tamsulosin, it was found that the floppy iris or the iris prolapse was there in as high as 57% of cases. So preoperatively, how do we plan out? We should realize that we have to give a longer dilatation time for in these patients. And you have to uh, dilate these patients in the preoperative days also to know how much does the pupil is going to dilate. We have to understand the preoperative pharmacomediasis. The parasympatholytic drugs have an indirect action by inhibiting iris constrictor muscle in the form of atropine, cyclopantolate, or tropicamide. And the sympathomimetics have a direct action because they displace tamsulosin and increase iris tone. But mark my words, when a, there's, a, there's a prolonged usage of tamsulosin, it becomes inefficient because in the advanced stage, there's muscle atrophy. We can use epinephrine and phenylephrine for that matter. The NSAIDs have their action because they help in preventing constricting of, of, the, of the iris, of the pupil. Let's see the different papers which are there across. Pharmacological pupil dilation as a predictive test for the risk of intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. For a pupil as large as seven millimeter, the risk of IFIS exists. That is the first thing. The second thing which we have to realize is that the use of malignant pupil expansion device for intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. No doubt the pupil remains at a constant six millimeter throughout the surgery, but, and there is no significant intraoperative or postoperative complications were noted, but 93% of the patients did have moderate to severe IFIS. Here brings us the, you know, the question, the answer, the how, what is the technique which has to be followed? The first and foremost is that you have to give a primary incision with a long tunnel. That is the first thing which has to be done. Calibrated side port incision, because that is at times the cause which sets in IFIS. Viscomedriasis, the usual uh, the viscodispersive, or the Arshinov 
tri-soft shell technique can be used. Capsule X's sizing has to be smaller than the usual because we do not want any excess of fluid to the posterior aspect of iris and the smaller uh, you know, capsular excess creates a situation where there is a less excess. Hydrodissection has to be minimal. Fluidics have to be, you know, the IOP has to be on the lower side. And that is the most important thing which you have, because that creates a, a good environment for, and a continuous irrigation has to be off. Off technique, when you bring in the FICO tip and when you take it out and, and it holds good for the IA tip. One minute left. Yeah, and this is the nuclear emulsification, which has to be done in a very guided way. And you have to leave the fake, the chopped nuclear pieces in situ so that the chamber, the, the bag doesn't become empty and there's a space and there is less uh, fluid access to the posterior aspect of the iris. Next is, next comes, you know, the irrigation and aspiration. Use a bimanual one. If, you, if you're not for bimanual, you can retract the sleeve so that you create two planes. And once you create two planes, then you have to do it in a very guided way. You go below, increase the vacuum only when you have held it, and then you take it out. So decoding, what is important is you should know the technique, make the surgery atraumatic to the iris, use sympathomimetics to your advantage. Visco madrasis hold a very important role decrease excess of fluid to posterior iris aspect. Calibrated side port incision is one very important factor. Low IOP FACO. So concluding, no, pre, no summarizing, no pre, predisposition in patients using alpha antagonist drugs. You should take history of, make it a point to have a history of such things. Use pupillary dilating aids. You can use it with, to as low as five, or maybe you can use it more if your technique is not quite apt for it. Most importantly, know the technique, calibrated side potency and use sympathomimetic OVDs. Trifles make perfection and perfection is no trifle. Thank you again for, the, for giving me the opportunity to speak in a prestigious annual day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Om Prakash, for decoding this enigma and also very nicely illustrating the very basic uh, physiology involved so that one can be systematic in one's approach. Uh, we now uh, have our next speaker who's chief of RP Center, Professor Vivan Pial, an excellent surgeon. And sir is going to talk about pair on autonomy, my clinical experience. Thank you, doctor. Um, there's an announcement to be made for the next session, which is scheduled at 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Subjected on experts perspective in retina. This session is, will be 10, 12 minutes delayed. So we'll be starting off with the session at 6.15 sharp. Back to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, the whole day has been a great academic exercise. And uh, this particular session, uh, the, whatever talks we had have been a wonderful. Let me talk something on the new intraocular lens, which has come up in uh, clinical practice for last uh, almost two years now, and share our experience from Indian uh, point of view. No financial disclosure from my side. As the uh, title talks about Clairon autonomy, it has two parts. The first is a, a lens itself, which is Clairon. As the name uh, speaks, it has to be a clear lens and advanced foldable, uh, single piece uh, foldable lens uh, a monofocal lens, which has a, a design which should give us the advantage of uh, clarity of posterior capsule as well as the lens itself. And second important part of this particular device is to have a injector system, which is automated. Apart from, uh, we have been used AutoCert, which is a foot switch driven. This is directly driven by a CO2 gas driven mechanism in, as such. Material-wise, it is a hydrophobic acrylic lens with has a water content of around 1.5 plus minus 0.1 uh, hydrophobic material. It is slightly more than uh, the initial design of IQ, which was around 0.38, 1.38. Refractive index is almost similar, 1.55 UV absorbing and a blue light filtering lens. Most importantly, uh, this lens would be transparent in all conditions. 
As I talked about the edge design, which is supposed to be a precision edge design, you can see in this particular diagram, very sharp posterior edge design, which is supposed to uh, minimize the posterior capsule opacification. We all know soft edge design, which came with a technic lens, has modified the concept of a in, in the bag implantation to decrease the requirement of YAR capsulotomy in these cases in the first uh, few years of implantation. This design should also minimize the basic uh, problem associated with edge designs, that is, uh, dysprotective symptoms. As far as uh, stability of these lenses are concerned, the design is almost similar like IQ design, and it is going to be stable in a large uh, range of uh, capsular bag diameters, right from the 9 millimeter to 11 millimeter. That is, uh, I think, basic advantage of this particular design of open uh, loop haptic designs. We had a multi-centric study uh, last year in which uh, we had seven different sites of India with total number of uh, 150 patients and one pitone eyes and had a one year uh, post uh, implantation follow up for these patients. And the inclusion and exclusion criteria was as standard as for any IOL study in these cases. We looked into primary effective endpoint was to see for a best corrected visual acuity, monocular and binocular and look for a surgeon preference and comfort with this uh, device of lens insertion. Uh, other way around, we look for a monocular uh, best corrected visual acuity at one month and uncorrected distance visual acuity also, and look for any adverse events, which is basically looking for a posterior capsular opacification, uh, requirement of yak capsular in these cases, anything to do with the device in terms of deficiency, difficulties, and the surgeon's problem associated with these cases. We had 150 subjects in these cases, and all cases could complete except for a nine patient who lost in a follow up for last within a one year of uh, follow up for these cases. And uh, average age was similar to any standard age related cataract patient in these cases. This is a standard uh, biometric uh, parameters for these patients. Look into the primary outcome measure, which uh, we look into the corrected uh, distance visual equity at the end of one year. Almost 100% of patients had 0.2 log bar uh, visual acuity in these cases. The first eye which was operated was 100%, that is uh, 102 out of 102 had 0.2 log bar vision. The second eye of our patient had uh, out of 35, we had 34 patients acquiring 0.2 log bar vision in these cases. If you look into a uh, uncorrected uh, visual acuity wise, we had almost 63% of cases achieving 0.1 log mark and 0.2 log mark was in a more than 82% of cases. But if you look at distant corrected visual equity, more than 97% cases in the second eye and more than 100 patient cases in the first eye had a corrected visual equity of 0.2 or better. 100% of eyes were within one diopter of a refractive target. The basic aspect, uh, if you look into uncorrected visual equity, getting slightly lower than 70% in these cases were or initial cutoff for a astigmatism, coronal astigmatism of one diopter. They would have some patient with a range of uh, minus 0 0.37 to 0.9 diopter cylinder, which could not be corrected because this was a monofocal non-toric implantation. Safety-wise, there was a complete safety in terms of device, in terms of eye in these cases. We looked for uh, two important areas of these cases of a smooth delivery of lens through this autonomy device any other problem associated. There are very few reports of uh, lens getting stuck during the implantation. And uh, subsequently, many surgeons had a good experience of these lenses. Haze was major concern for previous uh, material with uh, IQ design. And uh, in this particular design, within a one year, we didn't see any haze. Because the surface clarity was absolutely fantastic up to one year in these cases. IOL glistening is another second problem associated with the previous generation hydrophobic lenses in the Alcon series. How, this is how we grade these uh, glistening in these cases. In our series, we didn't find any patient having a significant uh, lens glistening in one year of follow-up in these cases. As well as posterior capsular opacification requiring YAC laser capsular team was nil uh, at one year. And these cases, I know that it has to be seen for at least more than uh, two or three years. These are our results for last one year. And visual acuity uh, quality wise also was significantly better. To conclude uh, this new uh, clearance autonomy uh, lens device, it was simple to insert through the 
incision of 0.2, 2.2 without uh, disrupting the incision and implanted very well in the cancellar bag. More, almost 100% of eyes achieved the required 0.2 log mark values as far as corrected distance visual acuity at the one year. No cases had a uh, glistening and surface haze. The visually uh, significant PCO was nil in all these cases. <laughs> Look into this, this is the future, uh, you can say material for these lenses. And I hope that Alcon will come out with all their lenses in this particular platform. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, sir. That was very illuminating and a very new technology. We look forward to it being available. And uh, we um, now go ahead with the next uh, speaker, none less than Dr. Harban Stahl who has had many accolades and achievements to his credit and is a wonderful surgeon as well. The topic is Toric IOL surprise, what next? I thank uh, Professor Titial. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes, sir, we can hear you. For giving me this opportunity. So Toric I will surprise, what next? So what is a toric? I will surprise. I'll consider if the toricity. Can you hear me? No. We can hear. We can't you. see your slides. Sir. We can't see the slides. Can you hear your slides, please? But I just. Could you please share your screen, sir? Yeah, I shared it. I don't know. I'm seeing. Okay. Uh, if you could stop sharing and uh, share. No, no. Again. I think it will come this time. So we can see the Zoom page. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it has stopped sharing again. Could you please open the presentation first and then start sharing, sir? Dr. Lal, can you hear us? It's going offline. He might be joining in. Audience, please bear with us. I think there's some technical glitch. Dr. Lal will be joining us back soon. They're going to call me. Dr. Lal, can you hear us? AV team, can we please have the Zoom gallery view? No. Thank you. Um, yes, Dr. Lal, we can hear you, sir. Could you please start sharing your screen? Can I press? There's a green screen on your uh, bottom of your screen called share screen. You yeah, have that to press I that. Press, and then I'm getting this, where it is a screen launch meeting inbox, Gmail and share. When I press share. Yes. So, sir, you'll have to uh, click on alt tab so that we can see the presentation. We are on the Zoom page. The site is open to Zoom meeting. Uh, don't cancel, sir, please. Uh, okay. Could you please minimize the screen, sir? Absolutely, uh, half. Sir, you will have to open the presentation, sir. I don't see the presentation icon open in your uh, laptop, sir. No, it is already. I kept it in the bottom. I'll open again once. Sir, you close other windows and just keep that open yeah it's there yes now we can see your screen yeah. sir okay that's okay perfect yeah perfect sir over to you so the uh, i got some simple logic of correcting this refractive uh, toric surprises does preoperative operative power and access matters no 
you don't have to worry about them. Do we need any app like estimatesfix.com? You don't need them. Do we need to take any photograph on a set lamp with any of your apps uh, with the mobile? No. So what we need is that we need to find out whether rotating or realigning the IUL is going to solve the problem or not, or how much problem it is going to solve, and whether it is advisable and possible to rotate. So whenever there's a toric I will surprise, there are two components. One is the non-correctable, which cannot be corrected by the toric I will realignment. Another is the correctable by the toric I will realignment. Once we define that, what can be corrected, then we need to calculate how much is the misalignment and calculate that misalignment, then try to correct it. So suppose, forget about the pre-operative values. Post-operatively, if the cratometric asymptotes may say three adapter and the IOL can correct 1.5. So that means 1.5 cannot be corrected by any means by realigning. Suppose if the cratometric asymptotes is two adapter and the IOL can correct 1.5, that means 0.5 cannot be corrected. If the cratometric asymptotes is 1.5, the IOL can correct 1.5, that means there should have been 100% correction. And if the cratomatic asymptotes is 0.75, 1.5 is the IOL should have been correcting, then 0.75 cannot be corrected. So we need to find out the non-correctable asymptotes, which is the difference between the cratometric value and the IOL can correct. And then find out what the patient is having the refractive cylindrical and reduce this non-correctable. And then you will find what the IOL can correct if you realign it. Like in this example, if the post-operative refractive error was 1.5, then in the first place, the difference is 1.5. That means the IOL cannot correct because that was the non-correctable 1.5. You got 1.5. But if the refractive error is 1.5 and non-correctable 0.5, that means one can be corrected by realignment. So you have to find out how much IOL can correct. And another important point is we do not correct the refractive error. We correct the misalignment. So what does that mean? That means if the IOL was supposed to correct one diopter and it could not correct one diopter, that means misalignment is 30 degree. But if IOL was supposed to correct six diopter, but one diopter is not corrected, that means one by six divided, multiplied by 30, the misalignment is only five degree. So one diopter of error, while in the first case, is easily correctable because you need to align 30 degree. But five degree of misalignment correction may be very, very difficult. So the how much is the misalignment you can correct? Find out with the what IUL can correct and what is the correctable asymptotism. So this way you can find out, like in this chart I have shown, if one diopter is correctable asymptotism, if the IUL was supposed to correct one, there is a 30 degree of misalignment. But if the IOL was supposed to correct two, there is only 15 degree of misalignment. But if the IOL was supposed to correct three, there is only 10 degree of misalignment. And if the IOL was supposed to correct four, then 7.5 degree. And if IOL was such a high power, it was supposed to correct six, then misalignment is only five degree, which may be very, very difficult to readjust five degree of misalignment. So you need to find out how much is the misalignment. So this, I'll just show you one of the example of my patient. This is the patient, which after putting the IUL, the best corrected, uncorrected visual equity was 618. Best corrected was six by six with one spherical and 1.5 diopter cylinder at 30 degree. Now we took the keratometric value on the lens star pass 1.56 at 94. Pentacam, three millimeter, 1.6, four millimeter, 1.5, degree 95 and 81.5. And we thought the lens should be at 90 degree. So we went in and this is the multifocal toric. You just have to make, you don't have to open the main incision. Just open the side port incision, mark the axis where you want to place the lens, put on the sodium halide inside the eye, lift the lens, position it and leave it over there. And before you come out, inject the air to compress the lens back. So the post realignment residual refractive error was only 0.25 and patient had 6.6. 6. 
pre alignment was 1 and 1.5 cylinder a uh, spherical equivalent is of course plus 0.25 which will not change so non correctable if there is any asymmetry which cannot be corrected by the toric iul like this is the wrong iul high spherical equivalent error is regular asymmetry or any general weakness pc or anything others then you need to adopt the other options like laser correction pk back iul and iul actions particularly in uh, high probes thank you very much for giving me this opportunity thank you dr harbans lal for a very nice and pre nice presentation and showing how to approach such patients which is always very sort of you know uh, difficult to handle for the surgeon and the patient as well thank you so much with that we'd like to thank all the speakers of this session for excellent talks wonderful teaching videos all the chairpersons and panelists for their participation and all the people off stage uh, who have helped everybody Uh, uh you know joined in from all parts of the world and india thank you so much and we apologize to the retina team for overstepping our time limit sorry so sorry for that we are very great but but i finished before time yes sir thank you <laughs> thank you absolutely excellent and insightful presentations by all our speakers and fantastically moderated by dr rajesh and and dr radhika thank you madam moving on to the next session which is subjected on experts perspective in retina i would take the honor to invite our chairpersons dr rajwardhan azad dr rajpal vohra dr pradeep venkatesh and dr lalit verma and as the moderator for this session i would take the honor to invite dr parijat chandra welcome sir lalit lalit sala एक मिनट मेरे पर प्रोग्राम देना मुझे आई वुड नाउ हैंड ओवर टू डॉक्टर परिजात चंद्रा टू प्लीज टेक इट फर्दर प्रोग्राम की कॉपी देना मुझे अगर है तो सबको एक एक कॉपी दे दो इनको कोई इंट्रोड्यूस करेगा ना बस तिवारी को कौन करेगा लगाओ लगा दो so very good evening and we are going to start this session on retina and uh, we have all a uh, uh, very illustrious speaker very prolific surgeons and top clinicians we have in this session uh, we have a lecture named lecture professor m m kumar tiwari who was my teacher and my friend and philosopher and guide Uh, this will be little later we will start with the first lecture by dr lalit none other than dr lalit verma and i don't think he needs any introduction but i will say a few words for him he he is an excellent surgeon excellent human being and uh, on the top of uh, he he is one of the best person to organize any scientific program i have ever seen he he is most of that you know time i have seen him he he is a very innovator he he, he innovates uh, you know uh, whether it is a surgery or whether it is a uh, you know scientific program or anything for that matter and very you know hard working very enthusiastic 
And uh, I'm saying all this because he worked with me for a very long time. We are still, we are working together. So I present to you, Dr. Lalit Verma. Thank you, sir, for these kind words. Most of the things, uh, whatever I've learned in uh, AIUS is courtesy Professor Azad. So I owe a lot because I was, uh, my longest association in AIUS has been with him only. So whatever we do in AIUS, uh, I think it is his giving. And even in SARC, uh, we are being groomed like this. So let's come to this uh, retina session talk. And at the outset, let me congratulate RPC, our own alma mater for uh, their birthday in fact. And uh, all of us are privileged to have been part of this great institution. And whatever retina we have, I think foundation was laid at RPC only. So I thank uh, Dr. Tyal, Dr. Namrata and uh, Rajesh and all these people who have been involved and Shaurya who just helped me out with my presentation here. Thanks Shaurya for all this. So it's a brief talk about uh, subretinal hemorrhage. In contrast to uh, Preatal hemorrhage, this is an emergency. Subhyaloid hemorrhage can wait, preatal hemorrhage can wait, but subretinal hemorrhage is one thing which is one of the eye emergencies, I should say, because it has a devastating effect on vision because of the uh, uh, reasons all of you know. Commonest cause of cerebral hemorrhage is AMD, IPCV. IPCV is variant of AMD, more common in uh, this part of the world. But from management point of view, we all have to see whether it's subphobial or extra. Extra, we uh, are not much concerned, but if it is subphobial, we try to do a pneumodisplacement with or without uh, PPA. And if the media is hazy, we do a vitrectomy and sub inject sometimes subretinal PPA also. And some people also inject air to displace the hemorrhage. But this is only a mechanical job, but the treatment lies either with anti vegf or laser if it is uh, laserable in not in a sensitive area or PDT, PDT nowadays, what he bought is not available, but this is the general management of subretinal hemorrhage. Sometimes what happens is subretinal hemorrhage can occur during surgery. So I'm going to describe one case which uh, had uh, the cause of subretinal hemorrhage as a block, as a peribulbar block. Uh, but this is more common in patients who have coronal sclerosis high myopic eyes, background setting of hypertension and diabetes where, where vessels are more likely to give way. So this is a story of a 65 year old man, non-diabetic, non-hypertensive. He had a reg RD with PVR and uh, multiple breaks. BCVA at presentation was finger counting, IOP was within normal limits. This was the picture, the posterior pole picture and a small localized PVR you can see here. So I'll just go on to the video, if hopefully it should play. So this is the peritomy being done. And then I place this uh, 240 band. You can see there is some scleral thinning here. You can see the sclera shining from here, meaning thereby that uh, slightly predisposed. And after we had put in the 240 band and tie, we make this uh, MIVS incisions and start doing core vitrectomy. And uh, once this core vitrectomy was done, I noticed a hemorrhage in the temporal part, infrotemporal part, which will just be here. So that is the reason I injected immediately PFCL. <coughs> then because of this third hand, this is the horseshoe tear, which was there did uh, the base dissection. You will just see that the cerebral hemorrhage had a communication with the infrotemporal. There is, a, there is a line which was connecting, which raised my bar that it could be a, because of block. And this was the PVR. We had this uh, membrane dissection, which we, this was a small flimsy membrane, nothing much. Then I went on to do a retinotomy here. So I was confused whether I should take out this hemorrhage or not. But uh, we drained this in air fluid exchange after the PVR component was taken out and the, the uh, vitrectomy was done. So retina went back easily because it was not a uh, difficult surgery. So some part of this blood came out here. So I was wanting that this blood should come out because I was afraid that in the post-op period, it may 
percolate under the fovea and spoil the entire uh, visual result in this patient. Although anatomically retina is flat here, but this, this blood could come out with active suction. So because some part had come out from the, from the uh, inferior part, so then I made another retinotomy over the hemorrhage. Aim was to engage this uh, clot and keep it engaged. And then gradually with the suction component, so this is being held by the green tip uh, backflash needle. Slowly the right left jerky Case in front of you was that operatively sometimes you see this track coming here. This was this raised the suspicion that it was a related to this block which was given. So, any patient who during VR surgery has uh, this catastrophe of cerebral hemorrhage, you do try to take it out. Sometimes I've seen people making uh, you know GRTs also to take it out if it is uh, required. But in this patient, what was required was two small retinotomies because the fear was that if it trickles down and involves the center in the post-op period, it may jeopardize the visual result. So this is what I wanted to share in this short presentation. And uh, I would invite comments from people who would have managed it differently, if at all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lalit. We'll have that discussion in the end. <clears throat> so, may I have the next speaker is uh, Dr. Dinesh Talwar, and uh, Dinesh Talwar is another stalwart, and uh, he he is one of my favorites. Favorite in the sense that he is a, a very you know argumentative, argumentative on the right side, not on the wrong, the wrong side, and uh, he he is a very methodical person. If he does surgery, he will do everything from uh, beginning to the end uh, in a very book style. So that is his beauty. And I will not uh, talk further about him. He will present himself. And his uh, uh, you know, topic is uh, AMD, real world lost effective management. Yeah, no, it's okay. Let's do it. 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 Okay. Okay. Can you make it a full screen? Already, oh, I don't want this. Yeah. I think so, in in the meantime. If uh, anybody has any any comment or anything on the subretinal hemorrhage, uh, you just heard from Dr. Lalit Verma. Thank you. Are you ready, Lalit? Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Right. Please go on. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, I must thank the RP Center for inviting me for uh, being part of these celebrations. 
uh, the Foundation Day celebrations. Management of neovascular age-related macular degeneration is something which is important for all of us because over time, the frequency of this disease is uh, increasing. This is my disclaimer and the financial disclosure. Now, we all know from the Marina, Anchor, and many such studies that monthly ranibizumab is probably has been the gold standard for treatment of subfoveal exudative ARMD till recently. The problem is this is an extremely intensive regime and is exhausting for both the patient and the doctor. Fortunately for us, the sustained study showed us that 20% of patients actually need no injections after the first three injections. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have patients who require injections month after month. So there is a need to individualize treatment for patients uh, with this disease. And we have not only uh, ranibizumab, but we also have bevacizumab, aflibercept, and rolicizumab now for management of this disease process. And in these uh, many years, we have developed both monthly regimes, PRN regimes, quarterly regimes, and treat and extend regimes. All sorts of regimes have been tried. And the common regimes now, which are being practiced, include the PRN, treat and extend, and the monitor and extend regimes. The important thing we learned from the, um, from the, uh, regarding the PRN regimes is from the Pronta, the, the uh, Sailor, and the Sustain trials, that monthly follow-ups are imperative. This is one of the most important facts to remember. And the guidelines for retreatment are stringent, including even a little bit of new macular hemorrhage or any subjective evidence of macular fluid. As regards the treat and extend regimes, the importance is that these are very proactive. They need much more number of injections, so much more expensive. But these are a good option for patients who are stable but not dry and in patients who are one-eyed and have now healed. It does reduce the number of clinic visits. On the other hand, with a weight and extend or a monitor and extend regime, you, the, the number of injections goes down, though it's a reactive treatment, and it's possibly the best treatment for two-eyed patients in whom the lesion becomes dry. As far as the uh, efficacy of the drug is concerned, we know that for type 2 CNV, uh, Ranibizumab is extremely effective for type C and VMs. Probably aflibercept is better than ranibizumab. Overall, both ranibizumab and bevacizumab, when given intensively, are good, though the macula dries less frequently and less often with bevacizumab. And of course, you have brolicizumab, which is more effective in drying all sorts of fluid, as you can see, whether it's the intraretinal fluid or the subretinal fluid, or it's the sub RP fluid, they dry much more faster and for a longer time with brolicizumab as compared to even aflibercept. What about the safety of the drugs? Both aflibercept and ranibizumab are safe. With bevacizumab, the only problem we faced is cluster end-offs. And with brolicizumab, we do have a 1 in 200 risk of intraocular inflammation and a 1 in 400 risk of inflammatory vascular occlusions. So what regime? The regime, depending on um, the drug, the, the frequency of uh, injections changes. With uh, ranibizumab, the fluid study showed seven weeks extension was possible. Altair study showed that with aflibercept, 60% of the patients could go into a treat and extend regime of 12 weeks and 40% for up to 16 weeks. And the Hawk and Harrier showed that brolicizumab achieves 12 weekly injections for a majority. So how should we individualize this treatment? After you've given the first three injections of whichever anti vegf you're giving, if your lesion is dry, you have two, of, two forms of treatment available, the treat and extend, or what I call the monitor and extend. The treat and extend is an acceptable alternative for one-eyed patients who have a dry lesion, but for patients who have both eyes uh, functional, if they once they become dry, Follow them up for the next three months. If they remain dry, you can actually put them on a monitor and extend regime, whereby you increase the duration between the monitoring. That means from six to eight to 12 weeks or progressively, but 12 weekly follow-ups would continue it. If a recurrence occurs during this period, the patient gets a PRN treatment and come, continues his monitoring. If a patient needs PRN treatment more than six Eight to eight weekly, it's best to consider aflibercept 
in this patient. But the more important group of patients are those who are not dry. They are stable. They have some fluid. They are not decreasing, not increasing. If, if this happens, this patient, you should consider now a treat and extend regime. And you can also consider a change to aflibercept if you had started with ranibizumab initially. Nowadays, we give very often aflibercept three loading doses. And if the patient is not dry after that, the patient should be put onto a treat and extend regime. And you see the possibility of maintaining on greater than eight weekly intervals. If that is not reached, then it may be worth going back to ranibizumab. Now, this is to show you what happens when you start with aflibercept. The patient is now stable, not dry, or he's dry but one-eyed. You can shift him to treat and extend aflibercept. If you are not able to achieve more than eight weekly intervals, it's worth trying ranibizumab in this patient and seeing that what is the maximum interval. If you can reach six to eight weeks with ranibizumab, you may be safer with this. On the other hand, if you find neither ranibizumab nor aflibercept seems to do the work for you, a trial of brolicizumab is probably the way to go. The important thing is that if with both aflibercept and with ranibizumab, you need to give the injections four to six weekly, then I would prefer to use ranibizumab, which is safer as compared to aflibercept. The other group of patients are those whom you've been putting ranibizumab and now you're reading, needing the injection every six weeks. In these patients, it's worth trying and treat and extend with aflibercept. When should you switch your patients? If you have an injection frequency with ranibizumab, which is less than or equal to seven weeks for a recurrence, switch to aflibercept. If the frequency is less than seven weeks with aflibercept, and you get a recurrence, you can consider brolicizumab in these patients. In patients who are stable but not dry with monthly ranibizumab, again consider a switch to aflibercept. And patients who are stable and not dry with four to six weekly aflibercept, consider a switch to brolicizumab. And finally, if a patient does not become dry with one injection of brolicizumab, consider using aflibercept in, in the interim period. The important thing is this particular study which showed there was no difference in visual outcomes or number of injections, regardless of whether you used aflibercept, ranibizumab, or bevacizumab in the long term. And the decrease in fluid was also more or less the same in each of the groups. The other important thing that came was <clears throat> ultimately more the number of injections and the more the time the injections were, were continued, the better the visual outcome. So it's not the drug, it's the frequency, it's the need for giving the injections regularly. And the FIDO study con confirmed this. People, they gave more than 10 injections per year, and they get, got results with, which were substantially better than every other study which we have. And this is only with ranibizumab. Ladies and gentlemen, can we provide cost-effective treatment for our population? We have a population of risk of 188 million, which translates into neovascular AMD of 1 million patients. I calculated that with bevacizumab alone, the cost of coverage for the entire population is 4,000 crores per year. That translates into 3 rupees per person per month, or less than 20 rupees per person at risk per month a very, very affordable figure if we, can, if we can get people to get together. Even more important, let's assume for a moment, we don't want to stick only to bevacizumab. We want to combine it with aflibercept in those patients who are not responding well to, uh, to bevacizumab and even to brolicizumab in patients who are not responding well to, uh, to aflibercept. In this, in this scenario, the total cost of the treatment with bevacizumab as your base treatment comes to something like 10,000 crores over the year or six rupees per person per month for the whole population or 40 rupees per person at risk. That means the 188 million people at risk per month. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very affordable cost. And remember, preservation of sight has a cost. I'm sure as a country, if we want to keep our aged population seen and well and their well-being intact, we would be willing to accept this price. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Dinesh, for your wonderful presentation and
the various uh, commutations you have meet, made for uh, different kind of agents which are used in uh, uh, you know our retinal diseases. We'll be having questions in the end, uh, Dinesh. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Ajit Babu. And uh, Dr. Ajit Babu was president of Vetrotal Society of India. And uh, you know, a wonderful surgeon, a wonderful human being. And he is now uh, presently in Bad. Earlier he was with us, but he left us. Anyway, he is now with us. So here is Dr. Ajit Babu. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Ajad, he is my teacher at RP Center, and I would like to thank uh, RP mm -hmm. Center uh, because I am the alumni of RP Center and very on very this podium. I received my degree certificate from the Prime Minister, where the President of India is also there. Both are there in a single ceremony. is very very rare rare to happen. And uh, then uh, Pradeep is my dear friend. Um, he is just junior to me, and uh, Rajpal is just senior to me. And a lot of uh, friends from RP Center I met today. That's why I prefer to come physically here and enjoy the hospitality. And I would like to thank my dear friend, uh, Professor Titial, who is a great surgeon and a great human being at the outset. Today, I would like to share certain developments that has happened in diabetic retinopathy, which is very, very important disease, not only for the retinologist, yeah, but yeah, yeah. for the yeah, general yeah. ophthalmologist yeah. as well. Yeah. I have no financial interest in putting this uh, thought process. If you see the world scenario, uh, the number of uh, population affected by diabetes is increasing day by day. And if you see in India, it is almost 84% of the people are likely to increase from 2017 to 2045. And Africa is at, uh, on the verge of explosion of diabetic population. Another concept of diabetic retinopathy is pre-diabetics. If you see one diabetic in a uh, population, there are two to three people who are pre-diabetics, which we are missing. Uh, this need to be identified and we need to increase the awareness at the level of pre-diabetes rather than after identifying diabetes. So the counseling should start from pre-diabetes rather than diabetic mellitus. In India, again, uh, it's uh, increasing like anything uh, uh, currently, 2019 figure show 77 million and 2030 it is projected to be 100 million and uh, 2045 it is 134 means our clinics will be full of um, the diabetic population not only that in the audience there will be a lot of people who are diabetics which will not surprise me in near future if you uh, read all the studies which were done in epidemiology, certain things we need to understand about diabetes and diabetic retinopathy is one very good control of HbA1c levels, which has shown that very effective in reducing both the progression of diabetic retinopathy and severity of diabetic retinopathy. Mm -hmm. If you see the collateral diseases, hypertension, again, a good control almost controls like 30% of uh, the progression of diabetic retinopathy. Hyperlipidemia is another uh, uh, parameter that need to be controlled, which I would uh, like to show you certain figures, like in disease and EDIC study. They have very clearly shown that every 1% of HbA1c level, there is a 10% decrease in progression of diabetic retinopathy. And the molecular memory is very, very good. So first 10 to 15 years of good control of diabetic, diabetes has helped in almost 50% reduction of diabetic retinopathy. This is very, very important finding. And uh, the oral therapy which is coming in diabetic retinopathy is phenofibrate, which again works both on lipid profile as well as blood sugar levels, which can be very helpful. If you see the international diabetic retinopathy classification, everyone knows this classification. I will not go into great detail, but while managing, you should have which stage are you dealing in the patient, given patient is, uh, you need to have a clear idea. And 
Let us start with mild to moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Everyone knows these signs, clinical signs. Once you diagnose, main treatment is counseling here. He, you need to counsel the pa patient how to deal with diabetes and their lifestyle changing and how good control will help them in uh, uh, retarding the progression of diabetic retinopathy. But once they come to severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy or very severe di uh, non-proliferative di uh, diabetic retinopathy, it is very easy to identify in the clinic. No one should miss, no ophthalmologist should miss these findings of severe intraretinal hemorrhages <coughs> or venous bleeding or IRMA. If you are finding means these are the candidates for very soon progression to site threatening diabetic retinopathy or the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And there are a lot of investigations which are there. Fluorescent angiography is the standard. OCT has really revolutionized our understanding about diabetic retinopathy. And uh, the different types you need to identify on OCT, which, which uh, type of diabetic macular edema you are uh, dealing with. And OCT angiography has made us to understand what happens to different layers of uh, retina in diabetic retinopathy and macular edema. And uh, recently, off late, uh, autofluorescence is given a lot of impetus. Again, it is non-invasive and can give a good understanding about diabetic macula in diabetic retinopathy. And wide field uh, imaging, especially wide field fluorescent angiography will tell you how much non-perfusion areas are there and whether that is the reason for persistent diabetic macular edema or persistence of neovascularization so that targeted laser therapy can be given in panretinal photocoagulation as well. Then a word about um, artificial intelligence and uh, telescreening, both are very, very essential and likely to come in a big way so that a lot of diabetics can be screened in the country and appropriate site threatening patients can be referred to retina specialists. These are the different uh, ways the AI can help both in classification and segregation of different layers of retina and prediction of disease processes. And diabetic macular edema, the recent uh, understanding is whether the diabetic macular edema involving the center or non center involving macular edema, because this is the main aspect that decides what treatment need to be given. Rest of the uh, sub aspects I have given on the table here. And anti VGFs really revolutionize the center involving macular edema, where uh, different agents are um, already in use, and there are some uh, agents which are in pipeline. Both are very, very helpful in um, treating the diabetic macular edema, but we need to understand which are the good indications for anti VGF agents. Then different lasers can help, especially where centered non-involving diabetic macular edema, where you can see a subthreshold laser. TRP targeted retinal photocoagulation is mainly for the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Then there is a definite role of surgery. And uh, here I given two examples of the same, both eyes are of the same patient, operated elsewhere. With recurrence, with tractional RD and persistence of retinal detachment, which are revived, one from half meter of vision to 2060, other eye from two and a half meters deteriorated to half meter, and again six by 60 vision, which is means that surgery also has a role for you. In conclusion, diabetes and diabetic retinopathy, assuming global uh, epidemic. And controlling systemic parameters are very, very essential. I did not emphasize repeatedly. Staging of NPDR helps in predicting site threatening diabetes and advances and diagnostic therapy helps in, uh, to a large extent in preventing and treating the site threatening diabetic retinopathy. Overall, I would like to say it is a concept that how to deal with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy, where you need to have a good background knowledge not only ophthalmic knowledge, but the systemic knowledge is very, very essential and better patient counseling at each stage is very important and newer therapeutic agents, you should be understanding very well and apply it to the uh, in the clinic that is more essential.
thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, uh, Ajit Babu. And uh, now the next uh, lecture is a name lecture on the name of uh, yes. Professor Hem Kumar Tiwari. I now call upon uh, Professor Parijat Chandra to introduce Professor Hem Kumar Tiwari. Thank you, sir. So it is my privilege and honor uh, to introduce Professor Hem Kumar Tiwari lecture. Uh, Professor Hem Kumar Tiwari served as the head of veterinary services and was the chief of RP Center Ames from 2001 to 2004. He was instrumental in transforming the face of veterinary <laughs> surgery at RPC. He served as the president of the All India Ophthalmic Society. He was the recipient of several <coughs> honors, including the esteemed P. Seva Reddy International Award by AIOS in 1989 and the Lifetime Achievement Award by Veterinary Society of India in 2016 for his notable contributions to the field of ophthalmology. So it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Sinu M. Hari Prasad, who will be giving the Hem uh, Kumar Tiwari uh, uh, lecture. He is a Shui Chin Lee Professor of Ophthalmology and Visual Science, Department of Ophthalmology, University of Chicago. He attended the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. He did his residency at the Cullen Eye Institute, Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, Texas. He has a fellowship in the diseases and surgery of the retina, vitreous, and macula at Barnes Retina Institute, Washington University School of Medicine. He served as principal or sub-investigator in more than 45 national and international clinical trials evaluating various medications. Numerous awards, including the AAO Achievement Award, American Society of Retina Specialist Honor Achievement Award, and an ASRS Senior Honor Achievement Award. He is credited to over 200 peer-reviewed publications, meeting abstracts, and textbook chapters. It is a privilege once again to invite Professor M. Sinu M. Hari Prasad to deliver the Professor Hem K. K. Tiwari lecture. Professor Hari Prasad, please. Thank you so much for the very kind and overly generous uh, introduction. Um, I, I'm so humbled and honored uh, to, to give this lecture in honor of uh, Professor Tiwari. Um, I, I really wish I could be in India uh, in person. Uh, I was very saddened in April of 2020. I was supposed to come to India to lecture and uh, everything was canceled. Uh, British Airways uh, canceled the flight and the whole world came to uh, a shutdown. Um, uh, it was, it's been a very long time since I've been in my homeland. And, um, uh, you know, but, um, you know, even though I'm not there in person, uh, my heart is uh, with all of you. My blood is Indian. And um, we think fondly of all of you. And I can't wait for my next trip. Uh, trip um, to visit uh, my very, very good friends over the past few decades uh, who uh, feel like my family and I'm um, always um, so happy to be involved in any way I can uh, with these type of uh, meetings. But uh, the, to give this honorary lecture um, uh, for uh, Professor H.K. Tiwari is um, a really um, a defining moment for me and um, we're really uh, very grateful. Uh, there are many, many uh, people who are uh, far more deserving uh, than me to give this lecture, but you won't find anybody as appreciative uh, as me. So with that, I'd like to uh, give the lecture on a, a newer treatment choice in new vascular AMD world experience. And uh, seeing uh, the previous lectures, um, it sounds like uh, you, you are having a vast experience with uh, brolicizumab. So we're gonna talk about the molecule. And then I wanna present some new data regarding um, uh, drying effect and uh, visual outcomes. So it's a very interesting study I think you'll enjoy. Then I wanna talk about uh, our case experience at the University of Chicago and then wrap it up. So what's unique about brolicizumab? Brolicizumab is a teeny, teeny molecule. You recall Avastin, uh, uh, Bevacizumab is about 150,000 Daltons. Uh, Ilea is about 107,000 Daltons. Uh, Ranibizumab is about 50,000 Daltons. Brolicizumab is only about 28 or 29,000 Daltons. So <clears throat> it's a teeny molecule, which allows uh, more drug in each single injection. Uh, we have potent inhibition of VEGFA, and this uh, molecule effectively penetrates the retina and choroid, and if it does leak out into the systemic circulation, it's uh, rapidly uh, broken up. You all know the Hawk and Harrier uh, studies. These are the FDA registration studies to allow brolicizumab to be FDA approved for a wet age-related macular degeneration. There were two phases of the study, a matched phase where uh, patients received uh, either a flibrocet or brolicizumab, three monthly injections, followed by a maintenance phase. And you'll see that brolicizumab is non-inferior to flibrocet in terms of vision across the board, gray being a flibrocet, you can see that the blue lines, uh, which are brolicizumab, uh, are non-inferior. But there's one big difference is that you can accomplish this 
with less frequent dosing. In fact, if you look at the data in HOC, um, uh, in HOC you can see that over 50% of patients receiving six milligrams of bolecizumab were able to be maintained on an every 12 week dosing regimen. Now, if we look at um, uh, fluid resolution in HOC, uh, gray being a flibberset, blue being um, uh, uh, brolicizumab, more patients at all time points achieve complete fluid resolution with the use of brolicizumab. And we call this the absence of subretinal fluid, absence of intraretinal fluid, and absence of sub-RPE fluid. So the drying effect of brolicizumab is unparalleled. If we look at Harrier as well, we see something very similar that at each time point, you see a higher rate of a drying effect uh, of brolicizumab compared to a flibberset. So I wanna talk about a very important study, looking at the number of consecutive fluid-free months and the association on vision and anatomical outcomes. And so the, the purpose of the study is to assess the impact of absolute retinal fluid-free free duration and its association on anatomic outcomes in neovascular AMD in patients with Hawk and Harrier. This is a very interesting study because it's agnostic of what treatment the patient received. We pulled data from Hawk and Harrier trials, looking at both the brolicizumab six milligram arms as well as the flibberset arms, and uh, retinal fluid-free status was defined as absence of both subretinal fluid and intraretinal fluid. And the endpoint was the maximal number of consecutive retinal fluid-free months since week 12. And uh, the time period of the study was from week 12 to week 96. So this is how the data was uh, defined. So there were a group of patients. So, so the analysis period started at week 12. There were some patients that were never uh, fluid free. There was no month where they were fluid free. This is called category one. But then there were 22, uh, a, a group of patients, we call this category five, that were always dry at every month in the study period. Then there were some patients that had a maximum of one to three consecutive fluid free months this is category two. Category three is 49 consecutive months of dry status. And then category four is 10 to 21 maximum consecutive fluid-free months. So the data is very clear. At the top, you see the patients in category four or five. These are patients with the longest fluid-free intervals, and this clearly leads to the best vision outcomes. Okay, so the, the data is very clear. It, the number of months you can keep the um, retina dry, the better the vision. Versus if you look at the red line, those patients who are never fluid free, their vision never really improves and uh, actually stays at baseline. And another way to look at this is at week 48, 72, 96, you can see that patients on the bottom who are always dry, they have a better mean vision uh, gain compared to those who are less um, uh, frequently dry. And the reference point of those patients who are never dry. And as you can imagine, um, longer fluid-free fluid intervals, especially category four and five, were associated with greater fluid reduction. So this is obvious. And you can see all the way at the bottom, those patients in category four or five had a beautiful uh, a sustained uh, drying effect throughout the entire uh, study period. And then if you look at this, more negative is good. What we're looking at is the um, um, a number of microns of drying effect with reference being never dry at the red at the top. And at the bottom, you can see patients who are always dry had a very robust and sustained uh, drying effect of the retina. So in summary, this treatment agnostic analysis in neovascular AMD patients who are always dry or fluid free had better vision and greater reduction in central subfluvial thickness compared to patients who are never dry. And these findings suggest that the longer absolute fluid free periods had a great uh, impact on visual and anatomic outcomes in neovascular AMD. In a treatment specific analysis, uh, the, the, the big data set is treatment agnostic, but if we break down and look at differences between the two treatment arms, a higher proportion of patients receiving brolicizumab were always dry or dry for longer periods compared with the flibberset patients. And then lastly, a lower proportion of patients receiving brolicizumab were never dry or dry for shorter periods compared to a flibberset. Now, keeping this in mind, I want you to see our case experience, and you'll see how some of this data translates uh, to the real world. So the first case I'll present is a 75-year-old Caucasian female. Believe it or not, she travels over 60 miles for her visits. Uh, I'm not sure why, but she uh, always uh, travels very far to see us. And she was very um, concerned at the time we started her was in the depth of the COVID-19 pandemic. And she was very concerned about the frequency of visits to our office uh, for obvious reasons.
Um, uh, she has wet macular degeneration. And for five years, we treated her with a Flibercet four to five weeks. And the OCT displayed is what she looked like after five years of frequent of Flibercet therapy. Her vision was 2050. She complained of blurred central vision and metamorphopsia. And uh, the decision was made to switch her from a Flibercet to Brolicizumab. And we reviewed in extensive detail the benefits and the risks. And we went ahead and uh, administered the first uh, uh, Bevacizumab Brolicizumab injection and scheduled her visit for one month. So notice the OCT, this is 523 microns. After just one month, her um, um, central subfield thickness reduced to 383 microns, a significant improvement. Her vision didn't quite improve yet, but she noticed less metamorphopsia. So we gave her the second brolicizumab uh, injection at this visit and had a one month follow-up and she improved another 20 microns in OCT and her vision finally improved to 2040 vision. And then we gave her the third brolicizumab injection, but this time the follow-up was 12 weeks. And once again, um, a, a little more improvement in the OCT architecture and her vision stabilized to 2040. So you can see the uh, time course and uh, the improvement on OCT, the vision improved from 2050 to 2040. And this is after um, uh, dozens and dozens of aflibercept injections. So you can see that br brolicizumab is a different drug. It acts differently, it dries differently. And whether it's the size of the molecule, whether um, uh, some other characteristics of the molecule that causes this effect, we don't know. But um, um, in clinical practice and as the study shows, that the drying effect of brolicizumab is exquisite. So I'll present two other quick cases. Now, this patient is a 91-year-old male, and I've been following him for about six, seven years with dry AMD, and the OCT on the left is um, his baseline. This is what he's looked like for many years. You can see drusenoid changes, and uh, but essentially his OCT was dry 2030 vision. And then all of a sudden he presented um, uh, during COVID uh, with um, uh, uh, a new conversion to wet AMD 2070 vision. So of course we uh, proceeded with brolicizumab, and you can see that um, uh, his OCT was dry nine weeks after the first brolicizumab injection. My intention was for him to come back in four weeks, but he was delayed due to uh, COVID um, uh, restrictions and the number of patients we could see per day. And uh, his vision improved back to baseline with one single brolicizumab injection, 2030 vision. And uh, he has not needed another injection for almost two years. So this is before and after. You can see 2070 to 2030, a beautiful response uh, with one single brolicizumab injection. Now, the last case I'll be presenting is a 59-year-old uh, female, uh, once again with exudative age-related macular degeneration, who received two of Flibercet injections every four to five weeks with persistent subretinal fluid. She had a very complex architecture with a pigment epithelial detachment and subretinal fluid. And, um, you know, after two injections, we saw minimal improvement. So we decided, let, let's try something different. So we switched her to brolicizumab. At the time we uh, started the treatment, she was 2050 vision. This is after two ILEA injections. Now, after five weeks after the first brolicizumab injection, you can see that the patient is bone dry. Um, uh, really, she was very uh, happy with vision. And so we really, um, um, uh, and her vision improved to 2040, and we did not do any further injections. So this is at the time on the left, at the time we started brolicizumab, after one single brolicizumab injection, uh, look at the beautiful uh, improvement in foveal contour uh, with one single injection. So, you know, there are a few lessons that I've learned in our um, experience uh, with using brolicizumab. First of all, it's very important to recognize that having more tools in your toolbox to treat a condition ultimately benefits the patient. We've had uh, countless cases of patients with chronic suboptimal response to another anti-VEGF injection. And then when we switch to brolicizumab, we have this wow effect, uh, the, this um, uh, uh, different effect than we were having with the older generation anti-VEGF injection. So, you know, there are times where it makes sense to do something different but only the physician is best suited to understand the risk benefit ratio and advise that specific patient. Each case is different, each eye is different, each scenario is different. So with an understanding of the clinical trial data and the rarity of these uh, adverse events, 
you know, we, we, we ask the question, is it better to continue with a very safe therapy that's not benefiting uh, the patient anatomically or from a visual outcome, but taking on the risk of sticking a needle in the eye? Is this a better scenario than the very rare rate of vision loss due to inflammation? Um, is this a, a good thing or not? And, you know, this is a discussion that's between the physician and the patient. Uh, no company or no lecture should um, <laughs> come in between that uh, respected relationship, but it's something to think about in a patient that's had, you know, 32 uh, bro, uh, be bevacizumab injections and we're not getting anywhere. Maybe we should consider switching. But without dispute, brolicizumab has an exquisite ability to dry the retina, and it can be very helpful in times of COVID, where durability can be incredibly helpful for obvious reasons. So to summarize, uh, Hawk and Harrier taught us that brolicizumab has non-inferiority in vision compared to Flibberset, but the, uh, the anatomical outcomes are clearly superior. Uh, the, it is an effective treatment with good reduction of subretinal and intraretinal fluid uh, reduction. And the longer fluid-free intervals are clearly associated with better vision. And, um, and, and this has been uh, seen in various aspects <clears throat> clinically, as well as in um, uh, analysis of uh, uh, larger trials. And the better, better anatomical outcomes and longer treatment intervals are possible with this drug. And lastly, we cannot underestimate the importance of uh, treatment burden. Uh, you saw the previous lectures, and it's very clear that with reduced treatment burden, this benefits patients, it benefits societies, and, and it also benefits our very busy clinics. So this is something uh, very important and, uh, and um, you know, something to consider very seriously. With that, I want to thank you all so much for your attention. And um, once again, um, just a word of gratitude for honoring me with this lecture. And um, I really hope one day I can be, uh, come in person and uh, uh, see all my brothers and sisters. Uh, once again, it's been uh, too long and I miss you all dearly and wish you all um, uh, the greatest luck with these uh, very, very difficult and challenging times. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim, for the excellent lecture. And we all learned a lot from it. So we would like to present you with a virtual memento. Uh, I can, request uh, Professor uh, Rajat. Uh, uh, can we just, <laughs> there, there are maybe a couple of questions. Yes. So, uh, uh, so we'll go with the, uh, one or two questions, maybe three questions. Uh, uh, questions or comments, whatever you can call it. Uh, I, like you, you, know, you said that uh, you showed a couple of your patients only with one injection uh, the macula was dry and he didn't require any injections, injection for uh, eight, nine months. Similarly, I had patients with brolucizumab, we call Pagenex here, and uh, I had given in patients mm -hmm. and uh, maybe for about, uh, at least for 10 months, the patient did, didn't require this second injection. So what I'm trying to say is, shouldn't we, you know, redefine our loading doses? Should we give one injections and give three loading doses? Is there is a requirement of three loading doses in every cases? No, D D Dr. Asad, uh, what you uh, mentioned is a very important concept. The um, uh, you know clinical trials are designed in a certain way, and the purpose of a clinical trial is to obtain FDA. No, clinical approval. trial, I understand. I have been you know associated with so many clinical trials. <laughs> I'm just I'm, I'm just trying and to I agree with you. The real world scenario, you know, real world scenario is very. The important. real world, um, um, yes. uh, yourself, myself, and uh, many of the doctors in the U.S. and Europe. That, that's what we've uh, done is that uh, we, we're doing a treat and extend paradigm essentially right at the outset because you saw the two that's cases. That's what I'm saying. Shall we have treat and extend only after yeah. one injection? I, yes, correct. That's what we're doing now. And uh, it's amazing. Uh, I, I don't see any reason for three mandated baseline doses because, uh, you know, whether you're in India or Chicago, you saw those two cases. Why would you inject uh, the, um, uh, the case two and case three? So uh, I, I, 100 you are correct. I, I'm in complete agreement. Your name for question? Lalit. Yeah, thank you, Sinu. Uh, I'm Dr. Lalit Verma here. Yes. Nice to hear your talk uh, once again. Excellent talk and three cases you showed. Uh, so based on your talk and uh, you see whatever Dr. Azad said, and uh, you see, I also use uh, PageNX, uh, but I use it uh, PRN basis rather mm -hmm. than as uh, Sir was saying. So what I wanted to know for the benefit of our audience today, after having so much of experience, do you, re you because in this last line, you said center part physician is the best person. Yes. So today is Brolusi, uh, your first choice once the patient comes or you go by 
If not, like you go by Accenture or uh, Lucentis, then Afilipercept and then Brolisumab. Mm-hmm. You know, Dr. Verma, you, you bring up uh, a good uh, question as well. Uh, we, we don't use uh, ranibizumab anymore. Um, uh, it's a very clear ranibizumab is um, one of the first generation molecules. And a lot of data shows that um, um, a flibercept um, is more effective in terms of drying effect, yeah. in terms of durability. And uh, uh, I, I'm not sure in India, are you still using a lot of ranibizumab? What I was wanting to know was, what yeah. if you are not using brolisumab as your first line, what yeah. is your threshold of shift? Yeah. So, so, so what we do is, uh, yeah, uh, I think as Dr. Dinesh uh, G's lecture, um, you know, what he showed was that uh, patients who, you know, using a, a flipper set, they're not having um, the durability we want. We call suboptimal response based on three things. Number one, the frequency of dosing is too much. Number two, the visual outcomes are not where we want them to be, or the fluid is persistent. Or number three, um, uh, for whatever issues, uh, we can't use that drug. And, um, you know, so basically in these patients, we switch them to brolicizumab. And during times of COVID, there are times that we use brolicizumab first line. Um, you know, having practiced for 17 years, you get a general gestalt to the more difficult patients, the one with difficult anatomy. And we start with brolicizumab first line. But most patients, what we're doing is switching from a flibercept to brolicizumab. If they're showing persistent fluid, the vision outcomes, God forbid, are getting worse, uh, then we switch over to brolicizumab. But especially those patients uh, where the treatment burden is uh, too much. And um, those patients are an obvious candidate. I think for we lost the connection here. connection here. So I was uh, wanting to know after how many injections of f um, I, I give uh, Flibercet at least uh, six injections, so six to eight injections, and then we uh, get a sense uh, whether um, uh, we're getting the response that uh, we expect. Uh, sometimes it's earlier, sometimes it's later, but, uh, but, but at least we give a good handful of injections and we get a sense of the response. So what I understood from your uh, comment was that basically uh, you, you use primarily a Flibercet for ARMD patients. And if the response is suboptimal, specifically from drying point of view, say after multiple injections, three to six injections, you switch to brolisumab. And there are patients uh, like uh, in COVID era who, uh, for the sake of durability, you can start brolisumab as the first line agent also. Uh, you said it beautifully, Dr. Verma, that's pr- precisely correct. And each case, each uh, patient is different, but uh, as a general uh, rule, that's what we do. And, uh, but, it, you know, brolicizumab has really helped us during COVID. Um, our, our clinics were slammed. Uh, we're, we're finally getting back to uh, where we were, but it's been a very rough year in the U.S. I, I'm certain in India, it's, it's been no different. Uh, but uh, brolicizumab and these extended durability drugs, uh, UT, Kaluvian, all these extended durability drugs, Ozodex, uh, um, uh, our usage has skyrocketed because we cannot see as many patients as we did in the past because of all these institutional guidelines, cleaning the rooms and uh, cleaning the keyboards and the exam chairs between each patient. It's uh, uh, very sluggish, very cumbersome in our clinics. Uh, are you having this experience in India as well um, uh, with COVID that you can't no, see the, the problem, volume? The problem, uh, so you know, here is that uh, people are generally afraid of IOI. Yeah. and vein occlusion. So honestly, how many patients have you seen in your real world scenario of IOI or, or, or vascular blo- you know, occlusion? Yeah, g- g- God willing, I haven't had this experience, but it's a very real phenomenon. I have very, very respected, very close colleagues who have had this phenomenon. And um, so it is real. Uh, we shouldn't un- underestimate. This is real. You may see it uh, maybe, um, you know, one in 600, one in 500 patients. And, um, and when it happens, um, it-, it is serious. Uh, we shouldn't underestimate this. But um, we have to mitigate this with the real risks of the frequent visit, uh, the ice and snow in Chicago, getting car accident, falling down, breaking your hip on the ice. These are real um, tangible risks as well. So this is where the physician patient discussion is critical, you know, to tell them that, listen, you've had 32 um, uh, bevacizumab injections and uh, your fluid is still persistent. Uh, Should we try something different? There is a risk but uh, we may have a different uh, response. And then uh, once you get the retina dry, you may want to try something different, uh, who knows. But, uh, but I think at some point- What I wanted to see was because the label mentions 4% risk. Do you in a real world scenario, in your real practice, honestly see that or not? 
No, that, that's the total uh, intraocular inflammation. But what we're concerned about are the blinding um, uh, rates, the blinding rate of inflammation. And that, that's the one where it's a point of no return and uh, we're in trouble. So we had to be careful about those. Um, th there is a higher rate of inflammation and uh, ranibizumab, um, uh, a flibber set have such a low safe rate of inflammation. And um, uh, so I think we've gotten spoiled by these very safe um, uh, drugs. But um, in certain circumstances, acceptance of this uh, uh, you know, low single digit rate of inflammation may be warranted uh, to get a different re response. What about farcimab? It is coming in a big way. We heard that. Uh... So, so furosemab has a similar scenario. Um, uh, the rate of inflammation with furosemab is three to five X uh, of ILEA, of aflibercept, about three to five X. But the difference uh, between uh, furosemab and brolicizumab is that the inflammation rate is much, uh, it's not as severe. Okay, so ILEA has an incredibly low rate of inflammation. It was a comparator arm in the study and uh, uh, well below 1% in the trial, if I recall correctly. But the rate of inflammation with furosemab was 3 to 5% higher than ILEA. But um, it, it's more frequent than brolicizumab, but less severe. And this is what we're trying to figure out in the U.S. Um, uh, you know, uh, what, what should be the treatment paradigm with this new drug and uh, how do we put it to use? And um, there's still a lot of discussion uh, trying to uh, sort through these uh, clinical trial details. Okay, thanks well, thank for you, so yeah. much because time is not on our side. Otherwise, we would have continued this discussion yeah, we had, for a uh, long time. So I'll request Professor Azad to present you with a yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, we have a memento you, for you uh, for your uh, wonderful lecture. Yeah. <laughs> thank so now you, we'd like to present you with a virtual memento. Uh, <laughs> Professor Azad and members of the dais to kindly uh, present the virtual memento to uh, Professor Harish Prasad. We will courier this memento you, uh, to you, <laughs> sir. Uh, and can <laughs> we zoom in on the uh, award, please? Yeah. <laughs> That's so beautiful. I'll proudly display this in my office and uh, I'm so honored to have this and um, uh, I'm very humbled, very humbled to receive this and thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Thank you, Professor Haritha. This is a small memento again. <laughs> thank you so much. Small plaque. Uh, I'll proudly display this on my desk. Thank you so much uh, for this honor. Thank you, Professor Haritha, for the excellent uh, delivery of the uh, HIM, uh, Dr. H.K. Tiwari lecture. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we have our next speaker and uh, Prashant. So Prashant is a very, you know, uh, attractive and uh, very friendly person. And uh, uh, I mean, he'll make a presentation here. Thank you, sir. Thank you for those kind words. And once more, uh, sincere thanks to the organizing team for this wonderful honor to stand in this podium at this prestigious institute. After wonderful talks from uh, uh, Dr. Sinu as well as Dr. Tinesh, I would be sharing some of our experiences, some classic cases, high profile cases, just to make you sure that how this uh, beautifully this molecule helps us out. So this is case number one, 45 years female who presented with this initial picture. And this is the OCT, which is self-explanatory being a retina crowd. I won't not describe further. Six by 60 was her vision, angio was done, ICG was done. And she received a flibercept. At that point of time, we only had this particular molecule. And this is at Q4 intervals, we kept on injecting the flibercept. And this is how the eye behaved. She received five aflibercept and it is after nine months after five dosages of aflibercept, it had become more hemorrhagic in nature, as you can see from the color of the swelling over there. And at this point, we had this new molecule. We injected the brolocizumab after necessary explanation. And this is within a month. This is within a month. You can see that orange hue has moved to yellowish. It seems more organized. OCT shows more flattening. We At that point of time, we believed in uh, uh, the Hawk and Harrier trial. So we emulated it and we went ahead with Q4 intervals. And this is second month. And we gave three loading dosages of brolocizumab. And since then, it is then eight weeks later, we thought we are seeing some activity. We injected fourth brolocizumab. I would just run through it. The fifth brolocizumab was given after 13 weeks and sixth was given after 13 weeks. So just I would come to the timeline of this particular molecule after we introduced 
uh, uh, with this case number one, after introduction of this molecule, before prolocizumab, Q4, Q4, first three injections. And this is two months after third prolocizumab, we had to give, that was Q8, fourth was given. Fifth was given again after Q8, while the sixth one was received after Q13 interval. So this is how the duration we could achieve. Now case number two, she is a senior gynecologist from our town. This was her picture at this point of time. This was the OCT at presentation. This was the FFA and we injected a flibercept. This is about before the availability of this molecule. And this is post three injections of, of Libercept, but seven weeks later, it came back with vengeance. Being a high profile case, we again did an angio OCT. We thought we are seeing some leak on an ICG, a polyplake lesion. We went ahead with treating it with PDT plus a Libercept further. And this is post PDT and a Libercept follow-up. The PDT, uh, that, uh, PD was increasing. We injected a flibercept at Q4 interval. This is the, how we went ahead treating the lesions. And six weeks later, she complained of further week after five injections of a flibercept following PDT. And she had a central core vitreous hemorrhage. Patient had meanwhile a second opinion from higher center. We can, and they advised to continue with a flibercept. And this is what is happening. Seven multiple a flibercept. Two months later, she complained of increased metamorphopsia, and this is the time when we introduced prolocizumab. And within a month, we could see the drastic improvement in vision to 6-9, the lesion seemed more organized, more fibrous. And we, at that point, we continued with injecting Q4 at Q4 interval. The second injection, the third was received at Q10 interval. I will just come directly now to the timeline of this particular case. You can see how this patient behaved. Before prolocizumab, first, second, third, the fourth was given. You can see nine mm -hmm. months after three injections, the lesion is totally dry. Case number three is a senior laparoscopic surgeon. His history dates back to 2010. And this was the picture at that time at his first uh, attack when we treated him with three loading dosages of ranibizumab. Then he was in remission. Then two years later, he had a first recurrence in the left eye again. Again, we treated him with a, a ranibizumab at that point of time. And then he had a second recurrence in the same eye. This continued. And finally, he had assumed that his vision is not going to improvise in the left eye beyond 6 by 18. And so we, he stopped coming to us. Now, four years after second recurrence in the left eye, he came, had a complaint in right eye. And this was the picture in right eye. He had a serous PD and the left eye by that time had assumed more of a fibrotic uh, character with a, we thought, degenerative fluid. We, that point, we injected three monthly dosages of Avlibercept, then two monthly, and you can see how the patient behaved. The PD came back with vengeance every time the Avlibercept was four to six weeks later. At that point, we injected Brolucizumab within first day. For the first time, laparoscopic surgeon said, I'm ready to do, uh, I'm able to do my laparoscopic procedure. We injected brolocizumab again, and you can see this is how we injected. Now Q8, we interval, and then 10 weeks later, he received fifth injection, sixth injection again at 8, 10 weeks, and the seventh at 11 weeks. So he, this is the timeline in the right eye, which was later affected. Now looking at the response in the first uh, right eye, he asked why not we should treat it in the left eye. And so we treated the so-called degenerative fluid with a scar and you can see the dramatic response even in that time. Vision for the first time in left time eight years moved to six by 18. And so we continued injecting him at this course and you can see how he responded. So this is in one even in the left time. Yeah. So these are some of the resistant cases. Now I would share one of my naive cases, case number one. This is the picture, OCT, FFA, ICG, first prolocizumab, and you can see the way it has responded and you can see the in improvement. I will come directly to the timeline of this particular patient. You can see the beautiful response and the re uh, restoration of vision back from 2 by 60 to 6, 9 parts in this particular patient with five dosages of brolocizumab. Last case, this is a, uh, I think uh, I will move ahead with this. I will go for a bilateral case. That would be my last case for you. Yeah. 
This person, person had a bilateral CNVM here. You can see here is a case where we injected bilateral bolucizumab at a gap of two, three days. And you can see how it behaved. I will come directly to the timeline for want of time. Just to make you feel comfortable that yes, it can be injected bilaterally, definitely not on the same day, but at a gap of two to three days. And in spite of number of injections, you can see the response in this eye. So these are some of the cases which I have shared. patient wisely so that they understand the ifs and buts about this molecule because we were as afraid as any one of us is about the inflammation part. So these are one of them is laparoscopic surgeon who has led us to the uh, uh, higher. You are a very lucky a person. I can only care. tell you yeah. that you can choose your patients for injections. Yeah. We, we can't. Thank so you very much. Case number three, one small one. Case number three, right eye, left eye, you shifted bilateral. bilateral. So you made one comment that to avoid, uh, you know, uh, patient going somewhere else or falling down. No, no. Started so what I'm wanting to ask you is that is brolosumab becoming first line of treatment in ARMD in your uh, center? Yes, it, sir. As it... I said, uh, now we have started about it's more than eight months with more than 150 plus procedures. We now think socioeconomically, if I think for my patients, it becomes more affordable even than an Avastin. And that's why in many cases where let patients me, me are well you, educated. Let me ask you one blunt question. If yeah. Dr. Azad comes to you with a CNVM, he's a very high profile man. What agent will you get to yeah, first I would, line? I would be ready to give him prolosism if he can understand day. me. Yes. Okay. But I should be ready to accept. I, as I said that, that was no. my complete answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that said, that was second. Sir, that is PRN me. basis. Previously, I used to give loading dose. Now it is P, uh, PRN right from dose one, after dose one. But I think in any case, we all of us, page next is we never, I never give loading dose and three. We always yeah. give PRN. Yeah, because it's, it's a long term drying effect is there. No. So I think we can, you know, uh, do treat an excellent yeah. in this. But I'm we happy. Began I am two happy years back, it was that the... is convenient for the patient also. Exactly. Prashant, I'm happy that you are offering. A high profile Dr. Azad, first line Brulusimab. That's a very good statement you made. So, for, uh, for us with 150 thanks, plus Thank procedure you. and beginners, luck, like, say, or touch wood. I'm extremely sorry to interrupt you, Thank sir. You. We have right. other speakers waiting. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. Actually, this is something, you know, uh, we can discuss hours and hours. And uh, one uh, best discusser is sitting. We have not given him a chance. That is Dinesh Talwar. Anyway, we'll talk in the dinner. At the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Titial, Dr. Namrata. No, sir, bolo. Samne bolo. Mic nazdik kar lo. Out the at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, the team of RP Center, Professor Titial, Namrata, Dr. Rajesh, uh, Dr. Rajpal, uh, Dr. Rohan, Dr. Vinod, Dr. Pradeep, Dr. Parajit for giving me this opportunity to talk to talk on this forum about a very serious complication that is management of expulsive hemorrhage, saving the lost. Uh, ex expulsive choroidal hemorrhage is a rare and dreadful complication of phacoemulsification or VR surgery that usually results in either loss of vision or loss of eye. 
इंसिडेंस ऑफ एक्सपल्सिव हेमरेज इज मार्केटली डिक्रीज विद द एडवेंट ऑफ एम आई वी एस और एंड फेको इमल्सिफिकेशन बिकॉज इट्स ए क्लोज सिस्टम एंड द चांसेस ऑफ हाईपोटनी आर वेरी रेयर एंड द आई ओ पी वेरिएशन आर मिनिमल कमिंग टू पैथोफिजियोलॉजी हाईपोटनी Uh, or stress causes blood from long or short ciliary artery to bleed which fills within the space between choroid and the sclera choroidal and choroidal bulge and expulsive hemorrhage the risk factors are can be local or it can be systemic uh, the local risk factors are choroidal arteriosclerosis glaucoma high myopia recent intraocular surgery and expulsive in the follow eye fellow eye and the risk factors uh, systemic risk factors are at advanced age arteriosclerotic changes hypertension blood dyscrasia and diabetes mellitus now coming to three scenarios uh, where patient had expulsive hemorrhage this is a case of 56 year old female had injury with badminton stick came to us with severe corneal edema details of anterior segment was not clear and patient had an iop of 46 on maximal medication we did an ultrasound of this patient uh, which showed low echogenic sh shadows with no cd or rd suggestive of dispersed vitreous hemorrhage so uh, this was one of the patient you can see a lot of corneal edema here and uh, uh, we uh, put all the three ports and going anterior and we once we cleared the debris and the vitreous at this stage we realized that whole of the lens is into the anterior segment and as i was clearing the uh, debris and you can see a ooze of blood which is coming here at this stage i thought uh, from somewhere the iris is bleeding the, but this blood kept on oozing and after a while after 5 10 minutes uh, after clearing this blood i didn't realize what is happening so i uh, closed this port and went with the other port now you can see here from this port you can see the blood is coming here and at this stage i realized that it's in choroidal expulsive hemorrhage i looked at the blood pressure of the patient the blood pressure was shooting up to 220 our anesthetist said please stop and i stopped at that moment the patient was started on nitroglycerin drip meanwhile while sitting i thought ki what next has to be done for this patient if i leave this lens into the anterior segment then i lose this eye other thing was to remove this lens and do a total vitrectomy and fill it with the oil i took the name of uh, i took uh, prayed with the god and i said i'll remove this lens i'll take a chance so what i did i'll do an sics i made a big scleral corneal tunnel almost 10 mm and went with an irrigating wire vectors and removed this lens with an irrigating wire vectors one thing what i did here was i increased the pressure to 60 uh, with the constellation system for 5 minutes so that my bleeding doesn't occurs so whole of the lens capsule and everything was removed and this tunnel was in self sealing wound and we went ahead and did a vitrectomy in this patient on examination i found a very large mound on the temporal side so made a sclerotomy and reached into the supracoroidal space you can see blood stains uh, uh, blood coming out from the sclera and at this stage somehow i thought ki i should go inside and reposit this uh, do something for this iris when i was going you can see this choroidal mound a second choroidal detachment occurred from the nasal side and uh, i drained this uh, choroid from the nasal side uh, the, filled the eye with pfcl and you can see and there is a big choroidal mound here and direct pfcl exchange was done and this patient you can see uh, this is a post operative patient uh, one week the patient was 660 and this patient has improved to 69 and later i did a glued iv in this patient and this patient improved to 69 uh, two important thing you will have to do when uh, you are draining a choroidal hemorrhage you can see an another uh, expulsive you can see a choroid here 
you should always have an infusion cannula or if you can't put an infusion cannula, then you should put an AC maintainer. Make in sclerotomy and reached into the supracoroidal space and just uh, uh, widen the uh, scleral lips and you can see a lot of blood coming out. And this patient was saved. I closed this patient uh, immediately. And uh, finally, you can see I was doing a glued IUL for this patient. Uh, three months later, I did a glued IUL. And this patient also recovered with very good vision. In uh, situation three, uh, the close the, if uh, uh, no drainage is possible, then close the wound with sutures, control the systemic blood pressure, wait for 10 to 14 days for the blood to lyse, and then VR surgery is performed. This is one of the, this scenario where the patient where the surgeon had an expulsive hemorrhage and what he did, he closed the wound with the sutures and referred the patient to uh, us. And you can see there was an SI and the wound is closed. There are large choroidal mounds. The ultrasound was done for this patient. And on ultrasound, you can see uh, large choroidal mounds with uh, high reflective shadows within this uh, choroidal uh, uh, mounds, which suggests uh, there is an uh, expulsive hemorrhage. Uh, after 10 to 14 days, uh, we took this patient for surgery and uh, we planned to do a scleral buckle. Once the buck band was passed and Beneath the band at the highest mound, <coughs> we drained, we created in sclerotomy. And you can see uh, <coughs> the lice blood after 10 to 14 days appears chocolate colored blood. This is the lice. Uh, and once we have drained this blood, we went inside and did a uh, PVD induction. The blood was removed. On examination, what we saw here, there is a uh, large subretinal hemorrhage. So until unless we remove this subretinal hemorrhage, uh, we are not going to give any kind of vision. So a, with the help of an 40 gauge needle, a peripheral detachment was created. I'm extremely and, sorry to interrupt you, sir. We have overshot. Uh, the we'll time. stop here yeah. because we have two more speakers. Uh, so so we'll... to con last slide. Uh, so to conclude, infusion cannula oblique AC maintainer is a must to maintain IOP and drain the CD. In the era of self-sealing wound, most of the eyes can be salvaged. If possible, drain the hemorrhagic choroids by making sclerotomy at the highest point of the choroidal uh, detachment. If CD drainage is not possible, control IOP and inflammation. These patients can be taken off of VR surgery after two weeks. Timely intervention can salvage most of the eyes. Thank you very much Thank for you. your kind attention. Thank you very much, Avninda. As I initially told that you are the master of redo surgery and wonderful presentation. May I have the next uh, presentation by the, uh, the the great innovator? I call him innovator of uh, you know ophthalmology. So uh, Ajay Arora ji will come and uh, Ajay make your presentation. <laughs> We have one more presentation, so. Can I hear you? Thank you. So at the outset, I must thank uh, Professor Titiyal, Dr. Namrata, and the entire RPC team for giving me this opportunity. And thank you, sir, Professor Lalit, Professor Rajpal, Dr. Venkateshan, Dr. Pariza, Dr. Lalit Verma for, for being on the, on the dais. My presentation today is on supracolateral injection of Trimsilone, a novel technique I experienced. So these are the various methods by which we can deliver drugs to the posterior segment, systemic, topical, periocular, intravitreal. And we know that the best uh, method at this point of time is an intravitreal injection. It has its <coughs> advantages of overcoming the blood retinal barrier, virtually no or little systemic effect, but a transalone given intravitreally can produce floaters, needs to be repeated because of the half-life and it needs to travel through the retina to the choroid. It can cause cataract, glaucoma, endophthalmitis, little and vitreous hemorrhage, vascular occlusion, and retinal detachment. 
Now, can a supracollateral space injection be the solution? So this was a landmark uh, experimental study which showed that a single injection of blue latex in the supracollateral space can spread and uh, can cover almost 50% of the posterior segment. Uh, so therefore, it can, it can be very effective for treating posterior segment diseases. Can we see supracollateral space? Yes, in some patients, uh, in over 50% of the patients over 50 years, we can make out a supracollateral space on a, on a SDOCT, especially in certain situations. And what Abninda showed that supracollateral space is obviously very enlarged in case of supracollateral hemorrhage. So a few facts about the supracollateral space is a potential space located between the outer layer of the choroid and the inner layer of the sclera. It can accommodate up to one ml of fluid, up to 20, 250 microliters, that is almost 0.25 ml can be easily given without increasing the intraocular pressure. Uh, we can give drugs, but the problem is it's a blind procedure and needs special microneedles. So this was a very interesting and innovative paper which came out in 2011. 11-12, where a microneedle was, was made for the first time. And this basically a microneedle had a bevel of 300 microns. This is a normal uh, 30 gauge needle, which has got a bevel of uh, 1200 microns. So can we inject drugs in the supracoronal space with a commercial needle, which has got a bevel of 1200 microns? So uh, the methods available today are the, a micro needle, and this is a clear set biomedical company. Imagine the entire company is based on single innovation of a micro needle. So this is the clear set uh, biomedical device for transplant injection. Then you have a uh, micro catheterization by Med1. Unfortunately, this has been discontinued. And then you have uh, uh, another microcannulation with an illuminated device by an eye track, and this company has been taken over by ClearSight. Finally, we have a Jugard of uh, 23 gauge needle with a 30 gauge right. needle, but this has to be made every time, so there are manufacturing limitations. So is there a way to enter the supracollateral space? If we enter it vertically, we will definitely enter into the, uh, into the vitreous cavity and maybe perforate the retina or the tissues. But if you enter obliquely, we can definitely enter. So they, we did a study where we had uh, um, uh, algorithms made for the angle with which we inject and the devices was made with its scanning electro microscope for Tramsalon. And we did some animal experiments. So this is a patented device with different angulation. This is a prototype which I've used in this particular study. And we did this animal study in Gorsai where we injected Tramsalon, Methacellulose and Helon. And this study was partly done at Shroff Charity and Vision Plus Eye Center. So this is just to show you, uh, this is being done in uh, Gorsai, Tramsalon being injected. You can see the UBM where Tramsalon is in the supracollateral space. We also injected Methacellulose. You can see the separation of the supracollateral space and a large